Hey everybody, welcome to this video on cybersecurity full course. I'm sure that most of you would have gone online and checked an image, watched a video, liked the picture and subscribed to a service. But have you ever wondered how all this data is kept safe? Cybersecurity is the practice of protecting computers, servers and networks from digital attacks, theft and damage. Cybersecurity is critical for individuals, businesses and organizations to protect against cyber threats such as viruses, worms and ransomware. Hey everybody, you are already watching a video on cybersecurity full course on Edureka. If you love watching videos like this, then consider hitting the like button and subscribing to our channel. You can also hit the bell icon to receive regular updates from here. We also have hundreds of training programs and certification courses on our website. So if you are interested in them, do check out the description given below. Now let's start this video by seeing what this video will cover. Since the title itself is Cybersecurity Full Course, I think that it is justified that we start with what is cybersecurity. After that, we can move on to cybersecurity fundamentals. This section will cover all the fundamental concepts that you will need to understand in order to start learning cybersecurity. After this, we can check the history of cybersecurity. How exactly did it start and what made it evolve into what cybersecurity is today? We will then see some cybersecurity threats and the tools that is used in this domain. Once we are done with that, we will tell you the top 10 reasons why you should learn cybersecurity along with a few cybersecurity skills. With this video, we really do hope that you are able to work in this industry. So the next section is how to become a cybersecurity engineer followed by the cybersecurity career path. If you are new to this industry, then let me tell you, cybersecurity certifications are absolutely necessary if you want to have a good chance in getting shortlisted. We will also need to cover coding for cybersecurity to maximize your knowledge in this domain. In this video, we will also see the top cybersecurity attacks that have gained reputation in the recent years. After this, we will move on to ethical hacking. We will start by seeing what ethical hacking means after which we can learn the phases in ethical hacking. Once you are done with this, we will move on to some core concepts like ethical hacking with Kali Linux, cryptography, penetration testing, etc. In this video, we will also show you how to use Nmap, a network scanner that is used to discover hosts and services on a computer network by sending packets and analyzing the responses. We will also see a few methods of cyber attacks like cross-site scripting, DDoS attack, SQL injection, etc. After that, we will cover steganography, a technique that is used to hide data in a non-secretive manner to avoid detection. Now, after all this, we really do hope that you use these skills and succeed in your career. That is why we have included an ethical hacking roadmap which will help you plan your career and cybersecurity interview questions and answers to help you ease through the interview process. So now, let's get started with the first topic, which is what is cybersecurity? What is cybersecurity? The onset of digitalization era has opened up a lot of opportunities for everyone, especially business and enterprises. From mobile banking to online shopping to reading news and books, everything is just one click away. But it has been rightly said that everything comes at a price. The more you connect to digital assets, the higher the risk of security vulnerabilities for your sensitive and confidential data. Now the question arises, how are companies securing this critical data and combating these threats? The answer is cybersecurity. So what is cybersecurity? Technically, cybersecurity is the body of technologies, processes, and practices designed to protect networks computers, programs, and data from attack, damage, or unauthorized access or misuse of authorized assets. The goal of cybersecurity is to reduce the risk of cyber attacks and protect organizations and individuals from the intentional and unintentional exploitation of security weaknesses in systems, networks, and technologies. You love the product on Amazon and plan to buy it. On your way to checkout, you are given options to pay through your debit or credit card or UPI. With millions of users sharing such sensitive information over the platform, ever wondered how Amazon tries to secure this information? 
How do Facebook and Google also manage to secure confidential information of its millions of users? Well, from renewed privacy policies to security-focused patents to use of AI for data security, each company is expanding its focus on data protection to encourage user trust. With the increasing advancements in the digital world, cybersecurity threats will keep getting more complex as hackers learn to adapt to security strategies. This will increase the widespread requirement of cybersecurity by companies that will be paying more than ever to land highly skilled cybersecurity professionals in order to secure their vulnerable assets from cyber attacks. Now, we are living in a digital era. Whether it be booking a hotel room, ordering some dinner, or even booking a cab, we are constantly using the internet and inherently constantly generating data. This data is generally stored on the cloud, which is basically a huge data server or data center that you can access online. Also, we use an array of devices to access this data. Now, for a hacker, it's a golden age. With so many access points, public IP addresses, and constant traffic and tons of data to exploit, black hat hackers are having one hell of a time exploiting vulnerabilities and creating malicious software for the same. Above that, cyber attacks are evolving by the day. Hackers are becoming smarter and more creative with their malwares, and how they bypass virus scans and firewalls still baffle many people. Let's go through some of the most common types of cyber attacks now. So as you guys can see, I've listed out eight cyber attacks that have plagued us since the beginning of the internet. Let's go through them briefly. So first on the list, we have general malwares. Malware is an all-encompassing term for a variety of cyber threats, including trojans, viruses, and bombs. Malware is simply defined as code with malicious intent that typically steals data or destroys something on the computer. Next on the list, we have phishing. Often posing as a request for data from a trusted third party, phishing attacks are sent via email and ask users to click on a link and enter their personal data. Phishing emails have gotten much more sophisticated in recent years, making it difficult for some people to discern a legitimate request for information from a false one. Phishing emails often fall into the same category as spam, but are more harmful than just a simple ad. Next on the list, we have password attacks. A password attack is exactly what it sounds like. A third party trying to gain access to your system by cracking a user's password. Next up is DDoS, which stands for Distributed Denial of Service. A DOS attack focuses on disrupting the service of a network. Attackers send high volumes of data or traffic through the network that is making a lot of connection requests until the network becomes overloaded and can no longer function. Next up, we have man-in-the-middle attacks. By impersonating the endpoint in an online information exchange, that is the connection from your smartphone to a website, the MITM attacks can obtain information from the end users and entity he or she is communicating with. For example, if you're banking online, the man-in-the-middle would communicate with you by impersonating your bank and communicate with the bank by impersonating you. The man in the middle would then receive all the information transferred between both parties, which could include sensitive data, such as bank accounts and personal information. Next up, we have drive-by downloads. Through malware on a legitimate website, a program is downloaded to a user's system just by visiting the site. It doesn't require any type of action by the user to download it, actually. Next up, we have mal advertising, which is a way to compromise your computer with malicious code that is downloaded to your system when you click on an affected ad. Lastly, we have rogue softwares, which are basically malwares that are masquerading as legitimate and necessary security software that will keep your system safe. So as you guys can see now, the internet sure isn't a safe place as you might think it is. This not only applies for us as individuals, but also large organizations. There have been multiple cyber breaches in the past that has compromised the privacy and confidentiality of our data. If we head over to the site called Information is Beautiful, we can see all the major cyber breaches that have been committed. So as you guys can see, even big companies like eBay, AOL, Evernote, Adobe have actually gone through major cyber breaches, even though they have a lot of security measures taken to protect the data that they contain. So it's not only that small individuals are targeted by hackers and other people, but even bigger organizations are constantly being targeted by these guys. So after looking at all sorts of cyber attacks possible, the breaches of the past, and the sheer amount of data available, we must be thinking that there must be some sort of mechanism and protocol to actually protect us from all these sorts of cyber attacks. And indeed, there is a way, 
and this is called cybersecurity. In a computing context, security comprises of cybersecurity and physical security. Both are used by enterprises to protect against unauthorized access to data centers and other computerized systems. Information security, which is designed to maintain the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data, is a subset of cybersecurity. The use of cybersecurity can help prevent against cyber attacks, data breaches, identity theft, and can aid in risk management. So, when an organization has a strong sense of network security and an effective incident response plan, it is better able to prevent and mitigate these attacks. For example, end user protection defense information and guards against loss of theft while also scanning computers for malicious code. Now, when talking about cybersecurity, there are three main activities that we are trying to protect ourselves against, and they are unauthorized modification, unauthorized deletion, and unauthorized access. These three terms are very synonymous to the very commonly known CIA triad, which stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. The CIA triad is also commonly referred to as the three pillars of security, and most security policies of bigger organizations and even smaller companies are based on these three principles. So let's go through them one by one. So first on the list, we have confidentiality. Confidentiality is roughly equivalent to privacy. Measures undertaken to ensure confidentiality are designed to prevent sensitive information from reaching the wrong people while making sure that the right people can in fact get it. Access must be restricted to those authorized to view the data in question. It is common as well for data to be categorized according to the amount and type of damage that could be done should it fall into unintended hands. More or less, stringent measures can then be implemented across to those categories. Sometimes safeguarding data confidentiality may involve special training for those privy to such documents. Such training would typically include security risks that could threaten this information. Training can help familiarize authorized people with risk factors and how to guard against them. Further aspects of training can include strong password and password-related best practices and information about social engineering methods to prevent them from bending data handling rules with good intention and potentially disastrous results. Next on the list, we have integrity. Integrity involves maintaining the consistency, accuracy, and trustworthiness of data over its entire life cycle. Data must not be changed in transit, and steps must be taken to ensure that data cannot be altered by unauthorized people for example, in a breach of confidentiality. These measures include file permissions and user access controls. Version control may be used to prevent erroneous changes or accidental deletion by authorized users becoming a problem. In addition, some means must be in place to detect any changes in data that might occur as a result of non-human caused events, such as electromagnetic pulses or server crash. Some data might include checksums, even cryptographic checksums for verification of integrity. Backup or redundancies must be available to restore the affected data to its correct state. Last but not least is availability. Availability is best ensured by rigorous maintaining of all hardware, performing hardware repairs immediately when needed, and maintaining a correctly functional operating system environment that is free of software conflicts. It's also important to keep current with all necessary system upgrades. Providing adequate communication bandwidth and preventing the occurrences of bottlenecks are equally important. Redundancy, failover, and even high availability clusters can mitigate serious consequences when hardware issues do occur. Fast and adaptive disaster recovery is essential for the worst case scenarios. That capacity is reliant on the existence of a comprehensive disaster recovery plan. Safeguards against data loss or interruption in connection must include unpredictable events such as natural disasters and fire. To prevent data loss from such occurrences, a backup copy must be stored in a geographically isolated location, perhaps even in a fireproof water safe place. Extra security equipments or software such as firewalls and proxy servers can guard us against downtimes and unreachable data due to malicious actions such as denial of service attacks and network intrusions. So now that we have seen what we are actually trying to implement when trying to protect ourselves on the internet, we should also know the ways that we actually protect ourselves when we are attacked by cyber organizations. So the first step to actually mitigate any type of cyber attack is to identify the malware or the cyber threat that is being currently going on in your organization. Next, we have to actually analyze and evaluate all the affected parties and the file systems that have been compromised. And in the end, we have to patch the whole treatment so that our organization can come back to its original running state without any cyber breaches. 
So how is it exactly done? This is mostly done by actually calculating three factors. The first factor is vulnerability, the second factor is threat, and the third is risk. So let me tell you about the three of them a little bit. So first on the list of actual calculations, we have vulnerability. So a vulnerability refers to a known weakness of an asset that can be exploited by one or more attackers. In other words, it is a known issue that allows an attack to be successful. For example, when a team member resigns and you forget to disable their access to external accounts, change logins or remove their names from the company credit cards, this leaves your business open to both unintentional and intentional threats. However, most vulnerabilities are exploited by automated attackers and not a human typing on the other side of the network. Next, testing for vulnerabilities is critical to ensuring the continued security of your systems by identifying weak points and developing a strategy to respond quickly. Here are some questions that you ask when determining your security vulnerabilities. So you have questions like, is your data backed up and stored in a secure offsite location? Is your data stored in the cloud? If yes, how exactly is it being protected from cloud vulnerabilities? What kind of security do you have to determine who can access, modify, or delete information from within your organization? Next, like you could ask questions like, what kind of antivirus protection is in use? What are the license currents? Are the license current? And is it running as often as needed? Also, do you have a data recovery plan in the event of vulnerability being exploited? So these are the normal questions that one asks when actually checking their vulnerability. Next up is threat. A threat refers to a new or newly discovered incident with potential to do harm to a system or your overall organization. There are three main types of threat. Natural threats like floods or tornadoes, unintentional threats such as employee mistakenly accessing the wrong information, and intentional threats. There are many examples of intentional threats including spyware, malware, adware companies, or the actions of disgruntled employees. In addition, worms and viruses are categorized as threats because they could potentially cause harm to your organization through exposure to an automated attack as opposed to one perpetrated by human beings. Although these threats are generally outside of one's control and difficult to identify in advance, it is essential to take appropriate measures to assess threats regularly. Here are some ways to do so. Ensure that your team members are staying informed of current trends in cybersecurity so they can quickly identify new threats. They should subscribe to blogs like Wired and podcasts like the TechGenix Extreme IT that covers these issues as well as join professional associations so they can benefit from breaking news feeds, conferences, and webinars. You should also perform regular threat assessment to determine the best approaches to protecting a system against a specific threat along with assessing different types of threat. In addition, penetration testing involves modeling real-world threats in order to discover vulnerabilities. Next on the list, we have risk. So risk refers to the potential for loss or damage when a threat exploits a vulnerability. Examples of risks include financial losses as a result of business disruption, loss of privacy, reputational damage, legal implications, and can even include loss of life. Risk can also be defined as follows, which is basically threat multiplied by the vulnerability. You can reduce the potential for risk by creating and implementing a risk management plan. And here are the key aspects to consider when developing your risk management strategy. Firstly, we need to assess risk and determine needs. When it comes to designing and implementing a risk assessment framework, it is critical to prioritize the most important breaches that need to be addressed. Although frequency may differ in each organization, this level of assessment must be done on a regular, recurring basis. Next, we also have to include a total stakeholder perspective. Stakeholders include the business owners as well as employees, customers, and even vendors. All of these players have the potential to negatively impact the organization, but at the same time, they can be assets in helping to mitigate risk. So as we see, risk management is the key to cybersecurity. So now let us go through a scenario to actually understand how cybersecurity actually defends an organization against very manipulative cybercrime. So cybercrime, as we all know, is a global problem that's been dominating the news cycle. It poses a threat to individual security and an even bigger threat to large international companies, banks, and governments. Today's organized cybercrime far outshadows lone hackers of the past, and now large organized crime rings function like startups and often employ highly trained developers who are constantly innovating new online attacks. Most companies have preventative security software to stop these types of attacks, but no matter how secure we are, cybercrime is going to happen. So meet Bob. He's the chief security officer for a company that makes a mobile app 
to help customers track and manage their finances. So security is a top priority. So Bob's company has an activity response platform in place that automates the entire cybersecurity process. The ARP software integrates all the security and IT software needed to keep a large company like Bob's secured into a single dashboard and acts as a hub for the people processes and technology needed to respond to and contain cyber attacks. Let's see how this platform works in the case of a security breach. While Bob is out on a business trip, irregular activity occurs on his account as a user behavior analytics engine that monitors account activity, recognizes suspicious behavior involving late night logins and unusual amounts of data being downloaded. This piece of software is the first signal that something is wrong. An alert is sent to the next piece of software in the chain, which is the security information and event management system. Now, the ARP can orchestrate a chain of events that ultimately prevents the company from encountering a serious security disaster. The ARP connects to a user directory software that Bob's company uses, which immediately recognizes the user accounts belong to an executive who is out on a business trip and then proceeds to lock his account. The ARP sends the incident IP address to a threat intelligence software, which identifies the address as a suspected malware server. As each piece of security software runs, the findings are recorded in the ARP's incident, which is already busy creating a set of instructions called a playbook for a security analyst to follow. The analyst then locks Bob's accounts and changes his passwords. This time, the software has determined the attempted attack came from a well-known cybercrime organization using stolen credentials. Bob's credentials were stolen when the hacker found a vulnerability in his company's firewall software and used it to upload a malware infected file. Now that we know how the attack happened, the analyst uses the ARP and identifies and patches all the things. The ARP uses information from endpoint tool to determine which machines need to be patched, recommends how to patch them, and then allows the analyst to push the patches to all the computers and mobile devices instantly. Meanwhile, Bob has to alert the legal departments of the breach and the ARP instantly notifies the correct person of the situation and the status of the incident after the attack is contained. And Bob's account is secured. The analyst then communicates which data may have been stolen or compromised during the incident. He identifies which geographies, jurisdictions, and regulatory agencies cover the users and information affected by the attack. Then the ARP creates a series of tasks so the organization can notify the affected parties and follow all relevant compliances and liability procedures. In the past, a security breach this large would have required Bob's company to involve several agencies and third parties to solve the problem, a process that could have taken months or longer. But in a matter of hours, the incident response platform organized all of the people processes and technology to identify and contain the problem, find the source of the attack, fix the vulnerability, and notify all affected parties. And in the future, Bob and his team will be able to turn to cognitive security tools. These tools will read and learn from tens of thousands of trusted publication blogs and other sources of information. This knowledge will uncover new insights and patterns, anticipate and isolate, and minimize attacks as they happen, and immediately recommend actions for security professionals to take, keeping data safe and companies like Bob's out of the headlines. So let us take a trip to the early days of hacking to start with. Now the Internet Engineering Task Force is responsible for maintaining documentation about protocols and various specification and processes and procedures regarding anything on the internet. They have a series of documents called the Request for Comments or the RFCs. And according to RFC 1389, it says, a hacker is a person who delights in having an intimate understanding of the internal workings of a system, computers, and computer networks in particular. While the expression hackers may go back a long time and have many different connotations or definitions, as far as computers go, some of the earliest hackers were members of the Tech Model Railroad Club at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And what those people did and the various things that they did and were involved in are detailed in Stephen Levy's book called Hackers for Our Purposes. Now for our purposes, we'll be talking about other types of hackers. Although the spirit of what we do goes back to those early days, now the definition of hacking or hackers has changed particularly in the 1980s and in part as a result of a couple of people, namely Robert T. Morris, who was a Cornell graduate, 
who unleashed a piece of software that was called a worm on what was an early version of the internet worm, went on to cause a lot of damage and create a lot of downtime on systems across the country and across the world. Now, the Morris worm did end up resulting in something good, however. That is, the computer emergency response team at Carnegie Mellon was created primarily in response to the Morris worm. Now, there's also Kevin Mitnick, who is another well-known hacker who was responsible for various acts of computer crime over a couple of decades. He was the first convicted in 1988. So the definition of hacker or hacking moved from something benign to something far more sinister in popular culture. Now, we see hacking or hackers in all sorts of popular culture. We've seen them in hacker movies called War Games, also the movie Hackers. Of course, you also see it in the Matrix movies, where you can see, if you look really closely, that they are using a tool called Nmap, which we will get into the use of in great detail later on as we go on. Now, also the movie Sneakers and the movie Swordfish. And on television, in addition to other places, you can see the agents at NCIS regularly doing things like cracking complex cryptography in just a matter of seconds or minutes. So what is hacking really? Well, hacking is about a deep understanding of something particularly with relation to computers and computing. It's also about exploring and the joy of learning new things and understanding them very clearly and being able to manipulate those things in ways that maybe other people haven't before. It's also about digging into problems to find out solutions in creative and interesting ways and sometimes finding problems where there weren't problems previously. And that's a little bit about what is hacking. Okay, so now that we have talked about what exactly is hacking and how the meaning and connotations of that word has changed over time, how it came into existence, how it was coined, let's go over the reasons that people normally hack. Now, you may want to hack just for fun. As discussed previously, hacking is a tradition that goes back several decades at MIT, even preceding the computer-related definition of hacking. Now, MIT has a long and storied history of hacking, and sometimes of a computer-related nature, which in this case happens to be true, and sometimes of a non-computer-related nature instance. Now here you can see that MIT's homepage has been hacked, or you might even say defaced, to indicate that Disney is buying MIT. This was an April Fool's Day prank in 1998, and again, this is just the kind of hacking that you would do for fun, rather. Now sometimes, you might wanna hack just to prove a political point or any point for that matter. In this case, again, Bill Gates had donated some money to the MIT, which allowed them to have a new building. And he was coming to MIT to visit and give a talk about Microsoft Windows and its systems. And as you can see, the, the Windows systems that were installed in the entryway at the building were hacked to be running Linux instead. And you can see here that Tux the Penguin is saying, welcome to the William H. Gates building. Again, that some students who decided that they wanted to make a point about Linux and Microsoft and Windows to Bill Gates, and they thought hacking was the best way to go about it. Sometimes you hack just for the challenge. Here's an example again at MIT, where some students turned the facade of a building into a Tetris game board. Now, this was a reasonably difficult hack and the students went after it just for the challenge of completing it. And it just so they could have some pride of ownership and to be able to say that they were able to pull this off. You know, the things that teenagers do to show off to other teenagers, it just increases with increase in scale. Now, in spite of its difficulties and its challenges and all the obstacles and planning that had to go into it, they were able to pull it off and now they have those bragging rights. So that was one of them and one of the instances where somebody would hack just for the challenge and for the fun in it. Now, sometimes you want to hack to prevent theft, and this is where we get more specifically into computer-related hackings. You see a lot of articles and stories in the news over the last few years about cybercrime, and here's an example of data theft compromised. And a few than one and a half million cards for global payments, so there are some attackers who got into this company, Global Payment, and they were able to pull out about a million and a half credit card numbers during the intrusion there. So what you may want to do is you may want to learn how to hack in order to find these holes in your systems or applications or employer systems so that you can fix these holes and prevent these compromises from happening. 
because of the reputational hit that your company takes wherever things like these happen you have the risk of completely running out of business so just to protect your job to protect your company and to protect your own desire of business you may just want to learn to hack and that's a very good reason now you may also want to find all the problems that exist in your system before putting them out and deploying them so that you can keep these attackers from getting in and stealing critical or sensitive information sometimes you may want to hack to get there before the bad guys and the same sort of idea is the last one where we're just going to talk about and that exactly is ethical hacking now we were just talking about how sometimes you may want to hack into your own system before publishing it out to the public let's take internet explorer for example now internet explorer was actually published to the public with some critical error in the code and these flaws were heavily exploited by people who actually found them now a number of people in the world go out looking for these flaws and they call themselves security researchers and they get in touch with the vendors after they found a flaw or a bug and work with the vendors to get it fixed what they end up with is a bit of reputation they get a name for themselves and that name recognition may end up getting them a job or some speaking engagements or a book deal or any number of ways that you could cash in on some name recognition from finding these sort of bugs and getting them fixed if you want to get there before the bad guys you may think you're helping out a vendor you may want to just make a name for yourself you may want to find these sort of bugs before the bad guys do because thing about the bad guys finding them is they don't announce them and they don't get them fixed and that makes everybody a little less secure finally you may want to protect yourself from hacked computer companies and fight cyber criminals and this is a new headline from june 18 2012 and we're starting to see these sort of news headlines show up as companies are starting to retaliate against attackers in order to retaliate against attackers now in order to retaliate against attackers you need to be able to have the same sort of skills and techniques and knowledge and experience that those attackers have and where your company may want you to learn to hack or the company may want to bring in people who are skilled at these sort of activities so that they can attack the attackers and hopefully you end up with more steely exterior and you get a reputation for not being a company that people want to go after those are several reasons and there we go i gave you around a bunch of reasons as to why you may want to hack for fun to prove a point to protect yourself to protect the company to not run out of business and along with another bunch of reasons okay so now that we have talked about why you would want to hack let's move on to the types of hackers that exist now we're going to be talking about the different types of hacking and the first type of hacking that i want to discuss is ethical hacking and ethical hackers which is really what we're going to be talking about through the rest of these lessons now an ethical hacker is somebody who thinks like a black hat hacker or thinks like somebody who's intent on breaking into your systems but follows a moral compass that's more in line with probably the majority of the population so their intent isn't to do bad things their intent is to look for bad things and get them fixed so that bad things don't happen ethical hackers aren't out to destroy anything and they're not out to break anything unless it's deemed to be acceptable as a part of the engagement and also necessary in order to demonstrate a particular vulnerability to the organization that they're working with so that's an ethical hacker and there's a certification that's available from the EC council It's a certified ethical hacker and you know if you find certifications valuable and this sort of thing is what you want to do for seeing a certif- certified ethical hacker maybe something you might want to look into now let's talk about black hat hacker there's a plenty of cases of black hat hackers through years and let's talk about a guy in particular called Kevin Mitnick this guy right here is a particularly good example probably because he was a black hat hacker for a lot of his years his goal was to cause mischief to steal where necessary and just to be engaged in the lifestyle of being a hacker and doing whatever was necessary to continue doing whatever it craw doing whatever he was doing it crossed moral boundaries or ethical boundaries and so kevin mitnick here was involved for well over a decade in computer crime and was finally picked up by the fbi and he was charged and prosecuted and he was eventually convicted of some of the activities that he was involved with Now you may be able to argue that Kevin is a gray hat hacker and as well and a gray hat hacker is somebody who kind of skirts the line between black and white hat hacking 
And white hat hacking is really what an ethical hacker is. So instead of saying ethical hacker, you could say white hat hacker. It's the same idea a white hat hacker is somebody who hacks for good. If you want to think of it like that, if you want to think of it as a good versus evil, and what they're really doing is they're in it for the technical challenge. They're looking to make things better, make things more efficient, improve them in some way. On the other hand, a black hat hacker is out for the money, for the thrill. It's really a criminal activity. And a gray hat hacker is somebody who may employ the tactics and technique of a black hat hacker, but have sort of a white hat focus, in other words. They're going to do things that may be malicious and destructive in nature, but the reason they're doing it is to improve the security posture of an organization that they are working with. So you can see there's actually a book called Gray Hat Hacking. It's a pretty good book and it details a lot of the tactics and strategies and techniques we'll be going over in subsequent lessons in this video. Now, one other type of hacking that I want to talk about is a thing called hacktivism. And you'll find hacktivism all over the place. And one example in the last year or so, and certainly in recent memory, is called Lulz Security. Yeah, you heard that right. It's called Lulz Security. And you can argue that Lulz is actually a response to another type of hacktivism. An organization called Anonymous started hacking companies like Sony to protest their involvement in a lawsuit regarding a PlayStation 3 hacker. Now, Lull Security was supposedly protesting the treatment of Anonymous or was hacking in support of this group. Anonymous, so they hacked a number of companies and did things like pulled information usernames and password from the databases at these companies. And they said that the reason was to shine a light on the security of these companies and also theoretically to embarrass the companies with their weak or poor security postures. And the problem with that, that they were doing this through were posting information that they had found online. And that information often included details about customers for these particular corporations and for an ethical hacker, a white hat hacker that would cross the boundary of causing harm. So there's no reason for me as an ethical hacker to post information in a public forum about somebody because I could be doing damage to them. But in this case, Lull Security and Anonymous Specifically, Lull Security were engaged in a form of hacktivism, and what they were doing was not only damaging to the corporation that certainly was detrimental to those people. So different types of hackers and different types of hacking. We've got ethical or white hat hacking, we've got black hat, gray hat, and then we've finally got hacktivism. It's really the goal and the means that vary from one to the other. Okay, so now that we've discussed the types of hackers, let's also discuss the skills necessary to become one. So what we're going to discuss in this part are the different skills that are required or will be learned as a part of this video. So initially, just for basic computing, you need a basic understanding of operating systems and how to work them. There are going to be several fundamental types of tasks that I won't be going into any detail at all, or and you'll need to know how to run programs and do things like open up a command prompt without me walking you through and how to do that. So I am going to assume that you have some basic understanding of how to do these sorts of tasks. Also, you need an understanding of the basic system software and you'll need a basic understanding of how to use command line utilities. There are a number of tools and programs that we're going to be going through this video and many of them use the command line. Now, whether it's on Windows or Linux, you'll need to be familiar with typing and being able to run programs from the command line and the various command line switches and parameters that those programs or types of programs are going to use. Now, from a networking perspective, you need a basic understanding of some simple networking concepts. You need to know what cables are and switches and hubs and how systems are networked together. You don't really need a deep level of understanding. I'll be going through some protocols at a reasonably deep level because I think it's important as an ethical hacker to understand what's going on at the protocol level so that you can know better what you are doing and how to achieve the goals and tasks that you have before you. So we're going to be going over some protocols. So just understanding what protocols are and how they go together, those sort of things are necessary from a networking perspective. Now, we're going to also be learning a bunch of life skills. Yes, there are some life skills that it's important to have. I think the most important one is the ability to accept failure and persevere. And by that, I mean you're going to be just running across several things that just don't work the first time around. And it's going to take a little bit of time and stick to itiveness to plug away and keep going until you get something to work. And the way that you get things to work is having an ability to problem solve. And sometimes solving problems requires being a little creative. 
Sometimes you need to think out of the box and come at a problem from a different perspective in order to find a solution. Throughout the course of this video, you're going to run across a lot of sticky problems through the course of learning about being an ethical hacker and just doing the work because it's not as simple. So here's a little recipe for how to do this. Now go follow this recipe every time and you're going to be successful. Every situation is different. Every system is different. You're going to run across some pretty sticky problems and you're going to have to just wait and get your hands dirty and keep failing and failing and failing and failing until you find a way to succeed. So I think those skills are very necessary to learn how to be an ethical hacker, digging through some of the material that we'll be going over in this video. As far as what you're going to be learning, you're going to be learning about how to use a lot of tools. You're going to learn networking. And by that, I mean, we're going to be talking about different protocols that are involved in networking systems together. You're going to learn about security and security postures. Security is the heart and soul of ethical hacking. It's why we do ethical hacking in order to make systems and networks more secure than they were previously. That's the goal from a networking perspective. We're going to be talking about how to read packets from network captures. We're going to be going into TCP IP related protocols in a fairly significant amount of detail. And you're going to understand how protocols interact with one another. So we're going to do all that and the reading packets is going to be really important and we're going to do a fair amount of that in addition to just a fundamental approach to learning how to read packets in several lessons. We're going to read packets as a way of understanding the different tools that we're using and how they're going to learn tactics and methodologies and you get to learn to use the information you've gathered in order to get more information and information is really what is this all about. You can't do much anything without information and sometimes it takes a fair bit of digging in order to find that information and what you're going to learn is the entry points and the stepping stones to get the information that you need and then once you have that information you're going to be learning about ways to exploit it in order to get deeper into the target you're going to learn security awareness we're going to talk about risk and understanding risks and vulnerabilities primarily recognize the difference between a vulnerability and an exploit and there's a significant difference there's so security awareness and understanding what a risk is and how that impacts your target and it's going to be key to a lot of things that we talked about so it sounds like a lot we're going to cover a fair bit of ground not all of it at a deep level sometimes we're going to skim the surface but there's an awful lot of material to be covered so let's get started into talking about the different skills that are required or will be learned as a part of the series of video. So initially, just for basic computing, you need a basic understanding of operating systems. So it sounds like a lot we're, that we're gonna cover and a fair bit of it is gonna be at a very deep level and sometimes we're just gonna skip the surface, but there's an awful lot of material to cover. So let's get started. Okay, so that was all about the skills that uh, we're gonna develop throughout this video and that might be necessary for you to become an ethical hacker. Now let's talk about the types of attacks that you might be dealing with as ethical hacker yourself. So now we're going to be talking about the types of attacks. Now one type of attack that you'll find common, particularly in cases of hacktivism, for example, or cases where people are trying to make a particular point or just be a general pain is this idea of defacing. Now defacing goes back for quite a while. It's the idea of sort of digital graffiti where you've left your mark or your imprint behind so that everybody knows you were there. Primarily a website thing and it's really just making alterations to something that used to be pretty common a long time ago. Now it's very particular for businesses or people or just organizations in general to have their home pages be replaced by this other thing that was along the lines of hey I was here and I took over your web page. We also have a pretty common one certainly has been common over the years and it's a pretty good path towards quality exploits and high profile vulnerabilities and that's buffer overflow. Now a buffer overflow is a result of the way programs are stored in memory. When programs are running they make use of a chunk of memory called a stack and it's just like a stack of plates when you put a bunch of plates down. When you pull a plate off you're going to pull the top plate. You're not going to pull the oldest plate you're going to pull the one that was on the top. So the same thing with the stack here. We're accessing memory and this has to do with the way functions are called in memory. When you call a function, a chunk of memory gets thrown on top of the stack and that's the chunk of memory that gets accessed and you've got a piece of data in memory within that stack and that's called a buffer. 
And when too much data is sent and try to put into the buffer, it can overflow. Now the bounds of the configured area for that particular buffer, it can overflow the bounds of the configured area for that particular buffer. Now the way stacks are put together, we end up with a part of the stack where the return address from the function is stored. So when you overflow the buffer, you have the ability to potentially override that return. At which point you can control the flow of execution of programs. And if you can control the flow of execution of the program, you can insert code into that memory that could be executed. And that's where we get buffer overflow that turns into exploits that creates the ability to get like a command shell or some other useful thing from the system where the buffer overflow is running. So that's a buffer overflow in short. Sometimes we also have format string attacks and sometimes these can be precursors to buffer overflow formats. Now format strings come about because the C programming language makes use of these format strings that determines how data is going to be input or output. So you have a string of characters that define whether the subsequent input or output is going to be an integer or whether it's going to be a character or whether it's going to be a string or a floating point, that sort of thing. So you have a format string that defines the input or the output. Now if a programmer leaves off the format string and just gets lazy and provides only the variable that's going to be output. For example, you have the ability to provide that format string. If you provide that format string, what then happens is the program starts picking the next piece of data off the stack and displays them because that way we can start looking at data that's on the stack of the running program just by providing a format string. And if I can look at the data, I may be able to find information like a return address or some other useful piece of information. There is also a possibility of being able to inject data into the stack. I may be able to find some information like a return address or some other useful piece of information. There is also a possibility of being able to inject data into the stack. I may be able to find some information like a return address or some other useful piece of information. There is also a possibility of being able to inject data into the stack using this particular type of attack. Now moving on to our next type of attack is a denial of service. A denial of service, this is a pretty common one and you'll hear about this a lot. This is not to be confused though with the one that I'll be talking about after this and that is a distributed denial of service. So this one that you see is a, this is a denial of service attack and a denial of service is any attack or action that prevents a service from being available to its legitimate or authorized users. So you hear about a ping flood or a sin flood that is basically a sin packet being sent to your machine constantly or a smurf attack. And the smurf attack has to do something with ICMP echo requests and responses using broadcast addresses. That one's been pretty well shut down over the last several years. You can also get a denial of service simply from a malformed packet or a piece of data where a piece of data is malformed and sent into a program. Now, if the program doesn't handle it correctly, if it crashes, suddenly you're not able to use that program anymore. So therefore you are denied the service of the program and thus the denial of service. Now, as I said, a denial of service is not to be confused with a distributed denial of service. And I know it's pretty trendy, particularly in the media to call it any denial of service, a DDoS or any denial of service, a DDoS. Now it's important to know that any denial of service is not a DDoS. A DDoS or as you might know, a distributed denial of service is a very specific thing. A distributed denial of service is a coordinated denial of service making use of several hosts in several locations. So if you think about a botnet as an example, a botnet could be used to trigger a distributed denial of service where I've got a lot of bots that I'm controlling from a remote location and I'm using all these bots to do something like sending a lot of data to a particular server. When I've got a lot of systems sending even small amounts of data, all of that data can overwhelm the server that I'm sending it to. So the idea behind a distributed denial of service attack is to overwhelm resources on a particular server in order to cause that server not to be able to respond. Now the first known DDoS attack used a tool called Stockhold Rot, which is German for barbed wire. Now Stockhold Rot came out of some work that a guy by the name of Mixter was doing in 1999. He wrote a proof of concept piece of code called TFN which was the tribe flood network. Let me just show that for you. So you can see on the Wikipedia page that the tribe flood network or TFN is a set of computer programs that is used to conduct various DDoS attacks such as ICMP floods, SYN floods, UDP floods and smurf attacks. 
Now, I know many people don't really consider Wikipedia a really good source of any sort of knowledge, but it's a good place to start off. So if you want to read about all these types of attacks like ICMP floods and what exactly is a sin flood, you can always do that from Wikipedia. It's not that bad place. Of course, you shouldn't use Wikipedia as your final Rosetta Stone. Moving on. So this program called Old Rod, which was it was used to attack servers like eBay and Yahoo back in February of 2000. So that attack in February of 2000 was really the first known distributed denial of service attack, which is not to say that there weren't denial of service attacks previously. So to that, there were certainly plenty of them, but they were not distributed. Now, this means there weren't a lot of systems used to coordinate and create a denial of service condition. And therefore, we get the distributed denial of service attack. So that's a handful of type of attacks and some pretty common attacks that you're going to see as an ethical hacker. When you become an ethical hacker or if you're trying to become an ethical hacker, you should always know about these types of attacks. OK, so in this lesson, we're going to be talking about penetration testing and some of the details around how it works and logistics and specifically things like scope. So what exactly is penetration testing? So, well, not surprisingly, it's testing to see if you can penetrate something, which means you're going to check to see whether you can break into a particular thing, whether it's a server or in applications, depending on the type of engagement you've got. You may have the ability to try to break in physically to a location, but primarily what you're going to be doing with penetration testing is you're going to be trying to break into systems and networks and applications, and that's the kind of what it's all about. And this may actually involve social engineering attacks. So it may require you to make a phone call to somebody and get them to give you their username and password or some other type of social engineering attack where maybe you send a URL via a crafted email. Sometimes it's just strictly a technical approach where you're running scans and you're running Metasploit and you're gaining access. That way, or maybe some other type of technical application sort of connection. Sometimes it's physical access that you need. So in order to get access to a particular system, if you can get physical access, then maybe you can get in. So that was all about that's what exactly penetration testing is. It's checking whether you can get into a system, whether it be physically or on a network. So what are the goals of penetration testing? The goals would be to assess weakness in an organization's security postures. You want to figure out what they're vulnerable so that they can go and fix these problems. You want to help them understand their risk positions better and what they can or may be able to do to mitigate those risks. And ultimately, you want to be able to access systems in a particular way to find weaknesses. So those are really sort of the goals of penetration testing. Now, from a result standpoint, when you're done, you're testing what you are going to do. Well, you're probably going to generate a report. And by that, I don't mean you're going to run some automated tool and you're going to get it to generate a report for you. You're actually going to give that to the client. You're actually going to give your report to the client and then they're going to write you a really large check. So that's not really how it works. You're going to write a report detailing the findings in a detailed way so that it includes what did you do to find out what you actually found out and how you can actually mitigate that particular risk. So you should really include remediation activities in order to fix these vulnerabilities that you find. And it's pretty easy to walk around saying, hey, that's a problem and that's a problem and that's a problem. That's really not a lot of value in that where there's a value is that, hey, that's a problem and here's how you can go about fixing it. So let's talk about the scope of penetration testing. So firstly, you want to actually realize how big is the bread box and how specifically, what is it that the you two of the two of you have agreed that being you, the ethical hacker, and the other guy being the authorized person to give you permissions to ethically hack, have specifically agreed that you can do penetration testing and you can target them as an organization or the client. And what you have agreed to are any exclusions or any sort of areas that they say you're not allowed to touch. So anything so like if they've got a database server maybe or there's a lot of really sensitive data on it and there's a little hesitant and they may put a don't touch this thing clause in the scope. So there are a lot of different reasons why they may exclude areas from the scope and if they exclude them then trust their reason and listen to them. What they have to say in terms of this is what we want you to accomplish. So along those lines you really need to get a sign off from the target organization. Now we've talked about this before and this is certainly all about the ethics 
and then trust. And it's also about legality, because if you do something that you don't have permissions to do, you could be prosecuted for that. So definitely get the scope very clear in writing and with signatures attached to it as to what you can and what you can't do and always get approval from the right people and make sure you get somebody who has the right level of permissions and is the right level of management so that they can sign off on its understanding and accept the risk that is associated with a penetration test. So let me talk a little bit about security assessments and how they differ from penetration tests. The security assessment is a hand in hand approach with clients. So you would walk in doing a collaborative thing where you're a trusted partner and you ally with them and your goal isn't to penetrate them and point out all the things that are really bad, but it's to get a full assessment of the risk that the organization is exposed to. And you would probably provide more details about fixes that maybe you would in a penetration test. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to walk in and make sure that the policies and procedures they have in place are really what they need for the organization and the risk appetite that they've got. And we're going to make sure that the policies and procedures have controls that can tell us whether they are being actually adhered to or not. So the procedures and policies are being followed. A security assessment is probably a little bit more comprehensive than a penetration test. And he would look at more factors to assess the security postures of the organization in their overall risk. And you would tailor the output based on their risk appetite and what they're most interested in. And that's not to say that I'm going to tell them what they want to hear. But if there's something that they know and I know that they're just not going to do, I'm not going to be making a big deal out of it because they're already aware of it. And I'll make a note of it in the report just for a complete sake. But I'm not going to go out in a lot of detail. So it's really kind of a hand in hand collaborative approach where again, you're not just saying that they want us to say we're providing some real security and risk guidance towards their activities and other things. So it may provide an unrealistic view. So you've got a week, let's say, to do this penetration test against your target. Now you're going to have to go in. You're going to have to get set up. You're also going to have to start doing a bunch of scans and make sure that you're gathering information and screenshots and data for your reports. You're going to have to do all sorts of activities also during the course of that week you're going to be engaged in probably beginning to write your report and getting a sense of what is going to say and what's going to be in it if you don't actually get any major penetration during the course of that week the organization may feel like they're quote unquote secure that's one of the reasons why penetration testing while really sexy and show is nice and all but if an organization walks out of it believing that in a week you didn't manage to get to know, get the keys of the kingdom, then they might must be secure. That's really a misguided view because a dedicated skill and motivated attacker isn't going to just take a week or some portion of that week. They're after something, they're going to dedicate themselves to, to it and really go after it. So just because you didn't find a penetration in some subset of a week doesn't mean that they are secure and, invul and invulnerable to attacks. It just means that during the course of that particular week and other circumstances that were in place, you didn't get a penetration that was really significant or major. That's all it means. It doesn't mean anything beyond that. And if an organization walks away feeling like they're secure, they're going to end up not fixing the real vulnerabilities that may be in place that could expose them to significant risks. So that's penetration testing, its scopes, its goals, and how it differs to security assessments. Now it's time to go over footprinting. So what is footprinting? Well, footprinting is getting an idea of the entire scope of your target. That means not just the scope that you were given, which may be an address block or it may be a domain name that even may be a set of address blocks. Now, what you want to do is you want to figure out all the information that's associated with that in great detail as you can possibly get. So you want a list of domain names as you're going to go through this. You probably want some sort of database or Excel spreadsheet or something to keep track of all the information because you're going to have a lot of it at the end. You want to be able to find the information quickly. So having some sort of either notepad going with your notes or as I said, a spreadsheet or a database. So if you can get uh, organized in that way, you want to keep all those sorts of things down. So in this case, I want to do some sort of search on suppose, let's say edureka.co. Now I need network blocks. So, so far we found out that just made up IP addresses because I'm just putting information down, but I need network blocks. So you may have one IP address that you can find externally, or you're going to want a whole range of internal blocks and you can do a little bit of digging. 
if you aren't provided those. You want specific IP addresses for critical systems, web servers, email servers, databases, if you can find any of these things of those sorts. And you want system architectures. And what kind of stuff are they running? Are they running Intel? Are they running Windows? Are they running some Unix systems? What are they running? What kind of access control list they have? These are going to be hard to get, but you may be able to guess them. And you can guess these by doing port scans. So what sort of responses you get back from the port scans with the filters and or what you don't get back will tell you about if there's an IDS around or some you want to do a system enumeration or you can get access to a system somehow you want to know usernames, group names, so on. So the basic idea of footprinting is gathering information. Now, if you can get access to system somehow, you want to know usernames, group names. So you want system banners, routine tables, SNMP information, if you can get it, DNS host names, if you can get those. So now this is for both internal and external on the side. If you're doing an internal penetration test or ethical hacking engagement, you want to know the networking protocols that are there. Are they using TCP IP or are they using some UDP or are they on IPX or SPX? Are they using DECnet or Apple Talk? Or are they using some sort of split DNS? In other words, do they have internal DNS servers that give different form for their external? And will it give different information if you want to check for remote access possibilities? Now, in the footprinting process, you want to be very exhaustive. You might want to try and take out email addresses, server domain name services, I mean, IP addresses, or even contact numbers. And you want to be very exhaustive with your approach. You don't want to miss anything out. Because if you do that, you can continue and also provide some, some launching points for additional attacks or tests that you may be able to do. But this is definitely a starting point of the types of information that you need to have as you go about footprinting your target. Now, next thing that we are going to see is very interesting. This is one of the many common tools that are out there on the internet, and that is the Wayback Machine, or also known as archive.org. Now, well, it might not give you all the information that you need, but it gives, certainly gives you a starting point. And what we're talking about out here is the Wayback Machine or archive.org. So let me just give you a quick look at what archive.org looks like. OK, I already have it open out here. So out here, what you can see is how a website looked like around some time ago. So for example, if you want to look at what Google looked like, so you just have to search for Google out here and wait for results to come back. OK, so we see that Google goes way back to 1998. So that was the last capture or the first capture. rather. It was the first capture by the Wayback Machine. And we can see that it has a screenshot of November 11th and how Google looked. So let's see what Google looked like in November 11th of 1998. So this is what Google looked like. It was there was actually nothing to it. It just said, welcome to Google, Google search engine prototypes and it has some link. So yeah, this is what the Google search engine looked like. It had a Stanford search, it had a Linux search, and you could do all sorts of stuff. You could just put the results. Now, what I'm trying to tell you all is you can see the evolution of a website through time through the Wayback Machine. And this gives you rather an in, in, informative look into how a website has actually evolved. OK, now that we know what footprinting is and how it falls into the whole reconnaissance process, so let's go over a couple of websites to do a little bit of historical digging about companies and the types of infrastructure that they may be using. And this information, of course, is useful so that we can narrow down our focus in terms of what we want to target against them for attacks. Now, over time, we've improved our awareness about what sorts of information we may want to divulge. So several years ago, you may have gone to a company's website and discovered that you could get email addresses and names of people in positions that you may find relevant. And there were all sorts of bits of information that could be used against the company. And over time, we have discovered that those sorts of pieces of information probably don't belong on a website where they can be used against a company. And so they've been pulled off. Now, it used to be also that Google had the ability to pull up information that it had cached so far. For example, if a website was no longer available or if it was temporarily down and offline, there was a little cache button that you could click when you did and the Google search and you could pull up that cached information. So even though the website wasn't available, you could still get information from Google's servers. Now Google's removed that so we don't have that ability any longer. However, there is an internet archive that we can use. So this thing is called the Wayback Machine and I have it open out here. So it's archive.org web. 
So archive.org is a website that gives us information about other websites and how they looked like in years ago. And by so I'm going to go to the Wayback Machine, which you can see is at the archive.org. And I'm going to go and try and search for edureka.co. So now we're going to take a historical look at edureka.co's website. And you can see we've got some years and they've got information going back up to 2013. So let's look at what this website looked like when it was just 2013. Okay, there don't seem to be any snapshots out here. I wonder what's going on. Okay, so let's go to 2014. And the first snapshot seems to be on the September 12th of 2014. Actually, it's on May 17 too. So let's see what that looked like. Okay, so this is what Eddie Rekka looked like back in 2013 or rather 2014, September 12, 2014 to be actually exact. Now you can see that we have some live classes and all these pictures are there and they've got this weird picture of this guy out here. I don't know why that was a thing back in 2014. Now we can browse more advanced screenshots or rather the screenshots that were taken later on and see how this company has evolved with this infrastructure and the way it actually lays out its content. Okay, so it still hasn't evolved, but I can go a couple of years ahead and see what this has actually evolved into. So if I were to go to December 2016, so this is what it looked like in 2016, and we can see that they've added this weird box out here about pricing courses. They have added a search bar that kind of looks weird, but it's mostly because my internet is slow and it's not loading all the elements. They've also changed how they've actually laid out the courses. We can also see a change in the prices, I guess. So yeah, this tells us about how it evolves as a complete website. Now this other website that I want to talk about is called Netcraft. Now Netcraft does internet research, including the types of web servers that companies run. And they have a web server surveys. You can see here as we scroll that Apache web servers has 64.3% of the internet market, of course, and that's followed by Microsoft with 13%. Interesting information may be useful information, but even more useful than that is looking at what different companies run for their websites. And you can see here. Okay, so let's try and search for edureka.co out here. So let's just put in the website URL and let Netcraft generate the site report. So as you can see that some of the stuff is not available. We know that the NetBlock owner is by Amazon Technologies. The name server is this thing right here. The DNS admin is AWS DNS host master. We also have the IP address. We can go for a virus, look up the IP on virus total. We can do that. There is no IPv6 presence, so that's some information that we can see. So we can obviously opt out to not target IPv6 ranges. Then there's also reverse DNS. Then we also have a bunch of hosting history. So this is a history of it. And we know that it's hosted on a Linux system with an Apache web server. And it was last seen and this was when it was last updated. So this is some very useful information. You can also get information on stuff like Netflix. So if you just type, okay, I, I, I just spelled that wrong. So let me just change it from the URL out here. So if you go and type for netflix.com, and you'll see that it'll show you all sorts of information. So as you see that it's on an AWS server, it's an Amazon Data Services Ireland, and this is all the hosting history that it goes along with. It has some send the policy frameworks, domain-based message authentication and reporting confirmations. And there's all sorts of information that you can get about websites and their web servers from Netcraft. So the Wayback Machine along with Netcraft make up for some interesting tools that are available on the internet from which you can do a little bit of your reconnaissance process. Okay, now that we have gone over Netcraft and the Wayback Machine, now it's time to actually get to know how to use the little information that this site actually provides. So what the next topic that we're going to go over is using DNS to get more information. Now we're going to be going over a tool and this is called Whois, and it is a utility that is used to query the various regional internet registries to store information about domain names and IP addresses. And let me just show it to you about all the internet registries that are there. So I have Aaron.net open out here, and these are the internet registries that provides the ISPs and looks over the internet control as a whole. So out here we have Afrinic, we have Apnic, we have Aaron, we have Lacnic, and we have Ripe NCC. So these are all the regions and all the different types of stuff that they support all the different countries. 
you can look at the map that it is supporting out here by just hovering over the providers so as you can see all these brown region out here is africa afrinic then we have afnic which is this black or grayish thing which is india and australia and quite a lot of asia then we have Aran, which is a lot of North America and the United States mostly. Then there's Lachnik, which is mostly the Latino side, which is the South American part. Then we have the rest of Europe, which is Ripe NCC. And this is the part that Ripe NCC is providing internet to. Okay, so that was all about the internet registries. Now let's get back to the topic, and that is using DNS to get more information. Now for this, we are going to be using a Linux-based system. So I have Ubuntu running on my virtual machine out here, and let me just log into it. So firstly, we are going to be using this query called whois that looks up these internet registries that I just showed you. Let me just quickly remove this. Okay. So for querying information from the regional internet registries that I just talked about, you can use whois to get information about who owns a particular IP address. So for example, I could do whois, and let's see, I could do who is Google or rather Netflix.com. And we can get all sorts of information about Netflix. So we can see that we have the visit mark monitor. Then let's see, let's go up and look for all sorts of information that is being given to us by this who is query. So as you guys can see, I just went a little bit too much. Okay, so registry domain ID. We have the domain ID where it is registered. The registered URL is mark monitor. Okay, so this is for marking actually. Now the creation date is 1997. So you haven't realized Netflix been around for a long time and it's been updated on 2015. And the registry expiry date, as we see, is 2019. So it's going to actually go off this year. Then this is all useful information. So we can see all sorts of domain status, the name server, the URL, the DNS sec that it says unsigned. This is very useful information that is being provided by a very simple query. Now, if you want to know who owns a particular IP address, so let's see. Did we get back the IP address out there? We should have got back the IP address, but it's kind of lost on me. So to get back the IP address also for a domain name service that you know, so you could use this command called dig. So you dig netflix.com. Now, as you guys can see that it has returned a bunch of multiple IP addresses. That these are all the IP addresses that Netflix is. So I could do something like if I was trying to check out who owns a certain IP address. And for example, I have got one of these IP addresses, but let's just assume I don't know that it actually belongs to Netflix. So I can go who is 54.77.108.2 and it'll give me some information. So as you guys can see, it is giving us a bunch of information as to who this is and how it is happening. So we see that it is from Aaron.net. And so it, we can very smartly assume that it's from the North American part. Now, we can also see that it's in Seattle. So our guess was completely right. So it also gives us a range. So this is something very useful. So if you see, we now have the range of the IPs that might be being used by this guy. So we indeed have a 54 and it says it goes up to the 54 there's also 34 now let's check that out and see what information we get so who is and let's check it out what was the ip that we were just seeing is 34.249.125.167 so 34.249.165 dot i don't know let's see you can also put in a random IP address. It doesn't really matter. And it'll give you the information. So let's see. Is this in some IP address? Even this seems to be an Aaron IP address. And it's also based in Seattle. And we get a bunch of information. So that's how you can use the whois query and the dig query to actually get all sorts of information about the domain name service and get information from a DNS, basically. So now let's go over some theoretical part that is for DNS. So using DNS to get information. So firstly, what is a domain name service and why do we need it? So a domain name service is a name given to an IP address so that it's easy to remember. Of course, you it's easy to remember names and mnemonics rather than 
a bunch of random weird numbers. Now, this was mainly so that we can map names to IP addresses and we can get the a bunch of information from the host name resolution. So that's the purpose of IP addresses. Now, we will also be looking at how to find network ranges. Okay, now before we get on to actually moving on to how to find out the uh, network ranges, let me just show you how you can also use who is. So who is, suppose you want to know the domains with the word foo in it. So you could go who is foo. And this will give you a whole bunch of things about how foo exists and all the sorts of foo that there is on the internet. So that was one interesting flag. And if you want to know how to use more about who is, you could just go dash dash help. I guess. Yeah, so this is all the types of stuff that we can do with who is. So we can set the host, we can set the port that we want to search for, then we can set with the L flag, we can find one level less specific match, and we can do an exact match, do an inverse lookup for specified attributes, then we can also set the source, we can set verbose type, and we can choose for a request template. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff they can do. So you could suppose say who is verbose and suppose edureka.co. And it'll give you a verbose version of this is a ripe database query service. The objects are in RPSL format. The ripe database is subject to only. So, okay, let's try something else like who is netflix.com. Okay, I'm sorry. I was supposed to do verbose and I kept doing H. Silly me. So you do V. And it'll give you a much more like this is a ripe database again. I think I'm doing something wrong. Okay, just for that thing. Okay, V and type. Okay, or let's just see. That's let me just show you how to use it. A primary keys are returned. Only primary keys. Okay, let's see. Let's try that out. Okay, so it seems to be that this is a ripe database query service, and the objects are in RPSL format, so it won't really work for that thing. And it also says that no entry is found because it's this error. So this is for some layer lesson. So for now, I hope I gave you a good idea of how to use who is. Like you could just go who is, then some IP address, like 192.168.101, or some gateway address like that. Or you could just go for a domain name service like Facebook and get all sorts of information about Facebook when the query actually returns you something. Okay, so let's move on to network ranges now. Now, in this part of the video, we're going to be going over the utility called Whois, which is used for getting information from the DNS. Now, let me just show you a website out here. So this is the regional internet registries. So the internet registries are used to store information about domain names and IP addresses, and there are five regional internet registries. First is Aaron, which is responsible for North America, so that would be the US and Canada. Then we have LACNIC, which is responsible for Latin America and portions of the Caribbean. Then there's RIPE that's responsible for Europe and Middle East and Central Asia. There's AFRINIC, which is responsible for Africa. And finally, we have APNIC, which is responsible for Asia Pacific Rim. So that's the regional internet registries. And as I said, who is, is responsible for querying information from the various regional internet registries as you can use who is to get information about who owns a particular IP address. So for example, let me just open up my Ubuntu system. Let me clear this out first. So as I was just saying, for example, you could go who is facebook.com. OK, so as you guys can see, we could find out pretty quickly about who owns a particular IP address. So for example, I could do who is and just go facebook.com. It tells me about who it belongs to. It also gives you who owns a particular IP address and who's responsible for them. From the information, you can get email addresses that belong to a particular company. This one has an email address for tech contact of IP reg, ad rate. So you can get all sorts of email addresses, tech contacts, and all sorts of stuff out there. The registry database contains only .com and .net and all sorts of information. Now, I want to query a different IP address and different information belongs in the different regional internet registries, of course. So if I want to go to a particular database, I would have to use the minus H flag. So I could do who is Aaron net and remember the IP address. And I'm going to query that again. And of course, I get the same information back because I went there. So you could just go who is H and then follow it with an IP address. So something like 34.205.176.98. So that's just a random IP address I just made up. And it says that who is option. OK, so it's a, it's a capital H. OK, so let's see that. And we get all sorts of information back from that. So area eight, Aaron, and all sorts of stuff. Now I can get information about domains as well. So if I can query 
something like netflix.com and I can find out that this is that actually Netflix and there's an administrative contact and a technical contact. That, and you can see the different domain servers, so the servers that would have authority of information about the DNS entries for that particular domain. You can also see other information like when the record was created and a whole bunch of different phone numbers that you can contact. And additional to storing information about IP addresses and domain names, sometimes it will store information about particular host names. And there may be other reasons why you would store a host name or particular information about a host name on the system. With one of the RIRS. Now, if I want to wanted to look up something specifically, once I had found that, I could now do a lookup on who is suppose let's say something like who is foo. So let's say who is foo. Now, if you already don't have who is installed, you can easily install it by just going apt install uh, who is on your Unix system, and that should do the trick. And then you can start use this really nifty tool. Okay, so that was all about using who is. Now let's get on to actually using how to find out network ranges for a domain. Okay, so now let's talk about how we are going to be going over and finding network ranges. So suppose you've got an engagement and you only know the domain name and you don't know much beyond that and you're expected to figure out where everything is and what everything is. So how do you go about doing that? Well, you use some of the tools that we either have been talking about or will soon be talking about in more detail. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the domain name edureka.co and I'm going to look up edureka.co and see if I get an IP address back. So let's just head over there and go who is edureka.co or we could use the host keyword. So as you see, we get an IP address back and that is 34.210.230.35 and that is the IP address. And you see that I've got back an IP address. So here's just an IP address and I don't know what that IP address belongs to. And I also don't know how big the network range or network block is and that's associated with. So what I'm going to do is a who is and I'm going to look up with Aaron who owns that IP address. So you can basically go who is 34.210.230.35. So as you guys can see, that gives us a bunch of information and the who is. Now, this doesn't seem to have a very big network range, but unlike something like Netflix, so uh, suppose we were to do something like host netflix.com and see, now we have a bunch of IP addresses. So suppose we were to do who is, let's see, who is 52.19.40.147. Now I'm expecting Netflix to be a much larger company and have a better, yeah, now see, we get net range. So this is the network range that we are talking about. So we had a random IP address and now we have found the network range. So that's how you find network ranges and this can be very useful. So this gives me evidence that Netflix.com has a presence on different addresses. The one I have also located by looking up that particular host name. So I've got one address here that I can look at and let's take a look at the website because that may be a different address. Now, if I didn't have that, I could also go and do something like an MX flag. So let's see, I could go dig and this will give us all the mails. So dig MX and let's see let's see what mx does actually you go help so we could do dig hyphen h for a list of options so these are all the options that we have and the one that we're going to use is something like this a so dig mx and we say mm, something like netflix.com so these are all the mailings and MXs that we have gotten from Netflix. And this is information regarding it's still producing information. That's a big thing to produce. Okay, so as I was just saying, you can use the MX flag and I could get back all the mail handlers in this case and their mail is being handled by Google. And uh, let's see, wait, let's go on to then it's going to tell me that Google's not particularly surprising and other things I can do is check for different host names since I'm assuming DNS probably doesn't allow zone transfers since most DNS servers don't anymore. Although they used to, you may have to start guessing so I could do something like webmails that we find out here. So uh, this shows us a dump of all the outstanding memory stuff. Okay, so that was all about finding network ranges. Now moving on to our next topic is using Google for reconnaissance. Now some people also call this Google hacking. 
Now, if you know how to use Google to exactly target and find what you are looking for, Google is an excellent tool for reconnaissance purposes. And today I'm going to show you how you could use Google exactly for your searches. So first of all, let's open a tab of Google. Um, let's open up here. So let's go to Google.com. OK, so now we're going to be talking about how we can use Google to actually gain some information or some targeted information. So this is in general called Google hacking. Now, when I say Google hacking, I'm not meaning by breaking into Google to steal information. I'm talking about making use of specific keywords that Google uses to get the most out of the queries that you submit. So, for example, a pretty basic one is the use of quotations. You quote things in order to use specific phrases. Otherwise, Google will find pages that have instances of all those words rather than the words specifically together in particular order. So I'm going to pull this query up and this shows a list of let me just show it to you. So if you go index off now this is showing us an index of all the films now this is basically all those index of sites that you want so as you guys can see this shows us an index of all sorts of films that are there now you can use the index of and you see that we have also an index of downloads or something like that hyphen.com slash download and it is an index of all sorts of stuff now you can go into some folder and check them out G. Jones, G. Worthy, G. Perico. I don't know what these are, but some sort of stuff. And this is how you can use Google. Now, let me just show you some more tricks. So you can use this. So suppose you're using Google to find for something like a presentation. So you could use something like file type PPTX. And it'll search for every type of file there that is PPT. OK, let's try some other side dot PPT. So config. OK, so this brings up all the types of files that have some configs in them. So this is some gaming configuration, as we see. This is some digital configuration of Liverpool. Now, you could also use something like this thing in URL. And you could use something like root. And this will give you all the things with root in their URL. So kingroot.n, digital trends, and how to root Android. So that's in the root. and Suppose you want to say something like all in file type or suppose you want um, some extension. So so dot PPT dot PPTX. Does that work? Um, let's search for JavaScript files. OK, I think it's JS. OK, that doesn't seem to work either. This shows us all the things with JS in it. No, it's just external JS. I'm doing this wrong. So you could use file type. So let's see, file type, and we go, let's see, doc. So these are all the documents that you could find with the file type thing. And you could also do JS, I guess. Yep, and this will give you all the JavaScript files that are there. So this is how you can use Google to actually narrow down your searches. So suppose you want a particular set of keyword, and we want to make sure we get the passwords file from Google. OK, so now let's go into more details about the various things you can find using Google hacking techniques. Now, while Google hacking techniques are really useful for just general searching in Google, they're also useful for penetration testers or ethical hackers. You can narrow down information that you get from Google. You get a specific list of systems that may be vulnerable. So we can do things like look for error pages that do in the title error. So I'm going to get a whole bunch of information. So suppose like we go in title and we say error. So as that, we get all sorts of stuff. And we can do the minus Google part. So if you do a minus Google, it'll not show you the stuff that's from Google. So we get various documentation pages about different vendors and the errors that they support. So here's one doc about Oracle, about Java error. But you know something more specific, we may be able to get errors about all sorts of other stuff. So this is how you could use the Google hacking technique to your own advantage if you're a penetration tester. Now, let's also show you something called the Google Hacking Database. Now, this is very useful for an ethical hacker. Now, the Google Hacking Database was created several years ago by a guy called Johnny Long, who put this Google Hacking Database together to begin to compile a list of searches that would bring up interesting information. Now, Johnny has written a couple of books on Google Hacking, so we're at the Google Hacking Database website here, and you can see them talk about Google Docs and all sorts of stuff. Now, you can see that we can do 
all sorts of searches like in URL, SAP, BC, BSP. This brings up some portal pages. Now out here you can bring up some password, APS password in URL. Now this will give you all sorts of stuff on Google. So suppose you go in URL, so like APS password. Now you can get all sorts of stuff like which have passwords in their URL. So maybe you can just guess a password from there too. Now that was Google hacking. So Google hacking entries and they also have a number of categories and that you can look through to find some specific things. So you may be interested in, of course, and you can search specific information that you may be looking for with regards to a specific product. For example, let me just show you exploit database. These are all the types of stuff you can go through out here. And as you see, we have all sorts of stuff like this is an SQL injection thing. This is something regarding peer archive TARS. So these let you get a foothold into some password cracking attempts and you can do some brute force checking and you can see here if it talks about the type of search it is and what it reveals, you can just click here on Google search and it will actually bring up Google with a list of responses that Google generates. So let's look at this one here. This type is a log. So this is something about cross-site scripting logs and we can also see some party logs if I was not wrong. So this is some denial of service POC and we can see a bunch of stuff and if you continue to scroll down there are a lot of interesting information in here so somehow somebody's got a party log that has log a lot of information they've got it up on a website and it's basically a bunch of information that you can see you can also get some surveillance videos sometimes and you can look into them and this is basically how you could use google so it's basically a list of queries that you can go through and this is a very useful site if you are a penetration tester and looking for some help with your Google hacking terminologies. So that's it for Google hacking. Now let's move on. Okay, so now it's time for some networking fundamentals and what better place to begin with TCP IP. Now we're going to be talking about the history of TCP IP and the network that eventually morphed into the thing that we now call the internet. So this thing began in 1969 and it spun out of this government organization called ARPA, which Advanced Research Projects Agency. And they had an idea to create a computer network that was resilient to a certain type of military attacks. And the idea was to have this network that could survive certain types of war and warlike conditions. So ARPA sent out this request for proposals to BBN, which is Bolt, Baranek and Newman, and they were previously an acoustical consulting company and they won the contract to build what was called the ARPANET. The first connection was in 1969. So that's where we get the idea that the internet began in 1969 and the internet as we call it now didn't really begin, but ARPANET did. And ARPANET has a long history that goes through NSF net in 1980s and after ARPANET was sort of decommissioned, and a lot of other networks were folded into this this thing called NSF net that then turned into what we now call the internet. And once a lot of other networks were connected into its first protocol on the ARPANET, initially there were 18 to 22 protocols, which was very first protocol defining communication on ARPANET. And it was called 1822 protocol because BBN report 1822, which describes how it worked shortly. And after that, there was this thing called the network control program. And the network control program consisted of ARPANET's host to host protocol and an initial control protocol. Now, there's certainly not a direct correlation or an analogy here, but if you want to think about it in particular, where you could say that the ARPANET host to host protocol is kind of like UDP and the initial connection protocol or ICP is kind of like TCP. So the host to host protocol provided a unidirectional flow control steam stream between hosts, which sounded a little bit like UDP. And ICP provided a bi-directional pair of streams between two hosts. And again, these aren't perfect analogies, but the host to host protocol is a little li bit like UDP and ICP is a little bit like TCP now. Now the first router was called an interface message processor and that was developed by BBN. It was actually a ruggedized Honeywell computer that had special interfaces and software. So the first router wasn't a ground up built piece of hardware but it was actually an existing piece of hardware that was specially purposed for this particular application. So Honeywell had this computer that they made out and BBN took that and made some specific hardware interfaces and wrote some special software that allowed it to turn into this interface message processor, which passed messages over ARPANET from one location to another. So where did IP come in here in 1973? 
So I became in here as well in 1973, as I just said, and a guy by the name of Vint Cerf and another guy by the name of Robert Kahn took the ideas of NCP and what the ARPANET was doing and they tried to come up with some concepts that would work for the needs that the ARPANET had. And so by 1974, they had published a paper that was published by the IEEE and they proposed some new protocols. They originally proposed a central protocol called TCP. Later on, TCP was broken into TCP and IP to get away from the monolithic concept uh, that TCP was originally. So they broke it into more modular protocols and thus you get TCP and IP. So how do we get to our version 4, which is IPv4, since that's the kind of internet that we're using right now. Version 6 is coming and has been coming for many, many years now, but we're still kind of version 4. So how did we get here between 1977 and 79? And we went through version 0 to 3 by 1979 and 1980. We started using version 4 and that's eventually became the de facto protocol on the Internet. In 1983, when NCP was finally shut down because of all the hosts on the ARPANET were using TCP IP by that point in 1992, a work began on an IP next generation. And for a long time, all of the specifications in the RFCs talked about PNG eventually and IPNG became known as IPv6. You may be wondering where IPv5 went. Well, it was a specially purpose protocol that had to do something with streaming and certainly not a widespread thing. One of the differences between IPv4 and IPv6 is that IPv6 has a 128-bit address, which gives us the ability to have some ridiculously large numbers of devices that have their own unique IP address. IPv4 by comparison has only 32-bit addresses. And as you probably heard, we're well on our way to exhausting the number of IP addresses that are available. And we've done a lot of things over the years to conserve address space and reuse address space so we can continue to extending to the point till where we completely run off IPv4 addresses. Another thing about IPv6 is it attempts to fix some of the inherent issues in IP. And some of those has to do with security concerns. And there are certainly a number of flaws in IPv4. And when they started working on IP next generation or IPv6, they tried to address some of those concerns in some of those issues. And they may not have done it perfectly, but it was certainly an attempt. And IPv6 attempted to fix some of the issues that were inherently in IP. And so that's the history of TCP IP till where we reach today. Okay, so now that we've discussed a brief history on TCP IP and how it came about to the TCP IP version 4, let's discuss the model itself. Now we're going to be discussing two models and those are the OSI model and the TCP IP model. Now, as I said, we'll be talking about the OSI and TCP models for network protocols and the network stacks. OSI, first of all, is the one that you see out here. It's the one on the left hand side of the screen and OSI stands for Open Systems Interconnect. And in the late 1970s, they started working on a model for how a network stack and network protocols would look originally. The intent was to develop the model and then develop the protocols that went with it. But what ended up happening was after they developed the models, TCP IP started really taking off and the TCP IP model was what went along with it and much better. What was going on with TCP IP, which became the predominant protocol. And as a result, the OSI protocols never actually got developed. However, we still use the OSI model for a teaching tool as well as a way of describing what's going on within the network stack. And in networked applications, you'll often hear people talking about different layers, like that's a layer two problem or we're under a layer three space. Now continuing through these lessons, I'll refer occasionally to the different layers. And when I do that, I'm referring to the OSI model. So let's take a look at the OSI model. Starting from the bottom, we have the physical layer, which is where all the physical stuff lives, the wires and cables and network interfaces and hubs repeaters switches and all that sort of stuff so all that sort of physical stuff is sitting in the physical layer now sitting above this is the data link layer and that's where the ethernet protocol atm protocol frame relay those sort of things live now i mentioned the switch below the physical the switch lives at layer one but it operates at layer two and the reason it operates at layer two is because it looks at the data link address and the layer two or physical address and that's not to be confused within the physical layer it does get a little mixed up sometimes and we refer to the mac address now the mac address is not the physical address that i'm talking about it is the message authentication code address on a system as so uh, the mac address on a system as a physical address because it lives on the physical interface and bound physically however that mac address or media access control address lives at layer 2 at the data link layer the network layer which is right above at layer 3 
That's where the IP lives, as well as ICMP, IPX. And from IPX, SPX suite of protocols from novel routers operate at layer three. And at layer four above that is the transport layer. That's the TCP, UDP, and SPX again. From the IPX, SPX suite of protocols. And above that is the session layer, and that's layer five. And that's Apple Talk, SSH, as well as several other protocols. And then there's a presentation layer, which is layer six. And you'll often see people refer to something like JPEG or MPEG as examples of protocols that live on that layer. Then there's a presentation layer, which is the final layer, which is layer six. And you'll often see people refer to something like JPEG or MPEG as examples of protocol that live at that layer. And then they live at that layer, which is the presentation layer. Finally, we have layer seven, which is the application layer. And that's HTTP, FTP, SMTP, and similar application protocols, whose responsibility is to deliver and use a functionality. So that's basically the OSI model, and that's the seven layers of the OSI model. And there's some important thing to note here. That is when we are putting packets onto the wire, the packets get built from top of the stack down by from the top of the stack to the bottom of the stack, which is why it's called a stack. Each layer sits on top of the other, and the application layer is responsible for beginning the process. And then that follows through the presentation session and transport layer and down through the network data link until we finally drop it on the wire at the physical layer. When it's received from the network, it goes from the bottom up and we receive it on the physical and it gets handled by the data link and then the network and till the application layer. So basically when a packet is coming in, it comes in from the application, goes out from the physical and then when it's going out also, it goes from the physical through the data link, then the network, transport session, presentation and application and finally to the target system. Now what we're dealing with is an encapsulation process. So at every layer on the way, down the different layers, add bits of information to the datagram or the packet. So that's when it gets to the other side. Each layer knows where its demarcation point is. While it may seem obvious, each layer talks to the same layer on the other side. So when we drop a packet out onto the wire, the physical layer talks to the physical layer. And in other words, the electrical bits that get transmitted by the network interface on the first system are received on the second system. On the second system, the layer two headers that were put by the first system get removed and handled as necessary. Same thing at the network layer. It's the network layer that puts the IP header and it's the network layer that removes the IP header and determines what to do from there and so on and so on again. While it may seem obvious, it's an important distinction to recognize that each layer talk to each layer. While it may seem obvious, it's an important distinction to recognize that each layer talk to each layer. And when you're building a packet, you go down through the stack. And when you're receiving, you come up through the stack. And again, it's called a stack because we keep pushing things on top of the packet and they get popped off the other side. So that was detailed and brief working on how the OSI model is set up and how the OSI model works. Now let's move on to the TCP IP model, which is on the right hand side. And you'll notice that there's a really big difference here. That being that there are only four layers in the TCP IP model as compared to the seven layers of the OSI model. Now we have the network access layer, the internet layer, the transport layer and the application layer and the functionality. Now we have the access layer, the internet layer, the transport layer and the application layer. The functionality that the stack provides is the same. And in other words, you're not going to get less functionality out of the TCP IP model. It's just that they've changed where different functionality decides and where the demarcation point between the different layers are. So there are only four layers in the TCP IP model, which means that a couple of layers that have taken in functions from some of the OSI models and we can get into that right here. The difference between the models at the network access layer in the TCP IP model that consists of the physical and the data link layer from the OSI model. So on the right here, you see the network access layer that takes into the account the physical and the data link layers from the OSI model. On the left hand side, similarly, the application layer from the TCP IP model encompasses all the session presentation and the application layer of the OSI model. So on the right, the very top box, the application layer encompasses the session presentation and application layer. And on the left hand side, that of course leaves the transport layer to be the same. And in the OSI model, they call it the network layer. And in TCP IP model, it's called the internet layer. Same sort of thing, that's where the IP lives. And even though it's called the internet layer as compared to the network layer, it's the same sort of functionality. So those are the really big differences between OSI and TCP IP model. Anytime I refer to layers through the course of this video that I'm going to be referring to the OSI model and in part because it makes it easier to differentiate the different functionality. If I were to say layer one function in the TCP IP model, you would necessarily know 
if I was talking about a physical thing or a data link thing, since there's more granularity in the OSI model, it's better to talk about the functionality in terms of the layers in the OSI model. And that's the predominant model, the OSI model and the TCP IP model for network stacks, network protocols and applications. Okay, so now that we've discussed the TCP IP model, let's go over another important protocol and that is UDP. So what you see out here on your screen right now is Wireshark and we'll be going over the uses of Wireshark and what it's useful for in the uh, upcoming lessons. But for now, let me just show you a UDP packet. Okay, so before we get into um, the analysis of the packet while it's still filtering, let me just tell you a little bit about UDP. So UDP is a protocol in the TCP IP suite of protocols. It's in the network layer. That's the network layer in the OSI. So a seven layer reference model, the IP network layer carries the IP address and that has information about how to get packets to its destination. The transport layer sits on top of the network layer and that carries information about how to differentiate network layer applications. And that information about how those network application gets differentiated is in the form of ports. So the transport layer has ports and the network layer has, in this case, an IP address. And UDP is a transport layer protocol. And UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol and it's often called connectionless or sometimes unreliable. Now, unreliable doesn't mean that you can't really rely on it. Unreliable means that you can't trust that what you send is reaching the other side. So what means actually that there's nothing in the protocol that says it's going to guarantee that the datagram that you send or the packet that you send is going to get where you want to send it. So the protocol has no sort of safety feature like that. So you shouldn't use this protocol that is UDP if you want some sort of safety net. And if you needed that type of safety net, you would have to write it into your own application. So basically UDP is a fast protocol and that's one of the reasons why it's good. It's also one of the reasons why it's unreliable because in order to get that speed, you don't have all of the error checking and validation that messages are getting there. So because it's fast, it's good for things like games and for real time voice and video, anything where speed is important and you would use UDP. So right here, I have a packet capture. So I'm using Wireshark to capture some packets and let's check out a UDP packet. So out here you see that there are some frames that says 167 bytes on wire, 167 bytes have been captured. But we're not really interested in the frame part. We're interested in the user datagram protocol part. So out here, you can see that the source port is 1853 and the destination port is 52081. Now it has a length and it has a checksum and stuff. So as you guys see out here, well, we don't really see a bunch of information. What you only see is the source port and the destination port, the length, and there's also a checksum. So UDP doesn't come with an awful lot of headers because it doesn't need any of the things that you see in the other packet headers. The only thing it needs is to tell you how to get the application on the receiving host. And that's where the destination port comes in. And once the message gets to the destination, the destination needs to know how to communicate back to the originator. And that would be through the source port or a return message. So a return message would convert the source port to a destination port and send back to that port in order to communicate with the originator. So we have a source port and destination port and the length is a minimal amount of checking and to make sure that if the packet that you received is a different from the length that's specified in the UDP header, then there may have been something wrong. So you may want to discard the message to check for more messages. So the checksum also makes sure that nothing in the middle was tampered with, although it's if there's some sort of man in the middle attack or something like that, a checksum is pretty easy to manufacture after you've altered the packet. So you can see here in the message that there's a number of UDP packets. Some of them just say UDP. The one look at happens to be from some Skype application, I guess. So talking to Skype servers and we've already got the DNS. Now DNS also needs some fast response times because you don't want to send a lot of time looking up information about servers that you're going to before because just to go to them. So DNS servers throw out, throw out their queries onto the wire using UDP hopping to get fast sponsors. They don't want to spend a lot of time setting up connections and during all the negotiating that comes with a protocol like TCP, for example. So here you see that the DNS is using UDP and what we've got here is another UDP packet with poor destination and all sorts of stuff so you can see it out here so you can see the checksum it's unverified checksum status so you can check out all sorts of stuff using Wireshark. so that was about udp or the user datagram protocol
Okay, so now that we're done with the user data gram protocol, let's talk about addressing modes. So addressing modes is how you address a packet to your different destinations. So there are three kinds of addressing modes. The first kind of addressing mode is unicast. This is a pretty simple one to understand. So there is one destination and one source, and the source sends the packet to the destination. And it's it depends on the protocol that you're using to actually address. So if it's something like TCP IP, you're probably using a bi-directional stream. So the blue computer can talk to the red computer and the red computer can talk back to the blue computer. But you can also use a UDP stream, which is like one directional stream. So it's I'm not sure if I'm using the correct word. So it's a stream that's in one direction. I guess I'm driving home the point here. So if it's a UDP, only blue is talking and when blue stops talking, then red can talk. But if it's TCP IP, blue and red can talk simultaneously at the same time. Now moving on, there's also broadcast. Now broadcast means that you are sending your packet to everybody on the network. So broadcast messages are very common from mobile network providers. So when you get those advertisements saying something like you have a new postpaid plan from Vodafone or Airtel or something like that, those are broadcast messages. So it's one server that is sending out one single message to all the other systems. Now there's also multicast. Now multicast is like broadcast, but selective. Now multicast is used for actually casting your, your screen to multiple people. So something like screen share when you are doing it with multiple people is multicast because you have the option to not show a particular computer what you are actually sharing. So those are the three modes of addressing, unicast, broadcast, and multicast. Okay, now moving on, let's look into the tool that we just used to understand UDP, that is Wireshark. So what exactly is Wireshark? So this utility called Wireshark is a packet capture utility, meaning that it grabs data that's either going out or coming in of a specific network. And there are a number of reasons why this may be useful or important. One of the reasons why it's really important is what's going on in the network is always accurate. In other words, you can't mess around with things once they're on the network, or you can't lie about something that's actually on the network as compared with applications in their logs, which can be misleading or inaccurate or if an attacker gets into an application, they may be able to alter the logging. Now, several other behaviors that make it difficult to see what's really going on. And the network, you can really see what's going on once it hits the wire. It's on the wire and you can't change that fact. Now, once it hits the wire, so what we're going to do here is a quick packet capture. So let me just open up Wireshark for you guys. So as you guys can see, I have already Wireshark open for us. Let me just remove this UDP filter that was there. So Wireshark is recapturing. So let us go over the stuff that you can see on the screen. Some important features of Wireshark so that we can use it later. So what I'm doing here is a quick packet capture and I'm gonna show some of the important features of Wireshark so that we can use it later on. Now, when we're starting to do some more significant work, I select the interface that I'm using primarily, which is my Wi-Fi, and I'm gonna be go over here and we'll bring up a Google page so that we can see what's happening on the network. So let me just quickly open up a Google page. As you guys can see, it's capturing a bunch of data that's going around here. Now let me just open up a Google page and that's gonna send up some data. Let's go back. So it's grabbing a whole bunch of stuff off the network. I'm just gonna stop that. I'm gonna go back and go back and take a look at some of the messages here. So some of the features of Wireshark, as you can see on the top part of the screen, here there's a window that says number, time, source, destination, protocol, length, and info. And those are all of the packets that have been captured. And their numbering starting from one and the time has to do with being relative to the point that we've started capturing. And you'll see the source and destination addresses and the protocol, the length of the packet in bytes and some information about the packet. The bottom of the screen, you'll see detailed information about the packet that has been selected. So suppose I'm still selecting this TCP packet out here. So we can go through the frames. The frame also has some interface IDs, the encapsulation type and all sorts of information is there about the frame. Then we can look at the source port, the destination port, the sequence number, the flag set, the checksums. We can basically check everything about a packet because this is a packet analyzer and a packet sniffer. Now you'll see some detailed information about the packet that has been selected. So I'm gonna select, so as I've selected this TCP IP packet, we see that in the middle frame, it says frame 290. It means that it has a 290 A flag packet and the packet that was captured is 66 bytes. And we grab 66 bytes and it's 528 bits later. 
So you, what you see out here was source and the destination MAC address of the layer to layer address. And then you can see the IP address of both source and destination. And it says it's a TCP packet and gives us a source port, destination port. And we can start drilling down into different bits of the packet. And you can see when I select a particular section of the packet down at the very bottom, you can see what's actually a hex dump of the packet. And on the right hand side is the ASCII. So this is the hex, the hex dump and this is the ASCII that you're looking at. What's really cool about Wireshark it, is it really pulls the packet into its different layers that we have spoken about, the different layers of the OSI and the TCP IP model. And the packets are put into different layers and there's a couple of different models that we can talk about with that. What Wireshark does really nicely is it demonstrates those layers for us as we can see here. It is actually four layers and in this particular packet here we can also do something. So I've got a Google web request so what I want to do here is I want to filter based on HTTP. So I find a filter. So let's see. We can do an HTTP. And what I see here is it says text input and it's going to get an image. So that's a PNG image. And this is a request to get the icon that's going to be displayed in the address bar. So you also see something called ARP out here, which I'll be talking about very soon. So let just the filtering be done. Now in the web browser, it's a favi con data ICO that I can do here. I can select, analyze and follow TCP streams. You can see all the requests related to this particular request and it breaks them down very nicely. So you can see we've sent some requests to Spotify because I've been using Spotify to actually listen to some music. Then you can see all sorts of stuff like this was something to some not found place. So let's just take the Spotify one and you can see that we get a bunch of information from the Spotify thing at least. Uh, you can see the destination, the source, it's an Intel Core machine. So the first part of the MAC address, the first few digits is, lets you tell if it's what what is the vendor ID. So Intel has its own vendor ID. So F496 probably tells us that it's that's an Intel Core. So Wireshark does this very neat little thing that it also tells us from the MAC address what type of machine you're sending your packets to from the MAC address itself. So it's coming from a Sophos 4C and going to an Intel core and the type is IPv4. So that was all about Wireshark. You can use it extraneously for packet sniffing and packet analysis. Packet analysis comes very handy when you are trying to actually figure out how to do some stuff like IDS evasion where you want to craft your own packets and you want to analyze the packets that are going into the IDS system to see which packets are actually getting detected as some intrusion. So you can craft your packet in a relative manner so that it doesn't get actually detected by the IDS system. So this is a very nifty little tool. We'll be talking about how you can craft your own packets just in a little while, but for now, let's move ahead. Okay, so now that we are done with our small little introduction and a brief use on history of Wireshark, now let's move on to our next topic for the video that is DHCP. Okay, so DHCP is a protocol and it stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. So DHCP is a network management protocol used to dynamically assign an internet protocol address to any device on a network so they can communicate using IP. Now DHCP automates and centrally manages these configurations rather than requiring some network administrator to manually assign IP addresses to all the network devices. So DHCP can be implemented on small or small local networks as well as large enterprises. Now DHCP will assign new IP addresses in each location when devices are moved from place to place, which means network administrators do not have to manually initially configure each device with a valid IP address. So if a device with a new IP address is moved to a new location of the network, it doesn't need any sort of reconfiguration. So versions of DHCP are available for use in the Internet Protocol version 4 and Internet Protocol version 6. Now, as you see on your screen is a very simplistic diagram on how DHCP works. So let me just run you down. DHCP runs at the application layer of the TCP IP protocol stack to dynamically assign IP addresses to DHCP clients and to allocate TCP IP configuration information to DHCP clients. This includes subnet mask information, default gateways, IP addresses, domain name systems, and addresses. So DHCP is a client server protocol in which servers manage pool of unique IP addresses, as well as information about client configuration parameters and assign addresses out of those address pools. Now DHCP enabled clients send a request to the DHCP server whenever they connect to a network. 
the clients configured with DNCP broadcasts a request to the DNCP server and the request network configuration information for a local network to which they're attached. A client typically broadcasts a query for this information immediately after booting up. The DHCP server responds to the client request by providing IP configuration information previously specified by a network administrator. Now, this includes a specific IP address as well as for the time period, also called a lease, for which the allocation is valid. When refreshing an assignment, a DHCP client requests the same parameters, but the DHCP server may assign a new IP address based on the policy set by the administrator. Now, a DHCP server manages a record of all the IP addresses it allocates to networks, nodes. If a node is reallocated in the network, the server identifies it using its media access control address. Now, which prevents accidental configuring multiple devices with the same IP address. Now, DHCP is not a routable protocol, nor is it a secure one. DHCP is limited to a specific local area network, which means a single DHCP server per LAN is adequate. Now, larger networks may have a wide area network containing multiple individual locations depending on the connections between these points and the number of clients in each location. Multiple DHCP servers can be set up to handle the distribution of addresses. Now, if network administrators want a DHCP server to provide addressing to multiple subnets on a given network, they must configure DHCP relay services located on interconnecting routers that DHCP requests to have to cross. Now, these agents relay messages between DHCP client and servers. Uh, DHCP also lacks any built-in mechanism that would allow clients and servers to authenticate each other. Both are vulnerable to deception and to attack where rogue clients can exhaust a DHCP server's pool. Okay, so let's move on to our next topic and that is why use DHCP. So I just told you that DHCP doesn't really have any sort of authentication, so it can be fooled really easily. So what are the advantages of using DHCP? So DHCP offers quite a lot of advantages. Firstly is IP address management. A primary advantage of DHCP is easier management of IP addresses. In a network without DHCP, you must manually assign IP address. You must be careful to assign unique IP addresses to each client and to configure each client individually. If a client moves to a different network, you must make manual modifications for that client. Now, when DHCP is enabled, the DHCP server manages the assigning of IP addresses without the administrator's intervention. Clients can move to other subnets without manual reconfiguration because they obtain from a DHCP server new client information appropriate for the new network. Now, apart from that, you can say that DHCP also provides a centralized network client configuration. It has support for boot TP clients. It supports of local clients and remote clients. It supports network booting and also it has a support for a large network and not only for short like small scale networks, but for larger networks as well. So that way you will see DHCP has a wide array of advantages, even though it doesn't really have some authentication. So because of these advantages, DHCP finds widespread use in a lot of organizations. OK, so that winds up DHCP for us. So now let's move on to our next topic for this video, and that is address resolution protocol. Now address resolution protocol is a protocol that is used in the local area network. So let me just give you a brief introduction to it, and then we'll get into how we can use it as an ethical hacker for to looking into stuff and looking into vulnerabilities and looking if somebody is actually being hacked or something like that. Okay, so first of all, as I just said, address resolution protocol is a local area network protocol. It basically works when you're using a LAN. So suppose you have a bunch of computers that are connected over a LAN and they have the following IPs, which is 192.168.1.31 followed till 32, 33, 34. So these are the computers and this is the scenario. How the ARP protocol works is that when suppose the red computer out here wants to send a piece of data or a packet or a datagram to this yellow computer that is the IP that it's calling out. So it'll call, uh, it'll broadcast over the LAN saying a who is message, like who is 192.168.1.133. And they will be constantly listening for a reply after that. So they send out a packet and they don't really know which machine to send it to because nobody has responded yet. So after that, the red computer asks who is 192.168.133. And after that, the yellow computer recognizes that it has the same IP address and he'll say that, hey, here's my MAC address so we can communicate more easily in the future. So this MAC address is going to be tied into this IP address and think called the ARP table. I'm going to show you the ARP table right now. 
in just a few minutes. Now, what you have to understand is that this is actually exploitable because there is no validation. Anybody can come into this situation and just lie. So suppose that 192.168.1.31 and there's this yellow computer and we also have this other computer with the blue computer and this is not supposed to be on the LAN, but somehow this guy got into the building and he just connected a LAN wire and now he's on the network. Now what he can do is that he can catch the packet that you are sending and then send it to 192.168.133 simply by lying when the ARP protocol is running and saying that, yep, I'm actually the yellow computer, so send your data to me. And then he'll modify the data and send it to the yellow one. And when the reply comes, it'll also be forwarded to the blue computer. So what I'm explaining out here in this scenario is actually called a man in the middle attack. Okay, so that was about the ARP protocol. Now let's talk about how we can use the ARP protocol for our advantage or as an ethical hacker. Okay, so now that we know how ARP actually works, let me show you how you can access the ARP table of your computer. So what do you have to do is just open up command prompt and all you go is ARP A. Now, this is not specific to Windows. It can be run on any machine that has the TCP IP suite of protocols installed on its computer. So every computer system, what is called an ARP table. And the reason it's called an ARP table is because it matches a layer two or physical address or MAC address to an IP address. And that's what our address resolution protocol is. And what it results is an IP address to a MAC address or a physical address. And the MAC or physical address are interchangeable because they mean the same thing. The reason it's called a physical address is because it is a physically on a network interface, which is of course, a physical device so it's sometimes called a physical address that's sometimes called a mac address for media access control so i might use mac address and i might use physical address to make a particular point but it means the same thing so you can see here that the ip address and there are the mac addresses so these are the ip addresses and these are the mac addresses and they're listed in the arp table and i've done minus a which means show me all your arp entries while i'm doing this on a windows system as i just said it's possible on a Linux system and anything with a TCP IP pseudo protocols installed because it's an important utility to have in order to help diagnose any issue with your network problems. So this is how you would display an ARP table. And as I said, ARP is just a mapping from IP address to MAC address. So let me show you how the protocol looks like when it's actually working. So let's head over to Wireshark. So we choose the interface that we want to see. Okay, now all we do is put on a filter that says ARP. So if you guys see out here, there is this R packets that we are finding. So this is how it looks like. And I just said that it's a who has and a tell me. Now there is no authentication. So when this guy is looking for, okay, so who has 192.168.2.172. Now if we see the hardware and if you see out here the MAC address that the target MAC address is empty because it hasn't gotten a reply yet. Now, when the MAC address is given, they're just interchanged and it is sent back. So the sender MAC address is a Broadcom and Wireshark does a really neat job at getting out the vendor names from the DNS, I mean, from the MAC address. So there's this Astroc thing, then there's Google, as I just saw out here, some Google phone, I guess, maybe an Android, I'm not really sure. This is how ARP looks like and this is how ARP works. And if you're trying to do a man in the middle attack and you shouldn't be trying to do that because that's completely unethical. But just in case you were trying to force a man in the middle attack, you could just try to forward the IP to your own address and just spoof your name while ARPing it. So you can use other tools like Ethercap for that. Now that was all about ARP. Now let's move on to our next topic. So our next topic has come up right after ARP because while studying about ARP, you must have realized that I told you that ARP has no sort of validation. So how could that exactly be fixed? So if the data that actually is being transferred over LAN is encrypted using cryptography, ARP can actually be used very validly. I mean, what you want to do is you want to hide what you're actually sending before sending it out on a local network so that people who are not supposed to get it can't actually see it. Now, let's first tackle the question, what exactly is cryptography? So cryptography is basically the art of hiding anything. 
Now, when talking about computers and computer science in general, it includes hiding data. So now cryptography doesn't really actually start with the new age. It's been there for a long, long time since the time of Julius Caesar and all. We'll be talking about the history of cryptography right now. But what I want you to understand is that when a message is sent, a key is actually used along with an encryption algorithm. Now, this key is also sent to the other person and how this key is sent, we'll get into that later. So what you want to basically understand for now is a message is encrypted using an encryption algorithm, which takes the key and the message as parameters. Then on the other side of the message with the ciphertext, that is after encryption, you get something called ciphertext because it has to be deciphered now. So cipher is just a word, a Latin word, I guess, or a Greek word, I'm not really sure. That means to hide. So first you encrypt your message, then you decrypt your message with the ciphertext and the decryption key, which is most of the time the same as the encryption key uh, when we're talking about symmetric key cryptography. So use the decryption key and the message uh, along with the decryption algorithm and you get the same message on the other side. So basically it's like a password. It's a, it's a password protect for messages and it's a fancy way to say that and that is cryptography. So let us go into the history of cryptography now. So let me give you a brief history of cryptography. Now cryptography actually goes back several thousand years before shortly after people began to find ways to communicate. There were some of us who were finding ways to make the understanding of that communication difficult so that other people couldn't understand what was going on. And this led to the development of Caesar cipher that was developed by Julius Caesar. And it's a simple rotation cipher. And by that, I mean that you rotate a portion of the key in order to generate the algorithm. So here's an example. We've got two rows of letters and that are alphabetical in order and means we basically written the alphabets down and the second row is shifted by three letters. So a B is a Z actually, because if you move that way, a B is a Z from the first row gets shifted back to the second row and then the letter D becomes the letter C. The, there's, that's an example of how encryption works. So if you try to encrypt a word like hello, it would look completely gibberish after it came out of that algorithm. So if you count the letters out, you can see that the letter H can be translated to letter L. So that's a Caesar cipher. Now you must have heard of things like ROT13, which means that you rotate the 13 letters instead of three letters. That's what we can do here again. And this is just a simple rotation cipher or Caesar cipher. That's what, of course, the rot stands for. It's rotate or rotation. Now, coming forward a couple thousand years, we have the Enigma cipher. Now, it's important to note that the Enigma is not the word given to this particular cipher by the people who developed it. It's actually the word given to it by the people who were trying to crack it. The Enigma cipher is a German cipher. They developed the cipher and a machine that was capable of encrypting and decrypting messages so that they could messages to and from different battlefields and war fronts, which is similar to the Caesar cipher. Caesar used it to communicate with his battlefield generals and the same thing were with the Germans. You've got to get messages from headquarters down to where the people are actually fighting and you don't want it to get intercepted in between by the enemy. So therefore you use encryption. And lots of energy was spent by the allies in particular the British trying to decrypt the messages. One of the first instances that we are aware of where a machine was used to do the actual encryption and we're going to come ahead a few decades now into the 1970s where it was felt that there was a need for a digital encryption standard. Now the National Institute of Standards and Technology is responsible for that sort of thing. So they put out a proposal for this digital encryption standard and an encryption algorithm. What ended up happening was IBM came up with this encryption algorithm that was based on the Lucifer cipher. That was one of their people had been working on on a couple of years previously in 1974. And they put this proposal together based on the Lucifer cipher. And in 1977, that proposal for an encryption algorithm was the one that was chosen to be the digital encryption standard. And so that came to be known as DES over time. And it became apparent that there was a problem with DES. And that was it only had a 56 bit key size. And while in the 1970s, that was considered adequate to defend against brute forcing and breaking of code. By 1990s, it was no longer considered adequate and there was a need for something more and it took time to develop something that would last long for some long period of time. And so in the meantime, a stop gap was developed and this stop gap is what we call the triple DES. The reason it's called triple DES is you apply the DES algorithm three times in different ways. 
and you use three different keys in order to do that. So here's how triple desk works. Your first 56 bit key is used to encrypt the plain text, just like you would do with the standard digital encryption standard algorithm where it changes and you take that cipher text that's returned from the first round of encryption and you apply the decryption algorithm to the cipher text. However, the key thing to note is that you don't use the key that you use to encrypt. You don't use the first key to decrypt a bit because otherwise you'll get the plain text back. So what you do is you use a second key with the decryption algorithm against the cipher text from the first round. So now you've got some cipher text that has been encrypted with one key and decrypted with the second key. And we take the cipher text from that and we apply a third key using the encryption portion of the algorithm to that cipher encryption portion of the algorithm to that cipher text to receive a whole new set of cipher text, obviously. To do the decryption, you do the third key and decrypt it with the second key, you encrypt it. And then with the first key, you decrypt it. And so you do reverse order and the reverse algorithm at each step to apply triple des. So we get an effective key size of about 168 bits, but it's still only 56 bits at a time. Now I said triple des was only a stopgap. What we were really looking for was the advanced encryption standard once again. And NIST requested proposals so that they could replace the digital encryption standard in 2001. After several thousands of looking for algorithms and looking them over, getting them evaluated and getting them looked into, NIST selected an algorithm and it was put together by a couple of mathematicians. The algorithm was called Raindoll and that became the Advanced Encryption Standard or AES. It's one of the most advantages of AES is it supports multiple key lengths. Currently, what you'll typically see is as we are using 128 bit keys. However, AES supports up to 256 bit keys. So if we get to the point where 128 bit isn't enough, we can move all the way up to 256 bits of key material. So cryptography has a really long history. Currently, we are in a state where we have a reasonably stable encryption standard in AES. But the history of cryptography shows that with every set of encryption, eventually people find a way to crack it. Okay, so that was a brief history of cryptography. Now what I want to do is let's go over and talk about AES, triple DES and DES in themselves because they are some really key cryptographic moments in history because there are some really key historic moments in the history of cryptography. Now we're going to talk about the different types of cryptographic ciphers and primarily we're going to be talking about DES, triple DES and AES. Now, DES is the digital encryption standard. It was developed by IBM in the 1970s and originally it was cryptographic cipher named Lucifer. And after some modifications, IBM proposed it as the digital encryption standard and it was selected by the digital encryption standard ever since then it's been known as DES. Now, one thing that caused a little bit of controversy was during the process of selection, NSA requested some changes and it hasn't been particularly clear what changes were requested by the NSA. There has been some speculation that wondered if the NSA was requesting a backdoor into this digital encryption standard, which would allow them to look at encrypted messages in the clear. So basically, it would always give the NSA the ability to decrypt DES encrypted messages. It remained the encryption standard for the next couple of decades or so. So what is DES and how does it work? Basically, it uses 56 bit keys rather than a stream cipher. It's a block cipher and it uses 64 bit blocks. And in 1998, DES was effectively broken. When a DES encrypted message was cracked in three days, a year later, a network of 10,000 systems around the world cracked the DES encrypted message in less than a day. And it's just gotten worse since then with modern computing power being what it is. Since DES was actually created, we already had come to the realization that we needed something else. So along came triple DES. Now triple DES isn't three times the strength of DES necessarily. It applies DES just three times. And what I mean by that is what we do is we take a plain text message, then let's call that P and we're going to use a key called K1 and we're going to use that key to encrypt the message and use a key that will we will call K1 and we're going to use that to encrypt the message. And that's going to result in the cipher text and we'll call the C1. So C1, the output of the first round of encryption, we're going to apply a second key and we'll call that K2 with that second key. And we're going to go through a decryption process on C1. Since it's the wrong key, we are not going to get plain text out on the other end. What we are going to get is another round of cipher text and we will call this C2. What we do with C2, we are going to apply a third key and we will call this K3 and we're going to encrypt cipher text C2 and that's going to result in another round of cipher text and we will call that C3. So we have three different keys applied in two different ways. 
So with key one and key three, we do a round of encryption. And with key two, we do a round of decryption. So it's an encrypt, decrypt, encrypt process with separate keys. While that doesn't really yield a full 168 bit key size, the three rounds of encryption yields an effective key size of 168 bits because you have to find 356 bit keys. So speaking of that, Technical detail for triple DES, we're still using the DES block cipher with 56 bit keys, but since we've got three different keys, we get an effective length of around 168 bits. Triple DES was really just a stopgap measure. We knew that if DES could be broken, triple DES could surely be broken with just some more time, I guess. And so the NIST was trying to request a standard that was in 1999 and in 2001, this published an algorithm that was called AES. So this algorithm that was originally called Raindoll was published by NIST as the advanced encryption standard. Some technical specifications about AES is that the original Raindoll algorithm specified variable block sizes and key lengths. And as long as those block sizes and key lengths were multiples of 32 bits, so 32, 64, 96, and so on, you could use those block sizes and key lengths. When AES was published, AES specified a fixed 128-bit block size and key length of 128, 192, and 256 AES with three different key lengths, but one block size. And that's a little bit of detail about DES, triple DES, and AES. So when AES was published, AES specified a fixed 128-bit block size and a key length of 128, 192, and 256 bits. So we've got with AES three different key lengths, but one block size. And that was a little bit of detail about DES, triple DES, and AES. We'll use some of these in doing some hands-on work in the subsequent part of this video. Okay, so now that I've given you a brief history of how we have reached to the encryption standards that we are following today, that is the advanced encryption standard, let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about DES, triple DES, and AES. So DES is a digital encryption standard. It was developed by IBM in the 1970s, and originally it was a cryptographic cipher named Lucifer. And after some modifications, IBM proposed it as the digital encryption standard. It was selected to be the digital encryption standard, and ever since then, it's been known as DES or DES. One thing that caused a little bit of controversy was during the process of selection, the NSA requested some changes, and it hasn't been particularly clear what changes were requested by the NSA. There has been some sort of speculation that wondered if the NSA was requesting a backdoor into this digital encryption standard, which would allow them to look at encrypted messages in the clear. So basically, it would always give the NSA the ability to decrypt this encrypted messages. It remained the encryption standard for the next couple of decades or so. And what is this and how does it work? Now, DES remained the digital standard for encryption for the next couple of decades. So what does it do and how does it work? So basically, it uses a 56-bit key rather than a stream cipher. It's a block cipher and it uses 64-bit blocks. And in 1998, if you know, DES was effectively broken when a DES encrypted message was cracked in three days. And then a year later, a network of 10,000 systems around the world cracked a DES encrypted message in less than a day. And it's just gotten worse since then with modern computing being what it is today. Now, since this was created and broken, we knew we needed something. And what came in between advanced encryption standards and this is triple DES. Now, triple DES isn't three times the strength of this necessarily. It's really DES applied three times. And what I mean by that is we take a plain text message, then let's call that P and we're going to use a key called K1. And we're going to use that key to encrypt the message, and that's going to result in the ciphertext one. So we'll call that C1. Now, C1 is the output of the first round of encryption, and we're going to apply a second key called K2. And with that second key, we are going to go through a decryption process on C1. Now, since it's the wrong key, we are not going to get the plain text out of the decryption process. On the other end, we are going to get another round of ciphertext, and we're going to call that C2. Now with C2, we are going to apply a third key and we are going to call that K3 and we're going to encrypt ciphertext C2 and that's going to result in ciphertext C3. So we have three different keys applied in two different ways. So with key one, key three, we do a round of encryption. With key two, we do a round of decryption. So it's basically an encrypt, decrypt, encrypt process with three separate keys. But what it does really is it doesn't really yield a 168-bit key size because in effectiveness, it's basically 56-bit keys that are being used thrice, whether it be three different keys. So in effectiveness, you could say that it's a 168-bit key, but 
it is not the same strength because people realize that triple desk can be easily broken because if desk is broken, you can do the same thing with three different ways with whatever key that you use. So it just takes longer time to decrypt if you don't know the tree and if you are just using a brute force attack, you know that triple desk can be broken if desk can be broken. So triple desk was literally a stopgap between desk and AES because people knew that we needed something more than triple desk. And for this, the NIST or the National Institute of Standards and Technology in 2001, they chose AES as the algorithm that is now called the advanced encryption algorithm. So it was originally called the Raindoll algorithm. And a, the main thing about the Raindoll algorithm and the advanced encryption standard algorithm is that the Raindoll algorithm specifically states in its papers that it has a variable block size and a variable key size as long as they are in multiples of 32. So 32, 64, 96, like that. But what AES does differently is that it gives you one block size that is 128 bits and gives you three different key sizes, that is 128, 192, and 256. So with AES, three different key lengths, but one block size. Okay, so that was a little bit more information on AES, DES, and triple DES. And we are gonna be using this information in some subsequent lessons. Okay, now moving on. Okay, so now that we've discussed the different history of cryptography and the more important cryptographic algorithms, let's discuss the different types of cryptography. Now, the first type of cryptography I'm going to talk about is symmetric cryptography. And by symmetric cryptography, I mean that the key is the same for encrypting or decrypting. So I use the same key whether I am encrypting the data or decrypting the data. One of the things about symmetric key cryptography is that they use a shorter key length than for asymmetric cryptography, which I'll get into a couple of minutes. It's also faster than asymmetric, and you can use algorithms like DES or AES as those are both symmetric key cryptography algorithms and you can use a utility like AES script. Uh, let me just demonstrate how symmetric key cryptography works. So for this, we can use a tool called AES script. So in AES script is actually available for Linux and Windows and Mac, all the systems. So I'm using it on the Windows one and I'm using the console version. So first of all, I have a text file called text.txt. So let me just show that to you. So we, as you guys can see, yeah, I have this thing called text.txt. Now to do text.txt, all I, let me just show what text.txt contains. So as you guys can see, it has a sentence called the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. So that's the sentence that has all the alphabets in the English language rather. So now we are going to try and encrypt it. So we can use something like AES or DES because both of them are symmetric key ciphers, symmetric key algorithms rather. So we are using AES in this case. So what we're going to do is say AES script. We're going to encrypt it and we're going to use a password of, let's say, um, Pokemon. So we're going to call it Pokemon and we're going to do text.txt. We're going to encrypt that file. So now we have encrypted that file. Now let's go see. We must be having a new file. So this is called text.txt.aes. So that is our encrypted file. And this is what we would generally send over the network if we are sending it to anybody. So let's assume the, uh, the person who's received it also knows our encryption algorithm. I mean, encryption algorithm and the key that goes along with it. So let's try to decrypt it now. Now, before I decrypt it, let me just show you what an encrypted message looks like. So this is what the ciphertext looks like. Type AES, no, no, text dot txt dot AES. So yeah, as you guys can see, the Windows console can't really read everything, but if I were to go here, if I were to just go into the file and just edit with Notepad++, you'll see that it's a bunch of crap. You really can't make out anything. What is being made here? We can't really decipher much. So that's the point of using encryption. Now, if you were to decrypt it, all we have to do is AES script, uh, we're trying to decrypt. We're trying to give the password is going to be, what was the password? Pokemon. Okay, so, and we're going to try and decrypt text.txt.aes. Let's DIR that again. Okay, so that just decrypts our message for us. So this is how you would use AES script for encryption and decryption. So that just decrypts it. And that's how you would use symmetric key encryption to encrypt a file for this example. Symmetric key uses the either a stream cipher or a block cipher and the differences between stream or block ciphers is that block takes a block of bits at a time and it's a fixed length. 
So for example, 64 bits, if I were to use a block cipher with 64 bits, I would need to take some 64 bits before I could start encrypting. Now, if I didn't have 64 bits to encrypt, I would have to fill it with padding in order to get up to 64 bits a stream cipher. On the other hand, it will encrypt a bit at a time, so it doesn't matter how many bits you've got. You don't need to have some multiple of the block length in order to encrypt without padding. And another type of cryptography is asymmetric. Now, asymmetric, as you would expect, uses two different keys, and that's where we have public key and private key. Asymmetric key cryptography uses a longer key length and it also has more computation and the encryption process is slower with a symmetric key encryption. And the encryption process is slower than with a symmetric key encryption. One of the uses for symmetric key is for signing documents or emails, for example, where I would have the private key sign something and the public key would be used to verify a signature. And another reason for using asymmetric key encryption is to ensure that you got it from who actually sent it. Since you've got two keys, you always know who the other end of the equation is. Where with symmetric key, since it's just one key, if you can intercept the key, you can decrypt and also encrypt messages. And so if somebody can figure out the key, you can break into a communication stream using symmetric key encryption. So asymmetric gives you the advantage of ensuring that the other end is who the other end says. And they are since they're the only ones who should have the private key and in this particular instance in practice however however hybrid encryption models tend to be used and that's where you would use asymmetric encryption to encrypt asymmetric session keys so basically you encrypt the message that you are sending using uh, symmetric key encryption and then you when you're exchanging the key with somebody else you use asymmetric key encryption so this is going to be a slower process you probably won't want to use it for smaller files in order to do that. Fortunately, the file example that I have is a smaller one. So I'm going to try and generate a key right now. So for this, we have to head over to our Ubuntu system. So let's see. Let me show you how public key encryption actually works. And we are going to first create a key. So let me just clear this out for you. So first of all, let's create a file and let's call that text.txt. Now, if you see, we are going to edit text.txt to have some file. So we'll have some text in it. So there seems to be a warning with the GTK. I'll just use echo instead. So now let's see if that is in our file. OK, so let me just show you how asymmetric key encryption or public key cryptography works. So first of all, we need a text file. So let me see. Do we have a text file? So there seems to be a text.txt. So let's see what this text.txt says. So it says that this is a random text file. Now, what we want to do is we want to create a public key first. So I'm going to use OpenSSL for doing this. So we go OpenSSL and we are going to use it with RSA. So we are trying to generate a key. So gen RSA and we're going to use des3 to use this and we're going to output it into a file called private.key. So we are also going to be using a 4096 bit. So this is going to be our private key. So this will create a private key using RSA algorithm. So let it work its way out. So first of all, it's asking me for a passphrase now. So since you can protect your keys with a passphrase, so I'm just going to use my name. OK, so now we see if we ls and we have a private dot key, I guess. Yep. So we have this private dot key. Now we're using this private key. We are going to generate a public key. So for this, I'm again going to be using OpenSSL and OpenSSL is a Unix space. So you will need a Unix system. So you go RSA UTL, that's RSA utility. And what we want to do is encrypt and we want the public key in, in key. And we want to use the public key that we just generated. I'm sorry, guys. So we are going to be using RSA. So first of all, we need to generate a public key. So for that, we use the private key. So we will give the private key as an argument after the in flag. So private dot key. And we are trying to get out a public key. So pub out and we are going to call it public dot key. OK, so there seems to be. OK, uh, I messed it up a little. Uh, I forgot to give the output. So you go out and then you use public dot key. So it's asking me for a passphrase and now it's writing the RSA key. And since the password was correct, we have a public key too. So if you see now we have a public key and a private key. So we are going to encrypt our file using the public key. 
So we go open SSL and we go RSAUTL and we go encrypt and we can do pub in. So we are going to use the public key and we want to put the text.txt as the file to be encrypted. So text.txt. And what we want to output is an encrypted file. So encrypted.txt. Okay, I call it open SLL. Need to go and edit that out now. Yeah, so that makes it a correct command. And now we have an encrypted file. So let's see. Alice and yep, encrypted.txt. So if you just cut that out, so we see it's a bunch of garbage and we really can't read it unless we decrypt it. So for decrypting the key, all we have to do is again use OpenSSL. Let's clear this out first. So OpenSSL and we are going to be using the RSA utility again. So RSA UTL, we're going to decrypt this time. So we go with the decrypt flag and then we are going to be giving the end key. And that is going to be the private key. And what we want to decrypt is encrypted.txt. And what we want to output it is as, let's say, plain text.txt. So it's going to ask me for my passphrase, which is my name. And I've entered the passphrase. And now we have a plain text.txt. Now, if we are to go in ls, we see that we have a plain text.txt out here, just replied info.txt. Now let me just cut that out. So plain text.txt. So this is a random text file. And if you go up, we see that it was a bunch of garbage. And before that, it was a random text file. Now you can also run this command called diff plain text.txt text.txt. So this will give you a difference in the text strings. So it's zero, so it gives you, that's the difference. So both the files are the same, and that's how public key cryptography works and how symmetric key cryptography works. Okay, now moving ahead of cryptography, let's talk about certificates. Okay, so now that we're done with cryptography, let's talk about digital certificates. So what is a digital certificate? Well, a digital certificate is an electronic password that allows a person, organization to exchange data securely over the internet using public key infrastructure. So digital certificate is also known as a public key certificate or an identity certificate. Now digital certificates are a means by which consumers and businesses can utilize the security application of public key infrastructure. Public key infrastructure comprises of the technology to enable and uh, secure e-commerce and internet based communication. So what kind of security does a certificate provide? So firstly, it provides identification and authentication. The person or entities with whom we are communicating are really who they say they are. So that is proved by certificates. So then we have confidentiality. The information within the message or transaction is kept confidential. It may only be read and understood by the intended sender. Then there's integrity, there's non-repudiation. The sender cannot deny sending the message or transaction. The receiver, we'll get to non-repudiation and I'll explain how non-repudiation comes into digital certificates. So digital certificates are actually issued by authorities who are business who make it their business to actually certify, certify people and their organization with digital certificates. Now you can see these on Google Chrome. Now let me just open Chrome for you guys and you can see it out here. You can see certificates and you can go into the issuer statements and you can go into all sorts of stuff. So you can see it's issued by Encrypt Authority X3. So that's an issuing authority for digital certificates. Now that was all about the theory of certificates. Let's go and see how you can create one. So to create a digital certificate, we are going to be using the OpenSSL tool again. So first of all, let me show you how to create a certificate. So we are going to be using the OpenSSL tool for that. So first of all, let me clear the screen out. So in this case, I'm going to generate a certificate authority certificate. So I'm doing an RSA key here to use inside the certificate. So first of all, I need to generate a private key. So to do that, as I had just showed you guys, we can use the OpenSSL tool. Uh, you go open SSL and gen RSA and we're going to use test three. Then we're going to out it and let's call it CA.key. And we're going to use 4096 bits. So I'm doing an RSA key here to use inside the certificate. So I'm generating a private key and the private key is used as a part of the certificate. And there's a public key associated with the certificate. So you've got public and private key and data gets encrypted with the public key and then gets decrypted with the private key. 
So they are mathematically linked at the public and private key because you need one for the end of the communication the, and the other for the other end of the communication. And they have to be linked so that the data that gets encrypted with one key gets to be decrypted with other key. So this is asking for a passphrase. And so I'm going to be giving my name as a passphrase. So that has generated the key for us. So now I'm going to generate the certificate itself. So I'm going to be using the OpenSSL utility. So first of all, you say OpenSSL, and you say request. So it'll be a new request, and it's going to be an X509 request. It's going to be valid for 365 days. And let's see, the key is going to be CA.key. And we're going to output it into CA, or let's call it edureka.crt. So this is certificate that I'm producing in the name of the company that I'm working for. So that is Edureka. So it says it's unable to load the private key. Let me just see, is the private key existing? Uh, I had a previous private key, so let me just remove that. Does it have a ca.key? Seems like I put the name differently. So let me just try that again. Open SSL, then we do request. So we're requesting a new certificate. And it's going to be X509. And it's going to be there for 365 days. And key is ca.key. Apparently, that's for a call out here. So, and it's going to be out into edureka.crt. Let's see if that works. So, let's enter the passphrase. So, it's my name. So now it's going to ask me a bunch of information that's going to be inside the certificate. So let's say it's asking the country name. Again, so let's put in the state. OK, so IN, uh, state province name, some state. So Bangalore, a locality, let's say Whitefield. Organization name is Edureka. Unit name, brain force. Common name, let's leave that out. Email address, let's leave that out too. And we have our certificate. So if you go and list out your files, you'll see that there is a certificate called edureka.crt out here, which is highlighted. OK, so now if you want to view this file, you could always use the OpenSSL. You could always use the OpenSSL utility. So you say you want to read an X059 request, and you want it in text. And what you want to see is edureka.crt. Okay, so that is the certificate. So you see that it has all the signature, it has a signature algorithm, it has all the information about the certificate, and it says signature issuer is CIN in state Bangalore in location Whitefield, Idareka Brainforce validity. It has all sorts of information. So that was all about digital certificates, how who issues digital certificates, where are they useful. So this is basically non-repudiation. So Nobody can say it with this certificate that like if this certificate is included in some sort of a website and that website tends to be supposed malicious and there's a complaint. Now, the website can go to a court of law and say they didn't know about this because the certificate that was included had their private key and the private key was only supposed to be known to the company. So that is non repudiation. You just can't deny that you didn't do it. OK, so that was all about certificates. Now moving on. OK, so moving on, we are going to be talking about cryptographic hashing. Now, while the word cryptographic is in the term cryptographic hashing, and uh, it does lead you to believe that there is encryption involved, there is no encryption involved in a cryptographic hash. There is a significant difference between hashing and any sort of encryption, and that is primarily that encryption is a two-way process. When I encrypt a piece of data or a file or anything else, what I'm doing is putting it into a state where I expect it to be able to get it back, out again, in other words, when I encrypt a file, I expect it to be able to decrypt the file and get the original contents. Hashing is a one-way function, on the other hand. Once I've hashed a piece of data or a file, there is no expectation and ability to get the original piece of data back. Hashing generates a fixed length value, and different types of hashing will generate different length values. For example, MD5 will generate a different length value than SHA-1. And they're both hashing algorithms, but they generate different length values. And the resulting value from a hash function should be in no relation at all to the original piece of data. As a matter of fact, if two inputs generate the same hash value, it's called a collision. 
And if you can generate collisions, you may be able to get a point where you can generate a piece of data that are going to generate the same hash values. And that leads you to the potential ability to break the particular hashing algorithm that you're using. So what we can use hash is for well, one thing we can use hash is for file integrity. We can run a hash on a file and get a value back and later we can check that the value to make sure if it's the same. If it's the same, I can be sure that the same file was hashed in both instances. So let me just show you an example of what I just said that if we hash a file, we'll get the same hash every time. So remember the certificate that we just created. Let me just log in again. So we are going to hash this uh, certificate and it will create a certain hash and we are going to see that every time we hash it, we are getting the same hash. So we can use this command called MD5 sum and we can do edureka.crt. So this is the hash produced after you've hashed edureka.crt. So if I do an MD5 again, so MD5 is a hashing algorithm that you should know of. So edureka.crt and it will produce very similar hash. Let's see if SHA-1 works like this. So SHA-1 edureka.crt. Okay, SHA-1 is SHA, the SHA from the SHA utils package. Okay, so I've proved my point that with MD5, which is a cryptographic hashing algorithm, we are getting the same hash back. So if you are able to produce the same hash, that means you have broken the algorithm in itself. So if you run MD5 on Linux, you can get a version of MD5 and MD5 summation program on Windows and Mac OS, where with the utility MD5, which does the same thing. So I just showed you the file and I hashed it. And another reason we use hashing is we are storing passwords. So passwords are stored after hashing. We hash the passwords and the reason for hashing passwords is so you're not storing the password in clear text which would be easily seen even if you got it protected with permissions. If I hash the password every time I hash that password, I'm going to get the same value back from the same algorithm. So what I do is store the hash in some sort of password database. Since it's a one way function, you can't get the password back directly from the hash. Now what you can do with most password cracking programs, do some variation of this and you just generate hashes against a list of words and you'll get a hash value that matches the one in the password. Once you get the hash that matches the one in the password, you know what password is there and here. And we come back to the idea of collisions. If I can take two different strings of characters and get the same values back, then it's easier to crack the password because I may not necessarily get the password, but if the hash that I get back from a particular string of data is the same as that I get from the original password, then it doesn't matter whether I know the password because the string of data that I put in is going to generate the same hash value that you're going to compare when you log in. And this hash value will just give you that it's valid and you'll be able to log in. So suppose the password that you chose while making your account is dog and the dog word produces this hash value. And if I were to like hash cat with the same algorithm and if the algorithm was prone to collisions, it might produce the same hash value as dog. So with the password cat, I could open up your password. I mean, I could open up your account. So that was all about hashing and hashing algorithms. Let's move on now. Okay, so in this part of the video, we are going to go over SSL and TLS. Now, SSL and TLS are ways of doing encryption and they were developed in order to do encryption between websites, web servers, and clients or browsers. SSL was originally developed by a company called Netscape. And if you don't remember, Netscape eventually spun off their source code and became Mozilla Project, where we get Firefox from. So back in 1995, Netscape released version two of SSL and there was a version one, but nothing was ever done with it. So we got to version two of SSL and that was used for encryption of web transmission between the server and the browser to do a whole number of flaws between the server and the browser. Now SSL version two had a whole number of flaws and SSL two has the type of flaws that can lead to decryption of messages without actually having the correct keys and not being the right endpoints. And so Netscape released SSL version three in 1996. And so we get SSL 3.0, which is better than 2.0, but it still had some issues. And so in 1999, we ended up with TLS. Now SSL is secure socket layer and TLS is transport layer security. They both accomplish the same sort of thing. And they're designed for primarily doing encryption between web server and web browsers because we want to be able to encrypt the type of traffic. So let me show you what kind of traffic looks like. So first of all, let me open Wireshark. And out here, I already have a TLS a scan ready for you guys that you can see we have all sorts of TLS data. So you can see that here's my source and it's 1.32 and destination is 7612.4059.46 doing a client key exchange and the change cipher spec and an encrypted handshake message. And then we start getting application data. 
So there are some other steps involved here and you're not seeing all of it with this particular Wireshark capture because again, you know, we get fragmented packets and at some point it starts getting encrypted and you can't see it anyways because Wireshark without having the key can't decrypt those messages. But what ends up happening is the client sends a hello and the server responds with a hello and they end up exchanging information as part of that. Now, including version numbers supported and you get random number and the client's going to send out a number of cipher suits that may want to support an order and it can support the server and it's going to pick from those suite of ciphers. Now, then we start doing the key exchange and then do the change cipher spec and from the client and server and eventually the server just sends a finished message. And at the point we've got this encrypted communication going on, but there's this handshake that goes on between the two systems. And there's a number of different types of handshakes depending on the type of endpoints that you've got. But that's the type of communication that goes on between servers and the client one. Important thing about using SSL and TLS is, as I mentioned, some of the earlier versions had vulnerabilities in them and you want to make sure that the servers aren't actually running those. So you want to run some scans to figure out the type of calls and ciphers that different systems use. So for this, we can use something called SSL scan. So this is available for Unix. I'm not really sure uh, if there is something that is similar for Windows or Mac, but on a Unix based system that is Linux, we can use SSL scan. So let me just show you how to use that. Clear this part out. So we, what we can do is run SSL scan again, suppose www.edureca.co. So I'm going to do an SSL scan here against the website and you can see it's going out and probing all the different types of ciphers that we know on this system start with SSL v3 and are going to TLS version one and we could force SSL scan to try to do an SSL v2 if I scroll back up. Here I get the surface ciphers, which is SSL version three. It's using RSA and it's using RSA for the asymmetric. Now in order to do the key exchange and once we get the session key up, we're going to do use AES-256 and then we're going to use the secure hash algorithm to do the message authentication or the MAC. It's something called the HMAC for the hashed message authentication code. And what it does is simply hashes the MAC address that you would check one side against the other to make sure that the message hasn't been fiddled with in transmission. You can see here all the different types of cipher suits that are available. Here's TLS running RC4 at 40 bits using MD5. So that would be a pretty vulnerable type of communication to use. And between the server and the client, the 40 bit cipher using RC4 is a low strength cipher. And we would definitely recommend that clients remove those from the supported ciphers that they have on their server. All that configuration would be done at the web server as well as when you generated your key and your certificates. Normally certificates would be handled by a certificate authority. Now you can also self sign certificates and have those installed in your web server in order to do communications with your clients. That the challenge with that is browsers today warn when they see a certificate against a certificate authority that is entrusted of it and it doesn't have any certificate authority at all. So you'll get a warning in your browser indicating there may be a problem with your certificate if your clients are savvy enough. And if the users are savvy enough, you may be able to make use of these self fine self signed certificates and save yourself some money. But generally it's not recommended simply because clients are starting to get these bad certificates and when they run across one that's really a problem a real rogue certificate they're going to ignore the certificate message in their browser and just go to these sites that could have malicious purposes in mind and may end up compromising the clients or your customers or users so that's ssl and tls and how they work and negotiate between servers and endpoints okay so now that we've talked about tls and ssl let's talk about disk encryption now, disk encryption is actually something that was not really difficult to do, but sort of out of the reach of normal desktop computers for a really long time. Although there have long been ways to do encryption of files and to a lesser degree, maybe entire disks. As we get faster processors, certainly encrypting the entire disks and being able to encrypt and decrypt on the fly without affecting performance is something that certainly comes with within reach. And it's a feature that shows up in most modern operating systems to one degree or another. Now these days we are going to look at a couple of ways here of doing disk encryption. I'm going to tell you about one of them first and it's not the one I can show. I can't really show the other one either. So with Microsoft, their Windows system have this program called BitLocker. Now BitLocker requires either Windows Ultimate or Windows Enterprise. I don't happen to have either version, so I can't really show it to you, but I can tell you that BitLocker has ability to do entire disk encryption and they use AES for the encryption cipher. And the thing about BitLocker is that they use a feature that comes with most modern systems, particularly laptops. They have a chip in them that's called the Trusted Platform Module or TPM. The TPM chip is part, what it does is it stores the keys 
that allows operating system to be able to access the disk through this encryption and decryption process. And they use a pretty strong encryption cipher, which is AES, but you have to have one of the couple of different versions of Windows in order to be able to use BitLocker. And it's one of those things you would normally run in an enterprise. And so that's why they included it in on its enterprise version. Now on the Mac OS side, they have this thing called File Vault and you will see in the system preferences on the security and privacy, if you go to File Vault, you can turn on File Vault. Now, I, if you have the little button that there says turn on file vault, then uh, you can turn on the file vault and it would ask you about setting up keys and it works similar to Windows BitLocker. Now, PGP happens to have the ability to do disk encryption and you can see that in the case of this, you burn the system. They've got a package called GDE Crypt, which is a GUI that allows you to map and mount a created encrypted volume. So I could run GDE Crypt and it would help me set up the process of encrypting the volumes that I've got on my system. Now, disk encryption is a really good idea because when you are working with clients, the data is normally very sensitive. So as I mentioned, you can always use things like BitLocker and Windows Vault or other such softwares for disk encryption. So what I mentioned before is now not only possible, it's very much a reality with current operating systems. Now let's talk about scanning. Now scanning refers to the use of computer networks to gather information regarding computer systems and network scanning is mainly used for security assessment, system maintenance and also for performing attacks by hackers. Now the purpose of network scanning is as follows. It allows you to recognize available UDP and TCP network services running on a targeted host. It allows you to recognize filtering systems between the users and the targeted hosts. It allows you to determine the operating systems in use by assessing the IP responses. Then it also allows you to evaluate the target host TCP sequence numbers and predictability to determine the sequence prediction attacks and the TCP spoofing. Now network scanning consists of network port scanning as well as vulnerability scanning. Network port scanning refers to the method of sending data packets via the network to a computer system specified service port. This is to identify the available network services on that particular system. This procedure is effective for troubleshooting systems issues or for tightening the system security. Vulnerability scanning is a method used to discover known vulnerabilities of computing systems available on a network. It helps to detect a specific weak spot in an application software or the operating system, which could be used to crash the system or compromise it for undesired purposes. Now network port scanning as well as vulnerability scanning is an information gathering technique, but when carried out by anonymous individuals, they are viewed as a prelude to an attack. Network scanning processes like port scans and ping swipes and return details about which IP address map to active live hosts and the type of service they provide. Another network scanning method known as inverse mapping gathers details about IP addresses that do not map to live hosts, which helps an attacker to focus on feasible addresses. Network scanning is one of the three important methods used by an attacker to gather information during the footprint stage and the attacker makes a profile of the target organization. This includes data such as organization's domain name systems and email servers in addition to its IP address range. And during the scanning stage, the attacker discovers details about the specified IP addresses that could be accessed online, their system architecture, their operating systems and services running on every computer. Now, during the enumeration stage, the attacker collects data, including routing tables, network user and group names, simple network management protocol data and so on. Now, a very popular tool that is used for network scanning is Nmap. Now, Nmap is a must have tool for most ethical hackers and ethical hackers throughout the industry are using this on a daily basis. Now, what it is used for is scanning, as I just said, and the only bad part about Edmap is it is a very noisy scanner. But uh, if you know some ways of IDS evasion, which is the next topic that we're going to talk about, you can very well do an Edmap scan by being very quiet. So let's go into Edmap and see the different ways that we can use Edmap. So Edmap is originally available on a Unix system, but I've also heard that it's also available on Windows systems. For now, I'm going to be using the Unix version. So first of all, let's go ahead and open up our Unix system that is running on our virtual machine. Now, let me clear out the screen out here. So I already have Nmap installed, but if you don't, you can go apt get install Nmap and that should install Nmap for you. If you're not a root user, you might want to check and use the sudo command along with this thing. So I'm not really going to run this command right now because I already have Nmap installed. What I'm going to do is show you the different ways we can use Nmap. So when you're using a tool on your Linux, the first thing that you want to do with any tool is go and type the help command. So if you do help 
I'll show you all the stuff that you can do with Nmap. So as you guys can see that we can do a bunch of target specification. We do host discovery. We have different types of scan techniques and port specification and scan orders. Then there's also servers version detection and script scans. So there's a bunch of things that we can do. Okay, so now what we want to do is let me just show you how you can do all sorts of stuff. So suppose you want to do an nmap scan on, let's say, edureka.co. So this will start up an nmap scan on the IP address that edureka.co sits on. So as you guys can see, this is uh, running an nmap scan and it, it can take a little bit of time. Now, since it's taking a lot of time, I'm going to show you some other ways by just quitting out of it. Okay, so now that I've stopped it because it was taking too much time, you can specify IP address. So suppose you want to 192.168.1.24. You can do an Nmap scan on an IP address like that. I'm also going to quit out of this because my computer is really slow and it's taking a bunch of time to actually load anything. Then you can also do a scan on an entire subnet. Like suppose you want 192.168.1. Then suppose you want to do all the IPs through one till 24. So this is how you would do it and you can run that and then it would do an Nmap scan on all those IP addresses. I'm going to quit out of every scan because this computer is really, really slow. Okay, so let me show you some other flags. So suppose you had a file that says targets.txt. So suppose you had a file that had all the target files in it. So let me just create a target file targets.txt. Now you could use this file and actually create an nmap. So, and actually run through all the IP addresses. So suppose targets.txt had a list of IP addresses. All you would have to do is nmap and il, which is basically input list. So small i and capital L, and then you tell the name of the target, which is targets.txt. Okay, so because that had no IP addresses, as you can see zero IP addresses scanned in 0 0.89 seconds. So you can do that. Now you can also do an exclude. So Nmap allows you to do that. With Nmap, you can do exclude. And suppose you want to do a scan and you want to exclude some IP address. So let's see, 192.168.1.1. Suppose you want to exclude that. So you can very well do that and it will start scanning up all sorts of stuff. So that was the host name. So that's why it's failed. It was its target. Now you can also do some scanning techniques. So suppose you want to scan for SYN ports. So SYN ports. So you could do something like let's choose a default IP address now. Nmap for so for a SYN scan, you do small s and capital S. So that is for SYN scans. And this will choose all the TCP SYN port scans and you can do it on anything. So after that, you just put in an IP address. So out here, I'm going to say 192.168.3.4. I don't know, dot two, dot thirty four. And it'll give you all sorts of information after that is done. I'm not going to run the scan for a long time. After that, you can also scan TCP connection ports. So for that, you use the ST flag. So nmap S and T. And this is default. And you can use a TCP connection port scan. So you, after that, you just enter the IP address. So 192.168.2.34. And that should do a TCP port scan. Let's quit out of that. Then, so let me just tell you all the flags for the different types of scanning techniques. So SU instead of ST, let me just tell you. SU instead of ST will actually scan for UDP ports. Then if you do an SA, it will scan for all the acknowledgement port scans. So if when there's a TCP handshake going on, it sends back an acknowledgement packet. So you can specifically scan for those types of stuff. Then for a Windows port scan, you can do SW. And for a main mount port scan, you can do an SM. Okay, now you can also do a bunch of host discovery stuff with Nmap. So let's go over them one by one. Now with Nmap, you can do something like S and L, and this will show no scan. So it will scan only the list targets. So you could do something like 192 and then the IP address. So 192.168.2.34. So that will do that. And let's quit out of that quickly. You can also use the SN tag. So, so you can use the SN tag, which is for disabling port scanning or host discovery only. So this will not give you a host discovery. It will save you some time. 
and you can use the n flag also and this will tell you to never do hostname resolution so you can just save yourself some time in that way then you can also do art discovery on a local network so let me just show you how to do that and map for our discovery is PR so that is for ARP discovery and you could do it on your local network 192.168.1.1 okay so that's a very invalid IP yeah so that was the gateway and since that's the gateway instead of running nmap on some random IP all the time let's let's go and if config first and let's see our IP address so our IP is 192.168.56.101. So let's try and do some scans on ourselves. That was all about host discovery. Now you can also do some port specification. So you can do port specifications like this. So our IP is 192.168.56.101. And suppose you want to scan for port number 21. So that'll scan port number 21 and I'll show you that TCP closed FTP it's a FTP and it's closed, so that's how it should be. Then you can use the port scan, like you could say 21 to 100, and that would scan all the ports from 21 to 100. So that was about port scanning. Now you can also do a fast port scan, so that's with the F tag, so nmap. Let's get up the previous thing. So nmap, and all you want to say is F hyphen f so that'll be a fast port scan and it's considerably faster than see that that was very fast so it was considerably faster than most of the scans and that was also you can do another thing so suppose you want to just scan the top ports so you could say top ports and all the top 2000 ports and that'll scan all the top 2000 ports that is on this ip address now this will take a long time because it's a very slow computer. So, okay, th that did it. Now let's go and do some service inversion detection. So let's, for service inversion detection, let's get back our edureka.co IP address. So that is 34.210. So let's try and do some service detection on that. So nmap 34.210.230.35. So you could have done it on edureka.co itself. So SV will give you the service version so it'll try and attempt to determine all sorts of service versions that are running on that ip address so far i personally know that it's an apache server 2.0 that's running on there so i'm not really going to wait for the scan to run but that's how you actually do it so you can also increase the version intensity so let's just stop out of that now you can increase the version intensity so the intensity is uh, done something like this so if you go version and intensity and then you specify a number anything between zero to nine the higher the number the more correctness that you can kind of get offered by nmap so you can say version intensity eight okay seems like version intensity actually has been the removed from nmap so that's an update that you learned in this lesson okay you can also do aggressive scans so for aggressive scans all you have to do is an a tag so a and that will do a very aggressive scan on that ip address Okay, so that was all about uh, aggressive scans and it's take a really long time. So I'm gonna just quit out of it. Then you can do something like OS detection also. So for OS detection, just if you want some OS detection, you could use nmap and you could go hyphen O and that'll give you the OS detection. And that's basically the end of our nmap tutorial. So moving on, we are gonna be discussing ideas evasion, which is gonna be the last lesson for this video. So now let's talk about intrusion detection evasion. So before we get into IDS evasion, let's talk about what exactly is an IDS. Now an intrusion detection system or IDS is a system that monitors network traffic for suspicious activity and issues alerts when such activity is discovered. While anomaly detection and reporting is primary function, some intrusion detection systems are capable of taking actions when malicious activity or anomalous traffic is detected, including blocking traffic sent from suspicious IP addresses. Although intrusion detection systems monitor network for potentially malicious activity, they are also prone to false alarms or false positives. Consequently, organizations need to fine tune their IDS product when they first install them. That means properly configuring their intrusion detection system to recognize what normal traffic on their network looks like compared to potentially malicious activity. 
An intrusion prevention system also monitors network packets for potentially damaging network traffic. But where an intrusion detection system responds to potentially malicious traffic by logging the traffic and issuing warning notification, intrusion prevention systems responds to such traffic by rejecting the potentially malicious packets. So there are different types of intrusion detection systems. So intrusion detection systems come in different flavors and detect suspicious activities using different methods. So kind of intrusion detection is a network intrusion detection system. So that is NIDS is it deployed at a strategic point or points within the network where it can monitor inbound and outbound traffic to and from all the devices on the network. Then there is host intrusion detection system that is HIDS which runs on all computers or devices in the network with direct access to both the internet and the enterprise internal network. HIDS have an advantage over NIDS in that they have, may be able to detect anomalous network packets that originate from inside the organizations or malicious traffic that NIDS has failed to detect. HIDS may also be able to identify malicious traffic that originates from the host itself as when the host has been infected with malware and is attempting to spread to other systems. Signature based intrusion detection system monitors all packets traversing the network and compares them against a database of signatures or attributes of known malicious threats, much like antivirus softwares. So now let's talk about intru IDS evasion. Okay, so now let's talk about IDS evasion. Now IDS is an intrusion detection system as we just spoke about and is there to detect exactly the types of activities that we are engaged in sometimes. And sometimes you may be in, called in to work on a target where your activities are known and should be known by the operators or the operations people involved in monitoring and managing the network and the idea being not only do they want to assess the technical controls that are in place, but they also want to assess the operational procedures and ensure that the systems and processes are working the way that they are supposed to be working. Now, when you are engaged with a target that you are in full cooperation with, you don't need to do these types of evasion tactics. All these techniques may be actually avoided, but if you're asked to perform an assessment or a penetration on a target where they are not supposed to see your activities, then you need to know some different techniques to evade detection from an IDS. So we're going to talk about a couple of different things that you can do. So one thing that you can do is manipulate packets to look a particular way. Now for this, there is a tool called Packet. So Packet is a really good way to actually manipulate traffic and by actually manipulating the contents of a packet, like you can specify the destination and source. So it's a really useful tool to set up packets, look a particular way. One thing it can do is allow you to spoof IP addresses. So I could set a source IP address here that was something completely different from mine. Now if I'm using TCP or UDP, I'm not going to see the response back. And in this case, TCP, I'm not even going to get the three-way connection made because the responses are going to go back to the source IP. But what you can do is in addition to spoofing, you can set up particular ways that a packet may look. Like changing the type of service or by changing the fragmentation offset, or by different flag settings that may allow you through an IDS without maybe getting flagged and it may also allow you through a firewall. Now it's a slim possibility, but it's a possibility. Now another thing you can do is use Packet to generate a lot of really bogus data and what you might do is hide in the noise generated by Packet. So you can could create some really bogus packets that are sure set of IDS alarms and then you can run some legitimate scans underneath and hopefully be able to get some responses. Now, cyber attacks are taking place all the time. Even as we speak, the security of some organization, big or small, is being compromised. For example, if you visit this site out here that is Threat Cloud, you can actually view all the cyber attacks that are actually happening right now. Let me just give you a quick demonstration of how that looks like. Okay, so as you guys can see out here, these are all the places that are being compromised right now. The red parts actually show us the part that is being compromised and the yellow places actually show us from where it's being compromised from. Okay, as you guys can see now that someone from the Netherlands is actually attacking this place and someone from USA was attacking Mexico. It's a pretty interesting site and actually gives you a scale of how many cyber attacks are actually happening all the time in the world. Okay, now getting back, I think looking at all these types of cyber attacks, it's only necessary that we educate ourselves about all the types of cyber threats that we have. So these are the eight cyber threats that we're going to be discussing today. Firstly, we're going to start with malware. So malware is an all encompassing term for a variety of cyber attacks, including Trojans, viruses and worms. Malware is simply defined as code with malicious intent that typically steals data or destroys something on the computer. The way malware goes about doing its damage can be helpful in categorizing what kind of malware you're dealing with. So let's discuss it. So first of all, viruses. 
like their biological namesakes, viruses attach themselves to clean files and infect other clean files, and they can spread uncontrollably, damaging a system's core functionality and deleting or corrupting files. They usually appear as executable files that you might have downloaded from the internet. Then there are also Trojans. Now, this kind of malware disguises itself as legitimate software or is included in legitimate software that can be tampered with. It tends to act discreetly and creates backdoors in your security to let other malwares in. Then we have worms. Worms infect entire networks of devices, either local or across the internet, by using the network's interfaces. It uses each consecutive infected machine to infect more. And then we have botnets and such, where botnets are networks of infected computers that are made to work together under the controller of an attacker. So basically, you can encounter malware if you have some OS vulnerabilities, or if you download some illegitimate software from somewhere, or you have some other email attachment that was compromised with. Okay, so how exactly do you remove malware or how exactly do you fight against it? Well, each form of malware has its own way of infecting and damaging computers and data. And so each one requires a different malware removal method. The best way to prevent malware is to avoid clicking on links or downloading attachments from unknown senders. And this is sometimes done by deploying a robust and updated firewall, which prevents the transfer of large data files over the network in a hope to weed out attachments that may contain malware. It's also important to make sure your computer's operating system, whether it be Windows, Mac OS, Linux, uses the most up-to-date security updates. And software programmers update programs frequently to address any holes or weak points. And it's important to install all these updates as well as to decrease your own system weaknesses. So next up on our list of cyber threats, we have phishing. So what exactly is phishing? Well, often posing as a request for data from a trusted third party, Phishing attacks are sent via email and ask users to click on a link and enter their personal data. Phishing emails have gotten much more sophisticated in recent years and making it difficult for some people to discern a legitimate request for an information from a false one. Now, phishing emails often fall into the same category as spam, but are way more harmful than just a simple ad. So how exactly does phishing work? Well, most people associate phishing with email message that spoof or mimic bank, credit card companies, or other businesses like Amazon, eBay, and Facebook. These messages look authentic and attempt to get victims to reveal their personal information. But email messages are only one small piece of a phishing scam. From beginning to end, the process involves five steps. The first step is planning. The phisher must decide which business to target and determine how to get email addresses for the customers of that business. Then they must go through the setup phase. Once they know which business to spoof and who their victims are, fishers create methods for delivering the messages and collecting the data. Then they have to execute the attack. And this is the step most people are familiar with. That is the fisher sends a phony message that appears to be from a reputable source. After that, the fisher records the information the victims enter into the web page or pop-up windows. And in the last step, which is basically identity theft and fraud, the fishers use the information they've gathered to make illegal purchases or otherwise commit fraud. And as many as a fourth of the victims never fully recover. So how exactly can you be actually preventing yourself from getting fished? Well, the only thing that you can do is being aware of how phishing emails actually work. So first of all, a phishing email has some very specific properties. So firstly, you will have something like a very generalized way of addressing someone like dear client. Then your message will not be actually from a very reputable source. So out here, as you can see, it's written as Amazon on the label, but if you actually inspect the email address that it came from, it's from management at maisoncanada.ca, which is not exactly a legitimate Amazon address. Third, you can actually hover over the redirect links and see where they actually redirect you to. Now, this redirects me to www.fakeamazon.com, as you can see out here. So basically, you know this is actually a phishing email and you should actually report this email to your administrators or anybody else that you think is supposed to be concerned with this. Also, let me give you guys a quick demonstration on how phishing actually works from the perspective of an attacker. So first of all, I have actually created a phishing website for harvesting Facebook credentials. I simply just took the source code of the Facebook login page and pasted it and then made a backend code in PHP, which makes a log file of all the Facebook passwords that get actually entered onto the phishing page. 
Now, I've also sent myself an email as to make sure this looks legitimate, but this is only for spreading awareness. So please don't use this method for actually harvesting credentials. That's actually a very illegal thing to do. So let's get started. First of all, you'll go to your email and see that you'll get some email saying your Facebook credentials have been compromised. So when you open it, it looks pretty legit. Well, I haven't made it look all that legit. It should look legit, but the point out here is to actually make you aware of how this works. So as you guys can see, it says, dear client, we have strong reasons to believe that your credentials may have been compromised and might have been used by someone else. We have locked your Facebook account. Please click here to unlock. Sincerely, Facebook associate team. So if we actually click here, we are actually redirected to a nice looking Facebook page, which is exactly how Facebook looks like when you're logging in. Now, suppose I were to actually log into my Facebook account, which I won't, I'll just use some random ID, like this is an email, at the rate gmail.com, and let's put password as admin123, and we click login. Now, since my Facebook is actually already logged in, it'll just redirect to facebook.com and you might just see me logged in. But on a normal computer, it'll just redirect you to www.facebook.com, which should just show this site again. Okay, so once I click login out here, all that the backend code that I've written in PHP out here will do is that it's gonna take all the parameters that I've entered into this website, that is my email address and the password, and just generate a log file about it. So let's just hit login and see what happens. So as you guys can see, I've been redirected to the original Facebook page that is not meant for phishing. And on my system out here, I have a log file. And this log file will show exactly, as you can see, I've fished out the email address. This is an email at the gmail.com. And it's also showed the password that is admin123. So this is how exactly phishing works. You enter an email address and you're entering the email address on a phishing website and then it just redirects you to the original site. But by this time you've already compromised your credentials. So always be careful when dealing with such emails. So now jumping back to our session, the next type of cyber attacks we're gonna discuss is password attacks. So an attempt to obtain or decrypt a user's password for illegal use is exactly what a password attack is. Hackers can use cracking programs, dictionary attacks, and password sniffers in password attacks. Password cracking refers to various measures used to discover computer passwords. This is usually accomplished by recovering passwords from data stored in or transported from a computer system. Password cracking is done by either repeatedly guessing the password, usually through a computer algorithm in which the computer tries numerous combinations until the password is successfully discovered. Now, password attacks can be done for several reasons but the most malicious reason is in order to gain unauthorized access to a computer with the computer's owner's awareness not being in place. Now this results in cybercrime, such as stealing passwords for the purpose of accessing bank information. Now today, there are three common methods used to break into a password protected system. The first is a brute force attack. A hacker uses a computer program or script to try to log in with possible password combinations, usually starting with the easiest to guess password. So just think if a hacker has a company list, he or she can easily guess usernames. If even one of the users has a password one, two, three, he will quickly be able to get in. The next are dictionary attacks. Now a hacker uses a program or script to try to log in by cycling through the combinations of common words. In contrast with brute force attacks where a large proportion key space is searched systematically, a dictionary attack tries only those possibilities which are most likely to succeed, typically derived from a list of words, for example, a dictionary. Generally, dictionary attacks succeed because most people have a tendency to choose passwords which are short or such as single words found in the dictionaries or simple easy predicted variations on words such as appending a digit or so. Now, the last kind of password attacks are used by keylogger attacks. A hacker uses a program to track all of the user's keystrokes. So at the end of the day, everything the user has typed, including the login IDs and passwords, have been recorded. A keylogger attack is different than a brute force or dictionary attack in many ways not the least of which the key logging program used is a malware that must first make it onto the user's device. And the key logger attacks are also different because stronger passwords don't provide much protection against them, which is one reason that multi-factor authentication is becoming a must have for all businesses and organizations. Now, the only way to stop yourself from getting killed in the whole password attack conundrum is by actually 
practicing the best practices that are being discussed in the whole industry about passwords. So basically, you should update your password regularly. You should use alphanumerics in your password. And you should never use words that are actually in the dictionary. It's always advisable to use garbage words that makes no sense for passwords as they just increase your security. So moving on, we're going to discuss DDoS attacks. So what exactly is a DDoS or a DOS attack? Well, first of all, it stands for distributed denial of service and a DOS attack focuses on disrupting the service to a network as the name suggests. Attackers send high volume of data of traffic through the network until the network becomes overloaded and can no longer function. So there are a few different ways attackers can achieve DOS attack, but the most common is the distributed denial of service attack. This involves the attacker using multiple computers to send the traffic or data that will overload the system. In many instances, a person may not even realize that his or her computer has been hijacked and is contributing to the DOS attack. Now, disrupting services can have serious consequences relating to security and online access. Many instances of large scale DOS attacks have been implemented as a single sign of protest towards governments or individuals and have led to severe punishment, including major jail time. So how can you prevent DOS attacks against yourself? Well, firstly, unless your company is huge, it's rare that you would be even targeted by an outside group or attackers for a DOS attack. Your site or network could still fall victim to one. However, if another organization on your network is targeted. Now, the best way to prevent an additional breach is to keep your system as secure as possible with regular software updates, online security monitoring, and monitoring of your data flow to identify any unusual or threatening spikes in traffic before they become a problem. DOS attacks can also be perpetrated by simply cutting a table or dislodging a plug that connects your website server to the internet. So due diligence in physically monitoring your connections is recommended as well. Okay, so next up on our list is man in the middle attacks. So by impersonating the endpoints in an online information exchange, the man in the middle attack can obtain information from the end user and the entity he or she is communicating with. For example, if you are banking online, the man in the middle would communicate with you by impersonating your bank and communicate with the bank by impersonating you. The man in the middle would then receive all of the information transferred between both parties, which could include sensitive data such as bank accounts and personal information. So how does it exactly work? Normally, an MITM gains access through a non-encrypted wireless access point which is basically one that doesn't use WAP, WPA, or any of the other security measures. Then they would have to access all of the information being transferred between both parties by actually spoofing something called address resolution protocol. That is the protocol that is used when you are actually connecting to your gateway from your computer. So how can you exactly prevent MITM attacks from happening against you? So firstly, you have to use an encrypted WAP. That is an encrypted wireless access point. Next, you should always check the security of your connection because when somebody is actually trying to compromise your security, he will try to actually strip down the HTTPS or HSTS that is being injected in the website, which is basically the security protocols. So if something like this HTTPS is not appearing in your website, you're on an insecure website where your credentials or your information can be compromised. And the last and final measure that you can actually use is by investing in a virtual private network which spoofs your entire IP and you can just browse the internet with perfect comfort. Next up on our list is drive by downloads. So gone are the days where you had to click to accept a download or install a software update in order to become infected. Now just opening a compromised web page could allow dangerous code to install on your device. You just need to visit or drive by a web page without stopping or to click accept any software and the malicious code can download in the background to your device. A drive-by download refers to the unintentional download of a virus or malicious software onto your computer or mobile device. A drive-by download will usually take advantage or exploit a browser or app or operating system that is out of date and has security flaws. This initial code that is downloaded is often very small, and since its job is often simply to contact another computer where it can pull down the rest of the code onto your smartphone, tablet, or other computers. Often a web page will contain several different types of malicious code in hopes that one of them will match a weakness on your computer. So how does this exactly work? Well, first you visit the site and during the three-way handshake connection of the TCP IP protocol, a backend script is triggered. 
As soon as a connection is made while the last ACK packet is sent, a download is also triggered and the malware is basically injected into your system. Now, the best advice I can share about avoiding drive by downloads is to avoid visiting websites that could be considered dangerous or malicious. This includes adult content, file sharing websites, or anything that offers you a free trip to the Bahamas. Now, some other tips to stay protected include keep your internet browser and operating system up to date, use a safe search protocol that warns you when to navigate to a malicious site, and use comprehensive security software on all your devices like McAfee All Access and keeping it up to date. Okay, so that was it about drive by downloads. Next up is maladvertising or malvertising. So, malvertising is the name we in the security industry give to criminally controlled advertisements which intentionally infect people and businesses. These can be any ad on any site, often ones which you use as a part of your everyday internet usage, and it is a growing problem as is evident by a recent US Senate report and the establishment of bodies like trust in ads. Now, whilst the technology being used in the background is very advanced, the way it presents to the person being infected is simple. To all intents and purposes, the advertisement looks the same as any other, but has been placed by criminal. Like you can see the mint ad out here, it's really out of place, so you could say it's been made by a criminal. Now, without your knowledge, a tiny piece of code hidden deep in the advertisement is making your computer go to the criminal servers. These then catalog details about your computer and its location before choosing which piece of malware to send you. And this doesn't need a new browser window and you won't know about it. So basically you're redirected to some criminal server, the malware injection takes place and voila, you're infected. It's a pretty dangerous thing to be in. So how exactly can you stop malvertising? Well, first of all, you need to use an ad blocker, which is a very must in this day and age. You can have ad blocker extensions installed on your browser, whether it be Chrome, Safari or Mozilla. Also, regular software updates of your browser and other software that work peripheral to your browser always help. And next is some common sense. Any advertisement that is about a lottery that's offering you free money is probably going to scam you and inject a malware too. So never click on those ads. So the last kind of cyber attacks we are going to discover today and discuss about is rogue software. So rogue security software is a form of malicious software and internet fraud that misleads users into believing that there is a virus on their computer and manipulates them into paying money for a fake malware removal tool. It is a form of scareware that manipulates users through fear and a form of ransomware. Rogue security software has been a serious security threat in desktop computing since 2008. So now how does a rogue security software work? These scams manipulating users into download the program through a variety of techniques. Some of these methods include ads offering free or trial versions of security programs, often pricey upgrades or encouraging the purchase of the deluxe versions. Then also pop ups warning that your computer is infected with a virus which encourages you to clean it by clicking on the program and then manipulated SEO rankings that put infected website as the top hits when you search. These links then redirect you to a landing page that claims your machine is infected and encourages you a free trial of the rogue security program. Now, once the scareware is installed, it can steal all your information, slow your computer, corrupt your files, disable updates for legitimate antivirus softwares, or even prevent you from visiting legitimate security software vendor sites. Well, talking about prevention, the best defense is a good offense. And in this case, an updated firewall makes sure that you have a working one in your office that protects you and your employees from these type of attacks. It is also a good idea to install a trusted antivirus or anti spyware software program that can detect threats like these. And also a general level of distrust on the internet and not actually believing anything right off the bat is the way to go. So first on our list is Blue Vector. Now, network security programs and human IT operators who manage them are under constant threat. New attack techniques like malware deployed without files are straining resources and testing defenses in two critical ways. First, brand new threats and attack techniques often have at least a small window of time when they can bypass some defenses before defender catches up. Second, even if critical threat like zero day malware are stopped, the constant siege of attackers means that defenders are likely to get overloaded by both real alerts and false positives. One possible solution that has only recently become an option 
is tasking machines and computers with protecting themselves. If a security program could be programmed to think that act like an analyst, then it could try and counter malware and human backed intrusion at machine speed, a move that would give defenders a serious home court advantage. This is exactly what Blue Vector Defense tries to do. Blue Vector works almost right away, but also has deep machine learning capabilities, so it gets even smarter over time. It will learn the intricacies of each network that deploys it, tweaking its algorithms and detection engines in a way that makes most sense for the environment. Blue Vector is installed as either a hardware based network appliance or as a virtual machine. It can operate in line with network traffic, stopping and remediating threats in real time as they attempt to enter a protected space or as a retrospective tool that can scan the work performed by other programs and analysts, catching threats that they might have missed and recommending fixes. It is designed to work with all IPv6 traffic as well as older IPv4 streams so it can operate in environments that are rich in Internet of Things and supervisory control and data acquisition devices, such as those in industrial and manufacturing settings, as well as for normal office type environments. So that was it for Blue Vector. Next up on our list of cybersecurity tools is Bricata. These days, even the most basic cybersecurity defenses for any medium to large enterprise will include an intrusion prevention system or an intrusion detection system. Even by itself, a well-tuned IPS slash IDS system that is constantly monitored by security teams will catch most network problems and security breaches. However, the fact that many organizations stop there has led to an uptick in successful attacks designed specifically to operate in IDS blind spots. This is where Bricata platform comes into play. At its core, Bricata offers advanced IPS IDS protection with multiple detection engines and threat feed to defend network traffic and core assets. But it goes a step further, adding the ability to launch threat hunts based on events or simple anomalies. This would enable an organization to begin network level threat hunting using the same staff and tools they are already using for IPS monitoring. It would be a good step in the right direction towards better protection without the pain of installing additional programs or retraining staff. Looking first at Bricata as a pure idea system, it is deployed as a physical or virtual appliance that serves as the main collator point and user interface. This in turn links up to network sensors that are deployed at network choke points to capture traffic data. While Bricata sensors will almost always be deployed at network gateways, they can additionally be placed around core assets of internal points where network traffic flow to give platform visibility into horizontal movements of potential threats. Now that takes care of intrusion detection. Up next on our list of tools is Cloud Defender by Alert Logic. Compared to traditional servers and client architectures, cloud computing is the new kid on the block. While cybersecurity best practices are similar within a cloud environment, many of the vulnerabilities and specific threats that target the cloud are different. As such, even organizations with deep cybersecurity teams that may need a little help when moving large chunks of their computing infrastructure to the cloud. That is the whole idea behind Cloud Defender from Alert Logic. Designed from the ground up as a way to provide protection to web applications, critical data, and everything else running or stored within an organization's cloud, there is a whole sliding scale of support available. At the low end, Cloud Defender is a user friendly tool that would enable local IT staff to inspect the cloud deployment to look for evidences or hidden threats or breaches. At the other extreme, the 200 person cybersecurity team at Alert Logic can take over most cloud based cybersecurity functions offering monitoring, advising, and logging of events in a software as a service model. When used as a SaaS, alert logic will do everything short of remediating problems. Most organizations are probably want to use Cloud Defender as some combination of both SaaS security and as a tool to aid their local team. The platform is configured for this and making all logs and information collected by the program available at least for a year to local IT staffers. Cloud Defender works with any cloud environment including Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Services, VMware's, and others. There is no difference in pricing based on the cloud environment. Pricing is totally based on the number of nodes you're being protected and the size of the log files being analyzed. Up next on our list of tools is Cofence Triage, which works as a phishing defense tool. One of the most popular and quickest ways for attackers to enter a network these days is to trick a user into taking an action, whether installing malware or providing their login credentials. And if they pretended to be a company official, a business partner or a family friend, their chances of success skyrockets. Phishing email run the game from clumsily worked sweepstakes type scams all the way up to highly researched and targeted campaign designed to attack a handful of key people at an organization. Yet, despite the danger they pose, most organizations have little or no defense against them. Back in 2008, when the original Fish Me product was deployed, 
which was also the name of the company at the time there was also very low awareness of the danger that these types of email represented the fish me simulation was created to allow network administrators and security personnel to craft their own phishing emails to train users about the dangers sometimes hidden in mail messages as an organization fish me has moved its focus away from pure education into threat remediation even the company's name is changing from fish me to cofence which is a combination of collaborative and defense one of the first cofence branded products triage takes email reported by users as suspected phishing and helps to manage responses in one sense the fish me product helps to make users more adept at spotting phishing scams while triage creates a way for organizations to tap into new found skill set that the employees should have learned the next tool in our list deals with application security which is basically the convergence of endpoint security network security and content security as you guys can see the name of the tool is contrast security which is actually a suit of tools now as such cyber security programs tend to look at the problem of defense from a lot of different angles with expectations that enterprises will employ several different type of security at the same time this has led to a different problem alert fatigue setting in on it teams as all of those programs sound the alarm many times and all the time the contrast security suit aims to change that trend in two important ways first it takes one of the critical aspects of cyber security today that is application security and condenses it into a single program that can protect apps from the time of development first begins all the way through the deployment and their full life cycle second because contrast security embeds agents inside each app that is protecting essentially becomes a part of the program there is almost no chance of a false positive in fact it scored a rare 100% on the owasp security benchmark passing over 2000 tests without generating any false positives the secret sauce for contrast security is use of bytecode instrumentation a feature in java used to help integrate programs and application features during development only here contrast security uses it for the purpose of cyber security specifically embedding an agent into an application which will thereafter be directly monitored and protected from the inside out in a sense it turns any type of normal application into one that is designed to focus on security but don't worry all the normal business focused task of the app will still function so next on our list of tools is digital guardian in recent years advanced threats have been increasingly targeting endpoints this makes sense because endpoint security has traditionally been the realms of signature based antiviruses technology that has proven to be inadequate protection against targeted and highly advanced malware campaigns that is where digital guardian threat aware data protection platform comes in with most endpoint security programs protection is delivered through the creation of rules behavior that breaks the rules of the network is considered a suspect and is blocked flagged or otherwise becomes the subject of a security alert one of the biggest problems with this method is that security is only as good as the rule set administrators either must carefully craft rules based on their own expertise or set a protection program into learning mode for several weeks or months while it discovers good network behavior and crafts rules restricting everything else the digital guardian platform by contrast come ready to use preloaded with thousands of best practices rules based on years of experience working in the field and after a quick data discovery process those rules are tailored to the specific network that it is protecting this is all done nearly instantaneously so that when agents are deployed they can immediately begin protecting endpoints with good security policies next on our list of cybersecurity tools we have intellecta there are important distinctions between compliance and security they are meant to be mutually supporting with compliance rules put in place to provide a good security baseline but it's possible to be completely in compliance with all applicable regulations and still not be adequately secure the reverse is also true if an organization has deep security but it's still not technically in compliance with applicable regulations should a data theft occur they will likely still be held responsible sometimes financially because of the lack of compliance and just like compliance and security are similar but different so too are the skill set used to implement them organizations can have a deep it or cyber security staff that is unskilled with compliance issues or unpracticed in knowing exactly which regulations apply that is where the intellecta platform from tech democracy shines the platform acts like a security information and event management console but for compliance issues installed either as an on premise or cloud based console it pulls information from a series of network collectors and correlates that data into a continuously monitored compliance dashboard it's a neat tool that every company should have Up next on our list of tools we have the Mantix 4 which is pretty interesting tool in my opinion given the insidious nature of advanced threats it's almost a certainty that every organization of any size 
will eventually be hacked or compromised regardless of what or how many cybersecurity defenses are in place in response the somewhat new concept of threat hunting is becoming an increasingly important part of cybersecurity defenses the mantix 4 platform named after the apex predator of the insect kingdom the praying mantis seeks to solve the people problem while the program provides robust threat hunting tools for use by clients the company also employs a team of experts to hunt on their behalf it takes threat hunting into the software as a service realm mantix 4 was originally designed for the canadian government's department of public safety which is the equivalent of the Department of Homeland Security in the United States. In Canada, Mantix 4 helps to defend networks sitting in 10 sectors considered critical infrastructure, rooting out threats that might bypass more traditional protection. The system is deployed as two components. The first part is comprised of observer sensors that sit at critical points within a protected network, either alongside routers or at network gateways, though they can be deployed almost anywhere depending on the need. The sensors are lightweight enough to be housed inside a virtual machine or within a network server with additional bandwidth. However, because the observer sensor process and record a lot of traffic, the best deployment is probably going to be as a small appliance that hosts nothing else, something the company provides. The sensors can be set to work inline or to passively sniff network traffic. Now, the last tool that we're going to discuss for today is a pretty important tool also in my opinion and it covers a very important aspect of any industry level cybersecurity plan that is traffic analysis. Network traffic analysis tools have been used for a long time to help improve efficiencies in enterprise network locating unused capacity bandwidth and eliminating choke points. It has recently been employed as an arms of cybersecurity too. That makes sense given that except for insider threats attacks are going to be initiated and ultimately controlled by outside elements. The communication between the internal threat malware and its controllers on the outside are captured by traffic analysis tools. The problem is that while the logic of using traffic analysis in cybersecurity is solid, the reality is a bit different. For one, even a small to medium sized enterprise is going to generate three or four billion traffic logs per month. Without computerized assistance, no human is going to be able to wade through that and find anything meaningful. Second, capturing all that data traditionally requires the installation of network traps on gateways across the network. For an organization with branch offices or remote locations, the number of traps installation can climb pretty high. And even then, some traffic may escape around those gateways. SecBI has fielded new software that aims to eliminate both of those problems, volume processing of data for actionable intelligence threat and a reliance on network trapping hardware. They have done this by deploying their analyzer as a software module capable of running on premise or in the cloud. It only looks at the log files, so there is no need for any network traps, agents on the clients, or anything beyond access to the constantly generated log files. It then crunches those billions of events in the logs using finely tuned algorithms that look for patterns associated with an ongoing attack or an advanced persistent threat. It can be deployed with as a pay as you go contract where users only pay based on how many gigabytes of log file data they need to process per day. So recognizing the national and economic security of the United States depends on the reliable function of critical infrastructure. The president issued executive order 13636, which is improving critical infrastructure cybersecurity in February 2013. The order directed NIST to work with stakeholders to develop a voluntary framework based on existing standards, guidelines and practices for reducing cyber risks to critical infrastructures. The Cybersecurity Enhancement Act of 2014 reinforced the NIST's Executive Order 13636 rule. Created through collaboration between industry and government, the voluntary framework consists of standards, guidelines, and practices to promote the protection of critical infrastructure. The prioritized, flexible, repeatable, and cost-effective approach of the framework helps owners and operators of critical infrastructure to manage cybersecurity-related risks. Now, according to Section 7 of Executive Order, the Secretary of Commerce shall direct the Director of the National Institute of Standards and Technology to lead the development of a framework to reduce cyber risks to critical infrastructure. The cybersecurity framework shall include a set of standards, methodologies, procedures, and processes that align policy, business, and technological approaches to address cyber risks. The cybersecurity framework shall incorporate voluntary consensus standards and industry best practices to the fullest extent possible. 
Now let's see why exactly do we need a cybersecurity framework? Let's tackle that question. So the framework will help an organization better understand, manage, and reduce its cybersecurity risks. It will assist in determining which activities are most important to assure critical operations and service delivery. In turn, that will help prioritize investments and maximize the impact of each dollar spent on cybersecurity. It results in a shift from compliance to action and specifies outcomes. By providing a common language to address cybersecurity risk management, it is especially helpful in communicating inside and outside the organization. That includes improving communications, awareness, and among IT, planning, and operating units, as well as senior executives of organizations. It gives you a measure of where you are and where you need to go. It can be implemented in stages or degrees, which make it more appealing to business. It has built-in maturity models and gap analysis, so you don't need additional maturity models on top of CSF. Organizations also can readily use the framework to communicate current or desired cybersecurity postures between a buyer or supplier. Now let's see what exactly is a cybersecurity framework. The framework is voluntary guidance based on existing standards, guidelines, and practices for organizations to better manage and reduce cybersecurity risks. In addition to helping organizations manage and reduce risks, it was designed to foster risk and cybersecurity management communications amongst both internal and external organizational stakeholders. Now let's see the types of cybersecurity frameworks that we have. So the first type of framework is PCI DSS, which stands for Payment Card Industry and Data Security Standards. It is a set of security control required to implement protected payment account security. It is designed to protect credit cards, debit cards, and cash card transactions. The second type of framework that we have is ISO 27001 and 27002. It is the International Organization for Standardization. Now the best practices recommendations for information security management and information security program elements are from this framework. The third type of framework is CIS, which stands for critical security controls, a prescribed arrangement of activities for cyber protection that gives particular and noteworthy approaches to stop the present most inescapable and perilous attacks. A key advantage of the controls is that they organize and center fewer activities with high outcomes. Last but not the least, we have the NIST framework. Now, NIST framework is made for improvising critical infrastructure cybersecurity with a goal to improve organizations' readiness for managing cybersecurity risk by leveraging standard methodologies and processes. Now, out of all the frameworks we just discussed, NIST is the most popular framework. NIST was developed in the February of 2013 after the US presidential executive order. It was designed to address national and economic challenges, and it is supposed to be voluntary at least for private sectors. Now let's discuss the objectives of the framework. So the cybersecurity frameworks prioritized flexible and cost-effective approach helps to promote the protection and resilience of critical infrastructure and other sectors important to the economy and national security. The framework was developed to be adaptable, flexible, and scalable by an organization. Also, it should be improve organization's readiness for managing cybersecurity risks. The framework was designed to be flexible and performance based, and it should be cost effective. It should leverage standard and methodologies and processes and should promote technological advancement and innovation, and it should be actionable across the enterprise focus on outcomes. Now let's discuss the components of the NIST cybersecurity framework. The cybersecurity framework consists of three main components, namely the core, implementation tires, and profiles. The framework core provides a set of desired cybersecurity activities and outcomes using common language that is easy to understand. The core guides organizations in managing and reducing their cybersecurity risks in a way that is complementing an organization's existing cybersecurity and risk management processes. Next, we have the framework implementation tiers, which assists an organization by providing context on how an organization views cybersecurity risk management. The tiers guide organization to consider the appropriate level of rigor for their cybersecurity program and are often used as a communication tool to discuss the risk appetite, mission priority, and budget. Last but not least is the framework profiles, which are an organization's unique alignment of their organizational requirements and objectives, risk appetite, and resources against the desired outcomes of the framework core. Profiles are primarily used to identify and prioritize opportunities for improving cybersecurity at an organization. Let's discuss the framework tires now. 
the tires describe the degree to which an organization cybersecurity risk management practices exhibit the characteristics defined in the framework. The tires range from partial, which is tire 1, to adaptive, which is tire 4, and describe an increasing degree of rigor and how well integrated cybersecurity risk decisions are into broader risk decisions, and the degree to which an organization shares and receives cybersecurity information from external parties. Tires do not necessarily represent maturity levels. Organizations should determine the desired tire, ensuring that the selected level meets organizational goals, reduces cybersecurity risks to the level acceptable by the organization, and is feasible to implement fiscally and otherwise. Next, we have the core. The core is a set of desired cybersecurity activities and outcomes organized into categories and aligned into informative references. The framework core is designed to be intuitive and to act as a translation layer to enable communication between multidisciplinary teams by using simplistic and non-technical language. The core consists of three parts, functions, categories, and subcategories. The core includes five high-level functions, which is identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. These five functions are not only applicable to cybersecurity risk management, but also to risk management at a whole. The core asks an organization to identify what processes and assets need to be protected. Now, after assessing that, you need to find what protection is available. Then you need to find out what techniques can identify the threats and what techniques can contain the impact of an incident. And finally, the core defines what techniques can restore the capabilities of the organization before the attack. All right, now let's dive deeper into the functions to see what these functions actually do and what purpose they serve. So the functions are the highest level of abstraction included in the framework. They act as the backbone of the framework core that all the other elements are organized around. So the first function is identify. It helps develop an organizational understanding to manage cybersecurity risk to systems, people, assets, data, and capabilities. The activities in the identify functions are foundational for effective use of the framework. Understanding the business context, the resources that support critical functions, and related cybersecurity risks enable an organization to focus and prioritize its efforts consistent with its risk management strategy. Examples of outcome categories within this function include asset management, business environment, governance, risk management, and risk assessment. Now the next type is the protect function. So to develop and implement appropriate safeguards to ensure delivery of critical services, the protect function supports the ability to limit or contain the impact of a potential cybersecurity event. Example of outcome categories within this function include identify management and access control, awareness and training, data security, information protection processes and procedures, maintenance, and protective technology. The next kind of function is the detect function. So this is used to develop and implement appropriate activities to identify the occurrence of a cybersecurity event. The detect function enables timely discovery of cybersecurity events. Example of outcome categories within this function includes anomalies and events, security, continuous monitoring, and detection processes. Now next we have the respond function. Now to develop and implement appropriate activities to take action regarding a detected cybersecurity incident, the respond function supports the ability to contain the impact of a potential cybersecurity incident. The outcomes category within this function includes response planning, communications, analysis, mitigation, and improvements. Last but not the least, we have the recover function. Now to develop and implement appropriate activities to maintain plans for resilience and restore any capabilities or services that were impaired due to a cybersecurity incident, the recovery function supports timely recovery to normal operations to reduce the impact from a cybersecurity incident. Examples of outcome categories within this function include recovery planning, improvement, and communications. These five functions were selected because they represent the five primary pillars for a successful and holistic cybersecurity program. They aid organizations in easily expressing their management of cybersecurity risk at a high level and enabling risk management decisions. Okay, now let's understand the last component of the NIST framework. NIST recommends that the framework be customized in a way that maximizes business value and that customization is referred to as a profile. Profiles are an organization's unique alignment of their organizational requirements and objectives, risk appetite, and resources against the desired outcomes of the framework core. Profiles can be used to identify opportunities for improving cybersecurity posture by comparing a current profile with the target profile. 
profiles are about optimizing the cybersecurity framework to best serve the organization. The framework is voluntary, so there is no right or wrong way to do it. One way of approaching profiles is for an organization to map their cybersecurity requirements, mission objectives, and operating methodologies along with the current practices against the subcategories of the framework core to create a current state profile. These requirements and objectives can be compared against the current operating state of the organization to gain an understanding of the gaps between the two. Now the following steps illustrate how an organization could use the framework to create a new cybersecurity program or improve on an existing program. These steps should be repeated as necessary to continually improve cybersecurity. So the first step is to prioritize and scope. The organization identifies its business mission, objectives, and high-level organizational priorities. With this information, the organization makes strategic decisions regarding cybersecurity implementations and determines the scope of systems and assets that support the selected business line or process. The framework can be adapted to support the different business lines or processes within an organization, which may have different business needs and associated risk tolerance. Risk tolerances may be reflected in a target implementation tier. Step two is to orient yourself. Now, once the scope of cybersecurity program has been determined for the business line or process, the organization identifies related systems and assets, regulatory requirements, and overall risk approach. The organization then consults sources to identify threats and vulnerabilities applicable to those systems and assets. So step three is to create a current profile. The organization develops a current profile by indicating which category and subcategory outcomes from the framework core are currently being achieved. If an outcome is partially achieved, noting this fact will help support subsequent steps by providing baseline information. The fourth step is to conduct a risk assessment. This assessment could be guided by organization's overall risk management process or previous risk assessment activities. The organization analyzes the operational environment in order to discern the likelihood of a cybersecurity event and the impact that the event could have on the organization. It is important that the organization identify emerging risks and use cyber threats information from internal and external sources to gain a better understanding of the likelihood and impact of cybersecurity events. So the fifth step is to create a target profile. The organization creates a target profile that focuses on the assessment of the framework categories and subcategories describing the organization's desired cybersecurity outcomes. Organizations may also develop their own additional categories and subcategories to account for unique organizational risks. The organization may also consider influences and requirements of external stakeholders, such as sector entities, customers, and business partners when creating a target profile. The target profile should appropriately reflect criteria within the target implementation tier. The sixth step is to determine, analyze, and prioritize gaps. The organization compares the current profile and the target profile to determine gaps. Next, it creates a prioritized action plan to address gaps, reflecting mission drivers, costs, and benefits, and risks to achieve outcomes in the target profile. The organization then determines resources, including funding and workforce necessary to address the gaps. Using profiles in this manner encourages the organization to make informed decisions about cybersecurity activities, support risk management, and enables the organization to perform cost-effective targeted improvement. The last step is to implement action plan. The organization determines which actions to take to address the gaps, if any, identified in the previous step, and then adjust its current cybersecurity practices to achieve the target profile. For further guidance, the framework identifies examples, informative reference regarding the categories and subcategories, but organizations should determine which standards, guidelines, and practices, including those that are sector specific work best for their needs. An organization repeats the steps as needed to continuously assess and improve its cybersecurity. For instance, organizations may find that more frequent repetition of Orient step improves their quality of risk assessment. Furthermore, organizations may monitor progress through iterative updates to the current profile, subsequently comparing the current profile to the target profile. Organizations may also use this process to align their cybersecurity program with their desired framework implementation deal. Now the framework helps guide key decision points about the risk management activities through the various levels of an organization for supporting risk management. Now, as you can see in the picture, it describes a common flow of information and decisions at the following levels within an organization. The levels are executive, business process, and implementations or operations. The executive level communicates mission priorities, available resources, and overall risk tolerance to business process levels. 
the business or process level uses the information as input into the risk management process and then collaborates with the implementation or operation level to communicate business needs and create a profile the implementation or operation level the implementation or operations level communicates the profile implementation progress to the business level the business level uses this information to perform an impact assessment next the business level management reports the outcomes of that impact assessment to the executive level to inform the organization's overall risk management process and to the implementation operation levels for awareness of business impact. So let's take a look on our top 10 reasons to learn cybersecurity. So one of the major reason to learn cybersecurity is that cybersecurity is an evergreen industry. As long as there is internet, there will be malware, hence a need of absolute digital protection against it. With a CGR of 13.4%, the worth of cybersecurity market through 2027 is projected to be staggering 403 billion US dollars, according to Forbes 2021. With the advent of technologies like big data, machine learning, the IoT, the cloud computing, the position of cybersecurity has carved in stone and the magnitude of its importance is only the set to increase. Cybersecurity job trends are always forever and there is no chance for a shortfall of demand for those who have gone through professional training or in this particular domain. So our next reason is cybersecurity is meaningful and vitally important. We all know cyber crimes have caused the world two trillion dollars so far since 2019 and the major drawbacks were the advancement of the technologies such as artificial intelligence as artificial intelligence plays an increasingly prominent role in cyber security as the number of attempted cyber attacks has grown rapidly it has become increasingly tricky for human cyber security experts to react to them all and predict where the most dangerous attacks will take place this is where ai comes to play but unfortunately thanks to ever growing availability of ai hackers and criminals where they are growing increasingly proficient and using it too AI algorithms are used to identify systems with weak security or that are likely to contain valuable data among the million of computers and the network connected to the internet. This is how the hackers get opportunity to attack their targets. Next is building a security aware culture. Perhaps the most important step that can be taken at any organization is to ensure that it is working towards initiating and fostering the culture of awareness around cybersecurity issues. Today, it's no longer good enough for employers or employees to simply think of cybersecurity as an issue for the IT department to take care of it. In fact, developing an awareness of the threat and taking basic precautions to ensure safety should be fundamental part of everyone's job's description in 2023. If we talk about Internet of Things and Cloud Security, Ranging from smart wearables to home appliances, cars, buildings, alarm systems, and industrial machineries, which have proven to be the bugbear for those with responsibility for cybersecurity. This is because, as they are often not used to store sensitive data directly, manufacturers haven't always been focused on keeping them secure with frequent security patches and updates. With more and more organizations now established on cloud security, measures need to be continuously monitored and updated to safeguard the data from leaks. Although cloud applications such as Google or Microsoft are well equipped with security from their end, still it's the user end that acts as a significant source for erroneous errors, malicious software, and phishing attacks. By this, you might have come to know that Cybersecurity is actually meaningful and very vitally important in our day to day lives. Now, if you wish or you are planning to become a cybersecurity expert, you must be wondering about the requirements to start your career in cybersecurity. Well, in cybersecurity, the requirements are super basic. If you think pursuing a career in cybersecurity is challenging, you are possibly wrong. Because in cybersecurity, the requirements are super basic. 
all you need is confidence and a professional background in IT. The overall eligibility criterion is being relaxed around the world. One reason for this could be the huge gap between the demand and the availability of the experts. Even the college students and young professionals can go for it without worrying anything. For those who doesn't have a professional background can simply proceed with the cybersecurity certification which enables them to earn equally as experts with solid background in cybersecurity. So to become a cybersecurity professional, you absolutely don't have to go to some college for a four-year degree course or anything else like that or get a handful years of experience. All you need is basic understanding to cybersecurity. Well, as we are talking about the basic requirements, we shall also know that mathematics is not a concern. Well, the fact couldn't be denied that mathematics have been challenging subject for many college going students. Not everyone loves it and the fact is that doesn't let them proceed with other best options which have mathematics as an important part. In cybersecurity, training and education is totally free from involvement of mathematics and thus one who hates it need not have to worry at all. Those who are still very young and consider it one of the best available options is due to this reason. Learners can rather learn the programming and other core topics related to cybersecurity and can work in challenging environments. Cyber attacks are getting smarter day by day. Cybersecurity professionals are always busy outsmarting black hat hackers, patching vulnerabilities and analyzing the risk of an organization. Tackling such attacks in an ever-advancing industry only comes with continuous study and thorough research. This means after you learn cybersecurity and start working, your knowledge is continuously enriched and with experience, your wisdom continuously gets honed and thus the sky is the limit when we are talking about personal growth in cybersecurity industry. Cybersecurity is expanding its horizon through various industries. This makes sure that the perfect platform for growth in terms of career as well as learning opportunities. This proves that when you learn cybersecurity, you will be continuously knowing new things and gaining rich experiences which will add on to your skill set. Now for those who aspire to travel the globe, cybersecurity might just be the perfect career path. Thousands of homegrown cybersecurity experts are working to protect business, government agencies, and general consumers travel the whole world. On a globe scale, the rise of cyber attacks is outspacing the supply of cyber defenders. This results in plenty of opportunities for cybersecurity professionals and experts to travel overseas to serve their skills which are in high demand. Hence, if you have ever wanted to work in different countries, then a career in cybersecurity must just be the perfect passport to your success. If we talk about industry requirements, then there are over millions of companies in this world spread across a variety of sectors and industry and a large proportion of them share one thing in common today that is the internet connection. More than 400,000 people already work in the information security industry and demand for cyber skills which is growing fast in every type of company and government department. So whether you dream of a working in a sports or a fashion or media or the emergency services the Skype or any other industry, cyber skills would be your gateway as everyone needs someone to defend their sensitive data. Well, we got to know that there are a plethora of industries where are the cybersecurity professionals are in huge demand. We should also know there's a wider scope in cybersecurity. That means it is certain that cybersecurity professionals have a clear shot working with prestigious Fortune 500 companies like Dell, Accenture, Infotech, etc. But the potential doesn't end here in cybersecurity. That means in cybersecurity, you get a chance to work with secret agencies. Experts who prove to be worthy of their skills might earn to work with top secret government agencies and intelligence agencies. For example, MI6, Mossad, NSA, RAW, and many other secretive agencies. So if you learn cybersecurity, 
you might just become a top secret agent. Well, that sounds interesting, right? Now, if we talk about one of the major reasons why should we learn cybersecurity, then that can be the paychecks which have ballooned in cybersecurity. I think we all can agree that money makes the world go round. And that's true. The world has realized the sheer importance of cybersecurity with stories in the news almost every week on new cyber attacks. Faced with online attacks, business and government agencies are looking for experts who can protect their systems from cyber criminals. And they are willing to pay high salaries and provide training and development. So, there are great opportunities for anyone starting their career in cybersecurity because salaries in cybersecurity have a greater growth potential than 90% of other industries. For senior security professionals, earning can surpass the average median by vast amount. And these earnings totally depends upon your merits. Now, the last but not the least, the reason to learn cybersecurity is that it's never too late to begin with. That means one of the best thing about cybersecurity is that it's never too late to realize that you want to be in this particular profession. There are a lot of people across the globe that opted this option after completing 50 years of age. In fact, it could be the best thing you can do after the retirement if you are having a background in IT. There is no need to worry about the job security as experts in this Fields are always demanded widely. So you are always welcome to join any of the training courses and other options in this particular field. Let us now see some of the top five skills to have as a cybersecurity professional. Starting off with intrusion detection system. An intrusion detection system is a set of skills where one monitors a network or a system for malicious activities or policy violation. Any intrusion activity or violation is typically reported either to an administrator or collectively centered using security information and event management system. A security information and event management system combines output from multiple sources and uses alarm filtering technique to distinguish between malicious activities and false alarm. The intrusion detection job roles can range from the scope of single computer to a large network system. The most common classification here network intrusion detection and host intrusion detection system. All right, then a system that monitors important operating system files is an example of host intrusion detection system, while a system that analyzes incoming traffic network is an example of network intrusion detection system. It is also possible to classify intrusion detection system by detecting the approach. The most well known variant are nothing but signature based detection and anomaly based detection. The next important skill is to know how to code. It is very important that a cybersecurity professional has a background in programming. Now you might be wondering how coding is related to cybersecurity, right? Well, you see, knowledge of programming language helps you defend against hacking techniques while using the languages. That's why coding is a sought out after skill in the industry. If you know cybersecurity programming language, you're already a step ahead. To give you a better understanding of what I'm speaking, let us consider JavaScript as an example. We all know JavaScript is one of the most popular and widespread programming language for web development. And I would say it is also one of the best cybersecurity programming language you can learn. You see, hackers can steal cookies, manipulate even handlers and perform cross-site scripting. But with JavaScript, a website owner can run any code whenever a visitor comes to the website, which can improve the functionality of the website but also its security. On the other hand, it can also produce malicious functions unknown to the visitor. If a hacker takes control of a website, they could program it to run malicious code. JavaScript engineer in cybersecurity space is a perfect job for someone with knowledge of programming language. Clearly, as a JavaScript engineer, you'll be expected to foster development process for API functionalities. You may also design websites and use interface while ensuring that the security is not altered. This means mitigating possible cross-site scripting attempts in web forms as well as minimizing other technical risk. To beat hackers, you have to think like them, right? So it's important that you think like a black hat. So what I'm trying to say is, with this skill, we can predict the hackers next move and beat them in their own game. It is the mindset needed during a response to an actual attack and to find goals of the hacker, besides the information that is being collected. 
Next skill is nothing but risk management and risk mitigation. Risk management and risk mitigation is a process of identifying, assessing and mitigating risk to the scope, schedule, cost and quality of a project. Risk comes in the form of opportunities, threats and are scored on the probability of occurrence and impact on the project. Few of the most common ways to achieve this is by having a risk management plan and then to identify the risk and whatever risk have been identified would be put in a register which is called as risk register and to perform qualitative and quantitative analysis on the risk. Then if the risk is pretty high or low, a response plan would be determined. And once we have controlled the risk, there will be an audits that can be performed in order to prevent the same risk from occurring on the project. Then we have cloud security. Cloud security is the protection of data stored online via cloud computing platforms from theft, leakage and deletion. Methods of providing cloud security include firewall, penetration testing, obstruction, tokenization and VPN. Therefore, it is always advised that never to use public internet connection. Major threats to cloud security include data breaches, data loss, account hacking, server traffic hacking and many more. One of the most common threat that occurs over here for cloud computing is nothing but denial of service. These attacks shut down a server by overwhelming it by data and thus users cannot access their accounts such as bank account details or email accounts. Why become a cybersecurity engineer? Let us first analyze the current and forthcoming trends that are driving the demand for cybersecurity engineers today. So there are six most recent trends which have resulted in an increase in the need for cybersecurity engineers. At first, increasing ransomware attacks. Ransomware isn't a new threat. It has been around for about decades, but it is a growing one. It is estimated that there are now over 120 separate families of ransomware and hackers have become very adaptive at hiding malicious code. Next, we have remote working cybersecurity risk. For example, did you know work from home possesses a new cybersecurity risk and is one of the most talked about new trends in cybersecurity? This is because home offices are often less protected than centralized offices. Next is the evolution of Internet of Things. The expanding Internet of Things creates more opportunities for cybercrime. So many additional devices change the dynamics and size of what is sometimes called as cyber attack surface, that means the number of potential entry points for malicious actor. Next, increase in cloud services and cloud security threats. Cloud services offer a range of benefits such as scalability, efficiency, and cost saving. But they are also a prime target for attackers. Misconfigured cloud settings are a significant cause for data breaches, unauthorized access, insecure interfaces, and sometimes account hijacking too. Next, we have social engineering attacks getting smarter. Social engineering attacks like phishing are not new threats but have become more troubling and the widespread remote workforce. Nowadays, attackers target individuals connecting to their employer's network from home because they can make easier targets. And lastly, continued rise of AI. While AI presents a significant opportunity for more robust threat detection among businesses, criminals are also taking advantage of the technology to automate their attacks using data poisoning and model stealing techniques. Now that we have got to know about the recent trends, let us know how much the cybersecurity engineers are in demand. So we had done an extensive survey and found out that there are 14,000 plus job vacancies in India, whereas in the US there are more than 15,000 jobs available for a cybersecurity engineer. The major high-tech cities Bangalore and California have the highest job vacancies for cybersecurity engineers. Moving ahead with the salary package, then an average salary of a cybersecurity engineer in India is 6 lakh per annum. And 
$101,580 per annum in US. Companies like IBM, Deloitte, TCS, Oracle, Cognizant, Accenture, Amazon, Capgemini, SIAC, and many others have a huge demand for cybersecurity engineers. Now that we have come to know the demand for cybersecurity engineer, let us know who is a cybersecurity engineer. A cybersecurity engineer is an IT professional who is responsible for maintaining the security aspects of computer and networking systems and perform various tasks such as designing and implementing secure networking solution, monitoring, troubleshooting, etc. How cybersecurity engineer helps the organization? A cybersecurity engineer helps the organization by assessing the organization's security requirement and setting up the best practices and standards in response, developing and deploying all security measures required to secure an organization, conducting regular testings and scannings to identify the vulnerabilities in the networks and the systems, performing regular penetration testing, and taking an active role in the change management process. Next, let us know the job description and the skills required for the cybersecurity engineer. We searched numerous job descriptions from many organizations, out of which we picked two job descriptions as a reference. So at first, we have Vodafone, which is a multinational telecommunication company. They had a requirement for cybersecurity engineer and their job description specified the tasks performed by a cybersecurity engineer, such as following the cybersecurity baseline to deliver the task which support the execution of cybersecurity strategies, supporting the team to deliver the technical operation in the cybersecurity platform. They are also responsible to detect, identify, and respond to the cyber events, threats, risks, and vulnerabilities in the line with the management response plan. Let's look on to the another job description that is from Visa, which is an American-based multinational financial service corporation. Their job description specify the tasks such as implementation and continuous improvement of effective security controls, ensuring the correct and comprehensive functioning of server security technologies, working with the vendors to ensure time implementation of product updates and bug fixes, and many more. To become a cybersecurity engineer, you must be familiar with skills such as programming language, operating system, networking fundamentals and protocols, security aspects, web development, and CIDI tools. Apart from that, you should also be familiar to the tools such as Jenkins, Travis CI, GitLab, Shodan, Maltego, Netgraph, etc. Moving ahead with roles and responsibilities of a cybersecurity engineer, a cybersecurity engineer is responsible for tasks such as planning and implementing security measures of systems and networks, troubleshooting security and network problems, ensuring the protection of organization's data and infrastructure, being a part of daily administrative tasks with relevant departments in the organization, regular testing and identifying networks and system vulnerabilities, and responding to all system and network security breaches. At last, how do you become a cybersecurity engineer? So in order to become a cybersecurity engineer, you need to follow this roadmap, which shows you the step-by-step -step approach that you need to take. So the first step is that you should have a basic knowledge about programming languages such as Python, Perl, C, C++, Java, PowerShell, etc. Next, you should work on operating systems like Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Kali Linux, etc. Followed by networking fundamentals and protocols such as TCP, IP, UDP, FTP, etc. After that, you should know about the security aspects followed by web development skills and at last, you should have an hands-on experience on tools such as Jenkins, GitLab, Travis, etc. This roadmap 
will surely help you reach to your destination easily. In order to start your career path in cybersecurity, you can check our Edureka YouTube channel and find all cybersecurity related session as well as you can also refer to our Edureka blogs related to cybersecurity. Apart from this, you can also enroll yourself to the Edureka's cybersecurity certification training program in order to learn from experienced industry professional, work on real-time projects and become a certified expert. So because of the frequency of cyber attacks, careers are varied and qualified professionals are in demand. If you're ready to get started in this fast growing career, start exploring cyber careers now. And there are ample opportunities and job titles in the cybersecurity domain. Some of the top positions include people like security analysts who plan and execute flawless security measures. Then we also have security engineers who build IT security systems for your organizations. Then we have security specialists who at an entry level range is a person with a huge potential. Then we have incident responders who prevent and protect organizations against threats. Then we have vulnerability assessors whose responsibility is to spot system vulnerabilities and create solutions to them. Next, we have security architects whose job is to outsmart online criminals by designing tough to crack security systems. Next, we have security administrators who keep security systems running smoothly every day. Following which, we have the cryptographers who write the code that hackers can't actually hack. Next, we have security directors who make the rules and solve complex problems regarding cybersecurity. Then we have security consultants who advise and implement security solutions. We also have security managers who keeps the system secure with expert team advisors. Last but not the least, we have security auditors who find the weak spots in the security system before criminals do. Now, when talking about a career in cybersecurity, it's easy to get confused where to actually start. So let's discuss that first. Now, before you start your career in cybersecurity, you need to undertake the following steps. Firstly, you need to earn a bachelor's degree. While it's possible to find certain entry-level cybersecurity positions with an associate's degree, most jobs require a four-year bachelor's degree in cybersecurity or related fields such as information technology or computer science. Coursework in programming and statistics combined with classes in ethics and computer forensics prepare students with technical and analytical skills required for successful careers in cybersecurity. In an environment where data breaches are becoming the norm, more cybersecurity degree programs are being added every year. Before choosing a cybersecurity degree, prospective students should make sure that it is not only accredited, but also aligns with their current career goals. Secondly, we need to complete an advanced training. Now, some employers will require candidates to hold an advanced degree, such as a master's degree in cybersecurity. Now, prospective employers may offer tuition assistance to meet this goal, and a master's degree takes an additional one to two years to complete after the bachelor's degree level and provides advanced instruction in protecting computer networks and electronic infrastructures from attacks. Students learn the ethics, practices, policies, and procedures of cybersecurity as they study how to tackle network security defense techniques and countermeasures. Cybersecurity professionals can also earn certifications to boost their skills while working full-time to gain hands-on experience. Last but not the least, we need to pass a security clearance test. Now, security clearances are necessary for those who wish to work with classified information, for example, in a military government agency. A variety of agencies issue both personal and facility security clearances, but most are issued by the Department of Defense. Each type of clearance has its own procedures and paperwork, and the process, which takes three months to a year, does not begin until an employer decides to hire you, at which point you receive a conditional offer of employment. The first step is to submit clearance documentation, followed by a background investigation. Now let's discuss the various career paths that are actually available in cybersecurity. New cyber threats appear constantly and creating new and innovative career opportunities. And because any individual or organization is a potential target for cyber attacks, from governments to banks to hospitals, cybersecurity professionals can find employment in a wide range of industries. Some of the most common career paths in this field include people like the Chief Information Security Officer, also known as the CISO, who is typically a mid-executive level position whose job is to oversee the general operations of a company or organization's IT security division. CISOs are directly responsible for planning, coordinating, and directing all computer network and data security needs of the employers. 
CISOs work directly with upper management level to determine an organization's unique cybersecurity needs. They are commonly tasked with assembling an effective staff of security professionals, which means that the position requires an individual with strong background in IT security architecture and strategy, as well as solid communication and personal management skills. Talking about the educational requirements, CISO positions normally require, at minimum, a bachelor's degree in cyber or information security, information technology, or other computer science related subjects. Additionally, most mid size or large organizations prefer their CISOs with a master's degree in one of the above described subject or an MBA in a related subject such as information technology or database administration. Next up on our list of career paths is forensic computer analyst. The forensic computer analyst is a detective of the cybersecurity world. Forensic computer analysts review computers based information for evidence following a security breach or other incident. Tasks include handling hard drives and other storage devices and employing specialized software programs in order to identify vulnerabilities and recover data from damaged or destroyed devices. Forensic computer analysts must be sensitive to the security concerns of their employers or clients and follow closely all privacy procedures when dealing with financial and personal information. They must also keep detailed and accurate logs and records of their finding, which are often used in litigation purposes. Now on the point of education requirements, Employment as a forensic computer analyst normally requires holding a bachelor's degree in computer security, forensic computing, or related subject. Previous experience may also be necessary depending on the company that you are looking to be employed in. Next up, we have information security analyst. An information security analyst is responsible for the protection of an organization's computer system and networks. They plan and execute programs and other measures including installing and using of software for data encryption and firewalls. Additionally, ISAs help design and execute plans and methods for the recovery of data and systems following a cyber attack. ISAs must continuously stay on top of the latest industry trends and cyber threats, which involves researching new security technologies and networking with other professionals. On the topic of educational requirements, ISAs need to earn a bachelor's degree in computer science or related area. There is a growing trend towards undergraduate degree programs specializing in the information security field which may become the preferred choice of employers in the future. Now employers, particularly large corporations or organizations may prefer job candidates with an MBA in information systems. Next up, we have a penetration tester field. Now penetration testing concerns the proactive authorized employment of testing techniques on IT infrastructures to identify system vulnerabilities. Simply put, that means Penetration testers are given the permission to hack into a computer and network system to preemptively discover operating system vulnerabilities, services and applications with problems in them, or improper configurations and more. And this is done before outsider intruders have the opportunity to cause some real damage. Penetration testers must be highly creative in their methods, often using testing tools of their own design to break into the system under scrutiny. Penetration testers are required to keep careful records of their activities and discovered vulnerabilities. On the topic of education requirements, penetration testers typically earn a bachelor's degree in information technology or cybersecurity or other closely related subjects. Many employers additionally require applicants to have earned relevant professional certifications too. Last but not least, we have the position of a security architect. A security architect is responsible for establishing and maintaining network security for his or her organization. Security architects work in all sectors of the economy for companies, government agencies, and nonprofit organizations. They may be employees of companies or independent contractors too. And in addition to working on specific security systems, security architects develop and implement organization security policies and procedures for employees and others with access to computers, networks, and data systems to follow. Now, security architects are responsible for the hands on repair of issues raised in the problem as well as an analysis of breaches following security incidents. They typically work in an office environment on a full-time basis. On the topic of the education required, a job as a security architect normally requires a bachelor's degree in information security, information technology, or computer science. Some previous work experience is often required in addition to an undergraduate degree too. Okay, so now that we've discussed the various career paths that are available in the cybersecurity domain, let's discuss the salaries that go with them. Okay, so the explosion in the demand for skilled cybersecurity professionals combined with the scarcity in talent has resulted in high wages and excellent benefits for qualified applicants. So as you can see on the screen, I have listed out the national median salary 
is available for some of the most in-demand cybersecurity careers. So for example, a CISO or a Chief Information Security Officer earns around $143,000 a year, while a Security Director or a Computing Networking or IT Director earns around $120,000 a year. And this keeps going down to IT security consultants who earn around $80,000 a year. Okay, so now that we know the salaries that come along with cybersecurity jobs, let's look at the skills that are actually required for having a cybersecurity profession. So there are a number of core skills needed by anyone entering the cybersecurity employment market, whether starting his or her first professional job or transitioning from another computer-related field. Here are a few of the key required skills. So firstly, we need communication skills. Cybersecurity professionals must have strong written and verbal communication skills as a job in the field requires them to communicate clearly and concisely with clients and executives as to what the problem is and how they are trying to tackle it. Next up, they must be able to work in a team environment as it is a very important skill for almost any profession. Without a team member having a clear understanding of their responsibilities and how they integrate into the whole team, no job is actually possible. Next up, we also need some integrity and discretion. By its very nature, working in the cybersecurity field requires sensitivity to an organization's security vulnerability issues and to be able to tackle those issues in a way that engenders trust. Above that, a person pursuing a cybersecurity career must have some organizational and problem-solving skills as one of the most important characteristics of the cybersecurity business is the sheer mass and complexity of data involved. A cybersecurity professional must develop solid organizational and problem-solving skills or must risk being overwhelmed by his job. Next up, he must also have some programming skills as a variety of scripts and programming tools are often required to design effective cybersecurity programs. Then he must also have a good understanding of security principles such as the CIA triad like confidentiality, authentication, privacy, access controls, and many other such concepts. Next, he must be excellent at risk analysis as cybersecurity personals must be able to assess a client's particular security needs in light of its organizational goals which require knowledge of risk analysis principles. Above that, network protocols must be at the tip of the tongues of cybersecurity professionals as that is always what they're dealing with. Also, they must be able to actually identify malicious code from actually good code and how they are propagated and the risk associated with it. And last but not the least, they also need to have a good information on intruder techniques. As analyzing attacks, personnel should be able to recognize known intruder techniques and the characteristics and effects and identify new intruder techniques by means of elimination of the known ones. Okay, so now that we know the skills that you may require to become a cybersecurity professional, let's look into the tools and technologies that you might be handling on a daily basis. So the most effective tools employed by cybersecurity experts are software programs designed to protect against hackers, viruses, and the like. Here are some of the most pressing areas of cybersecurity technology focused on today. So the first is access management. Third-party identity and access tools are used to provide additional protection for security gap from Microsoft's Active Directory. Next, we also have botnet protection, which defends against botnets that would otherwise require individual identification and deletion. And now since a lot of the information is moving to the cloud, we also need some cloud-based security. And there are a variety of cloud-based SOS security tools available for network protection. Data encryption tools are also used to provide added security for data as it's being transferred, and data leak prevention tools also ensure system information is secure from intruder access and stores information in secure form in the event of a security breach. Nowadays, we also have endpoint protection tools which address security issues for endpoints such as PCs, mobile devices, network-connected printers, servers, and many such other peripheral devices. We also have intrusion protection tools which prevent attacks from viruses and malwares designed to harm both software and hardware. Next up, we also have next generation firewalls. When compared to traditional firewalls, provide additional capabilities like integrated intrusion protection, stateful inspection, and application and identity awareness. Last but not the least, we also have some wireless security which provides WEP or WAP security for data transmitted over wireless connections. Okay, so now it's time we see the future prospects of cybersecurity careers and their estimated annual pay. Now, according to Cisco Systems, there is a distinct shortage of cybersecurity professionals, particularly with those data science skills. As a result of this scarcity, many computer science workers, particularly those current in the IT field, are eyeing employment in cybersecurity. Indeed, as job growth goes, it's hard to find a profession that outpaces cybersecurity. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, 
For example, job growth from 2012 to 2022 for information security analysts is projected to be a nice 37% compared with 18% for all computer occupations and 11% for occupations as a whole. So why is job growth in cybersecurity expected to be so robust? Well, cybercrime continues to be a significant and growing problem both in the United States and around the world. And for example, a record 79% of respondents to a recent PricewaterhouseCoopers study reported that they had detected some sort of cybersecurity incident within the last 12 months. Now, as the demand for cybersecurity experts grow, as does the variety of cybersecurity job titles. So here are a few examples of closely related careers along with their estimated total annual pay. So first of all, we have a computer and information research scientist. And to become one, you need a doctorate in computer science or any bachelor's may be sufficient for some government positions. They normally have a salary of around $102,000 and have a 15% growth every year. Next, we have computer and information system engineers. And to become one, you need a bachelor's in computer science or IT or related fields. And in some cases, you also need an MBA. They also have a handsome salary of $120,000 a year and a 15% growth above that too. There are also computer hardware engineers and you don't really need much education to become one. A simple bachelor's degree in computer science engineering is enough and you'll have a salary of around $100,000 a year and a growth of 7%. Next up, we have computer network architects, computer network support specialists and computer programmers. And most of them require a bachelor's degree in computer science, information system, engineering related fields, or other communication related fields. Sometimes companies might even ask for an MBA degree according to their preferences. Also, they have some handsome salaries like a computer network architect makes around $91,000 a year, a computer programmer makes around $75,000 a year, while a computer network support specialist makes around $60,000 a year. So let's talk about the basics of cybersecurity first. So security is more important to computing and the internet than ever before. And the following well-respected security certifications will not only help you stand out from the crowd, but also make you more valuable member of the IT security community. Cybersecurity skills fall into different categories, such as secure coding, vulnerability and penetration testing, breach detection, attack mitigation, and so on. Now, cybersecurity certifications come in all shapes and subjects from forensics to intrusion to ethical hacking. They are typically administered by independent accrediting organizations like CompTIA, EC Council, GIAC, ISACA, and ISC Square. Making a career in IT security requires both experience and certification. Cybersecurity certification qualifications are becoming a norm in many job descriptions today and organizations seek quantifiable ways of measuring prospective employee expertise. Also, DOD directive says that for certain levels of positions in security department, you should have one or more of these certifications to prove that you have knowledge and competency that are required within a position. Basically, DOD directives provide guidance for training of government employees who conduct information assurance functions in their position which is why I'm going to discuss some of the best and popular certifications throughout the variety of industry. Accrediting organizations often divide their programs into three categories, entry level, intermediate, and expert level. Entry level certifications are meant to ground you in the basics, foundation principles, best practices, important tools, and latest technologies. Intermediate and expert level certification presume that you have extensive job experience and a detailed grasp of the subject matter. When it comes to getting the best cybersecurity certifications, the variety of options baffle the purchasers while selecting. Hence, to make a perfect decision, it is better to focus on the knowledge and experience that it comes with. Here is a list of top-notch certifications being categorized as entry, intermediate, and advanced. As you can see in the entry level, there is MTA Networking Certificate, the very popular CCNA from Cisco, CompTIA Security Plus, and GSEC. So these are some really good certifications for beginners. Then in the intermediate level, there is a really good certification from ISACA like SSSP. From the EC Council, there is the CEH certificate. And then there is also the OSCP and ESCP certificates. For the advanced or expert level, there are CISA, CISM, and CISSP. The list here is not even exhaustive. I have just tried to include some really good certifications here. So you all can actually go check out and Google all the certifications that are available. 
Now let's unveil each of these. Since exam fees and renewal period can change, I haven't included it in the presentation, but I would recommend you check each certification website for the most up-to-date information. When it comes to entry-level training, you might start by considering certifications such as CompTIA Security Plus. We have our first certificate, GSEC, which stands for GIAC Security Essentials Certification, and SSCP, which stands for System Security Certified Practitioner. So CompTIA Plus is an ideal industry-level certification. Our recommended experience for this certification is two years as an IT admin with a security focus. You will then need to pass 90 question exam with a score of 750 or better out of 900. The Security Plus certification is also among the least expensive in this list, but CompTIA Security Plus is valid for three years. You must earn 50 continuing education units, which is also called CEU, within three years to maintain your certification. CompTIA Security Plus is one of DOD's approved baseline for level 2 IAT security technician. However, many consider it to be basic and lacking product-specific knowledge. Therefore, it may be undervalued by some employers. Despite these shortcomings, CompTIA Security Plus is one of the best ways to begin your security career. All right, now let me tell you all about the domains that CompTIA Security Plus certification covers. So the certification covers most domains like network security, access control, identity management, cryptographic concepts, application data, host security, compliance, and operational and threats and vulnerabilities. While taking your exam, you can expect the questions from all such domains. Next on our list is GSEC, which stands for GIAC Security Essentials Certification. The Global Information Assurance Certification Security Essentials is another good to go entry level InfoSec certification that is DOD approved for level two IAT security technicians. Candidates are secured to demonstrate an understanding of information security beyond simple terminology and concepts. The GSEC exam is a 5R 180 questions open book exam. The exam is proctored and candidates pass with a grade of 74% or better. Although the exam is open book, the GSEC exam tests the candidate's understanding and problem solving skills with scenario based questions. You need to really know your stuff to actually pass this thing. The GSEC is valid for four years and can be renewed with 36 continuing profession experience points. It's important to note that this certification is called security essentials. It actually also implies networking essentials. I recommend that you brush up on materials from CCNA, CompTIA Network Plus, and IPv4 subnetting. The domain of GSEC includes the following cryptography, web communication security, active defense, contingency plans, critical controls, IT risk management, access control and password management, window network security, networking, and its protocols. Next on our list of certifications, we have SSCP. The SSCP certification from ISC Square is a good intermediate level security certification. You are required to have a minimum of one year of experience in one of seven designated security areas. Then you must pass a 3R 125 question multiple choice exam with a score of 70% or better. You also must certify every three years by earning 60 continuing professional education points. SSCP is seen as a relatively easy vendor neutral badge to obtain. The certification is one of the US Department of Defense approved baseline certification for both level one and level two information assurance technical certifications. Now let's discuss the domains it covers. The content of SSCB has been refreshed to reflect the most pertinent issues that information security practitioners currently face along with the best practices for mitigating those issues. Some topics have been updated while others have been realigned. The result is an exam that most accurately reflects the hands-on technical IT skills and practical security knowledge required by practitioners to support an organization's mission and operations. Following are the domains of the certifications. Access control, security operation and administration, risk identification, monitoring and analysis, incident response and recovery, cryptography, networking and communication security, systems and application security. So next on our list of certifications, we have CEH. The Certified Ethical Hacker is an intermediate level certification focused on the prevention of most common attacks and securing systems and networks. CEH is designed to ensure a strong understanding of hacking practices, including footprinting, reconnaissance, scanning networks, SQL injections, worms and viruses, DOS attacks, social engineering, and honeypots. 
C at certification requires successfully completion of a 4-hour 125 question multiple choice cybersecurity examination with a minimum of 70% score. With the increasing number and awareness of cyber attacks, the certified ethical hacker resonates with many employers. However, there is some debate about the value of the certification. In terms of difficulty, the EC Council maintains a tight control over entry to the certification exam. In order to be eligible to attempt the CEH exam, it requires that candidates attend an EC Council official training program or provide employer verified proof of at least two years of information security experience. The CEH exam is further categorized as core, advanced, and expert. However, the general domains include information systems and networking, security controls, recognitions fundamentals, network attacks, system and device attacks, regulations and policies and ethics. So next on our list of certifications again is CISA. The Certified Information System Auditor or CISA is ICACA's validation for audit control, assurance and security. The main responsibility for a CISA is to assess vulnerabilities, report on compliance and institute controls within an enterprise system. This world-renowned certification will certainly set you apart from the competition and allow you to work anywhere you want. While anyone can take the CISA exam, getting certified has the following requirements. So firstly, you need a year of experience in information systems or any qualifying educational degree. Next, you need to have an adherence to the Code of Professional Ethics and also an adherence to the Continuing Professional Education Program and compliance with the Information Systems Auditing Standards. The domains of CISA include the following acquisition, development, implementation, operations, maintenance, and auditing. Next on our list of certifications, we have CISM. The Certified Information Security Manager or CISM is truly a management focused certification. This is an ideal certification for seasoned IT managers, security managers, and CSOs. The CISM validates a vast range of cybersecurity skills and recognizes managers who promote these international security practices. If you are interested in IT security management, the CISM provides a multitude of opportunities. While anyone can take the exam, maintaining the certifications require 20 hours of continuing education every year and compliance with ICACA's Code of Professional Ethics. The CISM exam objectives include access control, identity management, security management, policies and procedures, intrusion prevention, network security, physical security, security tools, and security trends. In the CISM certification exam, you can get questions from the following domains. Information security governance, information risk management, information security program development, information security program management, and incident management and response. Next, we have the CRISC certification. Another ISACA certification, which is the CRISC, helps professionals develop a better understanding of how IT risk relates to the overall organization. By earning the certification, you'll develop the skills required to understand and manage corporate risk and implement the right security controls. CRISC is a program often endorsed as a necessity for C-suit executives as well as chief compliance, risk, and privacy officers. The exam will focus on four areas of risk identification, assessment, response, and monitoring and reporting, and requires a minimum of three years of relevant experience to apply. The domains in the certifications majorly cover the IT risk identification, IT risk management, control monitoring, reporting risk response, and mitigation. Next on our list, we have CISSP, the Certified Information System Security Professional, also known as CISSP, from ISC Square, is arguably the current gold standard of InfoSec certifications. It's an advanced level certification for IT security professionals and is recognized and valued by both industry and government employers worldwide. Like CASP, CISSP is approved as a DOD baseline for level three IAT security technicians. That's where the comparisons end. CISSP certification is designed for security professionals who develop information security policies and procedures. This is the most advanced certification we've discussed so far. And for many candidates, it may require up to a year to prepare for the exam. The certification exam is a 6 hour 250 question monster. And in order to take the exam, you must prove that you have worked at least five years as a security professional and you must subscribe to the ISC Square Code of Ethics. Once you are a CISSP certified practitioner, you must recertify every three years through at least 120 hours of continuing professional education. 
and you must pay a yearly fee of $85 to maintain your certification too. CISSP basically makes you a cybercrime investigator. It's intensive but well worth it. Now let's see the domains of CISSP. So you will be challenged in a number of cybersecurity domains including security management practices, access control, cryptography, security models and architecture, telecommunication and networking. Now you must be wondering there are so many certifications so how should I decide which is the best certification for me? Choosing the right certification is a bit of a challenge. So you need to introspect a bit and ask yourself three questions. The first question is what experience do I have? Because of your experience you can opt for entry level or the intermediate level or the expert level. While doing so don't forget to do a ground level research of the certification exam you are willing to take and also the certification authorities. The next question that comes is what are your goals? Are you looking to get into the technical aspect of security such as penetration testing or incident response or are you interested in advancing your career into the management side of security? Choosing the right entry level certification can be a bit tricky because on one hand there are certifications related to things that interest you but you have zero experience with. In this case how does one obtain the experience? One simple word volunteer. Volunteer your service in exchange for mentoring from an experienced professional. Another option is to seek out online communities and associations of professionals. Join these organizations and participate with them to gain experience needed. The third question is what positions are available? The practical side of selecting security certifications come from human resources. What positions are employers seeking to fill? Or more specifically, what positions are they seeking to fill in my geographical area? It is a good idea to do your homework to answer these questions. Take a look at the many job posting sites such as Monster. Search for openings using various certificate acronyms. Let's see a few of the top programming languages to consider while learning cybersecurity. Starting off with C and C++. We all know C is one of the oldest programming language out there and was developed in early 90s. It was mainly used to develop software like operating systems, database, compilers and many more. It is an excellent language to learn for programming for beginners. Moreover, after learning C, it must be very easy to learn programming language like Java and Python. Speaking about C++, it is a general purpose programming language which is actually an extension of C programming. And the main use of C++ is to develop operating systems, browsers, games and many more. So why should I use C and C++ for cybersecurity? Well, you see, both are low level programming language that you need to know as a cybersecurity professional. This is because these languages have low level access to hardware such as RAM and system processing which are easily exploited by hackers if not protected. So why are C and C++ useful in cybersecurity? C and C++ are useful for reverse engineering and finding the vulnerabilities. And on top of that, a lot of malware is written in C++. This learning C++ is more important for reading and understanding open source code. Many cybersecurity programs such as Nmap, the network mapper tool are created using C++. Next we have Python. We all know Python is a general purpose object oriented high level programming language and is one of the most popular and widely used coding language due to its versatility. It includes high level data structures, dynamic binding, dynamic typing and other features making it ideal programming language for complex application development. Python is suitable for general purpose tasks like data managing and big data facilities. It is a high level scripting language that is easier to learn than other low level languages. Python is a useful programming language for cybersecurity professionals because we can perform variety of cybersecurity functions like Marvel analysis, penetration testing and scanning. Apart from that, Python enables cybersecurity managers who lead the team to implement projects quickly. As Python has extensive set of libraries which means that cybersecurity tools are already available. And finally, we all know Python can be used for accomplishing multiple tasks such as host discovery, accessing servers, port scanning and network scanning. This helps cybersecurity professionals to keep up with the task. Moving ahead we have JavaScript. JavaScript is one of the most popular and widespread programming language. It is one of the top rated programming language for web development. Moreover, the growth of frameworks such as jQuery, Angular and ReactJS has made JavaScript even more powerful. It helps programmers to build front-end as well as back-end software using different JavaScript based framework like jQuery and Node.js. However, JavaScript comes with variety of frameworks and libraries 
and its usage has now extended to mobile application development, desktop app development, and game development. It is one of the best cyber security programming language you can learn. If you are proficient in JavaScript, you can make sure that website is secure enough to reduce or even eliminate web-based attack. What I'm trying to say here is that JavaScript enables you to design secure websites and user interface. This is achieved by mitigating possible cross-site scripting attempts in web forms and minimizing other technical risks. JavaScript also allows you to work with cookies, manipulating event handlers, and even perform cross-site scripting. Next in our plate, we have PHP. PHP is a server-side programming language that is used to develop websites. PHP powers 80% of the top 10 million websites, thus making it most dominant server-side language on web. Thus, knowledge of PHP will enable you to know how to defend against intruders. One of the most common hacking techniques using PHP is DOS, which stands for Denial of Service Attack. Such attacks usually attempt to make web applications unavailable to users by shutting down the websites. How can make use of PHP to delete all the data on your website if you are not careful about how you built it? This learning PHP programming language can help you identify and solve vulnerabilities in the PHP code. Moving ahead, we have SQL. SQL is a domain-specific language used in programming. It manages the data stored in database. With organizations getting more data-driven, SQL is most sought-out programming language for managing databases. You see, SQL enables you to access records or data with just one single command. Thus, by using SQL queries, the user will not have to specify the data that should be retrieved. Nowadays, most hackers try to exploit database with the intention of stealing or modifying it. Whenever you attempt to log into a website, a password stored in the database is bought up and compared with what you have typed. While you cannot see it, hackers take advantage of this by using SQL injection to extract sensitive data from organization and individuals. It can result in loss of critical information such as password, bank account information, social security numbers, and many more. Therefore, learning SQL can help you make database more secure. I'm sure you might be wondering how, right? Well, an understanding of SQL, its users, and how SQL injection attacks enables you to manipulate website can be beneficial to security professionals. Since SQL injection is one of the top threats to web application security, security defenders will generally be helpful by mastery of SQL. To wrap things up, some researchers claim that there is one language that is more or less secure than other. The truth is that there is no one best programming language. It all depends upon what you are trying to achieve with it. Any programming language can be ideal as long as you create a perfect cybersecurity strategy. Now let's move ahead and see some of the projects to work with for getting hands-on experience on cybersecurity concepts and principles. Start by working on Keylogger. You see Keylogger, which is a shorthand term version of Keystroke Logger. So what this software does is it has the ability to record every keystroke made by anyone on that system. This would be useful by hackers to get private information like net banking credentials, account user ID and password and many more. This concept of cybersecurity could be a great topic to do a project on. You see, if you are a programmer or someone who is good at coding, you can develop your own keylogger and capture keystroke on your system. Another project could be developing a keylogger or find a way for a keylogger to capture stroke on a virtual keyboard as well. Keyloggers over the years have become more sophisticated. This is making it hard for AVs to detect them. So as a project, you can do a research on different ways to spot and detect keylogger from a system by reverse engineering it. Next on our list, we have Break a Caesar Cipher. If you don't know what Caesar Cipher is, it is a type of encryption method that was first used by Julius Caesar to communicate with his officials. This encryption technique is also considered to be one of the first method which is still ineffective. The concept of Caesar Cipher is pretty simple. A letter of a given text is replaced by another letter that comes after a number of other alphabets. As a project, using a logic behind Caesar Cipher, you can build a small web app that can break Caesar Ciphers. This would be a great project as a beginner, as someone who is just getting started with cybersecurity. This kind of project would give you confidence to make up to a bigger and more advanced project. Moving ahead to our next project, that is packet sniffing. Packet sniffing is one of the most important concepts of cybersecurity. When you are in a get to go of your cybersecurity journey and want to do a project around the concept you learned, packet sniffing can be a great choice. You see, if you are learning cybersecurity in a training center, they would definitely allow you to perform this task as your project. But if you are using network of an organization and institute, 
then it is advised to take a prior permission of the administrator. Packet sniffing, which is also known as network traffic analysis, is all about taking a look at data packets that are sent across the internet and moves on your network. There are several tools available that captures packets such as TCP dump, wind dump, and many more. Finally, on our next project, we have SQL vulnerability assessment. SQL injection is one of the most initial and important topics in cybersecurity. Over the years, many websites have been hacked using SQL injection. As mentioned earlier, it is a type of injection attacks that is possible for hackers to execute malicious SQL statement. Therefore, project on this concept would add significant value to your portfolio. Now moving ahead in our session, let's see how we can encrypt and decrypt our message using cryptography. Before we do that, let's see what is cryptography. Well, cryptography is associated with the process of converting ordinary plain text into encoded text. It is a method of storing and transmitting data in a particular form so that only those who are authorized to see it can proceed with it. Cryptography not only protects data from thefts and alteration, but also it can be used as an authentication. Before we move on and build our cryptography system, let me give you a brief overlook. So to give you a better understanding of what is cryptography, right? So let's go something like we have two people over here. Let's say A and B. Now A and B are trying to have a conversation. Sometimes what happens is when we are on a web, there'll be a third party as an intruder over here. When A and B are trying to connect, we obviously have an intruder. We have this kind of intruders only when we are trying to have a conversation over unsecured network. Okay, so now what happens is you, these people have access to public Wi-Fi and there is an intruder over here. So whatever conversation that these people are having, right, it's going through them. Okay, it's going through this intruder over here. So now what these guys do is they know that they are in a public network. So they come up with a solution. Okay, so if A is trying to send a message something like hello, he will try to encrypt this. Okay, he'll try to encrypt this, say something like hello will be converted into O L L E H and he'll send this as a package to B. And now as A knows B, right? So he will inform to B as he receives this package, which would be O L L E H. He will tell whatever message you're receiving from my end, try to just reverse it. So now B gets the actual message, right? But now what happens with I, who's our intruder over here? Intruder will get the message O L L E H. But now intruder is stunned. He doesn't know what this information means. And as I'm not providing any kind of clue or a key, so intruder will not have any access or any information to get out of this. So now what we are going to do is we are trying to create a system where there would be two servers. So we'll be using Python network programming. Although it's not necessary for you to know Python network programming to generate a cipher text. Okay. So this is just to give you the feel of sending a message from one server to the other. And what we'll do is we'll also have another intruder over here. Okay. This person over here, the server A over here, it'll encode the message and send the encoded message to both intruder as well as our server B. Okay. Now at server B, what will happen is he will get the message. Okay. Which is encoded message and he won't have any access to this information. Whereas for B, we'll be providing a key over here. And using the key, he will try to decipher the text. All right. So let us now quickly move to my code editor and see how we can implement this. So as you can see, I have come here to my ID. That's I'm using PyCharm here, and I've already created three files. So server one, hacker one, and client one. So server one here refers to the A part. A hacker is nothing but the intruder, and client one is going to be our receiver end, right? So what we're going to do initially is we are going to have the server one. Okay, before we move ahead, right? I'll just give you an example of what we're going to do. So we'll have like message here. So you're supposed to pass in your message. So we'll give here input. Okay, and we'll give a small message and like, please enter your message. Okay, so now what we're going to do is whatever message we get, it will be stored here in MSG, right? So now we're supposed to design our own encryption algorithm. So what are you going to do for that? We'll give something like ENC. But before that, what we'll do is let me just give an example what we're going to do. So let's take like four alphabets. Okay, so we have A, B, C, and D, right? So now our encryption algorithm would be something like wherever we have A, right? It would become D. If you have B, it would be C. If you have C, it's going to be B. And if you have D, it's going to be A. So basically, what I'm trying to say here is if this is a string, okay, 
our encryption algorithm would be the reverse of that. Okay, so our encrypted message would have the reverse of that equivalent values. So we'll define our key here. So key is gonna be is gonna be A B C D E F G H I J K L M N O P Q R S T U V W X Y Z. And we'll also have to mention some numbers, right? So it would be from zero to nine. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then we'll give a space with an exclamatory mark. Okay, this is just to increase the complexity of our code. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we'll create a dictionary. Okay, okay, so now we're going to create a dictionary, right? So we'll have something like encrypted message. So E underscore MSG, right? So let this be an encrypted message. This would be equal to dictionary. Okay. So here what we're going to pass is this thing, right? So like in place, if it's a, it's going to be replaced by exclamatory mark. So what we're going to do is we'll obviously have to reverse it. So we'll have val, which would be nothing but reverse of this. So how do I put a reverse of that? It's going to buy string slicing. So key and minus one. So this would give us the reverse value of this key. Now what I'm trying to achieve here is whenever I have alphabet A, it has to be replaced by exclamatory mark. Whenever it is B, it will be a space. So now what we'll do is we'll have a dictionary, then we'll have a zip because we are creating a dictionary, right? Key value pair, and then we'll give key and then value. Sounds good, right? Okay, so what we have done over here is we have created our dictionary. So let me quickly print this dictionary and show you how it would look like. So print. Okay, so let me quickly run this here. So we'll enter our message. Okay, but we have not getting the encrypted message, but we have something printed here, right? So what this is telling is this is nothing but the dictionary. So here a will be replaced by exclamatory mark B over here would be replaced by space and C by nine. So now let's encrypt our message. I'm pretty sure this sounds pretty interesting. So to encrypt our message, we'll have encrypted message ENC message. This would be nothing but dot join. Okay, so this is because we'll be just doing the list comprehension, right? So it will be join. And now what we'll do is we'll take this dictionary here, E underscore message, and then we are going to pass letters or words, you can say. Now, where am I going to get these words from? So it's going to be from a for loop for words in our message, right? So it's going to be this. Okay, so after performing this, right, we'll have our encrypted message. So if you don't believe me, let me quickly walk you through this. So let me print this print encrypted message ENC underscore message. And let me comment this out. We don't want to print our encryption key over here. So let me quickly run this. Let's give a message something like hi. It's a beautiful day. So anyone can read this out right now. Let's see what happens if I encrypt this. Okay, so as you can see here, we are getting an error right so the reason why we are getting an error is because we have an uppercase and we haven't defined any uppercase values here so in order to fix this all we need to do is use dot lower okay so over here we have message dot lower okay so let me quickly run this again so let me give the same message it's a beautiful day just to prove you that you know this thing works i have the combination of uppercase and lower cases here and let me so as you can see we are getting this message in an encrypted form right so wherever we have space it's going to be replaced by exclamatory mark and this is something which is not readable by anyone okay so similarly in order to decrypt this it's similar process so let me quickly show you that as well so for decrypting obviously we need the key part so this is the important thing so how decryption works is something like we have decryptor okay so let's give it as decryptor we are going to create something similar to this okay a dictionary Okay, so this is our decryptor and this is going to be dictionary. And then we are going to have zip over here. Instead of passing key and value here, we're going to just reverse it. So it's going to be value over here and key over here. Okay, so this is done. So similar to encryption, decryption performs the same way. So I'll just copy this here and paste it over here. So instead of encrypt message, we'll give here DEC decrypt message. So same thing over here decrypt message and it's going to be same way here instead of message dot lower what's going to happen is we'll have to pass this value so let me quickly run this and show you what it would look like 
So let's say something like we are passing our card details. Okay. So usually card details, it would be like, you know, nine letters or so. So we'll be like one, two, three, and then we have space four, five, six, and then some number. And then we'll also usually pass our name and all right. So it's going to be like, let it be like Edureka. Okay. So, and the CVV, CVV is usually three digits, right? So it's three, eight, seven. So now this number is very crucial as well as the first name, as well as the CVV, because anyone can hack it and try to misuse your account. So now let's see how our encryption and decryption work at the same time. So as you can see here, when I try to encrypt it, so it's in a form of, you know, some numbers which we cannot even comprehend to, you know, to get an output off. So this is how this thing works. And but finally, when I try to decrypt it or when a person has the right key, he can get the same and correct information. So you can check here. So it's one, two, three, four, three, four, five, five, six, seven, eight, eight, and so on and so forth. In order to make this Caesar cipher or encryption algorithm more powerful, what I would do is I would give one more encryption key or encryption algorithm, thus making it more secure. Now what we'll do is we'll try to create a server. Okay. So now what we're going to do is I'll create three parties here. One would be the authentic sender and receiver and third party would be an intruder who's trying to spy on these people's network. Okay. So let's see how we can implement that. So first off, let me create our sender here. For in order to send this over the server, we will have to import socket. Okay, so import socket. Okay, and then we have something like we need to get the message, right? So we'll give you a message MSG or let's give a full form M E S S A G E. And we have to ask the end user to give the input. So input, please enter your message. Okay, so now once this is done. We want this thing, this message to be passed through a server, right? So we'll have to create an instance of a socket. So S is equal to socket dot socket. And then within this, we have some variables like socket dot AF underscore in it. And then we also have socket dot socket stream. So it's going to be SOC stream. Perfect. Fine. So now we have to bind it. So You'll take the instance of this, so it's going to be s dot bind. Within this, we are going to pass a tuple. So it, this will have socket dot get host name, okay? And then we have to provide a port number. So it's going to be three, any number. It, it's up to you, okay? So this is done. So we'll have another method over here called as listen, and we'll give instance over here as five. Now we'll have a while loop, while true. So this is the infinite while loop. So we have something called as s dot accept, right? So this would return us two things address of our port and as well as the object that we need to send, right? So it's going to be like s dot accept. Okay. And now this would return us two things. That's nothing but an object using which we can send a message and the address. Fine. This is perfectly done. And now what we are going to do is we have to send a message, isn't it? So in order to send a message, we'll have something like CLT dot send. Okay. And here is going to be our message. So message, this should remain the same. So we'll not change. But before this, what we'll do is we'll try to encrypt our message. Okay. So in order to encrypt our message, as I mentioned, we have to define our key here. So key is going to be And then we are going to have numbers space with exclamatory mark. So in order to make it more complicated, we can also add some special characters like hash, whatever it is, it's totally up to you. And now we also have to have a value, right? So this would be like VAL and this would be just the reverse of our key. So key will use slicing operation here and this would be done. Now in order to encrypt our message, all we need to do is we need to just exchange these values, right? So we'll have message. Okay. And so for this, I'm going to just use this dot join. And then we'll use list comprehension. So this is going to be like dictionary name, right? So what's our dictionary name? So we obviously have to give a dictionary name. So let's give the dictionary name as encryptor. So encryptor over here would be equal to the dictionary, right? So dictionary and we are supposed to have a zip. The zip will have arguments like key, which would be the keys and values over here. Perfect. And now we have to pass an encryptor here. 
and we need to pass the key values which would nothing be letters or we can give it as words so how do i get these words as i mentioned it's from for loop for words in message so this is the message right so this is the input message okay dot lower perfect so this is done so now what we're going to do is we'll save this before we run what we'll do is we'll create our receiver and also an hacker so the code for the receiver and hacker would almost be same just few differences so let me quickly go back to my page okay we need something for the receiver end right so we'll have import socket something similar to what we did before and then we have something like okay give the encryption key okay so we'll try to perform two layers of security here what we'll do is if the person gives the correct encryption key size only then he will be prompted for next step to give the encryption key right so we'll have two layers of security so first off we'll have encryption key right e n c or we can give it as decryption right d e c key okay so first layer what we're going to do is if decryption key dot length or it's going to be here if it is equal to number of alphabets okay that's going to be 26 right so we have 26 alphabets so apart from 26 we also have numbers right so we have how many numbers did we have let me quickly show you that so here we have 26 alphabets then we have numbers that is 10 that is from 1 to 0 and then we have three special characters with a space so it's going to be 26 plus 10 that is going to be 36 37 38 39 and 40 so it's going to be 40 right so so this is going to be 40 i hope you understand why we got 40 right so if the length is same only then you go on okay so now we i need a decryption key fine okay so now if the length is same that says receive a message okay so it's going to be like socket we need to create an object of a socket so before that we need to import it so yeah we have imported our socket over here so let's create an instance of a socket s is equal to socket dot socket and then we'll pass some arguments so it's going to be socket dot if then we have socket dot socket stream okay and similar to earlier we have connect method here as well as dot connect wherein we're going to pass the tuple so it's going to be socket dot get host name and mind it we're going to fill this port number later the port number should be same as what we had before okay so we'll just give a random something like this here as of now and we'll change it later so whatever message you have received it's going to be like message whatever message you receive is s, s dot receive and then we are going to pass number of bytes so you can just give any random value so i'll give here as thousand it's totally up to you and then as the message is decrypted you have to obviously decode our message right so it's going to be message this will be message dot decode and obviously it's going to be utf8 okay so now we have the message let's try to put our decryption algorithm here so which is pretty simple it's something similar to what we did we need the value right so val is going to be key we need all the values of our decryption key minus one okay so it's going to be decryption key here dec underscore key so now we have the dictionary right so now we have to convert our message back to whatever it was so we'll we'll just give it as message or before that we have to create our dictionary right so we'll give it as decryptor d c r i p t e r so decryptor is nothing but dictionary which is nothing but obviously the values will be here first because we are receiving the values and then the keys so it's going to be decrypt key fine i hope you all understand till here and now finally what we are going to do is convert our message back to what it was so message then then i have join then we are going to just use list comprehension so whatever is the name of our dictionary here decryptor and then we obviously have to pass letters or words and the way we get this words is from for loop for 
words in whatever the message we have received, right? So it's going to be here. Hope you understand this. And now once we have our decrypted message, what we'll do is we'll just print our message. Fine. And now before that, so if this fellow doesn't give the correct key input, so we'll just say here, else print, you're not authorized for this information. So now we have our algorithm ready here. Before that, let's quickly fix this. So let me go back to our server one. Okay, so here, as you can see, we have two changes. We have to copy this part and we obviously have to encrypt our message before sending. Okay, so before this, we have to encrypt this into form of bytes, which will be encrypted in the form of bytes, right? And then we have to message which algorithm I'm using here. So it's going to be UTF hyphen eight. Perfect. So let me quickly jump here. Okay, and let me pass this value here as well because this host name should be same, right? Okay, so let me now quickly run this and show you how it would look like. But before that, let's copy our encryption key. Okay, and then another small change I would do is just give some space, you know, fine. So now let me run this and show you. First, let me run our server one. Okay, yeah, so here let's give something like hi. I am sending you my ID number and we'll give some random number. Let it be like 67, 69, 21 and something like that. Okay. And just give some characters as well. Okay. So let's hit enter. So now it is expecting that, you know, we run our client code. So let me quickly fetch that one now. And yeah, here we have our client. And we'll enter our presentation mode here. Okay, and let me run our client, right? So here I'll click for run and then we'll have client over here. This is asking me to give an encryption key. First, let's do one thing. Let's give some random encryption key. So let's give something like this, some random number that I'm generating over here. And let's have some special characters. So here it says you're not authorized for that information. So let's now run this again and give the correct encryption key, right? So let's run this here. And as I've copied this earlier, so let me just give this part and we should get our message. Hi, I'm sending you my ID and this is so and so forth is my ID. Okay, so now what we'll do is we'll create our hacker over here. So everything remains the same. All the mechanism that we have used for our client receiver, everything remains the same. Only part we won't be having is this option for encryption key it would just be like receiving a message, right? Because hacker will have access to this port number. So let me now quickly move to page empty sheet. And let me copy all of this. And now I'm going to go here. I'm going to go for hacker here. And let me enter our presentation mode. Okay. So let me paste our code over here. Fine. And let me quickly erase a couple of things. Fine. And then None of these would exist, right? So we won't have any of this, but the message exists because we are receiving the message and even the if statement won't be there. Fine. So let me kind of remove this as well. Okay. Let's fix our indentation issue over here. Fine. This is perfect. So now let's run our code. Like if you're wondering why we don't asking the input key and all see, only if a person is authorized to a system, he'll be having all the features of a security system. But if I'm a third party or an hacker, I would have bypassed all of those security systems, right? So only thing that is standing in my way is this port number, which is easily accessible most of the time. It is accessible most of the time when you use this public Wi-Fi, right? So let's now see how this guy would receive a code. Okay, so let's run our code here. And let's go for our hacker. Okay, so let me rerun this. Let's see where we are going wrong. Okay, let's see if our encrypted message is working fine over here. So let me just print my encrypted message. Fine. And let me rerun our server. Okay, so I'll have something like 
hello my bank details are so let me give something that resembles a bank account number okay and let's see if this works okay okay the issue that we are having over here is because we are supposed to encrypt our message before this while true right okay so let me quickly get that fixed so all we are supposed to do is just have this over here cut this part and paste it over here fine i hope this looks fine so let me fix this indentation part okay so let me rerun our server again so let me give some basic simple words here hi and your friend okay so let's see yeah so you can see here it's working now right so let me quickly rerun this and put some value that would resemble real life scenario so let's have something like i am sending you my account details okay fine so now this looks cool so now what we'll do is we'll try to run our code here again once again so we have run server let's see if our message is getting encrypted so my account details some random number that i'm giving here fine okay so it's getting encrypted okay so now let's run this once on our application that is once on our receiver another once on our the hacker okay right so okay so we have our client here so let's see what happens client one and we'll run our client one so it's asking me to give an encryption key let's copy our encryption key here close this and rerun our client fine so it's asking me to give an encryption key it should be something like this and i would hit enter so i'm getting a correct value so let me rerun this once again giving a wrong encryption key Okay, so let me rerun this here and let me give hello. I need info. So it would say you're not authorized for this. Pretty much simple, right? So now we'll do the same for how our hacker would have our message, right? So let's see how this would look like. Okay, so I would run this now. I would run our hacker. So hacker is over here. So hacker would get an encrypted message. I hope you got a brief idea about how to design a cybersecurity system, right? Specifically cryptography. Let's see some of the top cyber attacks in the history. Starting off with Adobe. Adobe was going through hell. Well, you see, Adobe announced on October 2013 a massive attack or massive hacking of its IT infrastructure where personal information of about 22.9 million accounts was stolen, which includes login IDs, passwords, name, credit card numbers, and expiry date. Another file discovered on the internet later, what number of accounts that were affected by this attack was about 150 million. To access this information, hackers took advantage of security breaches at publishers specifically related to security practices and around passwords. The stolen passwords have been encrypted instead of being chopped as per recommendation. Fortunately, this led to banking data not being stolen. This because of high quality encryption by Adobe. The company was attacked not only for its customer information, but also for its product data. Indeed, the most worrying part about Adobe was about 40 GB of source code. For instance, the entire source code of Cold Fusion product was stolen, as well as the part of source code of Adobe Acrobat Reader and Photoshop was also stolen. So the next one is a target. So people usually say as target targeted, right? So Target, this is the second largest US discount retailer chain, which was a victim of large scale cyber attack in December 2013. Data from about 110 million customers was hijacked between 27 November to December 15, including banking data of 40 million customers and personal data, which included names, postal address, telephone numbers, and emails. And it was not the Target who discovered the attack. The American Secret Service who detected abnormal banking movement and warned the brand. According to several US security services, the hacker group was located in Eastern Europe. It had installed malware in the cash registers to read information from credit card terminals. The technique is known as ramscaping. Once the data has been hacked, attacker resold it to the black market. Target was ultimately required to pay over $18 million as a settlement for state investigation into the attack. Moving ahead to the next one, that is Sony. 
So there was a panic at Sony. In April 2011, Sony's PlayStation Network was attacked. The multiplayer gaming service, online games purchasing, and live content distribution of Japanese brand contained the personal data of 77 million users was leaked. Banking information of tens and thousands of players was also compromised. After the intrusion was detected, PlayStation Network as well as Sony Online Entertainment were closed for one month. To appease their users, Sony paid around 15 million US dollars in compensation, plus few million dollars as a legal fees in addition to having to refund people whose banking accounts were illegally used. This cyber attack could have been largely avoided. Indeed, hackers were well known about vulnerability that Sony chose to ignore. Data was unencrypted and could easily be hijacked to a very simple technique that is SQL injection. Moving ahead to our next crisis that is at Equifax. Equifax, an American credit company, revealed that it had suffered a cybersecurity attack over a course of months. Detected in 2017, it contained personal data which had names, date of birth, social security numbers and driver license numbers. It contained information of about 143 million Americans, Canadians and British customers as well as 200,000 credit card numbers. So moving ahead, we have a cyber attack which occurred in South Korea. South Korea learned in January 2014 that data from about 100 million credit cards have been stolen over the course of several years. In addition to that, 20 million bank accounts have been hijacked. For fear of having their bank accounts emptied, more than 200 million South Koreans had their credit card blocked or replaced. Behind the theft was an employee of South Korean Credit Bureau. He stole personal information from customers of credit card companies when he worked for them. For a consultant by simply copying the data to an external hard drive. He then resold the data to credit card traders and telemarketing companies. As you see here, this is a classic example of an insider threat. So the next cyber attack that occurred was with Marriott Hotels. You see, information of about 500 million guests at Marriott Hotel was compromised. Their banking details, date of birth, and many other information will have been swept out. It seems that the account or the hacking was taking place since 2014, but was only spotted during the month of September of 2018. Marriott was first alerted to the potential breach in September. It said that there are internal security tools found someone was trying to access its database. It then found out people seem to have been hacking its database since 2014 and they copied information apparently with the intent of taking it. All right guys, these were some of the top cyber attack that struck the industry. So moving ahead, let's check out some of the challenges that we are facing with respect to cyber security. Starting off with ransomware attack Ransomware attack have become popular in last few years and pose one of the most India's prominent cybersecurity challenge in 2020. According to cybersecurity firm Sophia, about 82% of India's organizations were hit by ransomware attack in last 6 months. You see, ransomware attack involves hacking into a user's data and preventing them from accessing it until a ransom amount is being paid. Although ransomware attacks are critical for individual users, but more so for businesses who can't access the data for running their daily operation however with the most ransomware attack attackers don't release the data even after the payment instead try to exploit more money the next most common cybersecurity challenge is iot attack according to iot analysis there will be about 106 billion iot device in 2021 iot device are computing digital and mechanical device that can autonomously transmit data over a network Example of an IoT device include desktop, laptop, mobile phones, smart security device and many more. As the adoption of IoT devices is increasing in an unpredicted rate, so are the challenges of cybersecurity. Attacking IoT device can result in compromise of sensitive user data and safeguarding IoT device is one of the biggest challenge in the cybersecurity domain. The next type of attack is the cloud attack. We all know most of us today use cloud services for personal and professional needs. Also hacking cloud platform to steal our user data is one of the challenges in cybersecurity for businesses. We all are aware of the infamous iCloud attack which exposed private photos of celebrity. If such attacks is carried out in enterprise data, it could pose a massive threat to the organization and maybe could even lead to its possible collapse. Finally, we have phishing attack. You see, phishing is a type of social engineering attack often used to steal user data, including login credentials or credit card numbers and many more. Unlike ransomware attack, the hacker upon gaining access to the confidential user data doesn't block it. Instead, they use it for their own advantage, such as online shopping and illegal money transfer. Phishing attacks are prevalent among hackers as they can exploit user data until the user finds out about it. Phishing attack remains one of the major challenges for cybersecurity in India. 
as a demographic here is in well versed with handling confidential data. So moving ahead, let's see the future of cybersecurity. The rate at which cybercrime is increasing is alarming. Almost every week, a high profile cybercrime is being reported. Every business is in its own unique stage of digital transformation. However, it doesn't matter how far your business is going, it should consider security as its topmost priority. Cybersecurity professionals will be in high demand. You see, the need for cybersecurity professional is a dire as with the passing days, as new attacks are being coined, which are more harmful than the previous one. These rising threats require skilled cybersecurity professionals to help ensure safeguard for the individual as well as for the organization. We can also expect robust integration of artificial intelligence in cybersecurity tools and techniques. This is because it improves security expertise, analyzation, study, and understanding cybercrime. It enhances security technology that companies use to combat cyber crimes and help keep their organization and customers safe. We can also expect more of automation. In the future, automation of many roles and tools can also be heavily implemented. This will allow performing a constant search for threats and deploying immediate remedies, right? What exactly is hacking? So hacking is the process of finding vulnerabilities in a system and using these found vulnerabilities to gain unauthorized access into the system to perform malicious activities ranging from deleting system files or stealing sensitive information. Hacking is illegal and can lead to extreme consequences if you're caught in the act. People have been sentenced to years and years of imprisonment because of hacking. Nonetheless, hacking can be legal if done with permission. Computer experts are often hired by companies to hack into their systems to find out vulnerabilities and weak endpoints so that they can be fixed. This is done as a precautionary measure against legitimate hackers who have malicious intents. Such people who hack into a system with permission without any malicious intent are known as ethical hackers and the process is known as ethical hacking. So now that we know exactly what ethical hacking is and who ethical hackers are, let's go over the different types of hackers. So firstly, we have white hat hackers. Now white hat hackers is another name for an ethical hacker. They hack into a system with prior permission to find out vulnerabilities so that they can be fixed before a person with malicious intents finds them and does his job with it. After that, we have black hat hackers. Now black hat hackers, also known as crackers, are those who hack in order to gain unauthorized access to a system and harm its operations or steal sensitive information. Black hat hacking is illegal and has always been illegal because of its malicious intent, which includes stealing corporate data, violating privacy, damaging the system, blocking network communications and much more. Following which we have gray hat hackers. Now gray hat hackers are a blend of both black hat and white hat hackers. They act without malicious intent, but for their own fun. They exploit a security weakness in a computer system or network without the owner's permission or knowledge. Their intent is to bring the weakness to the attention of the owners and getting appreciation in form of a little bounty from the owners. Last but not least, there are suicide hackers. Last but not least, we have suicide hackers. Now a suicide hacker is a person who works with the intent to bring down major corporations and infrastructure. These kinds of hackers are not scared of the consequences of their actions as they mostly work with vengeance in their mind. These people are also called hacktivists because they mostly utilize the technology to announce a social ideological reform or some religious reform or a political message. In general, most hacktivism involves a website defecament or denial of service attacks. Okay, so now that we've discussed the different kinds of hackers that are there, let's go through the different kinds of hacks that exist in the world. Now that we have discussed the various types of hackers, let's go with the different types of hacking. Now we can segregate hacking into different types depending on what the hacker is trying to achieve. Firstly, we have computer hacking. So this is the process of stealing the computer ID and password by applying hacking methods and getting unauthorized access to a computer system. Secondly, we have password hacking. Now this is the process of recovering secret passwords from data that has been stored in or transmitted by a computer system. Thirdly, we have email hacking. Now, this includes gaining unauthorized access to an email account and using it without taking the consent of its owner for sending out spam links, third party threats and other such harmful activities. Fourthly, we have network hacking. Now, hacking a network means gathering information about a network using a tool like Telnet, NSLOOKUP, Ping, Tracer or Netstat. Now, these are done with the intent to harm the network system and or hamper its operations. 
Last but not the least is the most common type of hacking, which is website hacking. Now hacking a website means taking unauthorized control over a web server and its associated software such as a database and other interfaces. Let's get started with the phases. So the first phase is reconnaissance and also I'll be explaining each phase of ethical hacking with the help of an analogy so that it's easy for beginners to understand. Suppose you're a beginner. It's the first video you're watching on ethical hacking or maybe you have watched a little videos and you know you don't have a lot of understanding of what ethical hacking is then it'll be easy for you to understand. So let's start with the first phase. Firstly, I'll tell you what this analogy is. So the analogy goes something like this. Suppose there's an enemy layer at a location and this enemy layer has got a lot of destructive weapons and you are the army chief who's assigned to you know attack the enemy layer and take control of this. So my question to you is if you were actually an army officer, you know who's assigned to make a surgical strike. You've got a lot of forces. You've got the army. You've got tanks. You've got air force all at your command. So would you just take all your forces and go attack? I don't think so. Yeah, because first you'll have to create a plan and before that you'll have to understand the enemy layer. So you'll collect basic information such as the location of the layer. How to get to that location from the army base. You would collect more information about the building, the number of floors and the surroundings of the building. So similarly, when it comes to ethical hacking, you cannot just, you know, use tools or type something in your computer and just hack the target. So to hack the target, the first thing you have to do is understand the target. So this phase where you understand your target is reconnaissance. So reconnaissance is basically the phase where the ethical hacker collects information about the target so that it's easy for him to understand how to actually hack the target. So some of the basic information you would want to collect are the first one would be the IP address of the target. Suppose you're trying to hack a particular system in a network. Then you would want to know the IP address of the target because you know the IP address uniquely identifies the system in the network. The next thing you would want to know is the IP address range. Suppose there's an organization with you know hundreds of computers and you want to hack the whole network. You don't know which computer or which system has got the lowest security. So to check that you would need the IP address range of the whole organization or the network. The next thing you would want to know is the network. You would want to know the architecture of the network. And finally, you would want to know about the DNS record. So these are very basic things, very basic information to collect about your target. And depending on what your target is, this information might vary. So now I'll be talking about some of the most popular tools used for reconnaissance. The first tool I'm going to talk about is search engine. So I'm sure you're familiar with Google Yahoo and you know Bing. So I'll give you an example. Okay. Imagine yourself in this situation where you are an ethical hacker. You're the best in the city. There's no one else who can compete your skills of ethical hacking. And one day you're at your office and this guy a CEO of a big organization comes to you and he hands out the name of a website and he wants you to test for security loopholes or weaknesses on his website. And he just walks away. He doesn't speak a word. He's an introvert, you know. So at this point, you only know the name of the website. You have, you know, no idea of what this application is or what your target is. You only know the name of your website. So what would be the first thing you'd do? So the first thing you would want to do is use the name of the website into a search engine. So maybe Google the name of the website. There are different search engines you can use. There's Google, there's DuckDuckGo, there's Yahoo. There's Shodan and a lot of search engines. So you just Google search or use whatever search engine you want to and then find information about your target. So the first thing you'd get is the URL of the target, the URL of the website, using which you can find out other information such as the IP address, the IP address range, and whatever information I told about in the previous slide. So this is the first thing you would do. The next tool you would use which is one of the most popular tool for reconnaissance is NS lookup. So NS lookup is a DNS querying tool and it's mainly used to get the domain name and the IP address map of your target. So suppose there's an organization like maybe you want to you know collect information about the same website then you would run a NS lookup search on that and you'd collect information such as the domain name the IP address map the range the IP address range and such information. The next tool you can use is who is lookup. So who is lookup is a browser based query and response tool 
and it's mainly used to get the registration and delegation details of your target. So suppose your target application requires a login. So maybe the username is the email ID and using who is lookup you can find out who the website is registered to the contact information and many other information. So these information will play a vital role when you're actually trying to hack the application. So these are the most popular tools for reconnaissance moving forward to the next phase of ethical hacking. So the next phase is scanning. Now let's come back to the surgical strike example. You found out the location of the enemy layer. You know you found out the way how you can go from the army base to the enemy layer and you also found out about the surroundings. But is this information enough? You found the enemy layer. You found the building. But can you just go attack now? No, you need a strategy. You need a plan and for this the main thing you would require to know is which point of the building you can enter from. So basically you scan the whole building to see which points you can enter from and whether these points are blocked or are they open because obviously there are enemies they have got destructive weapons. So maybe a door is you know set up with a bomb with an explosive. So you have to scan the building so that you can find a safe way to you know enter the building and attack. Similarly when it comes to scanning in ethical hacking you found out the IP address the IP address range and many information but it's not enough. Now it's time to find out those points on your target which has got a weak security and where you can try to hack the target from. So this phase where you find the weak points on the target is scanning. The so scanning is basically the phase where you find out points on the target system or the network from where the hacker can try to hack the target. So these are the weak points on your target that you can start the hack from. Some of the information you would want to collect during your scanning are there's active ports and active hosts. So these are basically the ports and the hosts that are live and running on the system. So there's no point if there's an organization and there's a network of 100 computers and 10 computers out of the 100 computers are turned off. There's no point in finding out information about the 10 shutdown computers. If you want to hack the network, you would want to hack one of the target that's live and up and running. And that's why you would want to know about the active ports and the active hosts. Then you would want to know about the services being run on your target. So these services could be security services like firewall, intrusion detection, because obviously you wouldn't want your target to know that it's being hacked. So you'd want to be a little careful. So you'd find out services that are being run and then you would want to collect information about the application and the operating system. So when I say vulnerable application and operating system, it means the application or the operating system that is being used by the target, which is unpassed or outdated. So most of the time when you are, you know, scanning your target, you find out application or operating system that are unpassed, which have got security loopholes. And you can use these weaknesses to hack your target. Now let's see which are the most popular tools used for scanning. The first one is OpenVAS. OpenVAS is an open source framework with several services and tools for vulnerability scanning and management. The next tool is Nikto. Nikto is a command line vulnerability scanner and this tool uh, scans web servers for dangerous files, CGI's and outdated services. So like I previously told, while finding out information about the vulnerable application or operating system that if you find outdated services or unpatched services, there's a high chance that you can find out weaknesses on your target. So Nikto is a one such tool that will give you information about these outdated services. The next tool I'm going to talk about is Wireshark. Wireshark is a tool especially used for wireless networks. Suppose there's a Wi-Fi network and you want to you know, scan this network, then you can use Wireshark. And this is an open source packet analyzer and gives a lot of information about the wireless network. The next tool and my most favorite tool is Nessus. Nessus is a very powerful tool that provides high performance data capture. And the reason I like Nessus is it provides various types of scans. So depending on what information you want about the target or what type of target is, you know, your system or the network, you can select different scans. So each scan will give you different results using which you can hack the target. So these are some of the most popular tools used for scanning. So moving on to the next phase that is exploitation. So now you've collected enough information about your target. Your plans ready. You know where to enter the building from. You know how to attack. It's time to attack. So now you call your foes, your tanks, your army 
and then lead the attack and then gain control of the enemy layer similarly when it comes to ethical hacking you use different exploitation tools because your tools are like your force like your army and you use these exploitation tools to hack the target so this is the phase where the hack actually happens so exploitation is a phase where the hacker takes advantage of the weakness and loopholes found on the target system or the network and then runs appropriate tools to hack the target so there are different steps for you know using exploitation the first thing is selecting the right attack so not every attack is applicable to every target so depending on how your target is depending on what weaknesses you found on the target you will have to select the right the appropriate attack then you will have to launch the attack on your target and finally you will gain access of your target so some of the most popular tools used for exploitation are the first one is beef beef is a tool mainly used for penetration testing and uh, it's a tool that leverages you know browser vulnerabilities the next tool is one of my most favorite and uh, this is a tool that i mostly use it's metasploit it's one of the most popular exploitation tools and uh, this tool has got hundreds of scripts to hack the next tool I'm going to talk about is SQL map. SQL map is a tool that automates detection and exploitation of SQL injection flaws. So I'm sure if you're a beginner, you don't know what SQL injection is, but stay tuned. You'll be learning about SQL injection and a lot of different hacking methods in the coming up videos. So this tool is mainly used to take over database servers. Moving on to the next phase, it is maintaining access. So now the surgical strike is done. Will you just leave from the enemy layer? No, you wouldn't. Now you would take actions to maintain, you know, the control over the enemy layer. Because you wouldn't want your enemies to occupy the layer again and then store destructive weapons. Because if they did, if you just left and the enemies came back, you would have to carry out another surgical strike to gain control over your enemy layer. So this is maintaining access when it comes to surgical strike. So when it comes to maintaining access in ethical hacking, the hacker maintains you know a connection between the target so that if he wants to use a target later in time he doesn't have to you know start the attack right from the scratch he just directly access the target so this phase is maintaining access so maintaining access is a phase where the hacker installs software or makes changes on the target system after the target has been hacked so that he can access the target later in time directly without having to you know hack the target right from the scratch so some of the ways are doing this are there are different ways but i've listed down you know some of the most efficient or the most popular ways so the first one is installing backdoors so backdoors are basically used to bypass login or authentication then the next way is creating new users suppose your target requires you to log in to do something on your target then you would create a new user with a new username and password and uh, later in time when you want to access the target you would use this username and password to log into your target another thing you can do is escalate the privileges suppose you want to run certain system commands on your target or certain system services on your target and to run these system services you need super user privileges then what you would do is make a normal user a super user and then use this user to run system services on your target the next thing you can do is install rootkits rootkits are softwares used to enable access on your target and finally you can use trojans so let's see which are some of the most popular tools used for maintaining access the first tool is powersploit powersploit is a tool mainly used for windows operating system and this tool is used to connect to the victim's power cell so if you've used the windows operating system you should know that you know a power cell is a place where you can run system commands from so when you are a hacker and you hack a windows operating system and you want to do something on that system maybe you know delete the files copy the files or run any services which actually you shouldn't do you shouldn't be you know deleting the files or anything because you're on the track of being an ethical hacker but i'm just telling you for example if you want to do any such thing then having access to the victim's power cell will be really useful. The next tool I'm going to talk about is Weebly. Weebly is a PHP web shell that can be used to install stealth backdoors or to manage web accounts. And then you can use DNS to TCP. DNS to TCP is a network tool that relays TCP connections through DNS traffic. 
you probably don't understand a lot when I'm trying to explain about these tools, but you know, given time when you're learning, maybe watching the next videos, I'm sure you'll understand all these topics. So for now, just know about these tools and yeah, that's all. So let's move on to the next phase that is covering tracks. So you're done with the surgical strike and you've got control over the enemy layer. So the main thing you would want to do is keep your strategy, your plan confidential because you wouldn't want the enemies or any unauthorized person to know what your strategy, your plan or any information about your surgical strike. So you erase all the details regarding this. But when it comes to ethical hacking, it's a little different. A hacker erases all the details, all the information regarding his identity and also how he carried out the exploit so that the target doesn't know that someone has hacked the target first of all and if at all he knows that his system was hacked then he shouldn't be able to trace back who this hacker was. So covering tracks is a phase where the hacker hides his identity and also the way the exploit has happened. So he wouldn't want the target to know how he was hacked. There are different ways of doing this. Some of the most common ways are clearing the cache and cookies. Then you would want to tamper the log files. Suppose like I told you in you know one of the slides if your target requires you to log in using a username and password and you've done that you've logged in using a username and password then you would want to delete these log files so that the target doesn't know that some other user had logged into his system. Then you can close the ports that you might have started or stop the services that you might have started in order to install backdoors rootkits or whatever purpose you did it for. So this is covering tracks and the final phase of ethical hacking is reporting. Now you're done with the surgical strike. You've cleared all the evidence all the clues all the information and now you have to inform your higher officer on what actually happened. So you would inform him how you found the layer. What was your strategy? What was your plan? What weaknesses you found on the enemy layer and how did you actually gain control of the enemy layer? So you create a documentation of it. Similarly, when it comes to ethical hacking, instead of reporting to your higher officer, you report to the target organization. You tell them what weaknesses you found on the target, which weaknesses the target was vulnerable for and which attacks you used to hack the target. So reporting is basically a phase where the hacker creates documentation of the weaknesses and loopholes found on the target. The way he used these weaknesses and loopholes to hack the target and also mention certain precautions that the target can take to make the security better. So like I told you earlier, this is the phase that differentiates a malicious hacker from an ethical hacker. I'll tell you why now because as an ethical hacker, you know what you should do. You should tell the target organization about the information found the way you hack the target and also tell them how they can make the security better. But a malicious hacker wouldn't do this. A malicious hacker would hack the target would hide his identity and whatever purpose he hacked the target for he just do it and you know vanish. So this is the phase that differentiates a malicious hacker from an ethical hacker. So these are the six phases of ethical hacking. So if you want to hack a target successfully and efficiently, I suggest you follow these steps and maybe while you're practicing you think reporting is not really that important because you know you have your own target. You're trying to hack it. You hack it successfully. You might think why should I create a report for this? But let me tell you make a habit of creating reports right from the beginning so that when you actually are working for an organization, it's pretty simple. You know what details to include and it'll be very helpful. So, you know, don't take any of these phases lightly practice each phase, you know, with dedication. Now, let me tell you about some of the great hacks that have happened over time. I made a list of four hacks. I know there are hundreds of great hacks that have happened. But I've made a list of four hacks just to give you the idea of how powerful a hacker can be. So the first hack I'm going to talk about is the FBI hack. So in 2016, the entire database of FBI was hacked and the identities of all undercover FBI and Homeland Security agents was made public due to which a lot of lives were in danger. The next hack is the NASA hack. A hacker hacked into NASA and downloaded the source code used to run the International Space Station. And to fix this issue, NASA had to shut down its network for three weeks. So just imagine how powerful you'd be if you have the source code to run the International Space Station on your system. So this is how powerful you can be as a hacker. But 
You can only do this when you've got enough skills. Let's move on to the next hack that is the commercial sites hack. A student of a university launched a DOS attack with 70 plus computers on 50 plus networks which affected a lot of commercial websites such as eBay, Amazon, etc. Due to which these commercial sites face a lot of business loss. And the final hack I'm going to talk about in this session is the noble hack. So a hacker hacked into different banks around the world and then stole money from these banks and instead of using it for his own self, he donated this money to the countries living below the poverty line. So his intention was noble and that's why I've named this the noble hack. Though his intention was noble, what he did was illegal. And all of these hacks, the four hacks I spoke about was just to give you an idea of how powerful you can be. But all of these hacks were made for illegal purpose. As an ethical hacker, you should not be involved in any such illegal activities because that's not what ethical hackers do. As an ethical hacker, you should always contribute to make the security of the system, the network, basically any digital, you know, appliance or digital device, the security of these digital devices better. Now Kali Linux is a Debian based Linux distribution aimed at advanced penetration testing and security auditing. Kali contains several hundred tools which are geared towards various information security tasks such as penetration testing, security research, computer forensics and reverse engineering. Kali Linux is developed, funded and maintained by Offensive Security, a leading information security training company. Now Kali Linux was released on the 13th of March 2013 has a complete top to bottom rebuild of Backtrack Linux, adhering completely to Debian development standards. Kali Linux is specifically tailored to the needs of penetration testing professionals, and therefore all documentations are actually addressed to them in knowledge of and familiarity with the Linux operating systems in general. Now, as you guys might also know that Kali Linux is basically any Linux distribution that comes preloaded with a bunch of penetration testing software. Now, some might argue that Kali Linux is not really necessary, but well, it does save you a lot of time if you are a penetration tester. Aside from saving a lot of time, there are a number of reasons that you should be using Kali Linux for. Now let's go over the reasons one by one. First of all, Kali Linux has more than 600 penetration testing tools included. Now every tool that was included in Backtrack did not actually make it to Kali Linux. A great number of tools are simply not added because they do not work or because they duplicated what other tools did. So now you have a bunch of tools that serve a specific purpose and they are basically not cluttering up your computer with duplicates and useless tools. The second reason that you should be using Kali Linux is because it's free and it always will be. Now Kali Linux like Backtrack is completely free of charge and always will be and you will never have to pay for using Kali Linux. The third reason is an open source kit tree. Now Kali Linux is committed to the open source development model and the development tree is available for all to see. All the source code which goes into Kali Linux is available for anyone who wants to tweak or rebuild packages to suit their specific needs. Then another reason for using Kali Linux is a wide ranging wireless device support. A regular sticking point with Linux distributions has been supported for wireless interfaces. Kali Linux has been built to support as many wireless devices as you can possibly think of, allowing it to run properly on a wide variety of hardware and making it compatible with numerous USB and other wireless devices. More adventurous users to customize Kali Linux to their liking all the way down to the kernel, which brings us to the kernel now. And the last reason according to me that you should be using Kali Linux is because custom kernels and patched for injections. So as penetration testers, the development team often needs to do wireless assessment. So our kernel has the latest injection package that allows you to do so with much ease. So this was six reasons as to why you should use Kali Linux. And you can find a lot more reasons on the Kali documentation. So you can go through them if you want. Now, this brings us to the main agenda of our video today. So with that out of the way, now that we know what Kali Linux is and how it works and why you should be using Kali Linux. Let's go over the topics that we are actually going to go through the course of this video today. So through the course of this video, you could expect to learn a bunch of stuff. So firstly, we'll go through some command line essentials because Kali Linux tools are mostly in CLI format. So we have to be well versed with the command line essentials. 
So that's the first thing that we're going to tackle. Then we're also going to tackle how we can stay anonymous using proxy chains in Kali Linux. We'll be talking about Mac changers and we'll be also going into the whole realm of wireless penetration testing. We'll be checking out tools like Aircrack NG and we'll be also testing on how we can brute force some WPS pins. We'll be going through router vulnerabilities and some other miscellaneous topics that I couldn't really group into one. So without wasting much time, let's dive into the first topic for today, and that is command line essentials. Now, the way that this video is going to follow is that most of the times we are going to take a hands on approach to learning how to use things in Kali Linux because I'm a firm believer of actually practical work for learning any sort of thing. So we will be using a lot of practical work and I completely encourage you that you go ahead and download and install Kali Linux. You can do it on a virtual machine or you could try and do boot that thing. I'm not meant to teach you how to do that in that video because there are tons of videos out there that teach you how to install Kali Linux. What we are going to do first in this video is that we are going to take a hands on approach to firstly learn what the command line essentials are. Now, as you might have already realized, there are some theoretical aspects that we might need to tackle from time to time. For example, what is a MAC address? What are proxy chains? We'll need to learn some theory. So for the theory, we'll have to go through the obvious evil and that is PowerPoint presentation slides. So I apologize for that from before, but I assure you that most of the time we are going to be looking at a computer screen and I assure you that you will have tons of fun if you just follow along with me. Okay. Another disclaimer that I would like to add before we actually continue with our Kali Linux course, and that is this is not the entirety of Kali Linux. Kali Linux is a huge thing and this is just not it. So these are basically what I find interesting and what you may also find interesting. And these can cause a bunch of damage if you're doing it without permission. And damage comes with repercussions, which could include you being arrested. And that is not my fault. Again, I'm saying disclaimer, if you do this without permission, you will get arrested. And that is no way my responsibility because this video is just for educational purposes. Okay, now with all that aside, let's move ahead and learn about command line essentials. Okay, so now it's time that we go through the command line basics of any Linux terminal. Now the Linux terminal is a very powerful tool. It allows you to move around the whole operating system through the files and folders. It allows you to create files, change their permissions, change how they behave, and a bunch of other things. You can do filtering, you can grab stuff, the specific stuff from a specific file, and there's a bunch of interesting things that you can do. And as an ethical hacker, you will be working with a Linux distribution most of the time, whether it may be Kali Linux or some other thing like Parrot OS, but you will be working on Linux most of the time because it's a powerful tool for networking analysis and scanning and all sorts of stuff that you want to do as an ethical hacker. So the first essential step is to actually know how to use the tool that is available to you. And that is out here, which is the terminal. Now, as I'm running this on a virtual machine, you might find it that my execution times are much slower. And that is because I have a very, very slow laptop because my virtual machine is actually eating up a lot of my RAM and I have a bunch of other processes that are also rendering. I do this on my free time. So let's go ahead and go through the commands that we are going to actually go through. Now, let me actually make a list of commands that I want to teach you guys. So let me see if leafpad is available. Firstly, leafpad is basically a text editor. So the first command that we are going to start off with is CD. Now CD stands for change directory. Now at this moment, we are in the root directory. As you guys can see, we can print the current working directory with this thing called PWD. And that is a current working directory. As you see, it's called root. And suppose we want to change our directory to the home directory. So all we have to do is CD, which stands for change directory, as I just said, and specify the path. Now CD slash home. Okay, so once we're in home, I want to make a list of commands that are used on the CLI that I want to teach to you guys. So what would I do? I would firstly see if any files are available that I can edit. Okay, so these files are available, but let's create a new file for ourselves. So firstly, let's do nano list txt. Now what nano does is nano will open up a small command line text editor. Now command line text editors are very much used by ethical hackers because they save a bunch of time. If you're always switching between GUI and command line because you'll be doing a bunch of stuff on the command line and suppose you want to write something you're always switching to GUI 
it's a waste of time and you want to save time as an ethical hacker so you can use this thing called a command line editor and it's it can basically do most of the stuff a gui editor would do now you say nano and the name of this file so nano basically has created this file now and it has opened up this new fresh window which overrides the command line that we were in the bash and this is the place where you can actually edit what goes into the file now let's see the list of commands that i'm going to teach you i'm going to teach you ls ls will be the list of files we did cd we saw a pwd so that was the print working directory we'll be looking at how you can copy stuff with the cp command then we'll be looking at mv which is basically move then we'll be looking at cat and that's an interesting one and also less which is another interesting thing and we'll be looking at grep which is actually used for grepping or grabbing things from files that you might want to see you'll see what i mean in a short while we'll see echo which probably does what you think if you have any experience with linux then we'll be doing touch and we'll be doing make dir which is make directory and then we'll do in ch own ch mod then one of the most dangerous commands has rm and then you can do man plus help okay so these are the list of commands that we are going to go through in this part of the video so suppose i was making this video and i wanted to save this somewhere so if you see down here there are a bunch of options that are shown to you now this carrot sign might be not what you're thinking that the shift six one it's not shift six it's actually a control so carrot is control and then g of course means g so if you go control g it will actually get help now what we want to do is save the file and that is control o and that is write out so what we want to do is say control o and now it's going to say if we want to name the file list.txt and we want to name the file and it says that we have written down 15 lines so that's how you save a file now all we want to do is exit out of here okay so first let's go ls and let's go through whatever there is so ls shows us the list of files that are there in that directory now ls can also show you the list of files in a directory with the path that you specify like if i say ls var it'll show me everything that is in var okay there are a lot of interesting things in var so let's head over to var so cd slash var and you hit enter and now we are in the folder var so now to actually demonstrate how powerful ls is we have a few flags now to see the flags of any command you can just do dash dash help universally throughout the unix command line so out here you see some information that is kind of tough to read but if you go on top and scroll out here you'll see all the flags that you can use with the command that is ls and how you can use them so you can see what to use and you can read a little bit about it so if you use all it ignores entries starting with dot so suppose we were to do ls in var let's see so it shows us like this now if we do lsl it'll show a long list with more information so these are the permissions that you see out here we will be seeing how we can change the permissions of files soon enough and this is who owns the file the user and the user group this is the file number i guess i'm not sure this is when they were created the name of the file this is the time when the file was created i guess okay so that's how you get very detailed information about all the files now there's another thing you might want to use with ls and that is the a tag so you can go lsa and it will show you all the hidden files also so now you see some two files that were not shown out here our file list begins from backup but when we do ls slash i mean hyphen la we see two more files that is dot and dot dot so let's see if we can move into that cd dot so we can't even move into that so that's interesting so these are hidden files so these are not seen to random users and we can actually do stuff with them we'll see how we can use hidden files later on so if you want to show hidden files through ls you all you have to do is ls and hyphen la so that was all about ls so let's move back to slash home where our list of commands that i want to show you all was so cd home let's ls and see what was it called it's called list and suppose i want to see the contents of list.txt all i have to do is say list.txt now it shows us whatever this file is containing it'll read it out for you 
So we've done CD, we've done LS and its various forms. We've done PWD. Now it's time to do CP. So CP is basically used for copying files from one place to another. So suppose I want to copy this address file that is there into some other directory, let's say var. So all I would have to do is cp name.txt and then you specify which location you want to actually copy it to. So cd slash var. So this is where I want to copy my file to and you hit enter and it's copied. But that was a very small file. Now we can actually check if it was copied before I move on and pour some more knowledge into you. So let's go into var. So cd slash var hit enter and you're in var again and you see ls and now you see a name.txt so let's remove name.txt from here because i want to copy it again and show you all a difference between a flag that i'm going to use right now so the hyphen and letters that you use are called flags technically in the linux terminology so let's go back to home now instead of the name of the file and moving back to home just like i did you can type out the complete name of the file out here. So you could have gone cd slash home slash name.txt and copy to slash var. But this time what we're going to do is we're going to use the hyphen v, which is basically used for a verbose output of whatever you're doing. So most of the commands that we're going to using will have a hyphen v with them. So let's see how this actually affects the output. So what we're going to do is we want to copy. So p and verbose and we want to copy the file name.txt and we want to copy it to the folder called var right so now you'll see that it will give us what is being moved rather that is name.txt and where it is being moved to so this is a very good way of knowing what is actually happening because if you do it without the verbose part and suppose name.txt was just a 20 gb file and you just don't know if it has finished or not so if it's a 20 GB file, it'll continuously update you on where what is being copied. So basically all you have to do is type hyphen V if you want to know where your file is being copied on the exact path. Okay, so that was about how you can copy files from here and there. Now, what was the next command that we want to see? So cat. So let me just go and see the next command that is there. So list.txt. So after cat, I want to show less. Okay, so we've done CP. We also have to do MV. Now, as you guys can see that CP is basically a copy. Copy is as you would expect. It leaves a copy of the file that in the original directory while also maintaining a copy in the directory that you specified. But if you want to move the file completely, all you would have to do is use the command MV. So MV is for moving the file. Now let's see what all goes with MV. So you can type help. And as I said, you get the verbose option and you get suffixes. You can force things to happen. So suppose you don't have the permission, do not prompt before overwriting. So it'll give you a prompt and you can completely overlook the prompt with the F thing. So let me just show you how that looks like. We'll be doing a verbose and we will be copying the address .txt file. And okay, so every time I've been actually typing, so you can do address.txt by just pressing tab and it'll autocomplete. So address.txt to slash var. Now it'll show you that it is actually renamed address.txt to var address.txt. Now, if you go and do ls out here, you will see that address.txt is not actually here, but if we were to move to var, so cd slash var. Okay, I've also been typing out commands that I've been previously using, and you can simply toggle through all the commands that you've used by the up and down keys. So ls, mv, mvv help, cat list. I did cd home, and now I have to go through all this just to prove a point. So cd var, we want to change there. Now we're in the variable folder and we also want to see what we have out here. So address should be out here and ls and as you guys can see address.txt is the first file that has come up and it is basically the same file and I can prove that to you by just catting the file and address.txt and you see that is some random address for some random person. Okay, now let's quickly clear out our file, our window. You can do that with the control L or you can just type out clear. Now, what we want to do is move back to home. So yes, yeah, CD home. Okay, so now that we're back in home again, let's cat out our next file. So list.txt and after move, I want to go through cat. Now cat, as you guys can see, is printing out the contents of a file and there's also less, which does something very similar to cat. So let's see what it does. 
So if you go less and do list.txt, you actually see the contents of the file in a completely new window, which overlays on the previous window. And this is a very neat way to actually see the contents of a file, which is through less if you want to keep your main command line interface not so cluttered, which cat clutters it completely. So if you want to get out of this place, this less place, and all you have to do is press Q. And Q gets you back. And as you see, nothing was printed out on our main interface. So this is a very cool way to actually keep your command line interface neat and tidy when you're doing work. OK, so grep. So grep is used for actually filtering out stuff from a file. So suppose we want to see whether a command has some verbose option to it or not. So now I know that MV has a verbose command, but suppose I didn't know that. So MV dash dash help, then you use the pipe sign. So what the pipe sign means is you have to take this command, the first command, and then you pipeline it through the second command. And you want to see grep hyphen V if that exists. Okay, so let's see grep verbose. Yep, so a verbose exists and that is hyphen V and that's hyphen hyphen verbose. So explaining what is being done. So what happened out here is basically we took this first command and then we filter it and filtering is done through the piping. So basically think about you're taking some information and pipelining it through something else which funnels it out of this command, which is grep. So you can use MV slash help in conjunction with a bunch of other commands, just not grep. And I'll leave the creativity up to you. So grep is basically used for getting what you want from a file and grep is used very, very much throughout this course of this video through this Carl Linux tutorial that you're going to be watching. So that is a very easy way to see if you have a particular option or let me do something else also. So CD slash var. Now we're in the var folder and let's ls. We actually have name.txt. Now let's also go into backup. So CD b and tab and that brings us the backup folder and we're now in the backup folder let's do an ls out here okay so we have a bunch of files okay we have some password dot back now see if you have cat and you go password dot back you can see the entire thing now what if you didn't want this entirety of it or if you want something in particular you want to be very neat so you can do that same command you can pipeline it and you can say grep and you want everything with no login. So we can see that there are a bunch of things that say no login and we only want those. And these are all the things that say no login in them. And it's a much lesser list and it gives us a very particular list that you are looking for. So that is how you use grep. So now let's head back to home. Uh, okay, I typed that wrong. And again, let's see what the next command is. So now let's start the XT. So we've done grep. We now have to do echo. Echo and then touch. Okay, let's go back. Q. We press Q and we get out of there. So what did I have to teach again? I'm such a dummy. We have to do echo. Okay. So what is echo used for? So suppose you were to say echo and open code hello world. It would basically do what command says. And that is echo whatever you say. Now it'll say echo hello world. And that will basically echo whatever you typed out in the quotations that is hello world spelled very wrong. Okay, now suppose you want to actually put this into a file. So you could do echo hello world. Let's spell it properly this time. And you want to insert into a file. We had a phone number, I guess, phone number.txt. Yep. And we can echo it into that thing. Now that was done. Now let's see what is phone number.txt. Phone number.txt and it says hello world. So you can basically input text into a certain file with the echo command and that's how you do it. Okay, now let's also see how you can make directories and that is with the make directory command. So, okay, we also have to do touch before that. I forgot. Now touch is used for quickly creating files. So touch, you could say touch and then the file name. So we can create a name file again, name.txt or that will create a name.txt let me just show it to you lsl and we have a name.txt we can also create multiple files with touch and you could say file one file two and file three so like this you can create multiple files and let me just ls that out and show it to you lsl and we have file one file two and file three now we can also create 
a directory. So make dir and the name of the directory. So suppose you wanted to save all your movies in one directory. So you make directory movie. And now you have a directory called movies. And you can also move into movies. So cd movie. OK, so that's how you create directories. And you can move into them with the change directory folder. Now let's see what the next command was. So cd and dot dot. So with cd dot dot, you can move back to the previous folder if I've already not told you that. And since we're in movies, we can just go back to home with cd dot dot after. Now let's see what else is there. So cat list dot txt. And OK, now ch own ch mod. Now ch own will be a little tough to show because we don't have any sort of other user out here. The root user is the only user that we have on this virtual box as set up. But if you want to change the ownership of a file, so let's say, so you can see the ownership of a file through the lsl command. And you see that root and root. So this is the owner name, and this is the owner group. And they're mostly the same thing. So our next command that we're going to actually see is called chown. So let's see how chown is actually used. chown is used for changing the ownership of a file. So I actually don't remember how to use chown. So if you actually don't remember or you're getting stuck somewhere, just use the help function. So if a command line argument is symbolic, so let me just go through this once. So this is how you use it, owner and then colon group. OK, and then the file name. So you go ch own, and then you want to say the name of the owner and the group you want it to belong to that is root and root. And then you specify the name of the file. So suppose I want to change file one. Now it already belongs to root and root, so it doesn't really matter because I don't have any other username to actually change the ownership to. So this is how you would normally change ownership. So let me just show you where you can see the ownership, and that is ls hyphen l. And out here, the root and root you see on file one is basically this is the owner and this is the owner group. They're normally the same thing and the same name, but if you had some different owner like a guest, you could change it by actually using the ch own method or the command. Methods are different things. I always get confused because of the programming. OK, now the next command that is left is called chmod. To actually show you how chmod works, let me show you an interesting file. So suppose, let me just do this once. OK, now echo. What we want to echo is, let's echo hello world. And uh, let's put that in quotation, and we want to put this in test. Now, once we've done that, let's ls, and we see that we have a test file out here. And we want to move test to test.sh. So test.sh is the executable file that is used in bash scripting. So we move test to test.sh. And the way you actually execute bash files on your command line is with the dot and the slash. So you say dot slash. And if I press T and I press tab, you see that there is no options that's coming up. That is because test.sh is not an executable file. So test.sh is don't have the executable permission. So let me just show that to you. LS and you see test.sh, it doesn't have the executable. Now you see movie, it is executable. I don't know why it is a directory. So it is an executable. You can move into it. So it's blue in color. So the way you actually can make this an executable is by changing its permissions. So the way you do that is chmod. And basically, you change it to an executable, so plus x. Uh, that is making an executable. If you do plus R, it'll make it readable. And if you do plus W, it'll make it writable also. So if you do plus X and do test.sh, and now you go and do LSL, you'll see that test.sh has become green because it is an executable file now. And now if you do dot slash and you press T, you get test.sh if I press tab. So now it is an executable file. And if I execute it, it presses out hello world under my screen. So that's how you can use the ch mod or which is basically the change of permissions of files. And we'll be changing permissions of files throughout the course of this video. It'll be very useful for us. And you'll see as we go along with this video. OK, so the next thing that I want to show you all, only two are left, and I remember those now. And it is rm. And rm is used for actually removing files. So you should be very careful while using rm or any sort of removing command on a Linux system because once you remove something, it is very difficult to get it back and it's almost near impossible. It's not like Windows where it's basically just disappeared in front of your eyes, but it's still there in the memory cluttering it all up. That's why Linux always trumps Windows. That's one of the reasons. I'll make a video on that later on. 
but for now let's focus on rm now we can remove file one so let's see so file one is going to be removed so if we ls now you see file one doesn't exist but let me show you rm and if i do movie it'll say cannot remove movie is a directory but if you go into the help menu i bet there will be a option that you can just forcefully remove it so rm force will just remove so rm slash r and you can do movie and it'll recursively remove everything and if you go here and do lsl you'll see that there is no movie directory anymore and that is how you can remove movies now that prompt that you see out there is actually a safety measure because once you remove a directory and it's not retrievable that's a very sad scenario and you don't want to get yourself in such a scenario in whatsoever possibility okay moving on so on so forth that was all about the rm folder now you can do rm and the address of anything so rm i know we moved an address.txt so into the var folder we can go rm var and address.txt and that will remove address.txt from the folder of var let me just show you that worked so cd var and ls and you see that there is no address.txt out here okay another way to get help for any command that you want is man and suppose you want to see about rm It'll show everything about RM that is there to show to you. It'll show you how to use it. It'll give you a description, synopsis, the name, remove files or directories. It's a very useful way. So out here you see this is the manual page. So that is where it means man. And you can press line one or edge or you can press Q to quit. So that's very much helpful. Okay guys, so that was all about the command line interface and how we can use it to go about the operating system and change file permissions, copy files, move files, and a bunch of other stuff. Now it's time to get on with the interesting stuff, and that is, firstly, we're gonna be learning how you can actually stay anonymous with proxy chains. Okay, guys, so now that we are done with the command line basics, it's time that we move forward with proxy chains. So before we move forward with proxy chains, let us head back to our PowerPoint presentation and see what exactly proxy chains are, okay? So proxy chains. Now, as the name suggests, Proxy chains are basically a chain of proxies. Now, where is a proxy used? A proxy is used whenever you want to anonymize yourself on the wire or the network. You do not want to know, or you do not want your others to know what the source IP address was for your client system. And to do this, all you have to do is send your packets through a bunch of intermediary systems. And these intermediary systems carry the packet out and they transmit it to the target system. And this is much slower. And let's see how we can use this in Kali Linux now. In combination with Tor, to, in order to anonymize traffic, not only on web browsing traffic, but rather instead on all networks related traffic generated by pretty much all your applications. But you can also change this in the settings. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to open up the proxy chain configuration file and we're going to understand all its options that are available. So to do that, all you have to do is say nano. You go into the etc folder and then you go for the proxy chain .conf. And what you see out here is the nano editor. And we had spoken about the nano editor when we were discussing the CLI part. I hope you haven't skipped that. Now what you see out here is a bunch of instructions and options. So let me just zoom in into this command line interface and now you can read everything much well. So what proxy chains is, well, it gives you the ability rather to route your traffic through a series of proxy servers and stay anonymous in such a fashion by hiding behind them or by having them forward your requests. So it looks that on the other side that your requests are coming from them as opposed to you. Now, surprisingly enough, there are a large amount of these proxy servers out there that you can use, but they're not very stable. You know, they go up and down and they're not very fast. So for specific targets, they can be useful, but not for brute forcing and not for any sort of computing attack. So suppose you're doing something to a certain target. If you're trying to log in or you're already logged in, you can definitely do it through proxy chains and it will be reasonably fast and reasonably stable as well. But if you're doing some sort of mass scanning or you're brute forcing a password or something of a kind of a proxy chain with a list of proxies selected from the internet, especially the free proxies, it's not gonna work. I mean, it's going to work out eventually in a technical sense, but it will consume more time than you can spare 
And by that, I mean, it can be very, very long time. It can take about months or two to do a simple scan. So that's not an option. And there are other ways of doing that. But for the time being, I just want you to know how you can use proxy genes and how you can configure it. And actually, because it's really useful and I use it fairly often, and a lot of people do, and it's a fantastic piece of software. So first off, we have the types of proxies. So you see HTTP, SOX4, and SOX5. Now, there are fundamental differences between these protocols, and you always want to find yourself a SOX5 proxy as that's the best possible one, and that has the ability to anonymize all sorts of traffic HTTP, well, as the name it says, it's for HTTP traffic. And SOX4 is very similar to SOX5, but it does not support IPv6 protocol and it does not support UTP protocol. So this can be SOX4 and it can be rather problematic. And you always want to make sure that you're using SOX5 wherever and however. Anyway, down below, you have these other options, which we will go over. So basically, how you enable these options is that you don't need to type some complex lines of code or anything. Of any kind basically all you have to do is just delete the hash out here let me just show you so suppose we wanted to actually activate dynamic chains option so all we have to do is delete the hash but let's put in the hash right now so after you delete the hash all you have to do is save the file and the option is enabled this hash presents a commented outline meaning that the system reading this will ignore if there is a hash and if there isn't a hash it will take it into consideration and interpret it accordingly Anyway, what we have here are statements which allow us to specify how we want our traffic to be routed. So first off, we have dynamic chain. Now, dynamic chain is a sum and is an option which you will find people using the most. It is most commonly used option and a preferable one too at that. And honestly, I think it's the best one out there primarily because it's the most stable one. And here's why. Now, suppose you have ABCD proxies. So those are some servers with IP addresses, with open ports, and if you have a strict chain policy, which is enabled on this computer right now, as you see, if you have a strict chain policy, we can only be able to access any site on the internet in general by going through ABCD. So you have to go through all of them and you have to go through them in that specific order that is ABCD. And that's not always a good thing. I mean, if you're paying for five proxies, that's not a problem because they will always be operational and they will always be up. And why not? That's not a bad idea or an option. But there are, however, people who use proxies for free and they don't tend to pay for them. Why would you pay for like five proxies for a simple scan or something of that kind? They're not free and they cost money and they're rather expensive also. But still, I mean, the act of paying itself identifies you and kind of diminishes the amount of anonymity you have on the Internet. So some complex payment methods can still be used to actually anonymize yourself, but it's fairly simpler to just use a dynamic chain. So firstly, we're going to go ahead and uncomment the dynamic chain option and we're going to comment out the strict chain option so strict chain will no longer be used and i will be using dynamic chains and one more thing to note here is that if you want to use proxy chains in combination with tor if you want to route all your traffic through the tor network not just web traffic you must be enabling dynamic chains i mean there is a chance that it will work with strict chains but due to the instant instability of tor nodes it is highly unlikely you will need dynamic chains and that is why i'm using them Anyway, if you're using dynamic chains, just give you the ability to go from ABCD to your desired destination by not having to adhere to any order. So let's say C is down and you would go a B, D and it would work with no problems. Even if B was down, you would go to a D and you would go and still reach the destination. So as long as one single proxy is functional, it's going to work and you don't require any specific order to do it down below. Now down below you have some other options too. So first is random chains. Now random chains in effect are basically the same thing as resetting your service. I mean, if you're resetting your Tor, you will be now assigned new IP address. In Tor assigns your new IP address every 10 minutes or so. Anyway, with the random chain, you can specify a list of IPs and then you can tell your computer, okay, I want you to try and I want you to connect to this point. And every time you connect, every time you transmit a packet, I want you to use a different proxy and we can do that as well. And that's one of the options, definitely. And you can say, OK, use this is phone five times and then change to another one or some kind of like that. There are a lot of options to specify there, primarily the chain length. Anyway, down below, there's quiet mode. Uh, you don't really need that. Then that proxy DNS requests no leak from DNS data. This is very important. You cannot have any DNS leak. And let me explain to you what DNS leaks are. And even though somebody cannot get your particular IP address, they can get the IP address of the DNS server that you are using. And that DNS servers do is resolve the main domain to the IP address and vice versa. 
So for example, if you typed in youtube.com, the DNS server of your local ISP provider will resolve that into some sort of IP address that YouTube has and it will make a request. No problem. And you do not want that happening because your local DNS server will be discovered and that is information that can be used in order to figure out your personal IP address. And when that is done, your physical location is pretty much compromised and that's a no go and you definitely need proxy DNS here. It might slow you down a bit, but without that you're practically not anonymous and it's just a matter of time before somebody finds you. Now if you go down below, we have some other options here, but we're not really interested in them at the moment. What we hear are for the formats for entering proxies and I'm going to leave it at that. So what you see out here is first the type of the proxy that is SOX5, then the IP address, then the port number, and then two words that is Lama secret and then juice to hidden. Okay, so now what you see out here, as I just said, is how you would actually write down your proxy chains. And now, as I had already also said, you always want to be using SOX5 and you don't want to be using HTTP because they're not really that safe. And SOX5 doesn't support a lot of options anyway. And this is the IP address of the proxy server that we will enter a few of them manually later on. And this here is the port number that you see on which the proxy server is listening and that port is open over here these two words now what some proxy servers especially paid ones will always have a username and password so you can just type them here in plain text unfortunately it is assumed that only you and you alone have access to this computer besides this file and besides this file is you not not everybody can read this file anyway so if you can just type in the username here and password here you will gain access to a certain proxy that you have chosen or that you have paid for Anyway, these are just some examples and we won't actually be using these proxies or anything of a kind. We need to go down below here out here you see and at the end of the file. So if I just press enter a couple of times, there we go. So here is only one proxy active at the moment and since SOX4 and all traffic being routed here through Tor by default. So let's set to Tor now and Tor default listens on this port. So this uh, 905 report is where Tor listens on. Now what we want to do is we want to add a SOX5 proxy address. So what you want to do is just type in SOX5 and the same IP address SOX5 and you want to be keeping the spacing correct. Just use tab. So 127.0.0.1 and then you want to specify the port number also so 9050. So what you see out here the 127.0.0.1 this is the loopback address of your computer. So this is for into device communication and if you ping this address and if you're pinging yourself basically and usually people ping this address in order to make sure that the IP port protocol is set up correctly even though they don't have internet connectivity so let's just type in 1.27.0.0.1 and the same port number and 9050 so now we have to press Control o to save our file and we're going to save under the same name and we wrote 65 lines of codes down and that's written and now you have to press Control X and you exit out. So let's press Control L and clear out our screen. Now we just edited our proxy chains configuration in a very neat environment. So to go ahead and type in our service door status. So we want to check status of our Tor service. So service Tor status. So Tor service could not be found. So do we have the Tor service installed? Okay, so Tor service is not installed. Just give me a little moment. I'll quickly install it. Okay, so now that we have set up our proxy chains configuration file and we have put in a SOC5 proxy chain giving it the Tor service. Now what we need to do first is start up our Tor service. Now to actually check if Tor is running or not or if the Tor service is running or not. Let me just clear that out. We need to go service Tor status. And you see it says it's inactive. So what you have to do is say service Tor start and that will start the Tor service. It might take some time depending on the system that you're using and voila that it has started it for me. Now what you have to do to actually use proxy chains before you go to any website. So all you have to do is say proxy chains. Then you specify the browser that you're using. So we're going to be using Firefox and you could say something like www duckduck.com so now here you will see how your thing is being transmitted to duckduckgo.com when i say thing i mean your packets and your requests i'm sorry for my vocabulary 
So now your packets are going to be directed through a bunch of IP addresses, but we haven't actually put a bunch. We just have put the loop back for the Tor network. So we will let Tor do the rest of the things for us. Okay, so depending on your system, this might take a little bit of time to actually open up. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what's actually happening on the terminal while this thing is loading up. Okay, as you can see, it's going through a bunch of proxies out here and some are denying it and some are saying it's okay. So as you guys can see, most of the time you might get denied and it'll be a lesser number of okays and that is exactly what we're looking for. Because primarily we have gone a great extent for the anonymity and what you want to do is stay like that. So this is basically how you use proxy chains. Now, if this computer just decides to open up tuktuko.com on Mozilla, I could actually show you some interesting stuff, but it seems my computer has kind of given up on actually opening DuckDuckGo. It's still waiting for DuckDuckGo's actually confirmation, but that's about it. So this is how you can actually configure proxy chains. I'm really sorry that my computer isn't working right now so well and nothing is actually opening on Mozilla. It's mostly because my RAM is overloaded. I think I should go ahead and get myself a new RAM, but for now, let me just also say that we can put some custom proxy lists and instead of just saying, let me just go ahead and open up that file again. As you guys can see out here, I'm going to end this right now because my computer can't really take all this pressure. See, it's lagging so hard. Okay, let me just quit out of that and let me just open up a new one. Now, as I had said that you can put up some custom proxy lists. Not really going to do that, but let me just show you how you can do that. You go nano and you go etc and proxy so you basically have to go into the proxy chain okay so i think i have to put this again yeah now if you just go in and edit out here all you have to do is set up dynamic chains and you can go online and search for free proxy lists and that will give you everything with the port number to the ip address let me just show it to you free proxy server list so all you have to do is search for free proxy server list and you can see out here the proxy type is HTTPS and you basically want to find a software proxy to find software proxies just add that into your keyword and once you find those proxy addresses all you have to do is take down this IP address and followed by the port number and you go ahead and just put it down in this configuration file and then you hit control O and you just save it and then you just go back. So that was all about proxy chains and how you can set up proxy chains to set, make yourself very anonymous. I'm sorry, the whole Mozilla part didn't work. That's your sad state of my computer. But moving on, let's go ahead and study about Mac changes. Okay guys, so that was all about proxy chains. Let's move ahead to Mac changer. Okay, now before we go into the tool called Mac changer, let's just see what a Mac address is. Now, MAC address actually stands for Media Access Controller Address of a device and is a unique identifier assigned to a network interface controller for communication purposes. Now, MAC addresses are used as a network address for most IEEE A02 network technologies, including Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth. Now, in this context, MAC addresses are used in the Media Access Control Protocol sublayer and as typically represented as MAC addresses are not recognizable as six groups of two hexadecimal digits each. Now these are separated by a colon and the first three hexadecimals are actually the organizationally unique identifier. So they actually represent your vendor and the next three hexadecimals actually represent your network card uniquely. Okay, so when you are actually on a network, you are recognized on something called an ARP table. Let me just show you the ARP table, how you can see it. Let's go in. So the password is root. So an ARP table is basically an address resolution protocol table and well, this is a virtual machine and it doesn't really know many machines on the local network. But if I were to go on my Windows system and show you my ARP table, let's see. Okay, so if I show you the ARP table of my Windows machine on any machine that has a TCP IP protocol suit installed, you will have this command that is working called ARP and you give the hyphen A and now you see that your IP address or somebody else's IP address is actually mapped to a physical address. Now the MAC address is very commonly used in the ART protocol and this is how you are actually identified on a network. Now sometimes what you want to do is be unknown on this network. There are various reasons why you want to do that. Let me just give you an example of a very malicious reason that was done in my college. So we as students would actually change the MAC address of our own computer to the professor's computer. So we would somehow look up the professor's IP address 
and then come to know about his MAC address. And then we would spoof our MAC to be his MAC address. And then we would do some type sort of malicious activity on the college internet. And then the internet administrators of our college would come to know that that MAC address is doing some sort of malicious activity. And that MAC address would get permanently banned for that session on the college network. So basically our professor would not be able to use the wireless projectors that he would use to actually show us his presentations. And we would end up getting a free class. Now I am not actually promoting any sort of bad activity like this. I have just experienced this in my own college life. So that was something, but there are many other reasons that you might want to spoof your Mac. Now Mac changer is an amazing tool for actually spoofing your Mac. So first of all, how do you come to know your Mac address? So let's see you go IF config and this will give us our Mac address. Now this address that you see out here is the Mac address of this machine. So you can also check out the Mac address by going Mac changer. Then let's type in the help options and this will show us how to get the Mac address. So if you see there's a show flag so we can go Mac changer and you can put the S and then you put the interface. Now the interface is where it's working. So at zero is where we are actually getting. We don't want the loop back one. So at zero and this will give us the Mac address. So our current Mac address is 080027. Let's see if that was the same one shown. Where is that Mac address? Okay, so ETH 080027. So I'm sorry, this was the Mac address. I selected the wrong thing. What I was showing you is the IPv6 address and you can see that's very, very long. So this is our Mac address. Now what you might want to do to change your Mac address? Well, let's see. With V, we can get the version. With S, you can show. We can do the E. And as I said, if you remember that the first three bits is about the vendors, so you can also get the vendor list by going hyphen L. So you go hyphen L, and this will give you a list of uh, MAC addresses and which vendor they belong to. So sometimes if you know the vendors that are actually being used on the network of your college, for example, and you want to just stay anonymous and not raise any flags of suspicion. So you could hide yourself as a Cisco router. So suppose your college was using all sorts of Cisco routers and you decided that today I'm gonna to spoof myself as a Cisco router and I'm gonna screw around with the network. So it would not raise any flags before you actually decided to do some malicious activity. In some deeper inspection of your MAC address, people would actually realize that you are actually spoofing the address and after some investigation, they would indeed take some time to actually reach to you and how you spoofed it. But the point of changing your Mac is not raising any flags and that is exactly what you should try to do. So Mac changer is also very useful for getting the list of all the Mac addresses and their vendor IDs. Now let me just clear the screen out quickly. So we go clear and let's bring back the help. So we go Mac changer and dash dash help. Now what we want to do is give ourselves a random Mac address now Mac changer. So that is done with the R flag and we want to do it on each zero. So once you run that you will be given a new Mac address. So our new Mac address is F6 C6 49. Now you can verify that by running IF config. Now we could just do IF config and you see our new Mac address is on ether. So we could also do something like this IF config. And you could grab ether. So that is just telling you the MAC address, and this is completely new. Also, you could show it through the MAC changer tool itself. Okay, so we need to give it the E0. I forgot that. Now you see that this is our current MAC address, and this is our permanent MAC address, and they two are completely different. Sometimes you also might want to actually change your MAC when your laptop is or your system is booting up because. You might want to stay anonymous all the time. Who knows? And sometimes you might think I'll actually change it when I want to change it. But let's face it. We are forgetful as human beings and we tend to forget things that we are supposed to do. So what else is better than to actually automate the whole process yourself and forget about remembering all these stupid nitty gritty stuff. So you can tell Linux or Kali Linux to actually change your Mac address on boot up is use this tool called cron tab. Now crontab is actually used for scheduling tasks on Linux. So let me show you how to do that. Firstly, let's clear our screen and go crontab and go help. Now you see it's a pretty small menu, 
So first we start with the U flag, which user this file is going to work for. Then we got the E flag, which is for editing crontab users, the users crontab list. And you can see the list of users crontab. And uh, let's see. So do we have any crontab list? So there is no crontab at this moment. So we can set up one for ourselves by going to the E. Then there's the R, which is delete users crontab. And I want to tell you all, be very careful when deleting anything of that sort, because once you delete something from Linux, as I've already said, that it is very, very difficult to actually retrieve it back. You might get fragmented pieces of what you had actually deleted, and that will only leave you with sadness and devastation. Now, what you want to do is go through crontab and press E, and this will bring us to select an editor to change later run select editor. So we'll do it with nano. So what you have out here is the readme file of crontab. And if you read this entire thing, you will get how to use crontab completely. But if you have any sort of doubts, even after reading it, you can leave them down in the comment section below. Now, what you want to do is actually set up a crontab so that you can change your Mac address whenever you reboot your computer. So all you have to do is say at reboot, what you want it to run is Mac changer. And if you remember, we want a random Mac address and we want it on ETH zero. So that's done. Now all you have to do is save this thing. So you go control O and that will write it out to crontab and you press enter and you have written down one line. Now you go control X and you have exited out. So now let's us clear the screens by pressing control L and enter and let's go ahead and get our Mac address. So if we go ahead and run that, our MAC address is set to F6, C6, 49. So just remember the first few letters, F6, C6, and 49. Uh, now let me just reboot my computer, and you will see after I reboot and run ifconfig again with grep ethop, we will see a different MAC address. Now rebooting might take some time because I'm actually using a virtual machine, but still now it's given problems with the Firefox, but let's hope this won't take much time. Okay, so now that our computer has booted up and we have actually opened up our terminal, let's go in and type ifconfig and let's get in our ether that is the MAC address. So if you remember the MAC address, now you see that it has completely changed and that's how you can spoof your MAC address on your local network. And this will basically help you in staying anonymous on our protocols and anything that actually maps your IP address to the MAC address. Okay, so that was all about MAC changers. I'll meet you in the next section now. So in this section, we'll be talking about uh, wireless encryption protocol cracking. So that is basically Wi-Fi cracking. Now, Wi-Fi in today's day and age uses pins or passwords to normally encrypt their data usage. Basically, if you want to access the wireless access point, you need a password or a pin to actually gain authorization. Now, this authorization is done using a four-way handshake which we will try to capture using a tool called aircrack ng and then we will try to crack into the password using a wordless generator called crunch now you can use aircrack ng to crack wpa and wpa2 there's also another protocol called wep or web and that is not normally used these days if you find anybody using that you should always advise them to actually upgrade to wpa or wpa2 because WEP is actually very easily cracked in these days and people are generally punished for using WEP by hackers all around the world. Okay, so now you can actually go ahead and go into a terminal and type ifconfig to actually look at your network card name. As you guys can see out here, it's called WLO1. So the first step that we need to do to actually go into the process of Wi-Fi cracking is set up our network access card or our access point into monitor mode. So as you guys can see out here after typing ifconfig, it shows me that my Wi-Fi access card is WL01 interface. Now our process of cracking passwords is pretty simple. What we want to do is actually monitor for all sorts of access points that are nearby to us. Once we have chosen the access point that we want to actually penetrate into and find the password, what we want to do is run an arrow dump scan on it, and then we will try and deauthenticate any device that is connected to that access point. Now, one assumption out here is that the password is saved in that device and it will automatically try to re-authenticate itself with the access point. And we want to catch and log this re-authentication process, which will actually have a four-way handshake between your device and the access point. So this is basically the procedure we are going to follow. 
Now, another thing that you need to know before actually using this process to gain any access to any Wi-Fi is that you need to know a little bit about what the password is. Maybe it could be the length or it could be something like a specific character at a specific place. Maybe you know a series of characters. So you just can't really guess the password out of thin air. That is not how cracking works unless you have some unlimited potential of processing power. In that case, you can very well brute force it and just find the password. But if you are not somebody who has unlimited processing power and you're trying to use Aircrack NG, you need to know a little bit about the password. Also, before we proceed with this wireless encryption protocol cracking, what I want to say is if you want to get into somebody's Wi-Fi network or you want to actually test for vulnerabilities, it's better that you test for router vulnerabilities than actually cracking a Wi-Fi password because you're more likely than not to find more router vulnerabilities than actually successfully crack a Wi-Fi password if you don't know anything about it. If you don't know anything about the password, just go ahead and run some vulnerability tests on the router itself. And more often than not, you will just find something you can abuse. Okay, now let's talk about the two tools that I'm going to be using. Now, these two tools, one of them is already installed on Kali Linux. But if you are not using this on Kali, you can also use this on any Linux based system. So what you have to do is download and install Aircrack NG, which is easily installed with the command apt-get install Aircrack NG. And you also have to install this word list generator called Crunch. Now Crunch is easily downloadable by just Googling the name. And the first link will be a SourceForge link. And all you have to do is go inside that and install it. And once you figured out how to install Crunch, you can make sure that it's installed. Now, once you have installed both the softwares, you can check out if the manual pages are opening up. Let me just open the manual page of Aircrack NG and show you that it has been properly installed. Now, as you guys can see, the manual page of Aircrack NG opened up and the manual page of Crunch is also opening up. So that means both of our softwares have been successfully installed on our system. Now, before we go ahead, let me just show you how Crunch actually works. So Crunch is basically a word list generator. What you would do is you try and generate a word list with given characters. So what you can see out here is I've typed in Crunch 3.5. So that means the minimum length is 3 and the maximum length is 5. And I've given it a series of numbers. So it will use these numbers and generate all the words that are possible from length 3 to length 5. So the way we are going to use Crunch in conjunction with Aircrack is that we are going to use Crunch to generate the word list. And then we are going to pipe the word list through Aircrack NG when we are actually trying to capture and crack what we will capture in a certain log file. Now what you want to do first is actually put your network interface card on a monitor mode. Now you can do that by typing in ifconfig and then the interface name, which happens to be WL01. And first you have to put it down. So ifconfig WL01 down. Now to put your interface card into monitor mode, you have to type in iwconfig and you go the name of the interface and then you go mode monitor. Okay, it seems I've spelled it wrong. So let me just do it once again. So that has put our network interface card into monitor mode. And what we need to do after that is we need to start up our network interface. So all we have to do is type in ifconfig wl1 up. Now, once it is up and running, you can check by typing in ifconfig that indeed your network interface card is up and running. Don't worry, it's running in monitor mode if it's up and running. What we want to do next is pretty important to the whole process. So what we want to do now is check for some services that might still be running in the background that might hamper with our whole scanning process. So we do this by actually typing in the command airmon ng check and then the name of the interface. So as you guys can see, nothing is exactly running right now, but if there were any process running, you would only add the command airmon ng check. And instead of writing the interface name, all you have to do is say kill. 
and it will kill any processes. Now, if you see any process named the network administrator, you want to kill that process first separately and then kill any other child processes. You may need to actually run this command a few times before all the processes are killed and then you're good to go. Okay, so now that we have finished killing all the sub processes, what we want to do is run an error dump scan on the network card. So that is WL01. So for this, we go error dump hyphen ng and then we put in the name of the interface. And this will start up a scan that will look something like this. So after you run the error dump scan on your interface, what you see out here is a result of all the access point that is found out through the monitoring mode. Now, if you see, we have a bunch of columns out here. First of all, we have the BSS ID column. Now the BSS ID column is basically the MAC address of all the routers that are found. Now every router obviously has a MAC address. So those are the MAC address that is tied to the router names, which is shown by the ESS ID. Then we have the PWR column, we have the beacons column, we have the data packets column. Another important column is the channel column. It's important to know which channel your router is working on. Then we can see the cipher column, the authentication. So out here we can see the encryption that is used. So most of it is using WPA2. So what we will be cracking is basically WPA2. So from this list, what you need to recognize is basically the Wi-Fi router that you want to crack into. Now I'm performing this particular test in my office and I don't really have the permission to actually go in and test them for these vulnerabilities. I'm not the security analyst of here. So I don't really have the permissions to penetrate into them. So what I have done is I have run a similar test at home using my own Wi-Fi and I will show you the results for that. But for this working example, you will see the scans that I'm running in this office. So as we intend to stay ethical, what we are going to do out here is we are going to capture whatever we find in our office for only educational purposes. But when we are doing the actual cracking step, that is the last step of this whole procedure, I'll be running it on a file that I had generated at home, as I just said, because I have permissions to do whatever I want with my own Wi-Fi and password. OK, so for this example, I'm going to pick this Wi-Fi that is called EduTracker Wi-Fi and it's running on channel number six. So what we want to pick from here is the BSS ID and the channel number. We need to remember these two things. First, the BSS ID and second, the channel number. Now, what you want to do after that is open up a new window on your terminal and log in as root. Now, what we want to do here is run a separate error dump scan on this specific BSS ID and check for all the devices that are actually connected to this access point. Now we do this by running the command error dump ng and while we are doing this we also want to capture all the scan outputs that we actually get into a certain file. So we'll be actually storing it in a file called capture and then we just have to pass in the BSS ID and the interface. We also have to specify the channel. So let's see what the channel is one. So the channel is channel six. So that's what we want to do and we specify the channel with the hyphen C flags. So after you have identified the MAC address, all you need to do is copy it down and place it with after the BSS ID flag. Okay, so we're gonna run our command out here and we just wanna say our file is gonna be called test out capture. Now that our scan is up and running, all we want to do is wait till someone is actually connected to this access point. So I forgot to mention this, for this process to actually work properly, somebody needs to be connected to that access point because what we are going to try and do is disconnect that certain device and let them reconnect and capture that log file. Okay, so it seems like nobody is actually connecting to it. So at this time, all I'm going to do is go back to our error dump scan that we had run on our network interface and look for some other MAC address or other access point to actually penetrate into. And let's see if something has actually connected to that. Okay, so, oh, voila. Now what you see out here is that somebody has actually connected to this access point and his MAC address can be seen under the station tab. Now, what we want to do is run a deauthentication broadcast message on that station and deauthenticate that guy. Now, to actually run the deauthentication process, all you have to do is go ahead and open up a new terminal window again and let the scan be running in the background. Don't close any scan at this moment. 
Okay, so the information that we need to remember is the BSS ID or rather the MAC ID of the station. Now you also want your monitoring to be running on the same channel so that your deauthentication message is being already broadcast on the same channel. So we can do that easily by going airmon ng and saying wl1 and you can say start on the specified channel. So what we want to be doing is running this on channel 6. Then we want to go and use the third suit of tools that is air replay. Now air replay is used for broadcasting deauthentication messages and all sorts of stuff. Now you can see all this in the help menu also and you can do that by typing in dash dash help. If you go down you see that you can send a deauthentication message using the hyphen zero flag and that's exactly what we're going to do. Then we say zero again because we want to constantly send a broadcast of deauthentication. So it's looping basically and until and unless we stop the scan nobody will actually be able to access the Wi-Fi. So it's basically like a small DOS attack. And then we want to specify the BSS ID. Okay, so it seems like I forgot the whole A tag before the BSS ID and that should get it working. Okay, so it seems like I have copied some wrong BSS ID, I guess. So let me just go ahead and copy that once properly. Okay, so now that we have the proper BSS ID, as you guys can see, we are running a deauthentication broadcast message on that particular network access card. And now you want to run this for around a couple of minutes so that you become sure that all the devices have disconnected. Now, while this is happening, what you're doing is basically sending a DOS attack to that small little Wi-Fi and you want to catch the handshake that occurs between devices and the router that it is connected to while reconnecting themselves. Okay, so now that we've let scan run for a couple of minutes, let us just stop it. Let's stop this other scan too. Now, if I go and list out the files on my desktop, you should see that there's something called the test capture. Now, the test capture is given to us in various formats. We have the capture format, which is test capture hyphen zero one dot cap. And then we have test capture CSV. We have a Kismet CSV. So it gives you a bunch of formats to actually run your cracking on. Now, if you remember, I had told you all that I have already generated a similar file at home, basically when I was trying to crack into my own home password. So I will be running the test on that file or the cracking procedure on that file. And that is the last step of this whole procedure. So let me just go ahead and move into that folder. So I go CD scan. Now, as you guys can see out here, if I list down the files, you can see a capture1.cap, capture1.csv, there's a Kismet CSV and there's a net XML. So I was not lying when I said that I have already done this at home. So we are going to run our cracking process on capture01.cap. Now, let me just tell you guys, the password for my home Wi-Fi is SweetShip346. So you can say that I know the entire password, but I'm going to act like somebody who only has a general idea of what my password looks like. So let's say I know that my password contains SweetShip, but I don't really know the last three numbers or letters or whatever they may be. Okay, so we are going to use Crunch once again to generate a list of words that might include SweetShip346 and let me just open the crunch manual for once. Now, if you go down in the crunch manual, what you'll see is a hyphen T. So as you guys can see, there is a pattern that is specified like add the rate, add the rate God, and then followed by four other add the rates. And all the add the rates will be replaced by a lowercase character. Now you can remove add the rate and use a comma and it'll be replaced with an uppercase character or you can use percentages, which in case it'll be numbers, or you could use the caret sign, in which case it'll insert symbol. So when you know the length of the password and also a certain degree, a few letters, you can use the hyphen T flag. So that is exactly what we're gonna use with crunch out here for this example. So let me just remind you guys that the password for my home Wi-Fi is SweetShip346. Now what we can do is we can ask crunch to actually generate something that looks like SweetShip346. So what I could do is say crunch. So the minimum length is 12. I already know that. And the maximum length is also 12. Now let me just input in the pattern. So we put in the pattern after hyphen T. So now I'm going to just show you how long it can take. So we are just going to say sweet and then put in some other rates. 
and then also get try and guessing the numbers. So after you put in the pattern, you want to also input which letters and numbers they could be. And I'm just going to input my entire keyboard out here. Now, what you want to do is pipe this command through aircrack ng's cracking procedure. Okay, so now what we want to do is pipe this command through aircrack ng and we want to write from or rather read from the capture file. So what we go is hyphen W and then hyphen and then the capture file name. So capture01.cap. And then we also have to specify the ESS ID, which is given to the E flag. And the ESS ID for my home Wi-Fi is nestaway underscore C105. So that's exactly what I'm going to type in. And this will start up the cracking process on my Wi-Fi from the captured file. So as you guys can see, this is going to take a long, 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 long time and I'm not really actually going to complete it. So in this time, I'm actually just going to try and explain why this is not very feasible on a virtual network. So basically, this is not feasible because at this moment, my computer is using all four of its cores and all the memory that is possible. So what this means is on a virtual box, this is not really possible. Your virtual box doesn't really have that much power. If you are using a four core processor computer, only two of its maximum cores can be actually allotted to your virtual box machine. Above that, you can't really give it the entire memory because that will make your computer crash. So if you want to do something like this, you, it's better that you install Kali Linux as a dual boot or as your own daily driver, and then you can do this. So this is why I have not done this on a virtual machine and instead done this on Deepin Linux which is my daily driver operating system. Now, as you guys can see, it is constantly trying to actually guess the password by actually going through all the permutations and combinations. That is basically, it's taking in all the words generated from crunch, piping it into the current command, that is the aircraft ng command, and it's comparing everything. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to end this because this will take a very, very, very long time. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually try and shorten the command of the or the amount of guessing that we're trying to do so let me just try and do that so as you guys can see out here i have reduced the number of alphabets that might be actually tested but even in this case this will take a humongous amount of time and let me just show that to you so as you guys can see the test is running 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 and running and there's not really much you can do you can just let this run go out for a cup of coffee and then come back and you might still see that running. It really depends on what the password is and how much time it takes to crack it. And how much processing power you have directly affects how much time this will take. So let me just show you guys that this is taking a bunch of time. Okay, so now that I have fast forwarded a lot into the scan, you can see that I have tried almost 2127608 keys. So that's more than a million keys. That's 2 million keys that I've tried. So, and it still hasn't reached switch up 346. So what we're going to do is just to show you for demonstration purposes that this procedure actually works. Let me just shorten our guessing even more. So what we want to do is this time we want to just guess the numbers. So we will modify our command accordingly. So we just put in sweet chip and let the algorithm just guess the 346 part. So we're going to remove the alphabets from the guessing scope also. And as you guys can see, the password is almost immediately guessed because it, only 456 keys were tested. And uh, as you guys can see, it shows that the key was found and it's sweet chip 346. Now, let me also show you that it works with the guessing of letters just because I don't think I've justified that letters are also guessed and not just numbers. So let me make it just guess the P part. That is sweet she and then it should guess P and then 346. So let me just show you that. And as you guys can see, it guesses it almost immediately after just going through 15,000 keys. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this Wi-Fi cracking tutorial and also to the end of this video, which was regarding ethical hacking using Kali Linux. I hope you guys had a bunch of fun learning about Mac changes, proxy chains, and a bunch of stuff that we did like Wi-Fi password cracking. I hope you practice these procedures and methodologies that I've taught you only for your own educational purposes and not use it to harm anybody 
or do anything harmful with it because let me just tell you very seriously that you can be prosecuted by the law now i'm going to take the help of an example or a scenario to actually explain what is cryptography all right so let's say we have a person and let's call him andy now suppose andy sends a message to his friend sam who is on the other side of the world now obviously he wants this message to be private and nobody else should have access to the message now he uses a public forum for example the internet for sending this message the goal is to actually secure this communication and of course we have to be secure against someone now let's say there is a smart guy called eve who has secretly got access to your communication channel since this guy has access to your communication he can do much more than just eavesdrop for example he can try to change the message in itself now this is just a small example what if eve actually gets access to your private information well that could actually result in a big catastrophe so how can andy be sure that nobody in the middle could access the message sent to sam the goal here is to make communication secure and that's where cryptography comes in so what exactly is cryptography well cryptography is the practice and the study of techniques for securing communication and data in the presence of adversaries so let me take a moment to explain how that actually happens well first of all we have a message this message is firstly converted into a numeric form and then this numeric form is applied with a key called an encryption key and this encryption key is used in an encryption algorithm so once the numeric message and the encryption key has been applied in an encryption algorithm what we get is called a cipher text now this cipher text is sent over the network to the other side of the world where the other person who the message is intended for will actually use a decryption key and use the cipher text as a parameter of a decryption algorithm and then he'll get what we actually sent as a message and if some error had actually occurred he'd get an error so let's see how cryptography can help secure the connection between andy and sam so to protect his message and he first converts his readable message to an unreadable form here he converts the message to some random numbers and after that he uses a key to encrypt his message after applying this key to the numerical form of his message he gets a new value in cryptography we call this cipher text so now if andy sends the cipher text or encrypted message over communication channel he won't have to worry about somebody in the middle of discovering the private message even if somebody manages to discover the message he won't be able to decrypt the message without having a proper key to unlock this message so suppose eve here discovers the message and he somehow manages to tamper with the message and message finally reaches sam sam would need a key to decrypt the message to recover the original plain text so using the key he would convert a cipher text to numerical value corresponding to the plain text now after using the key for decryption what will come out is the original plain text message or an error now this error is very important it is the way sam knows that message sent by andy is not the same as the message that he received so the error in a sense tells us that eve has tampered with the message now the important thing to note here is that in modern cryptography the security of the system purely relies on keeping the encryption and decryption key secret based on the type of keys and encryption algorithms cryptography is classified under the following categories now cryptography is broadly classified under two categories namely symmetric key cryptography and asymmetric key cryptography popularly also known as public key cryptography now symmetric key cryptography is further classified as classical cryptography and modern cryptography further drilling down classical cryptography is divided into two which is transposition cipher and substitution cipher on the other hand modern cryptography is divided into stream cipher and block cipher in the upcoming slides i'll broadly explain all these types of cryptography so let's start with symmetric key cryptography first so symmetric key algorithms are algorithms for cryptography that use the same cryptographic keys for both encryption of plain text and decryption of cipher text the keys may be identical or there may be some simple transformation to go between the two keys the keys in practice represent a shared secret between two or more parties that can be used to maintain a private information link this requirement that both parties have access to the secret key is one of the main drawbacks of symmetric key encryption in comparison to public key encryption also known as asymmetric key encryption now symmetric key cryptography is sometimes also called secret key cryptography and the most popular symmetric key system is the data encryption standards which also stands for des next up we're going to discuss transposition cipher 
So in cryptography, a transposition cipher is a method of encryption by which the positions held by units of plain text, which are commonly characters or groups of characters, are shifted according to a regular system so that the ciphertext constitutes a permutation of the plain text. That is, the order of units is changed, the plain text is reordered. Now, mathematically speaking, a bijective function is used on the character's position to encrypt and an inverse function to decrypt. So, as you can see, that there is an example on the slide. So on the plain text side, we have a message which says meet me after the party. Now this has been carefully arranged in the encryption matrix, which has been divided into six rows and the columns. So next we have a key, which is basically 421635. And then we rearrange by looking at the plain text matrix. And then we get the cipher text, which basically is some unreadable gibberish at this moment. So that's how this whole algorithm works. On the other hand, when the cipher text is being converted into the plain text, the plain text matrix is going to be referred and it can be done very easily. Moving on, we are going to discuss substitution cipher. So substitution of single letters separately, simple substitution can be demonstrated by writing out the alphabets in some order to represent the substitution. This is termed a substitution alphabet. The cipher alphabet may be shifted or reversed, creating the Caesar and Abstash cipher respectively or scrambled in a more complex fashion, in which case it is called a mixed alphabet or deranged alphabet. Traditionally, mixed alphabets may be created by first writing out keyword, removing repeated letters in it, then writing all the remaining letters in the alphabet in the usual order. Now consider this example shown on the slide. Using the system we just discussed, the keyword zebras gives us the following alphabets from the plain text alphabet, which is A to Z. So the ciphertext alphabet is basically zebras, then followed by all the alphabets we have missed out in the zebra word. So as you guys can see, it's zebras followed by S, C, D, F, G, H, and so on. Now suppose we were to actually encrypt a message using this code. So as you guys can see on the screen, I've shown you an example, which is a message, flee at once we are discovered, is being actually encrypted using this code. So if you guys can see out here, the F letter actually corresponds to S. And then the L letter actually corresponds to I out here. Then we actually get the cipher text, which is S I A A Z Q using the code and the process that I just discussed. Now, traditionally, the cipher text is written out in blocks of fixed length, omitting punctuations and spaces. This is done to help avoid transmission errors to disguise the word boundaries from the plain text. Now, these blocks are called groups, and sometimes a group count, that is the number of groups, is given as an additional check. Now, five letter groups are traditional. As you guys can see, that we have also divided our cipher text into groups of five. And this dates back to when messages were actually used to be transmitted by telegraph. Now, if the length of the message happens not to be divisible by five, it may be padded at the end with nulls. And these can be any characters that can be decrypted to obvious nonsense. So the receiver can easily spot them and discard them. Next on our list is stream cipher. So a stream cipher is a method of encrypting text to produce ciphertext in which a cryptographic key and algorithm are applied to each binary digit in a data stream one bit at a time. This method is not much used in modern cryptography. The main alternative method is block cipher in which a key and algorithm are applied to block of data rather than individual bits in a stream. OK, so now that we've spoken about block cipher, let's go and actually explain what block cipher does. A block cipher is an encryption method that applies a deterministic algorithm to the symmetric key to encrypt a block of text rather than encrypting one bit at a time as in stream ciphers. For example, a common block cipher AES encrypts 128 bit blocks with a key of predetermined length that is either 128, 192 or 256 bits in length. Now block ciphers are pseudo random permutation families that operate on the fixed size of block of bits. These PRPs are functions that cannot be differentiated from completely random permutation and thus are considered reliable until proven to be unreliable by some source. OK, so now it's time that we discuss some asymmetric cryptography. So asymmetric cryptography, also known as public key cryptography, is any cryptographic system that uses pair of keys, which is a public key which may be disseminated widely and private keys which are known only to the owner. This accomplishes two functions authentication where the public key verifies that a holder of the paired private key sent the message and encryption where only the paired private key holder can decrypt the message encrypted with the public key. In a public key encryption system, any person can encrypt a message using the receiver's public key. 
that encrypted message can only be decrypted with the receiver's private key. So to be practical, the generation of public and private key pair must be computationally economical. The strength of a public key cryptographic system relies on computational efforts required to find the private key from its paired public key. So effective security only requires keeping the private key private and the public key can be openly distributed without compromising security. Okay, so now that I've actually shown you guys how cryptography actually works and how the different classifications are actually applied, let's go and do something interesting. So you guys are actually watching this video on YouTube right now. So if you guys actually go and click on the secure part besides the URL, you can actually go and view the digital certificates that are actually used out here. So click on certificates and you'll see the details in the details tab. Now, as you guys can see, the signature algorithm that is used for actually securing YouTube is being SHA-256 with RSA and RSA is a very, very common encryption algorithm that is used throughout the internet. Then the signature hash algorithm that is being used is SHA-256 and the issuer is Google Internet Authority. And you can get a lot of information about sites and all their authority key identifiers, their certificate policies, the key usage, and a lot of thing about security just from this small little button out here. Also, let me show you a little how public key encryption actually works. So on the site, which is basically cobwebs.cs.uga.edu, you can actually demo out public key encryption. So suppose we had to send a message. First, we would need to generate keys. So as you can see, I just click generate keys and it got me two keys, which is one is the public key, which I will distribute throughout the network and one the private key, which I will actually keep secret to myself. Now I want to send a message saying hi there. When is the exam tomorrow? So now we are going to encrypt it using the public key because that's exactly what's distributed. So now, as you can see, we have got our ciphertext. So this huge thing right out here is ciphertext and it absolutely makes no sense whatsoever. Now, suppose we were to actually then decrypt the message. We would use the private key that goes along with our account and we would decode the message. And as you guys can see, voila, we have hi there. When is the exam tomorrow? So we have actually sent a message on the Internet in a very secure fashion. Above that, there's also RSA that needs some explaining because I had promised that too. Now, RSA is a very, very commonly used algorithm that is used throughout the internet, and you just saw it being used by YouTube. So it has to be common. So RSA has a very unique way of applying this algorithm. There are many actual parameters that you actually need to study. Okay, so now we're actually going to discuss RSA, which is a very popular algorithm that is used throughout the internet, and you also saw that it's being used by YouTube right now. So this crypto system is one of the initial system. It remains the most employed crypto system even today. And the system was invented by three scholars, which is Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Len Adelman. Hence the name RSA. And we will see the two aspects of the RSA crypto system. Firstly, generation of key pair, and secondly, encryption decryption algorithms. So each person or a party who desires to participate in communication using encryption needs to generate a pair of keys, namely public key and private key. So the process followed in the generation of keys is as follows. First, we have to actually calculate N. Now N is actually given by multiplying P and Q, as you guys can see out here. So P and Q are supposed to be very large prime numbers. So out here P will be 35, but for some very strong encryption, we are going to choose very large prime numbers. Then we actually have to calculate Phi. Now Phi, as you can see, the formula goes is P minus one into Q minus one. And this helps us determine for the encryption algorithm. Now, then we have to actually calculate E. Now, E must be greater than 1 and less than 5, which is P minus 1 into Q minus 1. And there must be no common factors for E and Phi except for 1. So, in other words, they must be co prime to each other. Now, to form the public key, the pair of numbers N and E form the RSA public key system. This is actually made public and is distributed throughout the network. Interestingly, though, N is a part of the public key and the difficulty in factorizing a large prime number ensures that the attacker cannot find in finite time the two primes that is P and Q that is used to obtain N. This actually ensures the strength of RSA. Now in the generation of the private key, the private key D is calculated from P, Q and E. For given N and E, there is a unique number D. Now the number D is the inverse of E modulo phi. 
This means that D is a number less than phi such that when multiplied by E, it gives one. So let's go and actually fill up these numbers. So N should be 35 out here. And if we generate them, we get the value of phi, which is 24, which is basically four into six. And then we should also get E. So now E should be co-prime, so we are gonna give it 11 as 11 is co-prime to both. So now for the actual encryption part, we have to put in E and N out here. So E out here for us is 11 and N is 35. And then we are gonna pick a letter to actually cipher, which is A. And then we are gonna encode it as a number. So as you guys can see, we've encoded it as one. And out here, now after we've given the message its numerical form, we click on encryption and we get it. Now to actually decrypt the message, we are gonna need D and N. Now D for us was five and N was 35. So five and 35. And then we're gonna take encrypted message from above and we're gonna decrypt this message. So after you decrypt it, we have the numerical form of the plain text and to then decode the message, just click here, decode message. And as you guys can see, we have decoded a message using RSA. So guys, that's how RSA works. I explained all the factors that we actually use in RSA from N to five to E to D. And I hope you understood a part of it. If you all are still more interested, you all can actually research a lot on RSA. It's a very in-depth cryptographic system. So when you get hired as a penetration tester or a security analyst, one of your main roles is vulnerability assessment. So what exactly is vulnerability assessment? Well, a vulnerability assessment is the process of defining, identifying, classifying, and prioritizing vulnerabilities in a computer system, application, and network infrastructures, and providing organization doing the assessment with the necessary knowledge, awareness, and risk background to understand the threats to its environment and react appropriately to them. So vulnerability is a situation that can be taken advantage of by a hacker or a penetration tester for their own misuse or actually for fixing the issue. So vulnerability assessment has three steps. So the first step is actually identifying the assets and the vulnerabilities of the system. The second step is actually quantifying the assessment. And the third is reporting the results. Now, vulnerability assessment is only a small part and pen testing is an extended process of vulnerability assessment. Pen testing or penetration testing includes processes like scanning, vulnerability assessment in itself, exploitation research, and reporting whatever the results are. So in the industry, one of the most widely used frameworks when penetration testing is Metasploit. So Metasploit is widely used in penetration testing, as I just said, and also used for exploitation research. So some of you might ask, what exactly is an exploit research? Well, in this world, there are tons of exploits and the way to approach each one of them is ever so different. So what we have to do is exploit all the research that is available to us and we have to find the best way to approach them. So suppose, for example, you have a secure shell login. So the best way to actually approach a secure shell login until my knowledge is that you have to get a backdoor access to this from the port numbers that you can scan via Nmap or Zenmap. Okay, so without wasting much time at looking at PowerPoint presentations, let's actually get started as to how we can use Metasploit. So Metasploit is a freely available open source framework that is widely used by pen testers as we just discussed. So to actually install Metasploit, which is easily available on Linux and Windows, I guess. Let me just check it out. So you go on your browser and you type Metasploit downloads. Now you just visit the first link. And as you guys can see, it says it's the world's most used penetration testing tool. And then you just download the Metasploit framework by clicking the download button here. So y'all might also find a pro version, which is a paid thing. And this has a little bit of extra features like group support and actually helping a company work as an organization. But we don't actually need that when practicing our pen testing abilities. So for that, you just go ahead and download Metasploit framework and install it on your system. Above that, there's another thing I want to get, make you guys aware of, and that is Metasploitable. So when actually pen testing, we need a server or a website to actually pen test things on. So normally this is a very illegal thing to do without permission. So Metasploitable has actually created a server with a lot of vulnerabilities on it, and it's called Metasploitable 2. So Metasploitable 2 is easily downloadable from this link, 
and it's a VirtualBox file. So you guys must have a virtual machine software on your system to actually set this thing up. I'll also go through how to actually set up Metasploitable because it has a lot of configuration and network management to go with it. So we'll get to that later. But for now, let's get started with Metasploitable. So before that, Metasploitable is written in Ruby. And if you all know Ruby coding and you all know how to make exploits, you all can also always contribute to the Metasploit community. So Metasploit is one of the most widely used pen testing tools in the industry. So what exactly is Metasploit? Well, it's a framework. And what a framework is, is it's actually a collection of tools. So these tools are majorly used for penetration testing and exploitation research. Now one might ask what exactly is exploit research? Well, there are tons of exploits out there and there are tons of ways to actually approach them. And this only comes to us from thorough research as to how we can approach each and every exploit in their best way. So talking about Metasploit, well, it's open source and it's free and it's also written in Ruby. So if you guys know Ruby coding and know how to make exploits, y'all can always contribute to the Metasploit framework. Now talking about the download part, well, y'all can easily download Metasploit from its download page, which is www.metasploit.com slash download. I'll be leaving the download link in the description. And once you're on the download page, you'll see two versions. One is the free version, which is the original Metasploit framework, and it's the core framework that everybody works on. And then there's Metasploit Pro, which comes with a 14 day free trial. So Metasploit Pro actually has a few extra features, which is great for an organization like it helps you work as a team. But if you're a guy who's just practicing pen testing like me, Metasploit framework, the free version is the absolute way to go. Now also when pen testing, y'all will also need Metasploitable. Now Metasploitable is an intentionally vulnerable target machine for actually practicing your Metasploit skills on. So we'll go over the installation of Metasploitable later, but for now, let's go over Metasploitable. So once you guys have actually downloaded the link, y'all can actually install it on your systems and Metasploit actually has three interfaces. So we are going to be using the command line interface or the MSF console in other words, but y'all can also use the GUI interface, which is called Armitage if I'm not wrong. So let's get started. So first of all, I've already actually downloaded Metasploit and install it on my computer and you all can just do the same by pressing the download button as you guys can see. So to start up Metasploit, all you have to do is go on your terminal and so to start a Metasploit, all you have to do is go on your terminal on Linux. Well, we're starting a PostgreSQL server because first of all, the PostgreSQL server is the basis of all the Metasploit exploits that are stored and Starting it will just make it run faster. So we go service post gray SQL and start. So that should start up a service and indeed it has. So the next thing you want to do is go in and type MSF console. And that's going to take a little bit of time because I have a very slow computer and it's going to start up our Metasploit frame. So as you guys can see, we got a big banner out here which says Metasploit Cyber Missile. And it's the banner changes every time. Don't get worried if you have a different banner. And the main thing is that you should see this MSF thing out here. So this means we are in the MSF shell right now, which is the Metasploit framework shell. So let's get started by actually clearing our screen. So first things first, the first command that you might want to run on Metasploit is the help command. So help will tell us everything that we can do with this framework. So as you guys can see, there are a bunch of commands and the descriptions to go along with it. Y'all can give it a quick read and find the things that are interesting to you. So as you guys can see, banner is display an awesome Metasploit banner. Y'all can change the banner. As you guys can see, there are a lot of juicy commands like there's a banner command, which I just had used. So if you go and type banner, it'll give you a nice cool banner about Metasploit. And there are other commands which work very similar to Linux, like CD, which changes the current directory. You can change the color by toggling colors. And then you can connect with the host and all sorts of stuff. So Metasploit has a bunch of exploits. So before we go further, I want to make you guys aware of three important terms regarding Metasploit. So the first is a vulnerability. And we had already discussed this, that a vulnerability is a situation which can be taken advantage of by a system or a person who access. So the second part is an exploit. So what exactly is an exploit? Well, an exploit is a module 
which is a bunch of code written in Ruby on Metasploit that is used to target different vulnerabilities. And the third thing is a payload. So a payload is the action that you do once you actually have access to somebody's system. So basically, suppose you've hacked somebody and you've gained access to their system. Now the activities you do after gaining access is defined as the payload. So we just spoke about exploits and I told you guys that Metasploit has a bunch of exploits. So how do we see all the exploits that are there? So you go show exploits. Well, as you guys can see, we've loaded up a bunch of exploits, which is basically all the exploits that Metasploit has to offer at this moment. So let me just increase the screen a bit. And let's scroll completely to the top. Yep. So as you guys can see, show exploits gave us a bunch of exploits and it shows their name, a description, a disclosure date, and a rank. So the name and description is, as it says, it's the name of the exploit and it's a short description about it. The disclosure date is when the exploit was actually released by Metasploit and the rank is how it has fared against the vulnerability it was released for since it was actually released. So as you guys can see, ranks range from excellent, great, good and stuff. And we have a bunch of exploits. So as you guys can see, there's an Android exploit. There's a Samsung Galaxy Knox Android exploit. There are a bunch of Windows exploit, Adobe Flash exploits, FTP exploits, MySQL exploits, ASP.NET exploits, and a bunch of other stuff. So as you guys can see, there are a bunch of exploits to use and it can get confusing and rather troublesome to search for the exploit you actually want to use. So as a pen tester, you can always go for the search keyword, which is basically suppose you know that you have a MySQL server which has a bunch of vulnerabilities and you want to test those out. So you simply go search MySQL. Now I'll search the database for all the exploits that are related to MySQL and present them to you. Okay, so we have our results. So as you guys can see, we have a bunch of MySQL related modules now. Now it, this makes it way, way easier if you're a pen tester and you're looking for MySQL exploits. Now suppose you choose your exploit and let's see, let's choose which one do we wanna use today? We're gonna just use this MySQL hash dump. So to actually use this, we have to copy the name. So double click on it and it'll just select it and then you go control shift C in your terminal. So that copies it. And so if you want some more information about it, you can always go info and then just paste in the name of the exploit. So this gives us a bunch of information, actually gives us all the information you need about the exploit. So it gives you the name that it's a MySQL password hash dump its module name is auxiliary scanner and all this stuff. It's licensed by Metasploit framework in itself and it has a normal rank. And these are all the options that you might need to set when actually using the exploit. And this also gives you a small description. So it says this module extracts the usernames and encrypted password hashes from a MySQL server and stores them for later cracking. So seems like pretty cool stuff you can do with MySQL server and its password database. So if you actually want to use this, so you have to use the use keyword. So we go use and control shift V. So as you guys can see, it's denoted in red out here that we are indeed in the exploit that we want to use. Now, the first thing you want to do when you're using an exploit is you want to go and say show options. Now, as you guys can see, these are the options that we actually need to set before using the exploit. Now, the options can be necessary or they can be optional. Like, so there's a password field out here, which is not really necessary, but will help your exploit if you actually provide it. But you need to provide the R hosts, which is the targeting host machine, and the port and the threads is already set. Now, suppose you want to set the R hosts, so you can just go set R hosts, and you can set it to whatever IP address you want. Like suppose you want to address 192.168.2.56, something like that. So that will set the R hosts. 
you can also set the number of threads. Now, threads are actually what the threads mean in parallel processing. That means how many parallel threads you're going to run so that you have faster computation. So this means you need GPU power if you have multiple threads running. So let's set threads to 30 for now. So we've set the threads to 30. And then you can go show options again and see that you have indeed actually set your options. So we've set the threads to 30 and our host has also been set. So that was all about how you can get into a module, know, get some information about a module and how you can also use the module. So once you're done using the module or once you're done setting up the options rather, you can go ahead and run the command run or even exploit. And this will start actually running the exploit on the system that you want to. Now I've put in a very arbitrary IP address so, and that not have MySQL port running. So our exploit failed. Now, once you have tested out your exploit and you want to go back to the main MSF Unix shell, just go ahead and type back. It's as simple as that. So that brings us back to the MSF command line. So let's go ahead and clear our screen now. Okay, so it's time we do something interesting. So to do that, first of all, we need to go ahead and actually download Metasploitable 2. So to download Metasploitable 2, you have to go on this link. I'll leave the link in the description. So, or rather, you can just go on your browser and type in Metasploitable 2 download. So Metasploitable, as we had earlier discussed, is a Linux-based distribution, and it's mostly meant for actually practicing your pen testing skills. So basically, it has a bunch of ports open on it. So it's basically just for your ease so that you don't go ahead and test it out on some valid website and then get thrown into jail because that's a very illegal thing to do. So go ahead and download Metasploitable 2 and then also download Oracle Virtual Box Machine or Oracle Virtual Box. So you all can also easily download that from www.virtualbox.org. And this is because you should never run Metasploitable 2 on a system that is connected to a network. You should always use it on a virtual machine because it's protected that way so that nobody else can access it. So to actually set up Metasploitable, once you've downloaded it, you go ahead and open up your virtual box. So out here, you have to go into global tools and you create a host only network manager. Now I've already created a host only network manager and then you go ahead and enable the DHCP server by pressing this out here like enable. Then you go back and you just go new. You give it a name like whatever you want to name it. I have already named mine Metasploitable 2 as you guys can see. So we're going to call this demo for just demonstration purposes. Choose the type to be Linux and it's Ubuntu 64 bit. Click next, give it a gig of RAM and you are going to use an existing virtual hard disk. So out here, you just click on this button out here and you browse to the place where you actually downloaded and unzipped your Metasploitable download file. Then you'll get this virtual machine disk file. This is with VMDK file and you just go ahead and load it up. So I'm not going to do that again because that's just going to eat up my RAM and I've already installed it out here. So that was all about the installation and the configuration. So now let's get started and let's start playing around with Metasploitable. So once you're done downloading and installing Metasploitable on your computer, all you have to do is go ahead and start it up in your VirtualBox machine. And the login ID and the password both are MSF admin. So first of all, we need the IP address of our Metasploitable server. So we go ifconfig and this gives us the address. So as you can see out here, our address is 192.168.56.101. So once you go ahead and start up Metasploitable, it's time that we go ahead and exploit all the vulnerabilities that is presented to us by Metasploitable 2. So to do that, let's head back to our Linux terminal again. So once we have the IP address, that was 192.168.56.101 if I am correct. So let's go and quickly get a little bit of information about that. So who is 192.168.56.101? So this will give us a who is on Metasploitable 2 and it'll give us a bunch of information as to how the server is set up, where it is set up, the ports that are open and various other things. So as you guys can see, this gave us a complete who is. 
So to get some more information about our Metasploitable server, we're going to be using Nmap. Now, if you guys don't know about how to use Nmap, you can go out and check my other video on the playlist. I've made a pretty good Nmap tutorial. So we go Nmap hyphen F hyphen S and V, which is steel version, and we give it the name or the domain name server. And 2.168.56.101. So we've got a juicy result out here, and we can see that there's a bunch of stuff open. So as you guys can see, there's the FTP port open, which has a version of VSF TPD 2.3.4. There's also open SSH, which is 4.7 P1 Debian. There's also Telnet, which is almost miserable to have Telnet running on your computer. Then there's SMTP, there's HTTP, and there's a bunch of ports open, as you guys can just see on your screen. So it's time we actually use Metasploit, like a pen tester, to go ahead and test out these vulnerabilities. So let's choose these FTP things. So we have this FTP out here. So from the version number, which is given to us by the steel version flag on Nmap, we know that it's using VSFTPD 2.3.4. So we can easily search for an exploit of the same version. So as a pen tester, you would go search VSFTPD 2.3.4. So this should give us all the exploits that are available for this particular vulnerability. So as you guys can see, after a long search from the search VSF TPD, we found a vulnerability or an exploit that can take advantage of the vulnerability. So it's time we actually use this. So first of all, let's get some info about this. So info, let's copy down this thing and then let's get some info about this. So as this module description says, this module exploits a malicious backdoor that was added to VSF TPD download archive. This backdoor was introduced in the VSF TPD 2.3.4 tar.gz archive between June 30th and Vala Vala. So we have the options of setting an R host. It has an available target. It's provided by these guys. And it's a pretty good exploit in my opinion. So let's go ahead and use it. So we go use and the name of the exploit. So it's visible to us that we've again entered the exploit module, which is unix slash ftp slash vsf tpd 234 backdoor. So what we are going to do is we are going to actually gain a backdoor access to our metasploitable system. So to actually make this more believable. So if you guys go into your metasploitable system, so you guys can see that you're in the root directory. So you can gain some root access by going sudo su and going msf admin. So we're now a root user in the msf admin or rather the metasploitable console. So if we go ls, we can see the various files. And if we go sleety slash home, we're in the home directory now. And if we do ls out here, we can see that there are a bunch of stuff. So there's an FTP folder, there's a hacked folder, there's an MSF admin folder, and there's service and there's user. So that's five folders, if you guys remember. So now what we're going to do is we're going to gain some backdoor access into the system, and we're going to create a bunch of folders in the home directory. So let's get on doing that. So to do that, we head back to our Metasploit terminal, and we go show options as we had already entered our exploit. So we'll go show options. So as we see, the options that we have to provide is the R host and the port number. Now the port number has already been set because it's 21, and that's where FTP runs, or rather TCP runs, and we now just have to set the host. So to set the host, we have to just put in the IP address of our Metasploitable server. So if I remember correctly, it set our hosts to 192.168.56.101. So that has set our R hosts. So we can again check that if we've done it correctly by going show options. And we indeed have set our hosts. Now all we have to do is run the exploit. So we go and hit run. So as you guys can see, we have actually gained a backdoor service has spawned and it's handling and the command shell session has started. Now you might be confused as to why do I have this blinking line? Well, this blinking line actually means that you are inside the metasploitable server. That means we have already gained a backdoor access, and this blinking line denotes that we are on the terminal of metasploitable 2. Now, if you don't, guys don't believe me, let's do some experimenting. So, as I had said, 
I'll create a bunch of folders in the home directory. So let's change to the home directory first. Or rather, first you can also do a who am I, and instead you that you're the root user. Next, you go and do cd slash home, and I'll change to the home directory. Now, let's make a bunch of folders, like make directory, this is a test. So that should have made a directory. So let's go into that directory, cd, this is a test. So we're already into the directory, this is a test. Now let's make a file called targets. .txt. So that creates the file. So just to see if you have actually done it properly, let's go back to our Metasploitable server. Now in the home directory, you go and type in ls again. Okay, so let's type in ls and see. So as you guys can see, we have created a, this is a test folder and it's already available there. So let's go and move into that folder. So this is a test and we are already in that folder. So, and we had also created a text file, which was called targets. So that was ls and it should give us a targets.txt. So as you guys just saw, we gained a backdoor access into a remote system through a vulnerability that was available to us on the FTP port. So we first did that by scanning the entire domain name server of Metasploitable via Nmap and gaining some intelligence as to what ports are running and what ports are actually open. Then we found out that the FTP port was open. Then we went on to Metasploit and we found out exploit that vulnerability very successfully. We found out how to use the exploit, some information about that exploit. And in the end, we actually executed our commands. Now, you guys must be wondering what exactly is Nmap and why should I learn it? Well, Nmap is a network scanner that is widely used by ethical hackers to scan networks, as the name suggests. Now, you might wonder, why do I need a network scanner? Well, suppose, let me give you an example. So, suppose you have a Wi-Fi that has been set up in your new house, and you realize that your data is being actually consumed at a faster rate than you are using it. Now, you have suspected that it's your pesky neighbor who keeps on connecting to your Wi-Fi and eating up all your data. So to actually confirm all your doubts, what you want to do is a network scan. And Nmap is a pretty wonderful tool to do that. Now, Nmap runs on Linux, uh, Mac OS and Windows and I'm mostly going to be running this on Linux because that's what I do most of my penetration testing and network testing on. So let's go ahead and get on with the installation of Nmap on your computer. So what you do is go apt-get install Nmap. Now for uh, this you have to be logged in as root. If you're not logged in as root, just add sudo before this whole command and it will install it. Now I already have Nmap installed so I'm not really going to install it again and again. So let's just go ahead and just do a few scans on our website that is www.edureka.co and we are going to see what we get back as results. So first of all, let me just show you how you can scan a certain domain name service or sort DNS. So Edmap, we are going to use a flag all the time. Now let me just tell you uh, what our flag. So if you just go into Edmap and type dash dash help, this will give you all the flags and options that are available to actually use on Nmap. So if you are actually stuck and you can't remember stuff, just go in and type nmap dash dash help and it will give you all the stuff. Now, network scans generally take a long time, so I'm going to be using the fast mode most of the time. So for fast mode, all you have to do is type in edureka.co and sit and wait for this scan to get over. Now when the scan gets over, you will see a bunch of information and let me just wait till that information pops up and then we'll talk about the information together. Okay, so as you guys can see, our scan has been completed. It took 13.71 seconds to actually do the scan. Now, as you guys can see, it shows us the ports, the states and the services. Now, the ports is basically the port number which our service, that is also binder 2, is working on. So we can see that SSH service is working on port number 22, SMTP on 25, HTTP on 80, RPC bind on 111 and HTTPS on 443. So that is how you can use Nmap to scan a certain website. Now, if you see, 
Nmap has also given us the public IP of the DNS because what Nmap does is it looks up the DNS and then translates it to an IP that is recognized to that DNS server. So Nmap also returns the public IP. So what we can do also is Nmap hyphen F and 34.210.230 and .35. Okay, so as you guys can see that our command also works when we put in the IP address and it produces the same results. Now, we can also um, scan for multiple hosts. Now, suppose you are on a network and you want to scan for multiple hosts. Now, you don't really want to run different commands for that. Now, what you can do is just go in and type nmap and a bunch of IP addresses like 192.168.1.1 and 192.168.1.2 and 192.168.1.3 and what this will do is it will run an nmaps scan on these three different IP addresses and you did this uh, in just one command so that's a way that you can do this now you can also know about how much of your scan is left by just pressing the up button so that will tell you and give you a constant update on how your scan is going like mine is 32.4 percent done and 34.7 now and also show you kind of the time remaining okay so till this port scan is going on let me just tell you about the states now states can be of two types open closed and unavailable sometimes you'll see that it is unavailable and that's because some sort of firewall or something is running out there States can also be closed. In that case, mostly Nmap will not return you any result unless you're explicitly finding something of the closed state. So that was a little trivia on states and how they work. Let's see how much our scan is done. So our scan is done 81% and takes around another 20 seconds. It should be done soon. Now this scan could be significantly made faster with just the F tag, but I really want to give you all a good look into how this works. 97, 98, 99. Okay, so as you guys can see, this is our result. It gives us a bunch of ports and services. Now, as I just said, this thing can be also closed and also unavailable. So, open and closed, we see both the examples. Okay, so that was about how you can scan multiple ports. So, you can also scan multiple ports with this command, as I will show you. So, 192.168.1. Dot one to thirty. Now what this will do is basically scan everything from one nine two dot one six eight dot one dot one to one nine two dot one six eight dot one dot two up to thirty like that. So this is a very useful way of actually scanning multiple IP addresses. And let me just show you how that works. Since we have used the F flag, this is gonna work considerably faster. Now, as you guys can see out here, this had taken around 119 seconds, so that's around 2 minutes. Now, this will take a considerably lesser time. So, let's see, this was done in 29.91 seconds, and we did 30 IP addresses. So, we see that hyphen F surely speedens the whole scanning process. Now, you can also give Nmap a target list. Now, let me make a target list, so targets.txt. Let me just cat it out for you. So there's nothing in it. Now all I want to do is edit this file. So let me just edit that file and put in 192.168.1.1.192.168.1.2.192.168.1.4.192.168.1.4.192.168.1.5 or 15. Boom, roasted. Now all we have to do is save it. So that saves it and control X to actually exit it. Now you can go ahead and view what is in targets.txt. So as you guys can see, this is what is in targets.txt. And now you can just pass it to nmap with the IL flag. And you could say that nmap is going to actually scan all the IP addresses that are in this file. So let that just run. So this will take a little bit of time because it's five IP addresses and it's not really running on the fast mode. 83% of our work is done. Okay, so as we see, our scan has been completed. Now, what you see out here is the scan results for whatever we had provided in the targets.txt list. So, that's how you can also provide nmap input file and it will give you the results for all the targets that were specified in the file. Now, let's go ahead and talk about a little bit on port scanning. 
So Nmap is also a brilliant tool for scanning ports. And if you have a server or a website, you know that there are around 65,535 ports out there on every server. And almost 99% are unused. So sometimes scanning ports is really a necessity. Now you can scan ports by just using the P flag and specifying the port number. And this is how you would do it. And you would just specify the IP address after that. So I'm going to use www.edureca.co. And what you can also do is this will scan only the port number 20. But you can also scan from port number 20 to 25. You can also put in commas and tell Nmap you also want to scan all these other port 80 is HTTP and 443 is HTTPS. So you can surely do that. So let me just go ahead and run this. Okay, so that gives us an information on the ports that is there. Now, something about ports also, you suppose you know you want to scan for some HTTP ports. So you can just say nmap and with the hyphen p you can just say that I want to scan the HTTP port on www.edureka.co. So that will just go ahead and do that. And as you guys can see that gave us a result. And you can also add in stuff like MySQL, FTP and stuff like that. So let me just see and show you how that runs. Okay, HTTP is not a port, HTT. Okay, so as you guys can see, these are the ports that are running and it gave us according to the name. Now, if you want to scan all the ports, you can use hyphen p hyphen and then the IP address at www.edureca.co. Now, this generally takes a lot of time because you're basically doing 65,000 scans. So I'm not really going to do that. I'm going to quit this out. Another thing that I wanted to show you all that generally takes a lot of time to actually execute is called something like an aggressive scan. So as you guys can see out here, I have done an aggressive scan on edureka. So to do that, all you have to do is nmap-a and then you go edureka.co. So let us see how much time did this take to actually execute. This took 459 seconds. That's a long time for a scan. But it gives us a bunch of other information. For example, it gives us the trace route. So what is a trace route, first of all? So trace route is the route taken by a packet to actually reach the clients and the target server. So as you guys can see, our packet had 22 hops. First it went to the first hop was to the gateway router, that is 192.168.1.1. Then it went to the Airtel lease line, then it went to this IP address, then it went to the BSNL, VSNL net, and it went to London, New York, then Chicago, and it went all the way up to wherever this thing is hosted. That was some information, and then there is some other information given to us, like the TCP open, TCP wrap, program versions, port types, port states, and all sorts of other information is given about in an aggressive scan. Another scan that I have previously also done and kept for y'all is because it takes a lot of time and I have done something called the service version. So nmap-s and v with v capital will give you the service version. So it tries to actually guess the version of the service that is running. So for example, on the TCP port, it tells us it is postfix SMTPD. On the Apache, it's Apache HTTPD and you can see all sorts of versions that are here. Another thing Nmap is generally brilliant is for guessing the operating system that is running. Now, I have already done this scan previously because this takes a humongous amount of time that I don't really have. And that is 386.34 seconds. And this scan together basically took me more than 10 minutes. And I don't really have that kind of time for explaining all this stuff. So, as you guys can see out here, the OS is kind of, OS detail is Fortinet, FortiGate. It kind of tries to guess the OS upon the time to live that is in the response from the packets that it sends. So, hyphen SV, hyphen O, and hyphen A are some really cool th stuff that you might want to know. Another thing that you can do is trace route, as I had just told y'all, and y'all can do trace route separately. So, you go hyphen hyphen trace route. And then you say the name of any sort of website. So suppose I want to know how I reach Netflix.com. So I go Netflix.com uh, and this will give me a trace route that shows me how my packet actually reaches Netflix.com. Okay, so this is basically it was a direct one hop 
Okay, so that was surprising. On the other hand, if I were to do this on edureka.co, it would take a bunch of hops to actually reach there. Okay, this might just take some time to run. Okay, so it's 94% done. I'm just waiting for it to get completed. Okay, so this gave us the hop. And as you guys can see, we took 22 hops to actually reach edureka.co. And it's the same process. You go through a bunch of IP addresses and then you reach this thing called US West to compute.amazon.aws. Okay, so that was about trace route. Now, just to end this tutorial, let me just tell you guys that you all can also save a file to Nmap, and that is basically save all whatever you found from a search into a file, and let me just show you how to do that. Now, sometimes when you are working as a security analyst, you will have to perform network scans on a wide area network that is huge. It's basically huge. And these scans take a lot of time, and you don't really have the space on your command line to actually store that and see that in a way that is feasible for analysis. So what you want to do is actually save it in a file. So what you can do is say nmap on and then you can say the name of the file. We could say results.txt and we could save this in file. So www.edureka.co so whatever search result is going to be generated is going to be stored in this file called results.txt. Now this file need not exist from before. It will just be created by nmap. And now you see if I do ls, we have a targets or a results.txt. Now if I just cat out that file, let me just less it actually. Results.txt. And what you see out here is an nmap scan result that is stored. Um, another thing that I would like to show you all before I end this nmap tutorial is a verbose mode. So for verbose mode is basically when we were pressing up arrows to see how much of our scan is done, you can basically do that with verbose mode. So you go hyphen F and hyphen V for verbose and you could say www.edureka.co. And this will basically give you a verbose mode of what is actually going on. I'll tell you everything and boom, roasted, there it's done. And we have finished our Nmap tutorial. What is cross-site scripting attack? Cross-site scripting attack is basically a code injection attack executed on the client side of the web application. The client side of a web application is usually the software that is used to interact with the web application. And in most cases, it is a browser that is used to interact with the web application. So in cross-site scripting attack, we inject a malicious code onto the web browser to make the web application do something that is ideally not supposed to do. So in this case, in this attack, the attacker injects the malicious script through the web browser. And what happens is this malicious script executes on the web application after it's injected on the web browser. The malicious script is executed either when the victim visits the web page or the web server. Now, like I told you, there are different types of cross-site scripting. Depending on what kind of cross-site scripting is being used, the malicious script executes when the victim visits the web page, a single web page, or maybe the web browser. This attack is mainly used to steal sensitive information like cookies, session tokens, and maybe other sensitive information, maybe if you're passing your username or password, and Using this malicious script, using cross-site scripting, those information can be stolen from the web browser or the web server. Cross-site scripting can also be used to modify the contents of the website. Because cross-site scripting attack is a code injection attack, you can modify the contents of the website by injecting malicious code onto the web server or the web browser. Now this is a brief about cross-site scripting. Now let's see how cross-site scripting actually works. Let's see what's the logic behind this attack. Cross-site scripting is basically a web application hacking technique. So you need a website, you need a web server and a victim. So what happens when you ideally access a website? So you have your laptop and then you use the internet connection to access a web page and maybe you interact it, maybe you send data to the web application, maybe you enter your data in the text box or even if you don't, there is some transaction of data that's happening between you and the web server through the website. So what happens is you send a request to the web server through the website and then the response from the web server is sent back to you through the web page or the website. Now what happens in cross-site scripting attack is a hacker can inject a malicious code on the website which is then sent either to the victim or to the web server depending on what kind of cross-site scripting you are using. 
and when this happens the malicious script is executed either when the victim visits a web page or when the victim tries to access a page or access some data from the web server and when all this is happening a hacker can inject a code which can be used to steal the credentials or any sensitive information and by this logic a hacker can inject a malicious script that can be used to steal the credentials or any other sensitive information of the victim either from the web browser or the web server so this is the logic behind cross site scripting attack now let's look at the different types of cross site scripting attacks there are mainly three types of cross site scripting attack one is the reflected cross site scripting and also cross site scripting is also known as xss that's the abbreviation for it so the first type is reflected in this case the data is not stored on the web server the next type is a dom which makes use of the document object model to inject the malicious script and the third type is the stored cross site scripting in this case the malicious script is stored on the web server so i'll be explaining these types in detail in the next slides when i'm telling you how to hack each of these kind so let's move on and see how you can use cross site scripting attack to hack a web application now like i told you earlier there are three types of cross site scripting attacks and i'll be showing you how to hack each of them so the first type would be reflected cross site scripting so in this type of attack the script is executed on the victim side and it is mainly executed on the browser so the script is not sent to the server or even if it's sent depending on the api calls or the request the script is not stored on the browser side and that's why it's called reflected cross site scripting because the malicious script is reflected on the victim side and it's not really stored on the server now let's see how to hack a web application using reflected cross site scripting i'm using dam vulnerable web application to show you these demos so if you don't know what this is or how to install and configure it i have a video on how to install dam vulnerable web application go through it install it on your system and then you can practice different hacking techniques on this so here i've chosen a reflected cross site scripting attack now let's see how this works here's a text box where i have to enter my name and then hit a submit button so let me just enter some value and see how this web application is designed to work i'll be entering my name and i'll hit the submit button so i can see that this web application or this website is designed to echo my name on the website so what happens is when i enter a name and the web page takes the input and prints hello and the input that was given by me now as you can see i cannot really modify a lot but i have total control over what input i can give in the text box so this is the place where i'll be injecting my code so what i'm going to do is i'm going to type a html code i'll use a h1 tag first which is used to mention the headers and i'll type something and i'll close the tag so this is the code used to display something in h1 tag so let me just submit and if this web application is vulnerable to reflected cross site scripting you should see a different output so let me just hit the submit button so here you can see that the output is modified because i've used the h1 tag the way that my input is displayed on the web application is different and this clearly indicates that this web application is vulnerable to cross site scripting attacks now let me give some malicious script here so i'll be typing script this is a tag to execute any script and i'll be creating a pop up to display something and let me just hit the submit button and if this works you should see a pop up that says hello and yeah you did see a pop up that says hello so this clearly means that this web application is vulnerable to reflected cross site scripting now you might be thinking how is this hacking a web application just because i inject a code that displays the content in a different way it's not really hacking right so let me tell you how this can be dangerous so instead of displaying something in a different way i'll try to get some sensitive information from this web application and what i'm going to do is use the script tag and create a pop up but instead of printing a string i'll try to access the cookies for this web application or for this user basically so let me just hit the submit button and here you can see that the session id is displayed and using this session id i can log into a different account even if i don't know the username and password for that account now what is a session id basically a session id is a unique string assigned to a particular user when the session is going on by the web server to identify that particular user 
so suppose you log in to your account your gmail account your facebook account or your banking account and i can get hold of your session id i can use this session id and using a tool like burp suit i can log in to your account without even knowing the password so this is how dangerous a cross site scripting attack can be now i was just using the low security level let me just increase the security level and see what changes has to be done in this attack so i'll just increase the level to medium i'll click the reflected cross site scripting attack again now let me give the same input let me give script alert and some string and i'll just close the script tag i'll hit the submit button now you can see that previously when the security was low you saw a pop up that said hello but in this case i don't see a pop up that means that this web application under medium security is doing something to avoid cross site scripting now how would you know what it's actually doing now look at the output the input i gave was script alert hello and i closed the script tag so this was the input that i gave to the web application and the output was only this so this means that the web application is doing something to eliminate this script tag and the end script tag so i'll just change my input to something like this so i'll be using the same input but i'll modify it a little because the web application is designed to remove the script tag i just modify it a little i just modify this code to look something like this i'll add a nested script tag First let me give this as a input let's see if it works and if it works i'll tell you how this actually works and what's the logic behind this so just copy paste this and let me hit the submit button now like you can see this actually worked so when i use the nested script tag it actually worked now let me explain how this actually worked so like i told you this web application is designed to eliminate the script tag and when i give this as the input what the web application did is it looked at the input it found the script tag here and it eliminated the script tag and because i had nested a script tag even when it eliminated the main script tag there was another script tag that was formed and this is how you could see the pop up so basically when you nest a script tag the script tag is eliminated and when the script tag is eliminated the divided part of the script tag is concatenated as a string like you can see here and then this code is executed so this is how we can use cross site scripting if the web application is designed to eliminate the script tag now let me just increase the security i'll just increase it to high and hit the submit button then let me go to cross site scripting reflected let me give the first input that is the direct approach and you don't see a pop up so it means that the web application is handling the cross site scripting attack let me try the previous input and even now you see the same output now let me just show you the code that is used to sanitize the input on this web application so this is the code that is used to sanitize the input so what's happening here is this code is making use of regular expression and wherever there's a script tag found or wherever there's a script tag formed it is replacing that with a blank space or with a empty character so basically this means that we cannot use the script tag in any way now what other options do we have so what you can do is give a malicious script or give a malicious input without using a script tag now what you can do is you can use other tags of html or php i'll be using the image tag i'll be mentioning the source to some random thing and i'll be using this function called on mouse over and what the web page should do when the mouse is over that particular image so this line basically tells there's a image and the source to that image is this file which is a dummy value in this case and if the mouse is over that image then create a pop up that displays the string hello now let me just give this as the input and see if it works i'll just hit the submit button okay so now we can see that it says hello but you didn't see a pop up and because we have given a function on mouse over for the alert or for the pop up to appear you have to move your cursor on the image so when i move the cursor on the image you see that the pop up appears now what you can do is in this case i've not given any image as a source but what you can do is you can download a image that says click here and instead of giving a dummy value you can give the source to that image so when you use that malicious code what will be displayed is hello and the image that says click here so when the user will go to that image to click on that image 
basically because the mouse is over that image you see a pop-up so that's when your malicious code will be executed so this is all about reflected cross-site scripting let's move on to the next type that is stored cross-site scripting so like you saw in reflected cross-site scripting the data is not being stored on the web server it is executed on the web browser now in stored cross-site scripting what happens is the script is stored and executed on the server so there are a lot of web applications like facebook where you comment on a picture where someone uploads a picture you comment on a picture or you post a status on your wall or on your timeline so this data is stored in the database of the server and every time somebody clicks on that page or tries to access that data the web server fetches that data from the database and then displays it on the web browser so when you're using stored cross-site scripting attack you're basically storing this malicious script on the web server or the database that is being used by the web server the advantage of stored cross-site scripting is because it is stored on the web server every time any user that is accessing that data will be executing the malicious code now let's see how you can use stored cross-site scripting to hack a web application so this is a web page for stored cross-site scripting attack there's a name and there's a message so let me just give some input i'll type test one and the message will be message one and i'll just hit the sign guestbook button so basically this takes a name and it takes a message and then it stores there so even if i refresh this you can see that the data is still present because this is stored in the database and it is being fetched every time i access this web page now what i'm gonna do is try to inject some malicious code here so i'll give the name as test2 and then i'll try the first input the direct approach and i'll hit the sign guestbook button so you can see that there's a pop-up that appears so this means that this web application is vulnerable to cross-site scripting attack so even if i refresh this you can see that it executes the malicious script executes so every time a user visits this web page the malicious script executes so it's the same in the case of applications that store data from the user for example like i told you about facebook when you post something there's a comment or when you post something on your timeline you post a status on your timeline and any other user or any other profile accesses that page to view your photos or to look at your status or the comments on any of the posts they basically ask the web server to fetch that data and that data is basically stored in a database so in that case any user who accesses that data executes that malicious script now let me just increase the security and see what changes we have to make or what security features have been implemented and before trying the next injection i'll just clear this guestbook or else every time i refresh the malicious code will be executed and i'll see the outputs i'll see the pop-ups so let me just clear the guestbook all right so what i'm gonna do is gonna type the same input that i gave earlier so that'll be test one and the malicious script hit the guestbook button and see that it's not working i don't see a pop-up here so there's some way that this web application on a medium level is handling the malicious input now i'm gonna try to give the malicious input in the name field but i'm not able to type a lot of characters let me see the message field i'll just type message one and i'm not able to type more characters so this is because the text box is limited to take a limited number of characters i'm going to manipulate this by changing that restriction so what i'm going to do i'm going to inspect the web page and here i can see that there's a line that says max length equal to 10 which means that this text box is designed to take only 10 characters as input so what i'm going to do is i'm going to change this value to 100 and i'll just hit the enter button and close this window and now try to give the input so because i've manipulated it i've changed the max length of the input i can give more characters as the input and let's see if it works it still didn't work that means even the name field is designed to sanitize the input now let me just modify the input so i'm gonna nest the script tag because here i can see that the script tags are being eliminated or they're being cut off so if i find a way to manipulate the script tag like i showed you in reflected cross-site scripting maybe i can execute this code so what i'm gonna do is paste the script i'll again have to change the max length
I'll change the max length to 100 and then give the input and here I'll be using nested script tags similar to the way that I use in reflected cross-site scripting. I'll type a message here message to and let me see if this works. Well, it did work and because I could see from the output that the web application was designed to eliminate the script tag. I just manipulated the way you inserted the script tag. I used the nested script tag and then I could execute the malicious code. Now let's move on to the next level of security and before that I'll just clear the guest book. And I'll just increase the security. Go back to cross site scripting stored. Now again, I'm going to try the previous input the previous malicious script and see if it works. I'll change the max length to 100 again. Give the nested script tag as the input and the message would be message one. Let's see if it works. Okay, it didn't work and similar to how it was used in reflected cross-site scripting. I think this code is also using regular expressions to eliminate any script tags, uh, but just to confirm I'll just open the code for you and see if it's actually true. Yes, yeah, so it's same in this case. So what it's doing it's basically identifying all the script tags using regular expressions and then replacing it with a blank space. So it basically means that you cannot use any script tags. So you need to use the alternative of the script tag. Now similar to the previous case like how we use in reflected cross site scripting. I'm going to use the image tag for this and before that I'll change the max length field. And the input I'll be giving will be image source x on mouse over i'll be creating a pop-up that says hello and some message here i just hit the sign guest book button so now we can see that this worked but the pop-up didn't appear because the function that i use is on mouse over so let me see if i get the mouse over on the image yes it did work so when i brought the mouse over that image you saw that the pop-up appeared so this is how stored cross-site scripting can be hacked now let's move on to the next type of cross-site scripting attack that is DOM cross-site scripting. So DOM basically stands for document object model and it is basically the way the website is designed. So when you use DOM cross-site scripting, it is a client side attack. The script is not sent to the server or it is not stored on the server. It stays on the client side and the way this works is the web page sends a request to the server. The server sends a response. The server script is executed first and this is the genuine script that the server has to execute. So that is executed first and then the malicious script is executed. So let's see how to use DOM cross site scripting. So this is the web page that is vulnerable to DOM cross site scripting. So there are different options here. There are different languages and when I select one and hit the select button, nothing is seen on the web page, but you can see the URL is changed. So you can see that the default is set to English. Now let me change the value. I'll hit the select button. Let me change the language and hit the select button. So you can see that the language is being changed. So basically in this web page, I don't have a text box where I can give the input. Every manipulation that I have to do or every script that I have to inject here should be done in the URL. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to manipulate this. So instead of giving friends, I'll use my malicious script here. So the script will be script alert hello and I'll close the script tag so when I executed it you can see that the pop-up appeared that means in DOM based cross-site scripting you mainly manipulate the URL that is being used or the URL that is being generated so this is the low level let me increase the security I'll change it to high let me give the same input again script alert the string is hello and I'll close the script tag. Let me hit the enter button. Well, it didn't work. It actually went back to default as English. So let's see what's the code behind this. What's the logic behind this? So what's happening here is it's finding the script tag and it's just stripping the script tag and it's setting the default to English. So it means I cannot use the script tag. Now what if I use the nested script tag? Let me try that also. Let me nest the script tag like I did in the previous stages. Let me nest the script tag. 
well this also didn't work so this web application under medium security is designed in such a way that if there's any script tag it will set the default to english the language to english now how can you bypass this for this i'm going to inspect the element so let me see how the web page is displaying all this data here you can see there's a form tag and there are different options here so i'm going to make use of this syntax to inject my malicious query i'll just copy paste this so this is a line that displays english as the value so what i'm going to do is manipulate this so the way this is designed is there's a select tag and under this there are different options english i'm not typing the whole code because i want you to understand the logic and other inputs and then the select tag is closed and when one of the option is selected maybe english so this option is selected if i choose any different option maybe french then this line is selected and so on so what i'm going to do is manipulate the url in such a way that the option tags is closed earlier so basically when i choose english as the default it says english default so this part of the code is executed and this is used to close but instead of letting the page do it i'll give that as the input in the url so what i'm going to do in the url is i'm going to close the tag right here the option tag and the select tag and i'm going to use the body tag here and the function on load which has to create a pop up that says hello let me hit the enter button now as you can see here i could successfully inject the malicious code in the url so how this works is so when i choose english as the option this part is executed so instead of the web page closing this for me i'm adding another option tag and i'm adding another select tag so what happens is this part of the code does not execute because i'm closing it here and then i'm typing my malicious script here and that's how this code successfully executed for medium security level now let me increase the security level to high and see how it works let me try the direct approach well this didn't work let me use the previous approach well this also didn't work so the web page is designed to sanitize the url so let me see the code for this so this code is designed in such a way that it only takes these languages as the input and if there's anything else apart from these languages it will set the default to english now how to approach this so to hack this you need a little idea about how web pages are designed there's something called an anchor tag so anchor tags are basically used to index a particular part of the web page let me show you an example so i'll open a blog that uses the anchor tag and then explain you how this works so here you can see the url that says edureka.co blog and the url of the blog and if you scroll down a little as usual there are different contents on the web page and what i want you to see is the index part so there are different topics that are covered in this blog and here's a list of it so what happens when i click on one of this is the web page takes me to that particular part of the web page So in case I click this, it takes me to how to use network scanning tool. And uh, in case I click on types of network scanning, it'll take me to that part of the web page. Now what I want you to observe is whenever I click on one of the anchor tags, the URL is regenerated to point me to that particular section of the web page. I'm going to make use of this feature of web design or web development to hack our web application. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a pound symbol or the hash symbol and then use my malicious script after that. So because the pound symbol is used to index or to point to a certain page on the same website, this web page will not consider it as the input. It will just think that we are trying to point to a particular part in the web page. So let me type hello and then close the script tag. Let me hit the enter button and see if this actually works. Well, it did work. So you can see that there's a pop up that says hello and this is how you can use a pound sign or the internal anchor feature of the blogs 
to inject the malicious code so this is all about cross-site scripting attack we saw three types of cross-site scripting that is reflected stored and dom and what type of cross-site scripting attack you use depends on how the web page is designed you cannot use dom cross-site scripting on a web page that is vulnerable to stored cross-site scripting so first you have to understand how the web page works how the web application works and then decide which type of cross-site scripting attack to use now let's move on to the next topic that is how to prevent cross-site scripting attacks so the first thing you can do is escape the user input so there are special characters like greater than symbol smaller than symbol which are generally used in tags or in malicious script or maybe the percentage symbol so the first thing you can do is escaping these characters which means that you take off the special feature of this character and make it just another text character the next thing you can do is consider all input as a threat because the user has complete control on what input he gives you have to assume that every input is a thread and sanitize and handle every input with care the next thing you can do is data validation suppose you have a field of login where you can enter username and password uh, what you can do is use data validation especially in case of email ids because you know the generic format for an email id there should be a username there should be a at the rate symbol then something then dot com or dot something so you can use data validation to avoid cross-site scripting attacks Next thing you have to do is sanitize the data like you saw in the demo that some of the web pages were sanitizing data they were eliminating the script tags or they were eliminating any script tag founds and they were also using regular expressions to eliminate all the script tags that can be generated so this is how you can sanitize data the input data next thing you can do is encode the output so what happens is when i gave the script tag and alert as the input as the malicious script the arrow symbols were being treated as the arrow symbols what you can do is you can url encode them so the arrow symbol will be something like percentage 25 so when you encode it it's no longer a malicious script so you can use encoding url encoding for the input or for the output next thing you can do is use the right response headers you can decide what the response headers should be you can decide what data can be sent or what data can be received through the response headers and finally what you can do is use content security policies so this is a standard it is also known as csp standard so you can use a content security policy to avoid cross-site scripting to know more about this you can just google it you can just google content security policy to know what standards are this firstly let's go over what dos and dos means now to understand a DDoS attack, it is essential to understand the fundamentals of a DOS attack. DOS simply stands for denial of service. This service could be of any kind. For example, imagine your mother confiscates your cell phone when you are preparing for your exams to help you study without any sort of distraction. While the intentions of your mother is truly out of care and concern, you are being denied the service of calling and any other service offered by your cell phone. Now with respect to a computer and computer networks, a denial of service could be in the form of hijacking web servers, overloading ports with requests, rendering them unusable, denying wireless authentication, and denying any sort of service that is provided on the internet. Attacks of such intent can be performed from a single machine. While single machine attacks are much easier to execute and monitor, they are also easy to detect and mitigate. To solve this issue, the attack could be executed from multiple devices spread across a wide area. Not only does this make it difficult to stop the attack, but it also becomes near impossible to point out the main culprit. Such attacks are called distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks. Now let's see how they work. The main idea of a DDoS attack, as explained, is making a certain service unavailable. Since everything that is attacked is in reality running on a machine, the service can be made unavailable if the performance of the machine can be brought down. This is the fundamental behind DOS and DDoS attacks. Now, some DOS attacks are executed by flooding servers with connection requests until the server is overloaded and is deemed useless. Others are executed by sending unfragmented packets to a server which they are unable to handle. These methods, when executed by a botnet, exponentially increase the amount of damage that they are doing and their difficulty to mitigate increases in leaps and bounds. To understand more about how these attacks work, let us look at the different types of attacks. Now, while there are plenty of ways to perform a DDoS attack, I'll be listing down the more famous ones. These methodologies have become famous due to their success rate and the damage they have caused over time. 
It is important to note that with the advancement in technology, the more creative minds have devised more devious ways to perform DOS attacks. Now, the first type of methodology that we're going to discuss is called ping of death. Now, according to the TCP IP protocol, the maximum size of a packet can be 65,535 bytes. The ping of death attack exploits this particular fact. In this type of attack, the attacker sends packets that are more than the max packet size when the packet fragments are added up. Computers generally do not know what to do with such packets and end up freezing or sometimes crashing entirely. Then we come to reflected attacks. This particular attack is more often than not used with the help of a botnet. The attacker sends a host of innocent computers a connection request using a botnet, which are also called reflectors. Now this connection that comes from the botnet looks like it comes from the victim and this is done by spoofing the source part in the packet header. This makes the host of computers send an acknowledgement to the victim computer. Since there are multiple such requests from the different computers to the same machine, this overloads the computer and crashes it. This type of attack is also known as a smurf attack. Another type of attack is called mail bomb. Now mail bomb attacks generally attack email servers. In this type of attack, instead of packets, oversized emails filled with random garbage values are sent to the target's email server. This generally crashes the email server due to a sudden spike in load and renders them useless until fixed. Last but not the least, we have the teardrop attack. So in this type of attack, the fragmentation offset field of a packet is abused. One of the fields in an IP header is the fragment offset field, indicating the starting position or offset of the data contained in a fragmented packet relative to the data in the original packet. If the sum of the offset and the size of one fragmented packet differs from that of the next fragmented packet, the packets overlap. Now, when this happens, the server vulnerable to teardrop attacks is unable to reassemble the packets, resulting in a denial of service condition. Okay, so that was all the theoretical portion of this video. Now it's time to actually perform our very own DDoS attack. Okay, so now that we finished the theoretical part of how DDoS actually works and what it actually is with its different types, let me just give you guys a quick demonstration on how you could apply a denial of service attack on a wireless network anywhere around you. Like this could be somewhere like Starbucks where you're sitting, or this could be a library also, or your college institution. No matter where you're sitting, this procedure will work. So the first thing we want to do is actually open up a terminal as because we will be doing most of our work on a command line basis. Now for this particular demonstration, we will be actually using two tools. First is Aircrack NG, which is a suite of tools which contains Aircrack NG, Airmon NG, Air Replay NG, and Aerodump NG. So these are the four tools that come along with it. And the second one that we'll be using is called Mac Changer. Okay, so let me just put my terminal on maximum so you guys can see what I'm actually writing out. So first thing we want to do is actually log in as a root. So let me just do that quickly. So because we need to log in as root because most of the stuff that we're going to do right now will need administrator access. Now, if the first thing we want to do is check out our wireless network card's name, and we can do that easily by typing ifconfig. Now you can see that my wireless card is called WLO1 and uh, we get the MAC address and we also get the IPv6 address. So that's my wireless network card and we'll be actually setting that up in monitor mode. Now, before we actually go into and start up our network card in monitor mode, let me just show you how you can install the two tools that I just spoke about. That is Aircrack NG and Mac Changer. So to install Aircrack NG, you can just go apt get install Aircrack NG, hit enter, and this should do it for you. I already have it installed, so it's not going to do much. To install Mac Changer, you could just go the same command that is apt get install Mac Changer, and you can check if both the tools have been installed properly by opening the manual pages by typing man Aircrack NG, and this will open up the manual page for you. And let's also do the same for Mac Changer. So what we're going to do first is set up our network interface card into monitor mode. So to do that, all we have to do is type ifconfig, and we need to put our network interface card down. So we go wlo one down. And with the command iwconfig, we go mode monitor. Don't forget to specify the interface that you're working on. So iwconfig wlo one mode monitor. And all we have to do now is put it back up. So what we are going to type is ifconfig wlo one up. You can check the mode. It'll say managed if it's in monitoring mode. So as you guys can see, it says mode managed. So that's how we're going to go ahead. 
So you can check that just for your own purposes. So we can also check for only WL01 by specifying the interface. Or you could also check the mode only by passing it through a pipe function, and that is using grep mode. So iwconfig WL01 grep and mode. Well, mode begins with a capital M, so that's how you would probably return it. So as you guys can see, that has returned the mode for us, and gone along with the access point and the frequency. Okay, so that was a little fun trivia on how you could fetch the mode from a certain command that like iwconfig by passing it through a pipe and grabbing it with mode. Grab basically means grab. Okay, so now moving on, we'll get to the more important stuff now. So firstly, we need to check for some sub processes that might still be running and that might actually interfere with our scanning process. So to do that, what we do is airmon ng check and then the name of the interface. Now, as you guys can see, I have the network manager that is running out here and we need to kill that first and that can be easily done by going kill with the PID. After that, you can run a general command called airmon ng check and kill. So whatever it finds, it will kill it accordingly. And when it produces no results like this, that means you're ready to go as there are no sub processes running that might actually interfere with our scan. Now, what we want to do is we want to run a dump scan on the network interface card and check out all the possible access points that are available to us. So as you guys can see, this produces a bunch of access points and they come with their BSS IDs. They also have the power, which is the PWR, that is the power of the signal. And let me go down back again. So yeah, you can see the beacons, you can see the data, you can see the channels available. And what the BSS ID is, it's the MAC ID that is actually tied in with the ESS ID, which basically represents the name of the router. Now, what we want to do from here is we want to choose which router we want to actually DOS. Now, the whole process of DOSing is actually we will continuously deauthenticate all the devices that are connected to it. So for now, I have chosen Edureka Wi-Fi to actually DOS out. And once I send a deauthentication broadcast, it will actually deauthenticate all the devices that are connected to it. Now, this deauthentication is done with a tool called Air Replay, which is a part of the Aircrack NG suite of tools. Now let us just see how we can use air replay by opening up the help command. So we go dash dash help and this opens up the help command for us. Now, as you guys can see, it shows us that we can send a deauthentication message by typing in the hyphen zero and then we need to type in the count. So what we are going to do is type in hyphen zero, which will send a deauthentication message. And now we can type one or zero. So one will send only one deauthentication message while zero will continuously loop it and send a bunch of deauthentication messages. We are going to say zero because we want to be sure that we are deauthenticating everybody. And we can also generally specify the person we also want to specifically deauthenticate. But for this demonstration, I'm just going to try and deauthenticate everybody that is there. So, what we are going to do is we are going to copy down the MAC address or the BSS ID as you would know it. And then we are going to run the authentication message. Now, as you guys can see, our deauthentication message is beginning to hunt on channel 9. Now, as you guys know, and as I already know, that our BSS ID or the MAC address is working on channel six. Now, we can easily change the channel that our interface is working on by just going iwconfig wl one and then channel and then specifying the channel. Now, as you guys can see, our chosen router is working on channel six, so that's exactly what we're gonna do. Now, as you guys can see, it immediately starts sending deauthentication codes to the specified router. And this will actually make any device that is connected to that router almost unusable. You might see that you are still connected to the Wi-Fi, but try browsing the internet with them. You will never be able to actually reach any site as I'm constantly deauthenticating your service. You will need that four-way handshake all the time. And even if it completes, you are suddenly deauthenticated again because I'm running this thing on a loop. Now, you can let this command run for a few moments or how much of a time you want to DDoS that guy for. Well, this is not exactly a DDoS because you're doing it from one single machine, but you can also optimize this code to actually look like it's running from several different machines. So let me just show you how to do that. We are going to write a script file to actually optimize our code a lot. So this script file will actually automate most of the things that we just did and also optimize a little by changing our MAC address every single time. So we become hard to actually point out. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to put our wireless network card down. And maybe that's not the first thing that I want to do. 
just give me a moment to think about this. I haven't actually thought this through. And I'm doing this on the fly. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to start a while loop that is going to continuously run until we actually externally stop it. So we go while true, and then we're going to say do. And the first thing that we want to do is send out a deauthentication message, and we are going to send it around 10 deauthentication messages. And we want to run it on a specific BSS ID. So that is the BSS ID that I had copied. So let me just put in that. And then we just put in the interface that it's supposed to work on. Now, what we want to do after that is we want to change the MAC address after we have sent all these 10 packets. So what we will need to do is put our, down our wireless network. And as you already discussed, we can do that with ifconfig wl one down. And now what we want to do is change our MAC address. So we can do that with the simple tool that we had installed and saying MAC changer hyphen R. So let me just open up a quick tab and show you guys how Mac Changer actually works. Now you can already check out my other video called the ethical hacking course, which actually covers a lot of topics and Mac Changer is just one of them. And you can check how to use it in depth in that video. But for now, let me just give you a brief introduction to how Mac Changer works. The Mac Changer will basically give you a new Mac address every time. Uh, let me just open up the help menu for you guys. So as you guys can see, these are the options that are available to us. We can get a random MAC address. We can also tell it to show our MAC address. And we also have to specify the interface when we want to show us the MAC address. Now, let me just generate a new MAC address. Uh, so you see out here that interface up or insufficient permissions is being shown. So this means we always have to put down our interface first. So let me just do that quickly. I have config WL1 down. And now what we want to do is give ourselves a new MAC address and boom roasted we already have a new mac address as you guys can see from the new mac part now if we put back our in network interface card and then try and show our mac address again we see that our current mac and our permanent mac are two completely different mac addresses and our current mac and the new mac are identical so this is how you can actually generate new mac addresses to spoof your own identity on the wire and that is very useful in this case because the person you're attacking will be so confused as to what to do because your MAC address is changing every time and there's no real solution to the situation that you're creating for him. At least I don't know of any solution. If you do know how to stop this for yourself, please leave it down in the comment section below and help the world a little bit. Now we want to also get to know what our MAC address is every time. So let me just pipe my function through the whole thing and let me just try and grab the new mac address so mac changer r wl1 and grep mac and then we want to put our network card in the monitor mode and then we also want to put up our network interface card now what we want to do out here is optimize it so we can't be attacking constantly so let us put a sleep timer so this will make our program sleep for a particular amount of time i'm going to make it sleep for five seconds so after every five seconds it's gonna send that particular BSS ID 10 deauthentication messages. Then it's going to bring down my interface card. It's going to change my MAC address. It's going to put back the interface card into monitor mode and sleep for five seconds and then repeat the entire process. And to end the script, let's just say done. So that will denote when the loop is done. Now let me just save it. Control O, Control X to exit. And there we go. Okay, so first of all, to actually run this, we need to give it some more permissions. So as you guys can see, we already have it. Let me just put it in a much more readable format. Okay, so as you guys can see, our DOS DOS SH doesn't really have executability. So we can do that with the command ch mod. So I'm going to give it some executable permissions. So chmod plus x and then the name of the file. So this will actually change our dos dos sh into a executable bash script. Okay, so it seems that we have done some error. So let's just go back into our bash script and check for the error that we have probably done. So nano dos dos sh dos dot sh. Ah, uh, okay, so the thing that I am missing is that I forgot the hyphen A that I'm supposed to put before putting the BSS ID in the air replay ng part of the code. So let me just go ahead and quickly do that. Okay, so now that that is done, let me just save it and quickly exit and see if this thing is working. Okay, so now we are trying to work out our script. Now 
you guys should know that this Edurec Wi-Fi is my company's Wi-Fi and I have complete permission to go ahead and do this to them. Also, my company's Wi-Fi is kind of secure. So every time it senses that a de-authentication message is being sent like that, it kind of changes the channel that it is working on. So these guys are really smart, smarter than me most of the time. And this time I'm just going to try and force them to work on channel six. So let me just go ahead and run my script once. Okay, so let me just check that they're still working on channel six. Yep, they're still working on channel six. Let me just check my script once if it's correctly done, if I have the perfect Mac ID. Let me just copy in the Mac ID just to be sure once again. So there you go, we've copied it. Let's go into the script and let's paste it out. Okay, so now that that is done and we have the Mac IDs and everything set up properly, let me just show you how to run the script. So you go dot and backward slash and then you said dos dos sh. Now you see that our thing is working on channel 8. So this will definitely not work and will say that BSS ID is not there. So what we need to do, as I had showed to you guys earlier, we can go iwconfig wl1 and change the channel to channel 6. Oops, I changed it to channel 8 again. Um, this will not work. I'm sorry, that was my bad. So now that we have changed it to channel 6, you can see that it is sending everything immediately. Okay, so that is actually running our script very well. And as you guys can see, the security measures that are taken by my company, it will not always work on channel six. It'll keep rotating now until it finds a safe channel. So it really can't find a safe channel. I will always be dosing on channel six and it will run sometimes and it won't run sometimes, but mostly with unsecured Wi-Fi that is running at your home mostly, uh, this will work 100% times. So let me just stop this because my company will go mad on me if I just keep on dosing them. So this brings us to the end of our demonstration. This is how you can always dos your neighbors if they're annoying you. But remember, if you're caught, you could be prosecuted. So this was about how DDoS works, what DDoS actually is, and the different types, and how you can do one on your own with your own system. So let us understand what SQL injection is. SQL injection is one of the most used and one of the most common web-based attacks. So for SQL injection to work, you need a web application that uses a database. Let me tell you with an example what SQL injection is. Consider an example where there's a web application that's using a database. This web application might be taking input from the user and storing the information onto the database or it might be fetching data from the database and displaying out to the user. In either case, what happens is there's a SQL query or a database query that's generated on the web application, which is sent to the database and uh, this query is executed on the database and relevant information is returned back to the web application. Now this is how the normal scenario is. So what happens when you use SQL injection is you manipulate this database query in order to make it do something that it is ideally not supposed to do. So you change the SQL query, you manipulate it, you inject some malicious string in the SQL query and then make it do something that it is not ideally supposed to do. So what happens is you manipulate the query and then this malicious query is sent to the database, it's executed there and the relevant results are returned. Now this is SQL injection. So SQL injection is a code injection technique which is used to execute malicious SQL statements on the database. So basically SQL injection attack is something that you use to take over database servers. Now that you've got a high level understanding of what SQL injection is, let's understand how SQL injection works. Moving on to understanding how SQL injection works, let's take an example of a web application that takes username and password for login. Now on a day-to-day -day base, you use a lot of web application where the first thing you have to do is log in into the web application. You can consider the example of your Gmail account, your email ID, your Facebook account, your Twitter, Instagram, and even your internet banking services. So the first thing you have to do in order to use the features or the functions of this web application is to log in into the web application. So what you usually do is you enter the username, then you enter the password. Now because SQL injection works only on a web application that's using the database and suppose the details of all the username and their password is stored in a database, what actually happens is there's a database and in this database there's a table that is storing all the usernames 
and their respective passwords. So when you hit the login button after entering the username and the password that input information is sent to the database and it is cross checked with the table. So if there is any user with that username and the password to that username is right then there's a successful match and there's a successful login and if there is no user with that particular username or if there is a user with that particular username but the password to that username is wrong then the login is unsuccessful so this is how the usual case is now what we are actually interested in is not the flow of how this works but the sql query that's generated in order to do this job so for this example the simple query that would be generated would look something like this so there is select star where star means fetch any number of rows that matches some condition from users where users is the name of the database table then there's a condition to check the username equal to abc at xyz.com and the password should be 123456 so when this sql query is generated if there is a user with the username abc at xyz.com and the password to that username is 123456 then that particular row is returned and if there is no user with this particular username and password then there is no rows or there is no values returned so basically if this sql query returns some value or returns a true value then the login is successful and if this sql query returns a false value then the login is unsuccessful so this is how it actually works now like i told you we are not interested in the flow of how this works we are only interested in the sql query that's generated let me just highlight the sql query for you so this is the same sql query that i showed in the previous slide now what i've done is i've highlighted some part of this sql query now why have i done that i've highlighted the part that is the input to this sql query now when you're using a web application the sql query is pre-generated by the web application and the only control the user has is over the input so the part I've highlighted is the user input and that's the only part in the whole SQL query that the user has control over. So whatever changes we have to make or whatever we have to do in order to execute a SQL injection attack should be done by giving the right inputs. Now, like I told you that if this SQL query returns true, then the login is successful. And if this SQL query returns false, then the login is unsuccessful. So SQL injection attack is a web based attack where we manipulate this SQL query in order to always return true even if we don't know the username or if we don't know the password now the question is how can we do that to do that we'll be using something called an or logic gate so for that i'll be explaining you first what an or logic is so or logic is a function that takes certain inputs and gives an output now let's take an example where a and b is the input and out is the output now suppose there's an or function uh, running on the inputs a and b if both the inputs are false then the output is false if one of the input is true then the output is true and if both the inputs are true then the output is true now what you have to observe here is when one of the input is true then irrespective of what the other input is the output is always true so whenever there is one input true the output is always true and we'll be using this feature of the or function in the sql injection attack so there is this sql query and the objective is to make this sql query return true so i'm going to manipulate this sql query to something like this and like i told you that the user doesn't have control over the sql query that's generated and the only control the user has is over the input that is given so I'll be giving this as the input. The input will be inverted comma space or one equal to one hyphen hyphen space. Now uh, this part of this query is the part which always returns true. Now let me just highlight that particular part for you and explain how this malicious string actually works. Now the input is uh, inverted comma space or space one equal to one. Now the first inverted comma is used to close the string parameter. Whenever you give something as an input in the input box of the web application, then it is considered as a string in most of the cases, especially for username and the password. So the first inverted comma is used to close this parameter, the string parameter. Then there is the OR function and after that there is a statement that is one equal to one. Now if you see this, there are two inputs. 
there's the or function and there's one input to the left hand side and there's one input to the right hand side what we are interested in is the statement that is to the right hand side of the or function that is one equal to one now this is a statement that will always return true because one is always equal to one and like we've already understood that if one of the input to the or function is true then irrespective of what the other input is the result will always be true so in this case because one is always equal to one and that is true then this function the or function will always return true and hence the sql query will always return true now what is the use of the extra double hyphen that i've used so the double hyphen i've used is to comment out the rest of the sql query and that's why i have faded out the and password part so when i use double hyphen it doesn't matter what the next part of the sql query is and like we've understood that this or function returns true then the sql query returns true meaning that the login is successful so this is how sql injection works now let's see how you can use sql injection to attack a web application in the previous slide i showed you one malicious string that can be used for sql injection but there is no one universal string that can be used for sql injection now what kind of sql injection you use or how you use the sql injection depends on how the web application is built just so you can understand in a better way how sql injection can be used differently i have taken two examples in this session where in each case the data is being passed in different ways so first i'll explain to you what are these different methods that the data is being passed so the first way that the data is being passed is by using the get method so when a web application is using the get method to pass data maybe from one web page to another or from a web page to the database the data that is being sent is sent through the url of the request so the data that is being sent is visible in the url let's take an example where there's a login page and uh, there's a username and a password field you enter the username maybe as admin and the password is also the ad and when you hit the login button suppose the web application is using the get method then the url request will look something like this in this case there's a name of the web page and there is also the information that is being passed that is the username and the password so when you use the get method the data that is being passed is visible in the url now let's see an example where there's a web application that is using the get method and let's see how you can use sql injection to hack that web application i've built this web application that uses get method to pass the data and this is how the web application looks before telling you how it works let's just have a look at the database so to show you the contents of the database let me first log in into the database now i'm using the database named test so let me just select it first so first let's see what are the contents of this database table so the name of the database table is login details so let me just print out all the rows and columns that are in this table so there are two columns in this table one is the username and one is the password and there are three entries the username and password for the respective username now let's see how this web application works so first i'll show you the code i've used to build this web application so this is the code that handles the login activity so first it takes the data from the web application the html page then it connects to the database then it uses the sql query and it selects the user which has that particular username and that password and if there's a user with that particular username and password then it prints a success message and if there is no user with that username and password then it prints a failure message now let's see how this web application works so i'll just give some valid inputs first there is admin with the password admin let me just hit the login button well this was a success let me try another input where the username is at eureka and the password is one two three four five six let me try logging in and it was also a success now what if i give some wrong input so i'll give tony as a username and some random thing as a password let me try logging in and it's a failure because that user name does not exist in the database and obviously the password also now what you have to observe is because this web application is using the get method to pass data you can see the data in the url of the string especially this part where the username is tony and the password is this random string well now we can see that the data is being passed using the get method and the data is visible in the url of the request 
now what we'll do to use sql injection attack on this is we'll use that malicious string i showed you during the slides to bypass this login so what i'm going to do is erase the username and use the malicious string so the string is inverted comma space or one equal to one hyphen hyphen space so what should happen when i hit enter is this sql query should return true and the login should be successful and we should see a success message on the screen so let me just hit the enter button well the login was successful and we can see that the sql injection attack worked uh, this is how you can use sql injection while you're trying to hack the web application that uses get method to pass data well there's another method that can be used to pass data and it is called the post method now let's see what this post method is when a web application is using the post method to pass data maybe from one web page to another or from a web page to the database then the data that is being sent is not visible in the url string now let me show you how you can use sql injection attack on a web application that is using the post method this is the web application that uh, uses post method to pass data from the web page to the database i've kept the interface same because it doesn't matter how the web application looks so what matters is how it works so let me give some valid input at first uh, the first username was admin and the password was admin let me just hit the login button and you see the login was successful let me use another entry the username is at eureka and the password is one two three four five six and let me hit the login button and the login was successful now let me try some wrong input some invalid input some random characters and some random password let me hit the login button and the login was a failure so you can see that the web application works in the exact same way apart from one thing that when i hit the login button the username and the password is not seen in the url you can only see the name of the web page and not the data that is being sent now in the previous case you could see the username and the password in the url and you use the malicious string to hack the web application now that there is no username and password in the url how would you hack this web application like i told you while explaining how sql injection works the only control the user has over the web application is in the input that he gives so whatever malicious string that we are going to enter will be through the input that we give to the web application now let's use the malicious string in the username and the password field and see whether it is vulnerable to sql injection well the malicious string was uh, inverted comma or one equal to one hyphen hyphen space and let me just give some random password and let me hit the login button well this was a success and you can see i didn't give the right username and i didn't give the right password but still i used the malicious string and used sql injection attack on this web application well this is how you can hack a web application that is using post method to transfer data now the next part of this session is how to prevent sql injection well when you are an ethical hacker and you have to test a web application for vulnerabilities and suppose you found that that web application is vulnerable to sql injection attacks now you have to tell the organization on how they can make their security better and that's why it's important to know that how you can prevent sql injection attacks there are different ways of preventing sql injection attacks and it all depends on how the web application is built just so you know i'll be explaining one such way that you can use to prevent sql injection attack now there's another web application that i've built that prevents sql injection attack so let me just show you how it works i'll show you the code and i'll show you what changes i've made and then explain how this prevents sql injection attacks so the first part of the code is same it takes username and password from the html page from the input and then it connects to the database and then it runs some uh, sql query to check if the username and the password is valid and finally it returns a success if it's true and it returns a failure message if the login is unsuccessful now the changes i've made is in this part of the code what i've done is i'm using some method some function called prepare and bind parameter and what this actually does is it binds the whole input that the user gives as a string like i told you previously that the inverted comma was used to close the string parameter when you use the bind parameter function that whole malicious string is considered as a string now just so you can understand it better i've just visualized this logic so you can understand better so i'll get back to the slide and explain how this works 
So what we actually did was there was a username and the password field and we entered the malicious string in the username or the password and we could log in successfully. Now when you use the methods that I used in the code what actually happens is this whole string the whole malicious string is considered as a string and the inverted comma used is also considered as a string. Now when you use the bind parameter function what happens is the whole malicious string is considered as a string and the or one equal to one hyphen hyphen is not considered as a logic in the code. So when you use the bind parameter and even if you give this malicious string as the input it is sent to the database as the string it is compared it is cross checked with the username and the password in the database table and because there is no match the login will be unsuccessful. This is one way how you can prevent SQL injection. There are many other ways that you can use. You can use form validations. You can limit the characters that can be used as password and uh, there are many other ways and it all depends on how the web application is built. So you remember the last time you went shopping online? Remember all the pictures of clothes, books and electronics that you looked at? What if I tell you that those images weren't really for you? What if those pants you were looking at were really detailed blueprints of military installments? You would never know, right? This is the nature of steganography. Steganography is science of hiding information from plain sight. Secret communication is very important because if your message is important and if you do not want others to know about your message, then you use different kind of techniques to hide your message from third person. And steganography is one such technique. However, criminals and terrorist organizations are using this for their own purpose. So understanding how to hide data using steganography and prevent the data from being misused will be very helpful. However, to talk about steganography, we should consider its predecessor cryptography, which is science of writing and secret codes. Basically, cryptography makes messages meaningless to the casual reader by encrypting the data using set of rules which are known to both sender and receiver. Only the intended receiver with the decryption key can extract the actual message. Thus, when an attacker discovers the message, it is still difficult for him to get the secret message. If cryptography is a strong way to encrypt and secure a communication, then why do we need a new technique? Answer is very simple. When we are using any cryptography technique, we need to send a secret key and third person can easily judge that some secret kind of communication is going on. In simple terms, cryptography does not try to hide the fact that secret message is being sent. This is where steganography comes into picture. The main reason of using steganography is that you are hiding your secret message behind an ordinary file. No one will suspect the fact that a communication or some sort of secret message is being sent. People will generally think it is an ordinary file and your secret message will go without any suspicion. Unlike cryptography, which conceals the content of a secret message, steganography conceals the very fact that message is being communicated. So if I have to define steganography, it is an ancient art of covering messages in a secret way such that only the sender and the receiver knows the presence of the message. Well, now if you're thinking steganography is a brand new method, then you are mistaken. Steganography is an ancient practice. The word steganography is derived from Greek words steganos, meaning hidden, or concealed and graphin which means writing or drawing before moving further let's get a glimpse of how steganography evolved from past the concept of steganography was first introduced in 1499 but the idea itself has existed since ancient times there are stories of a method being used in roman empire whereby a slave chosen to convey a secret message had his scalp shaved clean and a message was tattooed onto his skin when the messenger's hair grew back he was dispatched on a secret mission. On the other end, the receiver shaved the messenger's scalp again and read the secret message. Well, that was one way of doing it. Demaritus, the king of Sparta, sent a secret message on tablet covered with wax. When it was received at the other end, the wax was scraped off to recover the message. Another oldest and the most fascinating and common way to hide message is to use invisible inks. The actual message can be made visible if document was heated gently. Next came the null cipher. Null cipher refers to the method of encrypting where plain text is mixed with actual message. Next was hiding data in the images. Microdots were used to conceal a message. 
A micro dot is a simple text or an image which is reduced in size to hide its contents. And this micro dot or the images or the text which are present in a micro dot are then read using magnifiers. Apart from these techniques, there are others as well, like spread spectrum, semagrams, etc. So, like I said earlier, steganography is an ancient practice. The majority of today's steganographic systems use multimedia objects like image, audio, video, etc. as cover media. Well, if you don't know what I mean when I say cover media, don't worry about it. You will know more about it as we progress through this session. But for now, cover media is a place where you actually store your hidden information or you store your secret information. So based on the type of cover media, steganography is divided into multiple types. To begin with, we have text steganography. Text steganography is hiding information inside the text files. It involves things like changing the format of existing text, changing words within a text, generating random character sequences, or using some sort of context free grammar to generate readable text. Well, there are different methods to hide data in text. Some of the popular ones include format based method, random and statistical generation, linguistic method. Moving on, we have image technography. This is nothing but hiding data in an image. It's one of the most popular way of hiding data because in image, there are huge number of bits present in digital representation. So it's easy to store or hide data in an image. There are a lot of ways to hide your information inside an image. Common approach includes LSP steganography, which we'll be discussing in detail later. And then there is masking and filtering, some sort of encryption techniques, and many others. Moving on, audio steganography. It sounds according to its name. In audio steganography, a secret message is embedded into an audio signal, which alters the binary sequence of corresponding audio file. Then there is video steganography. In video steganography, you can hide any kind of data in digital video format. The advantage of this type of steganography is that large amount of data can be hidden very easily. You can think of it as combination of image steganography and audio steganography. Well, there are two classes of video steganography. One is embedding data in uncompressed raw video and then compressing it later. Other one is embedding data directly into compressed data stream. And next there is network steganography. Like it sounds, it's a technique of embedding information within network control protocols like TCP, UDP, ICMP, and many others. For example, you can hide information in the header of an TCP IP packet in some fields that are either optional or not important. And finally, there's email steganography. It's not a very well known type, but anyway, email that contains the files embedded within head information using steganography can be very difficult to detect as well as read. Now that we have learned of different types of steganography, let's take a look at few features that a steganographic technique must and should possess. I'm sure you can see an image of an adorable and cute kitten on the screen, right? Well, that's our cover image or the file where we store our secret data. So the first feature that any steganographic technique must possess is transparency. It's an important feature. Each cover media, it can be image or audio or video, has certain information hiding capacity. If more information or data is hidden inside the cover, then it will result in degradation of cover media. As you can see, the stego image or our final image after hiding data inside our cover image is not proper or exactly similar to our original image, right? So there's some sort of distortion. So if attacker notices this distortion, then our steganographic technique fails and there is possibility that our original message can be extracted and damaged by attacker. Well, that's the first feature. Next feature is robustness. Robustness is the ability of hidden message to remain undamaged even if the stego media undergoes some sort of transformation like cropping or scaling and blurring or linear and non-linear filtering or some sort of hindrance. So we have to make sure that technique in any way doesn't affect our secret message. And the last property tamper resistance. This is one of the most important feature because if attacker is successful in destroying the steganographic technique, then the tamper resistant property makes it difficult for the attacker to alter or damage the original data. Well, you can think of it as a last step that as a sender you can do to protect your data from other people. Okay, so till now we have covered what steganography is, a bit about its history and its types. Now let's go through a basic steganographic model. Well, it's pretty simple concept. But before we start, we should be aware of a few technical terms that I was using earlier and which I said I'll explain later. So here we go. We have something called cover object or cover file. 
this is the file that we will use to hide the information. It could be an image or a video or an audio or network or the different types which we discussed earlier. And then there is our secret message. As you know, this is a secret information that we want to hide into cover object. And sometimes you also have something called Stego key and I'll explain you what that is when we encounter it. So let's get started then. So there is an steganographic encoder which uses some sort of steganographic method or function to embed the secret message which is represented by M into our cover object or cover file X. So as you can see there's a function which takes X which is our cover file M that is secret message and another input that's K. Like I said K is nothing but key or stego key. It is a key to embed data in a cover and extract data from the stego medium. Well, it's optional using a key provides extra security. That is all. So basically our steganographic encoder method or function takes this cover image secret message and key as an input and embeds our secret message into cover object. Embedding process generates a stego object and the stego object looks exactly like our cover object. Now this stego object is sent to receiver through the network without any encryption here. So this is where our steganographic encoding process ends. Now if on the other end receiver wants to extract the secret message all he has to do is feed the stego object into steganographic decoder which also takes key as one of its input and then as a result he gets secret message which was intended for him. So like I said it's a very simple process right. So if I summarize you have your cover file which could be image audio or anything and then you have your secret message both of them along with the key if you want are fed into steganographic encoder as a result you get your stego object which looks exactly same as cover object and this stego object is sent to receiver through secure communication channel without or without encryption on the other end if receiver wants to extract the secret data he feeds this stego object into steganographic decoder and he gets cover object and secret message as an output so this is how a steganography actually works well if i want to make this process more secure i can add one more step which is encryption let's see how to do that so like i said there's a sender before actually feeding the secret information into steganographic encoder he encrypts this secret message along with an encryption key as a result he gets a cipher text or like we discussed when we were discussing cryptography the meaningless text or the cipher text this cipher text along with steganographic key or stego key and cover file is fed into steganographic encoder embedding process generates a stego object and this is where our encoding process ends this stego object which looks exactly like our cover object is sent to receiver using a secure communication channel now on the other end if the receiver wants to extract the secret message he feeds this stego object along with stego key into steganographic decoder as a result he gets a cipher text and to decrypt the data he feeds the cipher text and the key that's decryption key into decryption algorithm and as a result he gets the secret message which was intended for him through the sender. So there you go guys that's simple. So like I said earlier we discussed the most simple process if you want to make it more secure you can include encryption as well. So basically any type of steganographic method or technique works this way. It's just that the type of algorithm they use or the encryption algorithm or the technique they use to embed data into an image or an video or it could be anything that's cover object is different. So guys till now we've learned about what steganography is and how a steganographic technique actually works. It's time that we should learn about one of the most popular steganographic technique which is LSP steganography. If you remember earlier we talked about image steganography you know where we hide secret data inside an image. Well, one of the popular technique to hide secret message inside an image is LSB steganography or least significant bit steganography. Now, before we jump into what LSB steganography is, let's take a look at a few basic concepts. On the screen, I have an image. To be more precise, let's call it a digital image. Every digital image is a finite set of digital values called pixels. You have probably heard the term before and generally know that pixels make up an image. Pixel is actually short for picture element. Well, you can think of them as dots of illumination, typically so small that you're unable to see them. Thousands or even millions of individual pixels together make up an image. So each pixel can be one color at a time. However, pixels are so small that often blend together to form new colors. In this session, we will work with RGB color model. The RGB color model is an additive color model in which red, green, and blue light are combined together in different ways to reproduce a broad array of colors. 
and each of these can be represented using a binary code. So like I said, I have three values which are R, G, B, that's red, green and blue and each of this value is represented in a binary code. So by mixing the 8 bit binary red, green and blue values, pixel can be any color and the color is usually determined by number of bits used to represent it. Well, in this case, we are using 8 bits so we can display for about 250 colors. Moving on when we are working with binary values, we have more significant bits and less significant bits. The leftmost bit is the most significant bit. On the other hand, rightmost bit is the less significant bit. Now, if we change the leftmost bits, that is most significant bit, it will have a large impact on final value. For example, let's say I have 255 and its binary representation, which is 8 once in 8 bit representation. Now, if we change the leftmost bit from 1 to 0, the decimal value will change from 255 to 127. As you can see, the amount of change is very huge here. It has made a large impact on final value. On the other hand, the rightmost bit is the less significant bit. Now, if I change the rightmost bit, it will have less impact on final value. For example, if we change the leftmost bit, which is 1 to 0, it will change the decimal value from 255 to 254. And you can note that the change is about decimal 002%. Which is very less when compared to most significant bit. So the point I want to state here is that if we change most significant bit or MSB, it will have larger impact on final value. But if we change LSB, the impact on final value is very less. This very point is made use by LSB steganography. So in this method, which is LSB steganography, least significant bit of an image or of a pixel in an image is replaced with a bit of a secret image. The result of this process alters the original output very slightly. So your cover image and your stigo image, that's your final result after hiding the data, look exactly same without any difference. This technique works very good for image, audio and video stenography. Well, let's consider a simple example. Suppose we want to insert letter A into an image. The binary representation of A is 1 followed by 5 zeros and again 1. Now, like I said earlier, we are using RGB color model here. So and I'm using 8 bits to represent each of these value, which is red, green and blue. So I'll be needing about three consecutive pixels. That's about nine bytes to replace all the least significant bits by the bits of the letter A. Well, don't worry about it. You'll understand once you see the next image that I show you on the screen. So like I said, I'm considering three pixels, which is about nine bytes. So these are the pixels before insertion. I've picked like random pixels. So as you can see, I have three pixels, one, two, three and nine. So totally nine bytes I have here. And now if we replace the last bit or LSP for each byte with a bit from binary representation of A, what we get is this. So as you can see, I have replaced the zero with this one here. So as you can see, zero is replaced with one. And then I have five zeros, zero, zero, like five zeros followed by one, one, which is already one. So I'm not replacing anything here. So as you can see, all the color bits have been replaced here. So once you are done with replacing, you'll find that the final result or the stigo image is very much identical to your actual image. That's your cover object. On an average, LSP requires that only half of the bits in the image can be changed. As you can see, I've like left three or four bits unchanged here. For example, this one, this one and the zero here. The zero in the first line in the last line, I have two ones left without changing it. So if need required, you can hide data and the least and the second least significant bits as well. And still the human eye would not be able to discern it. So guys, that's all about least significant bits technography. Well, that's the concept. So to summarize, every pixel can be represented using different color models. Well, in this demo, I've used RGB color model and if each of these values are represented using eight bits. Well, you can use a different number of bits as well. And this number of bits used usually determine the color which pixel displays. Like I said, we have used eight bits here and in a binary format, we have least significant bit and more significant bit. Like I said, changing more significant bit makes more changes to our final value, but that does not happen when we change the least significant bit. So we made use of that point. So basically the least significant bits technography make uses of the fact that changing LSB doesn't make much change to our actual image. So it replaces the LSBs in the cover object by the binary bits of secret message. So there you go guys. Now you know the theory part of the concept. It's time to perform a small demo. In this demo, we'll see how to use the concept of LSP stenography and hide secret text in an image. So here are the steps involved. 
First, to encode the text into image, the program loads an image and looks or considers each pixel hexadecimal's value. Then the program asks you for the secret text and converts it into its binary form. And then one by one, it stores the secret message bits into LSP of image pixels, which is our blue value bits of RGB model. After the message is embedded into an image, program adds delimiter to the end to determine when the text ends. So here ends the encoding process. Suppose you want to retrieve the data, then the program extracts all the zeros and ones from the Stego image until delimiter is found, and there goes our secret message. So these are the steps we'll be performing in the program. So guys, this is what a program does. Well, to summarize, it takes our image, it converts that into hexadecimal values, it takes our secret text and converts it into its binary value, then it replaces the LSB of cover image with the bits of secret message. Once it does that, it adds some delimiter at the end so that we know that this is where the text ended. So this is how encoding is done. Suppose you want to retrieve the message, all you have to do is extract zeros and ones from the stick object and convert the binary form into string format. That way you can get your secret message or the receiver can extract the secret message. Well, I'm using the code which I found in GitHub. And suppose if you guys want to experiment as well, please do post your um, email IDs in the comment section below and we'll get back to you with the code. Now let's get started with the demo. So guys, I'll be using my Ubuntu system here. So as you can see, I have a code. Let me show it to you guys. I have code here and have certain images of different formats. I have one of JPG and one of PNG as well. Okay, let me delete this file, move to trash. So going back to terminal, let me show you guys the code first. The file name was hide file. Okay, I think I've misspelled it wrong anyway. Let me just check it anyway. It's HIDs. Silly mistake. Hide dot pi. Here we go, guys. I already have code because I've already extracted it from Git and I'm using it here. So I'm just gonna explain you the basic concept of how this code works actually. So like I said, we're gonna convert our uh, image into a hexadecimal format. So I have a code which converts RGB values to hexadecimal values. Before that, since we're using images here, we need to import certain libraries. We need Python library image or PIL, which is below. Well, if you're using Windows operating system, you need to separately download it. But if in Ubuntu, it comes by default. And suppose if it doesn't work, let me go back. Well, if it doesn't work, all you have to do is make sure you have Python 3 version installed. For that, check Python 3 version. And make sure you have pip installed. Again, you can uh, check using version command itself. Okay. So as you can see, I have pip installed. And suppose if you don't have, please do install it. The command is simple. All you have to do is the sudo apt install python3 pip. That's it. I'll just click enter and it'll install. I'm not doing it again because I already have it installed like you guys saw. And once you've done that, do install pillow sudo pip install pillow. That's all. And then it'll work. That's just the way of installing pillow library. Let me clear the stuff. Let's go back to program. So since we're using images, like I said, we need to use certain libraries. Here we'll be using Pillow Library. So if you get an error while using this program, please do install pip and Pillow. So getting back to program, like I said, here we're using an image and converting that to its hexadecimal format. And similarly, while retrieving it, we're using the inverse function of it. And our secret message, which is in string format, we're converting into binary and binary to string. And then there is encode. Basically, it goes through the hex code and places the binary bit of a secret message into the hex code. Similarly, the inverse program is decode. It'll decode the hex format. First, it'll check if for the zeros and ones, and then it pulls the data from that. So basically, we have four main functions here, which is encode, decode, hide, and retrieve. Like I said, encode and decode. Like I said earlier, it checks for the hex code, hexadecimal code, and then replaces the bits and decode. It checks if the hex code has zeros and ones, it'll extract the data. If hex code doesn't have any zeros and ones, it'll return none. So there you go. Now, uh, these are the basic functions. And then comes the complex function, which is to hide a message. I have a hide function here. Just go through it. It's very, very simple. So basically, as you can see, this hide function, it takes file name and the message. It opens the image library where it gives the file name as input and then converts the message from string format to binary format. and uh, adds the delimiter as we discussed in the 3D part of the session so that while extracting you know that you have reached the end of the text so basically first it checks if our image in, is in rgb format or not if it doesn't and then it converts to it and then there it goes and uh, basically it takes each and every bit 
checks if the bit is in proper format, if the actual bit of the secret message can fit into this and all that, and then replaces the bit. And once it has encoded the secret message completely into our image, it returns a message saying completed. If the mode of the image or if your file doesn't exist and for all that, it returns a message saying incorrect image mode couldn't hide. Now, the retrieve function is as very simple, the most simple one. It's taking the file name from which you'll have to extract the data. If it checks first, it checks if it's in the RGA format. I mean, that's red, green, blue format. And if it's not, it's going to convert into it properly. And from there, it's going to extract the data. And then it retrieves all the zeros and ones until it finds delimiter. Once it has found the delimiter, it gets to know that it has reached the end of the text and then it displays the message success. Otherwise, it will give you an error message. Finally, we have our main function. So basically, we're going to give like string. You have switch option while writing code, right? Either in Java or C++, anyway. Just like that, I'm going to give a code. Well, it's not going to display to the user, but anyway, it's in this code according to the code. You need to use a command like Python, the file name, as in the file name and which contains the code, hyphen E to embed the data and the image and the text which has to be embedded and all that. Oh, we'll get to know when we actually perform the demo. So let me just summarize what we've learned in the code again. So just basically go through it. It's very simple. So like I said, we are using Pillow, a library. For that, we need to install it properly. If not, the program doesn't work. So make sure you have Python and after that install pip and through pip install Pillow. And like I said, we're converting our uh, image into his XRSML format using this function and inverse using this function and our secret message to binary and binary to string. And code, it basically checks for each and every XRSML of our image and replaces that by zero or one of a secret message. And then you have decode. It checks if the hexadecimal code has zeros or ones. If it does, it extracts the data. Otherwise, it returns not. And then there's our hide image, which actually embeds the data into our image. So it will take file name and message as input. It checks if the image is actually in um, RBA format. And before that, it converts our message into binary format and all that. And then based on certain conditions, it embeds the data properly into the image. If there is some error regarding the mode of the image you're using or if the text file doesn't exist, it shows an error message. Same goes for the retrieval as well. It checks for the zeros and ones, extracts until it finds a delimiter, and then it gives you a success message. So there we go, guys. The program is simple. So if you guys want a copy of the code, and please do post your uh, email ID in the comment section below, and we'll get back to you with the code. And now that you've understood the code, let's go ahead and see if this works properly. For that, I'm going to exit. Before that, like I said, I have my uh, few images here, docs, .jpg, then cat and cube and all that. I need a text file to hide, right? So here I go. Okay, I've just typed some random message. Board meeting is on Tuesday. Please do send weapons, lawyers, and food. So I'm going to save it in my home page itself. Let me just give it a name, msg.text, and click. Let me close it. So now going back to files, as you can see, I have a file here, which is msg.txt. Now I'm going to use a DOGS, a docs JP, the image. Oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you this program only works for PNG images, so I can't use docs image. It, let's take cube.png, so Python, because we are using the Python code. I meant the file is in Python format, right? Python, and uh, the file name is have py, e to embed, and the file name, which is cube dot png enter a message to hide well basically this doesn't actually take a file which contains the message it directly asks you to enter the message to hide but don't worry the file which we just created i'll show how to use it for while we are discussing the steganographic tools anyway getting back to what we'll be doing hide a message so so it says it's completed now let's get back to files now, if in case I open QPNG, it's same as before. You won't find any changes here. Getting back to terminal, if I want to extract the message, siphon D and enter success, it says the message is extracted, which is high and we weapons to you know where. So that's easy, guys. Well, it's a very simple program. It's just taking an image, it's taking, it's asking you to enter the message and it's embedding in that. So, well, you can take this as a base code and create your own code, which performs many things or advanced steganography as well. So basically to summarize in this program, what we did was we converted our secret message into its binary form and we took the file, the bits in the binary code and replaced the least significant bits or the blue color bits of RGB color model by these bits of secret message. So basically we're replacing the least significant bits. 
so that our cover image, that's cover object, as well as a stego object, both are same and look identical. Now let's get back to PPT. So guys, earlier we discussed about the instance stenographic methods. There are various ways of achieving the stenography in this digital communication world. However, you do not need to perform coding to achieve this. There are various software tools are available for stenography. This software can hide your secret message behind the image file or audio file or video file or any kind of file, basically. So we are going to take a look at few such uh, tools and I'm going to show you how to use them, maybe at least two or three. So there we go. The first tool is Stigo Suite. Basically, here you can hide any kind of text inside an image. Then you have Stigo Hide. It hides a secret file in an image or audio file. Then you have Sio Steganography. It's a free software where you can hide your files inside BMP images or WAV files. That's WAV files. And then there is Suite Pixel, which works as in it's similar to other tools where you can hide data and images, but the way it works is slightly different. I show you how it actually works, so don't worry about it for now. Then there is OpenPuff, where you can conceal all the files in an image, audio, or flash files. And then camouflage tools that let you hide any type of files inside any other file. So these are very few. There are other tools outside as well. As for today, we're going to explore three to four tools, which is Stego Suit. Other one is Stego Hide, then Sio Steganography, and Suit Pixel. So there we go, guys. Let's begin with Stego Hide. Let's go back to our Ubuntu. So this tech hide is an open source technography software that lets you hide your secret file in image or audio file. You will not notice any change in the image or audio file. It is a command line software. Therefore, you need to learn the command line to use this tool. And therefore, I have come back to Ubuntu here. So I already have it installed. It's very easy to install. App get install tech hide. It'll install. Use the command just sudo apt get install tech hide. And click enter. I'm not doing it. It's going to take time. Since I've already done it, I'm going to straight away use it. So, stig hide. Well, as soon as you enter the command stig hide, it'll show you the help command related to the stig hide. So, basically, it says the first argument should be one of the following that is, either you should embed the data or extract the data. And uh, you have various options that you can add in commands to use your cover object or the stigo object or your secret message. And you have options to compress and encrypt the file before actually putting it into an image for hiding it as well. And then suppose if you want entire information about your file after encrypting it, you can use different commands as well, which for example, let me, yeah, you have info command here. If you use that command, it'll display all the information about your file. And when you're trying to embed data, it'll ask you for a passphrase. Basically, it's nothing but just like key. You can think of it as a key or a password. Basically, it's making sure that you're the right user who has entered a hidden the data or extracting it. So, well, to make it easier for people using it, they also have given a few examples here. So, usually the command begins with steg hide, the command name, and embed to embed the file. Hyphen CF is refers to your cover object. It's the name of your cover object. And then you have your secret message. And for that, you're using hyphen EF. Let's do that. So, steg hide embed before that let me go back to files so i'm using this docs jpg and the message dot text which we created earlier embed iphone cf so that's docs dot jpg and iphone ef which is our msg dot txt right cool it says enter passphrase which let's say a b c d it says embedding and it's done now to check if it's done that properly or not, let's go back to files. I'm going to move it to desktop. Click on enter. Cool. Now let's go back to desktop. Here is our file. Now to extract, I'm using extract command. Before that, I need to go to my desktop, right? Because that's where my file is stored. Here we are and stick hide. Extract SF is what you use to extract your stego file. You can see it in the help session. And the name was docs.jpg. It's asking for the passphrase, more for security purposes. So it says extracted to message.txt. Now to check the file, you need to go back to desktop because that's where our file should be. And if you open that with editor, there you go. We have successfully extracted the data from the image. Now let's try a few other commands. Let me come back. Okay, let me try it here. Stig hide. What was that? Info command, right? Info. And let's say, so as you can see, it's extracted the information about the file. 
it's in format, it's capacity, and it says they want to get information about the emitted data as well. Why? Could not extract any data with the data phase because already extracted the secret message from that file. Well, if you hadn't extracted, then maybe it would have showed the embedded content as well. So that's how you use a stay guide. You have multiple other options as well. Like, for example, when you were trying to embed, it asks you for the passphrase, right? Instead, if you don't want it to ask like this, you can use hyphen p command and enter the passphrase. You can add it in the command itself here. And then it actually skips that step and actually goes back to this embedding message and done step. So yeah, that's all about stay guide. Now let's go back to other tools. So the next tool we'll be using is a Stego suit. It is a free steganography tool, which is written in Java. And with Stego suit, you can easily hide in confidential information and image files. So I have a file called sample here. I have certain images. It's in JPJ format. It's a BMP file. And then there is a PNG file as well. So first tool that we're going to explore is Stego suit. So Stego, yeah, there we go. This is the Stego suit tool. It looks very simple. Basically, there's nothing here. So click on file open and select the file in which you want to embed the text or the secret data. Let's go back to sample. And here I'm using this PNG image open. Here it's ask you for the test which you want to embed in the image. So this is the secret text I want to hide. If you want, you can give the password and embed. It says embedding completed. The file is saved to desktop sample image embed.jpg. Let's go back and check sample. And here we go. You have an image and properties. It's a JPG file. Let's try opening it. There you go, guys. It looks similar to our actual message. Well, it doesn't look different at all, but the data is actually hidden inside it, right? To know that, all you have to do is let's just rename this. Let's say image E. That's the embedded format of our image. It says the image is open. Okay, I'm gonna close the suit. So yeah, you can see the image here. Let's uh, rename it image E. Now, if you want to retrieve the message, stego suit file open select the file in which the text was embedded which is image e and open enter the password which is and extract so as you can see it has extracted the text message which earlier i hid into the image hey this is a secret test i want to hide well go ahead and try to use it it's fun it doesn't have any other functionalities apart from these it's a very basic simple tool let's go to our next tool which is sio steganography well, it's a free software that can be used to hide secret files in BMP, that's bitmap images or WAV files. Use of this tool is very easy. You can just open the software, load any BMP image or WAV file to its interface, and then add a file which you want to hide. And this also supports encryption, multiple formats. Well, instead of telling all this to you, let me just show it to you. So as you can see, I have it already installed. It's just one step installation. And to add the file, as in to encode, you need to click on this add files option to extract. You can use this. First, let's try to add files. So the first name, all you have to do is load your BMP or WAV file. And sample, I have one BMP image. I'm going to load it open. Well, uh, as you can see, the size is slightly bigger. Click on next here. So now that you've loaded your cover image, you'll have to load the image or the file which you want to store in this cover image. For that, you click on add file option here. Let's say I want to store this image. Let's try open and uh, next. So as I said, it shows different encryption formats here. So you can select from various algorithms like RC4. Then you have triple DS, DS, triple DS with 1112 and many other formats. And it's asking for the password. Give some password. Click on next. So the embedding is done. It's asking you to name the file. Let's say bird and save. So the final file is similar to the actual BMP image. You can't make out any changes, right? But there is a secret data which is hidden inside it, which is another image. Now let me close, finish. Let's try to extract it. Click on this extract files and load the source file, which should be a bird. Then open, next. It's asking for the password. So A, B, C, D, that's what I'd give it. And extract file, image two, dot J, save. File extract successful, okay. Finish, let's go back to the location and see. So here we go. We had tried to store this image too in the bird, but after that we tried to extract it. So there we go guys. The image has been successfully extracted. This way you can store any kind of file 
it can be your excel file or word file document file or powerpoint file or image or anything so that's your sios technography tool so like i said you can add the files but to extract the message you'll have to start using this file from the beginning again and then uh, let's go back to our next tool which is issued pixel it's here let me just check i have um, installed it i'm gonna extract all let's store it in our desktop and okay now if you go to desktop this is our application pixel click on that so guys even this is a tool where you can store any kind of hidden information but it has a different approach when compared to other tools it uses image file as a key to protect your hidden text inside an image that is to hide and unhide text inside an image you need to enter another image as a key so as you can see you have three images here original image that's your target image and delta image which acts as a key instead of giving some password or anything it takes another image as a key or passphrase so open original image desktop let's go to samples let's try fly now uh, you need to enter the message hi this is the text i want to hide and here i'm clicking on encrypt message save image let's try and save it somewhere else desktop let's store it in the documents file name uh, my image and save now let me open the thing again or you can just say reset exit here now if i open the application again let's try to extract what we just hid so open the original message which is in desktop right sample that's flying open decrypt image so there you go so let me show it to you again all you have to do is reset click on the open original image give the original image which you try to encrypt that would be flying and open and then say decrypt image so like i said it uses an image as a key to extract or hide anything inside your image and now give your actual image as in the encrypted encoded image or your stego image and click on open yeah and just say yes so as you can see it has extracted the data which i was trying to hide so i am sure you might have observed right the way it functions is slightly different from other uh, stenographic tools so let us now move ahead and see few of the roles that ethical hackers do there seem to be a general misconception that a person with an ethical hacking career is only responsible for penetration testing of system and application well this is not true an ethical hacker is responsible for much more you see ethical hacker perform operations such as scanning open and closed port using nmap tool and then ethical hacker is engaged in social engineering methodologies examining patches released to perform various vigorous vulnerability analysis on them and an ethical hacker will see if he or she can evade an ips which is nothing but intrusion prevention system honey pots and firewall ethical hackers can also employ their strategies into sniffing networks bypassing and cracking wireless encryption and hijacking web services and web applications as ethical hackers tries to replicate working of black hat hacker by analyzing the defense protocols and social engineering aspect of an organization thus to sum up ethical hacker job role is to protect the privacy of an organization that ethical hacker is working for then immaculate report any sort of breach in the system to the corresponding division with the responsibility of mending the vulnerabilities and update hardware and software vendors regarding the sort of vulnerabilities found in the product that is being used in orchestrating the business all right so moving ahead let us now see why ethical hacking is important we all know that data has become invaluable resource accordingly the prevention of privacy and integration of data has also increased in the importance in the essence this makes ethical hacking extremely important today this is primarily due to the fact that almost every business out there has a internet facing side whether be it public relation content marketing or sales internet is being used as a medium this makes any endpoint that is being used to serve the medium a possible vulnerabilities furthermore hackers of the present age have proven themselves to be creative genius when it comes to penetrating into a system fighting fire with fire might not work in the real world but to fight off a hacker so smart an organization needs someone who has the same training to go through recent hacking outrages have led to losses amounting to millions of dollars these incidents have cautioned businesses around the globe 
and made them rethink their stance on the importance of ethical hacking and cybersecurity. By now, I'm sure you have a motive to study ethical hacking. Let me now walk you through the roadmap to become an ethical hacker. How you begin your road to become an ethical hacker very much depends on your current field of occupation, study or research. If you're not in the field that is remotely related to computer science, information technology or cybersecurity, you might need to shift to one. For someone who is at the early stage of their career, this might be an easy task. But for others, suddenly changing their field into work is a daring task. Having a bachelor's degree certainly helps you slag the job. But you can pass most of the beginner level interview with a general knowledge of networking and operating systems. Technical knowledge aside, an ethical hacker must be a creative thinker. And a reason for this is that ethical hackers have to predict and prevent crack activities and this requires out of the box thinking. Apart from that, ethical hacker should also think like an hacker in order to beat him in its own game. Furthermore, ethical hackers need to be able to work under pressure with immaculate judgment. Last but not least, an ethical hacker must be proficient at communicating the problems he finds to the corresponding department. Those who are skeptical about going to college could pursue their career in the military. Having some experience in the military, particularly in the intelligence faction, could help your resume get noticed by necessary employers. Getting a job as a ethical hacker prior to getting industry experience is really difficult. After getting an entry-level job such as tech support engineer or a security analyst, you may try attending some of the partnered certification which will definitely give you a certain edge over the others while you're applying for the job. Speaking about certifications, let's discuss about it. While talent and ability aren't established only by certification, but they do help when you're proving your knowledge and skills to others. Even if you don't have ample industry experience, a certification like Certified Ethical Hacker, in short CHE, unquestionably helps. CHE is an unbiased credential and generally CHE Certified Ethical Hackers are in high demand. According to Payscale, Certified Ethical Hacker, in short CHE, earns around $88,000 per annum. Apart from CHE, few other noteworthy certifications are SANS Certification, Certified Vulnerability Assessor, Certified Professional Ethical Hacker, and then Certified Penetration Testing Engineer. Alright, now, so moving ahead, let me now speak about few of the skills that ethical hackers should have. As I mentioned earlier, an ethical hacker is a computer expert who specializes in networking and penetration testing. Some of the skills that I would say important are experience in various operating systems, primarily in Linux and its various distribution. This is because a good portion of vulnerability testing includes invading the target system and shifting through their systems. This is impossible without a good grasp of an operating system. Then, in-depth knowledge of networking is also a key to a successful ethical hacking career. This involves packet tracking, packet sniffing, intrusion detection, prevention, and scanning subnets. Also, programming is an important skill. Now, programming is a very vast topic with different approach in every language. As an ethical hacker, it is not expected of you to be a master coder, but to be a jack of all trades. Whenever I have mentioned programming is an ethical hacking essential, I have been asked why. This is because most people don't have the slightest clue about the roles and responsibilities of an ethical hacker. Here are the few reasons that makes programming knowledge critical in ethical hacking career. You see, ethical hackers are problem solvers and tool builders. Learning how to program will help you implement solutions to the problem. Programming also helps in automating tasks that would generally take up precious time to compete. Writing program can also help you identify and exploit programming errors in application that will be targeted. Programming knowledge also helps you in customizing pre-existing tools in order to cater to your needs. Talking about tools used in ethical hacking, let me walk you through a few of them. Although it is impossible to go through every ethical hacking tool in this single session, hence I'll be just going through some of the really famous ones. Starting off with Nmap. Nmap, which is a shorthand term for Network Mapper. It is a reconnaissance tool that is widely used by ethical hackers to gain information about the target system. This information is key to decide proceeding steps to attack the target system. Nmap is a cross-platform and works on Mac, Linux, and Windows. It has gained immense popularity in hacking community due to its ease of use and powerful searching and scanning abilities. Next, we have NetSpeaker. NetSpeaker is a web application security testing tool, and NetSpeaker finds and reports web application vulnerabilities such as SQL injection, cross-site scripting, on all type of web applications, regardless of the platform technology that they are built with. NetSpeaker's unique and dead accuracy proof building security technology does not just report vulnerabilities, 
It also produces a proof of concept to confirm that no false alarms have been ringing, freeing you from having to double check the identified vulnerabilities. Moving ahead to the next tool that is Burp Suit Enterprise Edition. Burp Suit is a JavaScript based web penetration testing framework. It has become an industry standard and this tool is used by information security professionals. Burp Suit helps you identify vulnerabilities and verify attack vectors that are affecting web applications. Burp Suit's unquestionable acceptance and fame came to an attribute to the fantastic web application crawler. It can accurately map content and functionality, thus automatically handling sessions and handle all sort of state change violation content and application logins. Moving on to our next tool that is nothing but Metasploit. Metasploit is an open source pen testing framework written in Ruby. This acts as a public resource for reaching security vulnerabilities and developing code that allows network administrator to break into his own network to identify security risk and document the vulnerabilities. It is also one of few tools used by beginning hackers to practice their skills. It allows you to replicate website for phishing and other social engineering purposes. So the first question is, what do you mean by cybersecurity? So as an interviewee, I'd expect that the candidate should first tell me the need for cybersecurity, his views on cybersecurity. So the candidate should be like this. Today's generation lives on the internet, and we general users are almost ignorant as to how those random bits of ones and zeros reach securely to our computer. For a hacker, it's a golden age. With so many access points, public IPs, and constant traffic, and tons of data to exploit, black hat hackers are having one hell of a time exploiting vulnerabilities and creating malicious software for the same. Above that, cyber attacks are evolving by the day. Hackers are becoming smarter and more creative with their malware and how they bypass virus scans and firewalls still baffle many people. Therefore, there has to be some sort of protocol that protects us against all these cyber attacks and makes sure our data doesn't fall into the wrong hands. This is exactly why we need cybersecurity. Now for defining cybersecurity, here goes. Cybersecurity is a combination of processes, practices and technologies designed to protect networks, computers, programs, data, and information from attack, damage, or unauthorized access. Okay, so moving on to the next question is, what do you have on your home network? So a home network gives you a test environment for experimentation. Active Directory, Domain Controller, a dedicated firewall appliance, and a net-attached toaster. As long as you are learning and fiddling with it, that's what matters. I've augmented the router my ISP provided with an Apple Airport Extreme, which provides better wireless performance to some devices. From there, I've extended the wired part of the network into two parts of the house using five port ethernet switches, my office and living room, each with four devices. In the office, I have a network attached storage device, which provides shared data folders to every device. For movies and TV streaming, anywhere in the house, as well as backups. In the living room is a range of gaming consoles, a TiVo box and an Android media player, Despite owning a smart TV, it's not hooked into my network simply because the device we own do a far better job of anything the smart TV offers. Okay, now moving on to the next question is, what is encryption and why is it important? Well, a process of converting data into an unreadable form to prevent unauthorized access and thus ensuring data protection is called encryption. Encryption is important because it allows you to securely protect data that you don't want anyone else to have access to. Businesses use it to protect corporate secrets, governments use it to secure classified information, and many individuals use it to protect personal information to guard against things like identity theft. Okay, so that explains encryption and why it is important. Moving on, tell me the difference between symmetric and asymmetric encryption. Okay, so if we compare on the basis of keys, symmetric encryption has the same secret key for both encryption and decryption whereas asymmetric uses different keys for encryption and decryption purposes. Performance-wise, symmetric encryption is fast but is more vulnerable, while asymmetric encryption is slightly slower due to high computation. Some examples of symmetric are DES and 3DES, while asymmetric, the most popular is RSA and Defi Hellman. Okay, so time for the next question. So what is the CIA triad? Now, in this question, the candidates should explain what is CIA triad and what it is used for. So here's the answer. The CIA triad for information security provides a baseline standard for evaluating and implementing information security, irrespective of the system and or organization in question, where confidentiality is all about making sure that data is accessible only to its intended individual. Measures undertaken to ensure confidentiality 
are designed to prevent sensitive information from reaching the wrong people while making sure that the right people can in fact get it. Integrity, on the other hand, is all about making sure that data is kept properly intact without it being meddled with an unauthorized way. Data must be changed in transit and steps must be taken to ensure that data can be altered by unauthorized people. These measures include file permission and user access controls. On the topic of availability, well, it is all about making sure that data and computers are available as needed by authorized parties. Moving on to the next question is, what do you understand by risk, vulnerability, and threat in a network? Well, threat refers to someone or something with the potential to do harm to a system or an organization. Moving on, vulnerability refers to a weakness of an asset that can be exploited by one or more attackers. In other words, it is an issue or bug that allows an attack to be successful. Last but not the least, risk refers to the potential for loss or damage when a threat exploits a vulnerability. Okay, the next question is, how do you report risk? Well, risk needs to be assessed first before it can be reported. There are two ways you can actually analyze risk. The first is, it can be either quantitative or qualitative. This approach is suitable for both technical and business guys. The business guys will see the probable loss in numbers, while the technical guys will monitor and assess the impact and frequency. Now, depending on the audience, the risk can then be reported. Moving on, how do you differentiate between IPS and IDS systems? Well, first of all, IDS stands for Intrusion Detection System and IPS is Intrusion Prevention System. Now, IDS just detects the intrusion and leaves the rest to the administrator for assessment and evaluation or any further action. IPS, on the other hand, detects the intrusion and takes necessary actions to further prevent intrusion. Also, there is a difference in the positioning of devices in the network Although they work on the same concept, the placement is very, very different. Moving on, what do you know about cybersecurity frameworks? Well, cybersecurity framework is a voluntary guidance based on existing guidelines and practices for organizations to better manage and reduce cybersecurity risks. Besides helping associations oversee and decrease probable risks, it was intended to cultivate risk and cybersecurity administration communications among both inner and outer authoritative partners. Most frequently adopted cybersecurity frameworks are PCI DDS, which stands for Payment Card Industry Data Security Standards, the ISO 2701 and 27002, which is the International Organization for Standardization, then CIS, which stands for Critical Security Control, and the most famous cybersecurity framework is NIST. Moving on to the next question, which is what is weak information security? Well, information security policy is considered to be weak if it does not meet the criteria of an effective one. The criteria include distribution, review, comprehension, compliance, and uniform. Information security is weak if the policy has not been made readily available for review by every employee within an organization, or the organization is unable to demonstrate that the employees understand the content of the policy document. This is when an information security is considered weak. Moving on to the next question is, what's the better approach of setting up a firewall? Okay, so following are the steps you should take to configure your firewall. The first is a username and password. Modify the default password for your firewall device. Next is the remote administration, which will disable the feature of remote administration from the outside network. Then comes port forwarding. For certain applications to work properly, such as a web server or FTP server, you need to configure appropriate port forwarding. Next comes the DHCP server which is installing a firewall on a network with an existing DHCP server will cause conflict unless the firewall's DHCP server is disabled. Then is logging. Now, in order to troubleshoot firewall issues or potential attacks, you want to make sure to enable logging and understand how to view the logs. Last but not least, we need to actually go through the policies. Now, if you want to have solid security policies in place, make sure that your firewall is configured to enforce those policies. Moving on to the next question is, can you explain SSL encryption? Now, SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer, and it is a protocol which enables safe conversation between two or more parties. It is designed to identify and verify that the person you are talking to on the other end is exactly who they pretend to be. We also have HTTPS, which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, which is actually HTTP combined with SSL, which provides you with a safer browsing experience with encryption. So this is a very tricky question, but SSL wins in terms of security. Moving on, which one is more secure, SSL or TLS? Well, SSL is meant to verify the sender's identity, but it doesn't search for any more hazards than that. SSL can help you track the person you are talking to, but that can also be tricked at times. 
TLS is another identification tool just like SSL, but it offers better security features. It provides additional protection to the data and hence SSL and TLS are often used together for better protection. Moving on, what are salted hashes? Well, salt is actually random data. When a properly protected password system receives a new password, it creates a hash value of that password and adds a random salt value. Then the combined value is stored in its database. This helps defend against dictionary attacks and known hash attacks. Example, if someone uses the same password on two different systems and they are being used using the same hashing algorithm, the hash value would be same. However, if someone of the system uses salt with the hashes, the value will be different. Moving on to the next question, which is how can identity theft be prevented? OK, so the following steps can be ensured to actually prevent identity theft. First of all, ensure a strong and unique password. Secondly, avoid sharing confidential information online, especially on social media. Third, shop from known and trusted websites only. Fourth, use the latest version of the browsers. Fifth, install advanced malware, spywares and tools. Next, use specialized security solutions against financial data and always update your system and software. And last but not the least, always protect your social security number. Now moving on to the next question is, how can you prevent a man-in-the-middle attack? OK, so an MITM attack happens when communication between two parties, that is systems, is intruded or intercepted by an outside entity. This can happen in any form of online communication, such as email, social media, web surfing, etc. Not only they are trying to eavesdrop on your private conversation, they can also target all the information inside your devices, and the outcome could be pretty catastrophic. So the first method to prevent this attack would be to have encryption, preferably public key encryption between both the parties. This way, they both will have an idea with whom they are talking with because of the digital verification. Secondly, to prevent this, it is best to avoid open Wi-Fi networks, and if it is necessary, then use plugins like HTTPS, force TLS, etc. Moving on to the next question, which is state the differences between encoding, hashing, and encryption. OK, so the purpose of encoding is to transform data so that it can be properly and safely consumed by a different type of system. That is example of binary data being sent over email or viewing special characters on a web page. The goal is not to keep information secret, but rather to ensure it's able to be properly consumed. Examples include ASCII, Unicode, URL encoding, and Base64. Now, the purpose of encryption is to transform data in order to keep it secret from others. Example, sending someone a secret letter then only they should be able to read or securely sending a password over the internet. Rather than focusing on usability, the goal is to ensure that data cannot be consumed by anyone other than the intended recipients. Examples include AES, Blowfish, and RSA. Now, hashing serves the purpose of ensuring integrity. That is, it makes sure that if something has changed, you know that some change has taken place. Technically, hashing takes arbitrary inputs and produces a fixed length of string. Example are SHA-3, MD5, which is now obsolete, and SHA-256, etc. Now, moving on to the next question, which is, what steps will you take to secure a server? Now, secure server uses the secure socket layer protocol for data encryption and decryption to protect data from unauthorized interception. Here are four simple ways you can actually secure a server. So the first way is that you make sure that you have a secure password for your root and administrator user. The secondly, the next thing you need to do is to make new users on your system. These will be the users you'll use to manage the system. Step three is remove remote access from the default or root administrator accounts. And the last step is to configure your firewall rules for remote access. OK, so the next question is, what is a DDoS attack and how is it mitigated? OK, so DDoS stands for Distributed Denial of Service. When a network is flooded with large number of requests, which is not recognized to handle, making the server unavailable to the legitimate request senders. DDoS can be mitigated by analyzing and filtering the traffic in the scrubbing centers. And the scrubbing centers are centralized data cleaning stations where in the traffic to a website is analyzed and malicious traffic is removed. OK, so the 20th question is, why do you need DNS monitoring? The domain name system allows your website under a certain domain that is easily recognizable also keeps the information about other domain names. It works like a directory for everything on the internet. Thus, DNS monitoring is very important since you can easily visit a website without actually having to memorize their IP addresses. DNS has an important role in how end users in your enterprise connect to the internet. Inspecting DNS traffic between clients' devices and your local recursive resolver could be revealing a wealth of information for forensic analysis. 
DNS queries can reveal both botnets and malwares connecting to the CNC server. So this is why DNS monitoring is very essential. Moving on, what is a three-way handshake? The TCP three-way handshake in transmission control protocol is the method used by a device on a network to set up a stable connection over an internet protocol based network. TCP's three-way handshaking technique is often referred to as a SYN, SYNAC, or more accurately, SYN, SYNAC, and ACK because of there are three messages transmitted by the TCP to negotiate and start a TCP session between two computers. Moving on to the next question is what are black hat hackers, white hat hackers, and gray hat hackers? So like all hackers, black hat hackers usually have extensive knowledge about breaking into computer networks and bypassing security protocols. They are responsible for writing malware, which is a method used to gain access to these systems. Their primary motivation is usually for a personal or financial gain, but they can also be involved in cyber espionages, protests, or perhaps just addicted to the thrill of cybercrime. Now, white hat hackers choose to use their power for good rather than evil. Also known as ethical hackers, white hat hackers can sometimes be paid employees or contractors working for companies as security specialists that attempt to find security holes via hacking. They employ the same method of hacking as black hats with one exception, that is they do it with permission from the owners of the system first, which makes the process completely legal. Now there comes gray hat hackers. As in life, they are gray areas that neither black nor white. Gray hat hackers are a blend of both black hat and white hat hackers. Often gray hat hackers will look for vulnerabilities in a system without the owner's permission or knowledge. If issues are found, they will report them to the owner, sometimes requesting a small fee to fix the issue. Okay, now moving on. How often should you perform patch management? Well, patch manage should be done as soon as it is released. For Windows, once the patch is released, it should be applied to all machines not later than one month. Same goes for network devices. We should patch it as soon as it is released. And proper patch management process should be followed too. Question number 24. What do you know about application security? Application security is a practice of improving the security of applications using software, hardware, and other procedural methods. Countermeasures are taken to ensure application security, the most common being an application firewall that limits the execution of files or the handling of data by specific installed programs. Moving on to the next question, which is differentiate between penetration testing and software testing. Now, penetration testing helps identify and address the security vulnerabilities, whereas software testing focuses on functionality of the software and not the security aspect. A good penetration tester truly thinks differently than the other two. They don't care about the proper behaviors of the system or software, and they are crafty, looking for that one small chink of vulnerability that was not mitigated. And software security testers generally have a fair amount of crossover, as they usually know the full details of the system or software, and they know how it's supposed to properly behave when properly used, and they can test for a lot of the common end user misbehaviors. Moving on, when to use tracer or trace route. So trace route is a command which can show you the path a packet of information takes from your computer to the one you specify. It will list all the routers it passes through until it reaches its destination or fails to and is discarded. In addition to this, it will tell you how long each hop from router to router takes. Now, when you connect to a website, say howtogeek.com, the traffic has to go through several intermediaries before reaching the website. The traffic goes through your local router, your internet service provider's router, onto larger networks, and so on. Okay, so moving on to question number 27, which is tell me something about the common cyber attacks that plague us today. I'm going to be discussing eight cyber threats. Firstly, it's malware. Now, malware is an all encompassing term for a variety of cyber threats, including Trojans, viruses, and worms. Malware is simply defined as code with malicious intent that typically steals data or destroys something on your computer. Next is phishing. Now, phishing often posing as a request for data from a trusted third party. Phishing attacks are sent via email and ask users to click on a link and enter their personal data. Phishing emails have gotten much more sophisticated in recent years, making it really difficult for some people to discern a legitimate request for information from a false one. Phishing emails often fall into the same category as spam, but are more harmful than just a simple ad. Next is a password attack, and a password attack is exactly what it sounds like. That is a third party trying to gain access to your system by cracking a user's password, usually using some algorithm like brute force, dictionary attacks, or a software which is a key logo. Next is a DDoS attack, and a DOS attack focuses on disrupting the service to a network. Attackers send high volumes of data or traffic through the network until the network becomes overloaded and can no longer function. 
Next is a man in the middle attack. And a man in the middle attack is an attack where somebody is impersonating the endpoints in an online information exchange. For example, if you're a banking online, the man in the middle would communicate with you by impersonating your bank and communicate with the bank by impersonating you. Next is drive by downloads. And this is a malware which is actually implanted into a legitimate website and a program is downloaded to the user's system just by visiting the site. It doesn't require any type of action by the user to actually start to trigger the download. Next is malvertising and malvertising is actually malicious code which is hidden behind advertisements on websites and it is also downloaded to your system without your knowledge. Last but not the least is rogue software which is malware that masquerades as legitimate and necessary security software that will keep your system safe. Okay, so moving on to the next question is what are different OSI layers and what is the job of the network layer? Okay, so OSI or open system interconnection is a reference model for how applications communicate over a network. A reference model is a conceptual framework for understanding relationships and the purpose of the OSI reference model is to guide vendors and developers so the digital communication product and software programs they create can interoperate and to facilitate a clear framework that describes the function of a network or telecommunication system. The seven OSI layers are application layer, presentation layer, session layer, transport layer, network layer, data link layer, and the physical layer. Okay, so the network layer is actually used for controlling the operations of the subnet. And the main job of this layer is to deliver packets from a source to a destination across multiple links. Moving on to the next question, which is how would you reset a password protected BIOS configuration? Now, since BIOS is a pre-boot system, it has its own storage mechanism for its setting and preferences. In the classic scenario, simply popping out the CMOS battery will be enough to have the memory storing these settings lose its power supply, and as a result, it will lose all its setting. Other times, you'll need to use a jumper or a physical switch on the motherboard. Still other times you'll need to actually remove the memory itself from the device and reprogram it in order to wipe it out. The simplest way by far, however, is if the BIOS has come from the factory with the default password enabled, try the whole word password. Now for question number 30, what is cross-site scripting or XSS? Now XSS refers to client-side code injection attacks wherein an attacker can execute malicious scripts, also commonly referred to as malicious payload, into a legitimate website or web application. XSS is amongst the most rampant of web application vulnerabilities and occurs when a web application makes use of unvalidated or unencoded user input within the output it generates. By leveraging XSS, an attacker would exploit a vulnerability within a website or web application that the victim would visit, essentially using the vulnerable website as a vehicle to deliver a malicious script to the victim's browser. Now, what is data protection in transit versus data protection at rest? So the answer to that is that Data in transit or data in motion is data actively moving from one location to another, such as across the internet or through a private network. Data protection in transit is the protection of this data while it's traveling from network to network or being transferred from a local storage device to a cloud storage device. Wherever data is moving, effectively data protection measures for in transit data are critical as data is often considered less secure while in motion. Now data at rest is data that is not actively moving from device to device or network to network, such as data stored on a hard drive, laptop, flash drive, or archives, slash stored in some other way. Data protection at rest aims to secure inactive data stored on any device or network. While data at rest is sometimes considered to be less vulnerable than data in transit, attackers often find data at rest a more valuable target than data in motion. The risk profile for data in transit or data at rest depends on the security measures that are in place to secure data in either state. Moving on to question number 32 is tell me the differences between cybersecurity and network security. Okay, so cybersecurity describes that the policies and procedures implemented by a network administrator to avoid and keep track of unauthorized access, exploitation, modification, or denial of the network and the network resources. Network security describes the process and practices designed to protect network, computers, programs, and data from attack, damage, or unauthorized access. In a computing context, security includes both cybersecurity and physical security. While cybersecurity is concerned with threats outside the castle, network security is worried about what is going on within the castle walls. The cybersecurity specialist is the crusading knight defending the kingdom, and network security focuses on the barbarians at the gate and how the castle connects to the world around it. Moving on to question number 33, which is how will you prevent data leakage? 
Data leakage is when data gets out of the organization in an unauthorized way. Data can get leaked through various ways, that is emails, prints, laptops getting lost, unauthorized upload of data to public portals, removable drives, photographs, etc. A few controls can be restricting uploads on internet websites, following an internal encryption solution, restricting the mails to internal networks, or restriction on printing confidential data, etc. Moving on to the next question, which is what is ARP and how does it work? Okay, so address resolution protocol or ARP is a protocol for mapping an internet protocol address to a physical machine address that is recognized on the local network. On the topic of how it works, when an incoming packet destined for a host machine on a particular local area network arrives at a gateway, the gateway asks the ARP program to find a physical host or MAC address that matches the IP address. Now the ARP program looks into the ARP cache and if it finds the address, it provides it so that the packet can be converted to the right packet length and format and send it to the machine. Now, if no entry is found for the IP address, ARP broadcasts a request packet in a special format to all machines on the LAN to see if one machine knows that it has the IP address associated with it. So for question number 35 is, what is 2FA and how can it be implemented for the public websites? So an extra layer of security that is known as multi-factor authentication requires not only a password and username, but also something that only and only that user has on them. That is a piece of information only they should know or have immediately to hand, such as a physical token. Authenticator apps replace the need to obtain verification code via text, voice call, or email. For example, to access a website or web-based service that supports Google Authenticator, the user types in their username and password. That is a knowledge factor. Okay, now time for question number 36, which is what techniques can we use to prevent brute force login attacks? So here the attacker tries to determine the password for a target through a permutation of fuzzing process. As it is a lengthy task, attackers usually employ software such as Fuzzer to automate the process of creating numerous passwords to be tested against target. To avoid such attacks, password best practices should be followed mainly on critical resources like servers, routers, exposed services, and so on. Okay, so now time for the next question, which is what is cognitive cybersecurity? Now the applications of artificial intelligence technologies pattern on human thought process to detect threats and protect its physical and digital system. Self-learning security systems use data mining, pattern recognition, and natural language processing to simulate the human brain, albeit in a high-powered computer model. This is exactly what cognitive cybersecurity is. So what is port blocking within LAN? Well, restricting the users from accessing a set of services within the local area network is called port blocking. Stopping the source to not to access the destination node via ports as applications work on the port, so ports are blocked to restrict the access, filing up the security holes in the network infrastructure. Okay, so time for question number 39, which is what is the difference between VPN and VLAN? Okay, so VPN is related to remote access to the network of a company, while VLAN basically means to logically segregate networks without physically segregating them with various switches. Now, while VPN saves the data from prying eyes while in transit and no one on the net can capture the packets and read the data, VLAN does not involve any encryption technique, but it is only used to slice up your logical network into different sections for the purpose of management and security. Okay, so it's time for question number 40. So the question is, what protocols fall under the TCP IP internet layer? Okay, so I'll be going through the five layers that consist the TCP IP protocol, and I'll also be listing out the protocols that are inside every layer. So starting with the physical layer, the protocols that reside in the physical layer are the Ethernet IEEE 802.3 and the RS-232 from one of the many protocols. And moving on to the data link layer, we have the Triple P protocol, the IEEE 802.2 protocol. Then moving on to the network layer, it's governed by the IP protocol, the ARP protocol, which is basically the address resolution protocol, and the ICMP protocol. Then moving on ahead is the transport layer. Now the transport layer has two main protocols, namely the TCP and the UDP protocols. And last but not least, we have the application layer, which is governed by a multiple of protocols, namely NFS, NIS+, DNS, Telnet, FTP, RIP, SNMP, and various other protocols as such. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the general interview questions that might be asked in any cybersecurity interview. So now moving on to the scenario-based questions. So first I'll be reading out the scenario and then I'll ask the questions regarding the scenario too. 
Okay, so for scenario number one, we have you received the following email from help desk. So the email goes as follows. Dear UCSE email user, beginning next week, we will be deleting all inactive email accounts in order to create space for more users. You are required to send the following information to continue using your email account. If we do not receive this information from you by the end of the week, your email account will be closed. So then the email actually goes on to ask the various credentials like name, email, login, password, DOB, and alternate email. And then it says, please contact the webmail team with any questions and thank you for your immediate attention. So in such a scenario, what do you do and justify your actions for doing so? Okay, so this email is a classic example of phishing trying to trick you into biting. The justification is the generalized way of addressing the receiver, which is used in mass spam mails. Above that, a corporate company will never ask personal details on mail. They want your information, so don't respond to the mail, instant message, text, phone calls, etc., asking you for your password or other private information. You should never disclose your password to anyone, even if they say they work for the UCSC, ITS, or any other campus organization. Moving on to the next scenario, which is a friend sends an electronic Hallmark greeting card to your work email. You need to click on the attachment to see the card. What do you do and justify your actions? Well, this one has four big risks. Firstly, some attachments contain viruses or other malicious programs. So just in general, it's risky to open unknown or unsolicited attachments. Secondly, also in some cases, just clicking on a malicious link can infect a computer. So unless you are sure a link is safe, don't really click on it. Third, email addresses can be fake. So just because the email says it is from someone you know, you can't be certain of this without checking with the person. Fourth, finally, some websites and links look legitimate, but they're really hoaxes designed to steal your information. So what we have to do is actually not click on the email and actually ignore it completely. Moving on to the next scenario, which is one of the staff members in ITS subscribes to a number of free IT magazines. Among the questions she was asked in order to activate her subscriptions, one magazine asked her for a month of birth, a second asked for a year of birth, and a third asked for a mother's maiden name. What do you infer is going on in the situation and justify? Well, all three newsletters probably have the same parent company or are distributed through the same service. The parent company or service can combine individual pieces of seemingly harmless information and use or sell it for identity theft. Then it is even possible that there is a fourth newsletter that asks for a day of birth as one of the activation questions. Often questions about personal information are optional. In addition to being suspicious about situations like the one described here, never provide personal information when it is not legitimately necessary or to people or companies you don't personally know. So now time for scenario number four. Well, in our computing labs and departments, print billing is often tied to users' login. People log in, they print, and then they get a bill. Sometimes people call to complain about bills for printing they never did, only to find out that the bills are indeed correct. So what do you infer is going on in the situation and justify your inference? Sometimes they realize they loaned their account to a friend who couldn't remember his or her password, and the friend did the printing and thus the charges. It's also possible that somebody came in from behind them and used their account. Now, this is an issue with shared or public computers in general. If you don't log out of the computer properly when you leave, someone else can come in from behind and retrieve what you were doing and use your accounts. Always log out of accounts, quit programs, and close browser windows before you walk away from a general public computer. Now, moving on to scenario number five, we have that we saw a case a while back where someone used their Yahoo accounts at a computer lab on a campus. She made sure her Yahoo account was no longer open in the browser window before leaving the lab. Now someone came in behind her and used the same browser to reaccess her accounts. They started sending emails from it and caused all sorts of mayhem. So what do you think might have gone wrong here? Well, the first person probably didn't log out of her account, so the new person could just go into the history and access it. Secondly, another possibility is that she did log out but didn't clear her web cache. This is done through the browser menu to clear pages that the browser has saved for future use. Time for scenario number six now. Okay, so two different offices on campus are working to straighten out an error in an employee's bank account due to a direct deposit mistake. Office number one emails the correct account and deposit information to office number two, which promptly fixes the problem. The employee confirms with the bank that everything has indeed been straightened out. So what is exactly wrong here? Well, 
Account and deposit information is sensitive data that could be used for identity theft. Sending this or any kind of sensitive information by email is very, very risky because email is typically not private or secure. Anyone who knows how can access it anywhere along its route. So as an alternative, the two offices could have called each other or worked with the ITS to send the information in a more secure fashion. OK, moving on to the next scenario, which is the mouse on your computer screen starts to move around on its own and click on things on your desktop. What do you do in such a situation? A, call your coworker over so they can see. B, disconnect your computer from the network. C, unplug your mouse. D, tell your supervisor. E, turn the computer off. F, run an antivirus. Or G, all of the above. So we have to select all the options that apply in the situation. So the options that apply are B and D, which is basically disconnect your computer from the network and tell your supervisor. So this is definitely suspicious. Immediately report the problem to your supervisor and the ITS support center. Also, since it seems possible that someone is controlling the computer remotely, it is best if you can disconnect the computer from the network and turn off wireless if you have it until help arrives. If possible, don't turn off the computer. OK, time for scenario number eight. So below are a list of passwords pulled out of a database. Now, which of the following passwords meet the UCSC's password requirement? OK, so the third password, which is option number C, is the only one that meets all the following of the UCSC's requirement. It has at least eight characters in length. It contains at least three of the following four types of characters, which are lowercase characters, uppercase characters, numbers, and special characters. And not a word is preceded or followed by a digit. So it's the third option, which is correct in this situation. Moving on to the second last scenario we have for today is you receive an email from your bank telling you there is a problem with your account. The email provides instructions and a link so you can log in to fix your account and fix the problem in doing so. So what should you do? Well, we have to delete the email and better yet, use the web client that is Gmail, Yahoo Mail, etc. and report it as spam or phishing and then delete it. Any unsolicited email or phone call asking you to enter your account information, disclose your password, financial account information, social security number, or any other private or personal information is suspicious even if it appears to be from a company you are familiar with. Always contact the sender using a method you know is legitimate to verify that the message is indeed from them. OK, so it's time for our last scenario of the day, which is a while back, the IT folks got a number of complaints that one of our campus computers was sending out Viagra spam. They checked it out and the reports were true. A hacker had installed a program on the computer that made it automatically send out tons of spam email without the computer's own knowledge. So how do you think the hacker got into the computer to set this up? Well, this was actually the result of a hacked password using passwords that can be easily guessed and protecting your password by not sharing them or writing them down can help to prevent this. Passwords should be at least eight characters in length and use a mixture of uppercase, lowercase letters and numbers and symbols. Even though in this case it was a hacked password, other things could possibly lead to this are that out of date patches and updates, the lack of an antivirus software or an out of date antivirus software or clicking on an unknown link or attachment or downloading unknown or unsolicited programs onto your computer. OK, guys, so that was it. If you all have any questions regarding any of the questions that were discussed here, please put a comment down below. That's it from me. Goodbye. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!